What is up, YouTube? Welcome in to another edition of Bucky and BK, live on Texas Sports Unfiltered and on the free Texas Sports Unfiltered app. Today is Thursday, February 15th, 20 and 24. And the Buck and I are with you for the next two hours on today's show. Baseball is back. We've got some World Series odds for the upcoming 2024 season. Some way too early college football playoff projections, giving the Texas Longhorns a lot of love. Speaking of the Longhorns, how about the top 10 reasons to be optimistic about Texas going into 2024 and 25? We'll talk about things to give up for Lint. We've got some NFL mock drafts to get into a blockbuster NBA trade that almost happened, and it is Thursday, of course. So we'll have buck-ons and buck-offs, and we'll have another classic TBT viral video today. We've got a ton to get into between now and 10 o'clock. We appreciate y'all tuning in this morning. What's going on, Buck? Another beautiful day, yes. And thank you very much to the uh, – who was it? I think it was Ruth, Ruth who – Asked if it was going to rain yesterday, and I told him, no, you would not have rain. And no, you did not have rain. So I'll start you back off. I'm back on the streak on the winning end again. So it's all good. Of course, it wasn't going to rain yesterday. It's not going to rain today either. So it looks like a beautiful, another beautiful day. It was a beautiful day yesterday. And but that wind still got something out there because I got something going down in my throat too. Ew. And it wasn't a Valentine's wish. It just, <clears throat> there's something caught up in my throat. And this is a family know. show. Don't be saying stuff like that. That's disgusting. Yeah, but it's all good. It didn't rain. I'm back. You know, we're, you, know, we you don't get credit for not predicting rain when it's obviously not going to rain. You're the guy who's supposed to tell us when the rain is coming, not when the rain is not coming. And we don't That's need easy to enough when it's not coming. Yeah, we, okay. we don't need to hear you on live broadcast talking about the stuff you shove down your throat on Valentine's Day. You keep your <laughs> love life to yourself. Man. Oh, this my. is a family program. What are we doing? Uh, it's all good, man. Good morning to soldiers at Fort Cavazos, Texas, the soldiers in the state of Texas, and all those that fight for us each and every day. Thank you so very much for what you do. It is appreciated, and do be safe out there. Amen. You told me right before we got on today that um... – your cousin's been having some success in the NBA. Are we about yeah. to see some five or 10,000 unit plays coming for basketball? Yeah. You know who's getting warmed up a little bit? Your Dallas Mavericks We're on a little bit of a streak right now, too. So I like the way they're playing. There's some teams that are kind of are, are streaky when it comes to NBA betting. Uh, the Clippers, the Mavs, Golden State, the Knicks. You know, some of them are still the same. The Trailblazers are still awful. They're, they're the ones you bet against. Every once in a while, OKC, if they get on a little bit of a run. But when they go bad, they go bad. The Suns are another runny team. I don't even mess with the Lakers. I never put I never put anything on the Lakers. I just don't do it. No. I don't care if they've got 25 in a row. I, there's something about them I just can't put money on. All right. And it's easy to bet on LeBron, but the Lakers have been so up and down this oh, yeah. season that you just never know what you're going to get from them. They're like a box of chocolates to use yeah, a Valentine's Day reference. Absolutely. Yeah, but the Don't Mavs got the chance to beat up on the uh, San Antonio losers last night. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was Spurs. Good. I had that. That was nice. That was a nice yeah, that was gonna happen. You know that. Yeah. Anytime you get the chance to bet against the Spurs right now, that uh, feels like the right move. I mean, Wemby looks the part, but outside of him, there is That's nothing good. going for San Antonio this season. So they're still a couple of years away, you would think, from getting back to contending status. And uh, yeah, the Mavs, I think, have won six in a row, and they mm -hmm. took it to San Antonio in Dallas last night. Love it. All right, my friend. How about uh, some big news out of the NFL before we dive into some of the Texas football wow. stories we have today? The San Francisco 49ers, just a couple of days after losing the Super Bowl, have fired defensive coordinator Steve Wilkes Booth. Yeah, they, they, they fired that dude this morning. Yeah, they needed uh, a scapegoat, I guess, for that result on Sunday. And you knew Kyle Shanahan wasn't losing his job, right? He held his end-of-year press conference yesterday, so you knew he was sticking around. You knew John Lynch, the general manager, wasn't going anywhere because he was a part of that press conference yesterday. 
So those two guys got the stay, but uh, somebody, I guess, needed to pay the price for the loss to Kansas City on Sunday, and it's the defensive coordinator, Steve Wilkes. Yeah, the offense that screwed up, you know, the defensive coordinator who had a better year than the D'Amico Ryans had when he was there. I mean, really? I mean, the guy's there for one year. He's gone. He had a great defense last year all throughout the season. Get to the Super Bowl, and that's the guy who's the scapegoat of what just went on. He didn't take the coin toss and say at the playoffs and say, we'll take the ball. He didn't fumble punts. He didn't fumble the ball that Christian McCafferty fumbled. I mean, he didn't. When they got the ball at the 40, he wasn't calling offensive plays that they didn't get a score off of a turnover. I mean, why is that guy getting fired? Buck, the Niners' defense gave up one touchdown in regulation to Patrick Mahomes. I know. Like, the defense was great. They gave up 19 points. In four quarters. I think if you asked any Niners fan before the game, if they would have taken that, they would have said what, yes. 19, yes. Yes, yeah. of course they would have. Like, how do you fire that guy? And you're right. The Niners had one of the best defenses in football all season. There were some numbers that were better for San Francisco this year under Steve Wilkes than they were the last two years under D'Amico Ryans, who, of course, should have won Coach of the Year in Houston this season. Like, I, I guess my biggest question is, why, why did the Niners need a scapegoat anyways? Why did they have to fire anybody? Like it's no. not like it's not like they got blown out on Sunday. They lost the longest Super Bowl ever, right? Like they went to overtime against a guy who was having the best start to an NFL career of anybody ever. They nearly won. They actually had a lead in overtime in that game. Like, of course, it's disappointing that they lose, but it's not like they were three touchdown favorites and they lost to a nobody. No, like right. they lost to a great team in a great game after having a fantastic season. Why did they feel the need to fire anybody? Yeah, that didn't make any sense because because they didn't want they couldn't fire the head coach. They they, right. they and they, they shouldn't they have though. Like no. they would have been stupid to fire the head coach, just like it feels stupid to fire the defensive coordinator. Yeah, well, that's one where Jerry should call up and say to Zim, "Hey, I need you to get this guy on your staff with you." I could get you two guys together. We can we can really play some defense here. Because this is a tough time of the year to get a job now. Jobs are full. Right. That's it's, the worst part for Steve yeah. Wilkes Booth, right? Like he there are no open defensive coordinator jobs in the NFL. So like if he wants a gig right now, he's gonna have to take a step back. Call him up, Sark. Sure. Yeah, I don't know what Steve Wilkes wants to do. Maybe he takes a year off. Maybe he is willing to be a position coach or an analyst somewhere else. I mean, yeah, Texas doesn't have any position coach jobs open, but hell, I'd make one open if Steve Wilkes <laughs> is an option. Uh, I can't imagine he is, though. There's a few you could think about opening uh, up if possible. Yeah, sorry about that, Terry Joseph or Blake Gideon. You guys yeah, I mean, are – that, that dude is, is pretty good. That was a pretty good defense all last year. That's a pretty good defense in the Super Bowl. Yeah, I'm telling you, you you hold Patrick Mahomes to one touchdown in 60 minutes of action, like that's a good job. And like you said, I mean, you laid it out perfectly. Like Steve Wilkes didn't fumble the ball twice. No. He didn't make the mistake on the coin toss in overtime. Uh, it wasn't his fault. The offense couldn't score more than 20 points in regulation. Like couldn't that, score that, off of that one turnover they had at the 40 going in. Yeah. Now I I will say this. I went back last night and watched the overtime. And the defensive play calls for San Francisco when the Chiefs had the ball in overtime on that game-winning touchdown drive were terrible. Uh, and, and Kyle Shanahan actually took a timeout at one point on that possession. Oh, yeah. Because, because he was so pissed at the play calls. You could see him, like the TV cameras cut to him, and you could see him kind of with the play sheet half over his mouth, like just cussing out Steve Wilkes. Like, dude, what the F are we doing right now? And it was a joke, right? It wasn't like... It wasn't the prevent defense that Pete Kwiatkowski in Texas ran against Oklahoma. But it was Cotton soft. Bowl. It was soft coverage. Yeah, they they like every single play, they would rush six. So it's not like they just dropped a bunch of guys back, but they would rush six and they kind of played this soft cloud coverage with the five yeah. secondary wow. players who did drop back. And they were basically giving Kansas City, you know, six, seven, eight yards of play. And it's like yeah, catch it again, catch and run stuff too. It's like, what, what are you doing? Like, you get four stops here and you win the Super Bowl and you're just letting this team pick up yards at will. It was like the, the, the defensive play calls made no sense. So that's that's where Steve Wilkes lost his job. Like, he did everything right in that game, just about everything right in that game. He did most 
everything right in the regular season and in the playoffs to get to the Super Bowl. But on the yeah. most important possession of the year for San Francisco, his defensive play calls were atrocious. And I guess that was enough for San Francisco to feel like they didn't have the right guy and they had to make a move. Well, they also found out, which I, is hard to believe, that he wasn't running the same defense that D'Amico Ryans is w- running. I, mean, I said, that's kind of weird. You mean Kyle Shanahan didn't realize that until like game number six or seven? He, he asked about, aren't we running the same defense? And the defensive coordinator tells him, I'm like, hey, head coach, you need to know that before game number six or seven during the year, that it's not the same type of defense. Wouldn't you think he would know that? Yeah, probably should have known that before he hired him, right? Yeah, yes, you know that. Yeah. Before you hire that dude, you got to know what he's doing. That just seemed, that it's just really strange. And the Niners but, had a top three scoring defense in the league this year. Like they weren't, they weren't bad, were they? No, they weren't bad. No, I just, yeah, I just, it doesn't, you know, you lose a Super Bowl. I, I didn't think they were, dominated in in playoff play, but uh, they weren't bad. Right, you're right. I mean, look, they they gave up a lot in the first half to Detroit, but they still yeah. came back and won. Like they shut the Lions down in the second half and had a couple of big turnovers to get back into that game. You're right. I know they didn't play that well against Green Bay, but they found a way to win. Uh, Daryl brings up a good point. Like, in that Super Bowl, they also lost Dre Greenlaw, who's one of their best players. And they still had a pretty strong defensive performance. So, I, man, that's that's a low blow to Steve Wilkes Booth, man. Like, he didn't, murder, he didn't murder or assassinate the Niners' Super Bowl chances on Sunday. No. They didn't. They didn't lose that game because of him. And for Kyle Shanahan, like I'm a Shanahan guy. Of course, I'm biased. He went to Texas. He played at Texas. He's a lifetime Longhorn. Like, even though he coaches for the Niners, I want to see that guy succeed. But this dude is making himself less and less likable. And he's making himself less and less endearing to San Francisco fans who are starting to get a little uneasy. I know they've had a bunch of success regular yeah, season and post season. season. But because they haven't won the big one, People are getting antsy, and now you throw this on top of it, like dude. They better play look. some. They better play some excellent defense to get. They need to be able to get back. Yeah, they better not be just oh, I'm on defense. Yeah, you're right. This is good I mean, for the. This is good for the Cowboys. This is good for Detroit, Green Bay. This is good for everybody. If their defense is just okay next year, that's going to be a problem. If they don't get back, because expectations are they're going to be back. They should be going back. Uh, they're the favorites to win the Super Bowl next year, right? Wow. Not only to get back, but to win the whole damn thing. So they've got to have somebody in mind, right? Like they wouldn't have made this move unless they knew there was somebody out there they could get that was going to be an upgrade. I don't know who that could be. be. That's, that, I... Could it be Bill Belichick? Get out of here. Could it be? I would worry if he was. Yeah. Because there's nobody, even with a bad team, that guy can coach defense. Oh, yeah. So can you imagine with those players what he would do? Oh, man. I mean, I've said it since the offseason started. I don't expect Belichick to take any job that's not a head coaching job. But, ah, uh, man. I mean, with all that talent on that Niners defense. That dude wants the numbers. He wants the wins. He doesn't get credit for being a head coach for the wins for as a, as a defensive coordinator. That doesn't help him out. You're right. I still wouldn't bet on it happening, but could it be Mike Vrabel? Maybe. You know, there, are no, there are no more head coaching jobs open. So, like, if Vrabel or Belichick or anybody who didn't get a head gig uh, wants some sort of gig, that's as good as it gets, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't get any better than that with what they, what they have defensively. No, oh, you get to be the defensive coordinator on a on the team that's favored to win the Super Bowl next year. You talk about, like, putting yourself back in the good graces of NFL teams and finding yourself back to an NFL head coaching job. That's how you do it. Isn't it? Come on, Jerry, do some quirky stuff. Get assistant defensive coordinators. Zimmer don't give a shit. What does he care? Mm. Make him the highest paid guy. Make the other guy the second highest paid and move okay. along. And then hold, hold your breath. Hey, and then hold your breath for McCarthy. Cause that's just the way that's going to be. Cause if he doesn't go anywhere now, he's gone no matter what. No matter what you paid him, he's done after this year. Mm. Yeah, it's the lame coach, the lame duck coach. Yeah. He's kind of a lame coach, too. But that's what's going on in Dallas with Mike McCarthy entering the final year of his contract and not getting an extension this offseason. Yeah, that's a I mean, shot. I, that's a shot. I mean, that guy was a good coach. That was a good defense. 
Right. Oh, Steve Wilkes. Yeah, that's that's just yeah. hard to believe. I'm like, who are you going to find better right now? I mean, who are you going to find better at this time? I mean, you brought up D'Amico Ryan's. D'Amico Ryan's was the hottest coaching candidate in yeah. last year's cycle because of the job he did as a defensive coordinator in San Francisco for those two seasons. Yes. Steve Wilkes did just as well, if not a little better. It was better. The defense was better than D'Amico's and, last year before he got the head coaching job. And he gets fired. Now, it's a little different, right? Steve Wilkes has been a head coach before. He was a one and done in Arizona. Like things and he did, did not a great, go he did well. did a fantastic job in Carolina, and they thought he was going to get that gig in Carolina. And he was an interim to coach. To, to Frank Wright, who got fired one year later. Yeah, not even a full year. He didn't even yeah. make it a full year this past season. So, yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like, that's that was a big surprise. Uh, once again, my overarching point is I don't think the Niners needed to do anything drastic. Like, they lost in overtime to an all-time great quarterback and a team in a dynasty. Is Obviously, they're disappointed. They should be disappointed. There's no moral victory here, but – doesn't feel like you needed to completely flip this thing up on its head. With yeah, the we don't know the inside happened. ins and outs. I don't know the personality of, of Steve right. Oaks or Kyle Shanahan under pressure. I, I mean, some things could have been said during the course of that game or after that game between each other that they weren't going to be able to work together, period, anyway. Or yeah. Kyle Shanahan is the head coach. You know, it's just said, I can't work with this dude. We've That's how it works. Couple, yeah, we've said a couple things to each other. It's just not going to work. Yeah, if you piss off your boss, it doesn't matter how good of an employee you are. They right. might let you go. So I don't know if it was John Lynch. I don't know if it was Kyle Shanahan. Maybe it was ownership. I don't know. But Steve Wilkes did something to piss the wrong person off. Yeah. And that's that's the reason why he is jobless Joe Jackson right now. Yeah, because there doesn't make any sense that he would be jobless over the way they play defense the entire year and even in the Super Bowl, as you said. Yeah, agreed. 100%. All right, we'll take your thoughts. The Coda text line, 512 222 nine three two eight uh, of course if you're watching on youtube please be sure to give us a like and uh, leave a comment in the live chat as well we want to hear from you uh somebody says hire mike brable on the code of text line yeah there you go it'd be a big time get for san francisco and i'd feel even better about their chances to get back to the big game if they bring in mike Vrabel as their dc all right buck before oh by the way quick shout out to rob who the randomizer shows as the winner of that oh, hat gift card yesterday. Very nice. We'll be sending the, that off to Rob today. Congrats to you, and thank you very much for being a proud supporter, hopefully proud, of Texas Sports Unfiltered. Buck, before we get into some Longhorn football, we've got the top 10 reasons Texas fans should be excited going into 2024 and 2025, especially on the recruiting front. How about uh, a quick early shout out to one of our great sponsors yes relax the back folks take advantage of the great sales at relax the back today you know get one of those select massage chair get fitted for that right size pillow just for your back and your neck of course you are definitely going to sleep better they've been doing this for 35 years of proven expertise like i said my back feeling good right now sitting in the support that i have from this wonderful chair over over 20 years i've been in this chair and i love this chair man it didn't I had a thoracic back surgery. I never thought it, well, the doctors told me it's not going to be the same. But you know what? Thanks to this back, it is the same. I feel fantastic. And they've got two great stores, two great locations. The B Cave at the Hill Country Gallery across from Whole Foods. And in North Austin up there at the Gateway Shopping Center across from the Container Store. Do live pain-free like the buck at Relax the Back. Absolutely. Shout out to our great friends at 7-Eleven. Yeah, as man. Well, if you're up and at them early this morning. Go stop by 7-Eleven on your way to work. Get you that call. Get you that hard copy. Get you that newspaper, I guess. <laughs> Nobody reading the newspaper, but if you want to buy one to support local journalism, then all right, go ahead. Give it to a homeless guy. You know what he's going to do with it? Use it as toilet paper. Put it in his sock. <laughs> or put it in his sock, and <laughs> you don't know. You don't want to know what else has gone in that sock. Yeah, I can tell you that. But Seven Eleven, they got the coffee, the monster, the Red Bull, the five hour energy. If you need that, pick me up. They've got you covered. They've got the donuts as well. If you need a little snack, mm. they've got all the great pre packaged snacks as well. And of course, <laughs> they'll have pizza and wings and the rollers as the day goes on. Fuel to get you through your day. And of course, most Seven Elevens have fuel for your car as well. Uh, love our friends at 7-Eleven. Bucky and I are big-time 7-Eleven customers. 
And uh, we've got that 7-Eleven app. Make sure you download that if you haven't yet to cash in on the 7 Rewards program. You know what they have at 7-Eleven also, BK, that I haven't mentioned? They've got the little packets of Pop-Tarts. Now, I can't eat them because my sweet tooth gone away. I'm good. I've gained two pounds because of not being on sweets. I don't know how that happens. But from not being sugar sugared in for almost two weeks now, I've gained two, almost two and a half pounds. So, but you, I would, I, the little pop tarts they have there, I used to eyeball those and I never got a hold of them. I went right to little Debbie's instead. But were you a pop tart guy? Did you like pop tarts? Dude. With butter? I grew with butter. I mean, you just put some butter on the top of the pot when it popped out and then you soak it in butter on the top or you just ate it plain. I don't know anyone who's put butter on a pop tart. That's a thing. That's a thing. Yes. What flavor pop tart? I mean, just about any one of the pop tarts, especially the cinnamon. Just the cinnamon with the, um, the brown sugar cinnamon. The brown sugar cinnamon. Yes, with That's the little butter on top. Wow, I've never thought about doing that. I mean, butter tastes good on everything. So, <laughs> so try it on a pop tart. Try it. Get go to Seven Eleven. Get yourself a pop tart. And put some nice butter on the top when it pops out. Okay, after the toaster, okay. not before. No, after the toaster. Don't put it in the toaster with the damn Pop-Tart. <laughs> put it on the plate and put some butter on it. Almost like you do a pancake. You know, it's tasty. Dude, I, I grew no. up on I grew up on Pop-Tarts. Like, not with butter, but that was breakfast for me before school for years. Really? I mean, every day. Oh, my God. My sisters and I, it was Pop-Tarts, sometimes cereal, sometimes toaster strudels. But I would say the most... Toaster strudels, huh? Most popular breakfast for me as a kid was Pop Tarts, and we would alternate yeah, I had flavors. A, yeah, I, mine was really brief. I, I I just after a while, I think my mom was like, "Dude, you can't keep eating those. Those can't be every breakfast." Because I did that stretch for about you know a year as a kid. And then my mom said, "That's it," because I was the oldest of eight, so I had to show some discipline that everybody else wasn't jamming Pop Tarts down, you know, twenty four seven. Because it got to be a thing where it wasn't just breakfast. I mean, it could be you come home and there'd be things of pop tarts popped all over the place. You know what I mean? Because they oh, yeah. were good at any time, really. Oh, 100 percent. And then once I found weed, pop tarts started disappearing out of the house at a much quicker rate than they did. But beforehand. you grew up on that, huh? Yeah. Oh, I, dude, I, I love it, green. man. The uh, the blueberry, the strawberry, the brown Ooh. sugar, cinnamon, and then the s'mores kind of became a big flavor. I don't know if you've ever had the s'mores pop. No, I've never before. had the s'mores. I would, uh, man, I, I usually didn't toast them. I usually nuked them in the microwave for like 15 to 20 seconds. And that, that was what I was looking for. The soft inside. I didn't want the super crunchiness that you got from the toaster. Like that's, that's what I wanted. You can get on me for that, but that's Dude, the way I'm I, old. I didn't even have, there was no microwave back then. It was no toaster microwave stuff. back then. No, for me as a kid, no, I didn't have any microwave. I didn't know when the microwave came around. I figured that was like some Thomas Edison stuff. When did the microwave come? I'm going to take a shot at the microwave in the, if I, if I, am I, am I crazy for saying mid seventies? I'll, I'll look it up. I, I have no idea. I'm going to say seventies, maybe even mid seventies. And the microwave popped up. 1945. The microwave in 1945. Wartime. Get away. That ain't exactly. true. That ain't true. That's <laughs> what Google says, man. It's on the internet. You can't put anything on the internet that isn't true. You can't? That's what uh, William Howard Taft once said. The Google said 1949? 45. No, that's not. That's that's incorrect. I'm going with incorrect. I'm going to share the screen. Okay, when did it, I mean, when did it get out for sale? I mean, was it for sale in 45 or did just the president have it? Yeah, they sold it at Sears back in 1945 around Christmas time. Like, there damn, you go. I was, damn, I was poor. Yeah, I never saw one of those things. That looks like a giant toaster to me. You were born in what, the 20s? 55. 18 or 19? 19. What do you mean 18? <laughs> no, we didn't have a microwave in my house. Yeah, right, Jack's toaster. letting you. Jack's letting you off the hook. He said, "Well, he's wrong about fifties because it was forties, but no one had until the early 80s. See, there you go. I said mid seventies. Okay, it wasn't out there. It wasn't out there for consumption for the for the people then. 
Who the hell had that? The military? Were they blowing stuff up then? I got to ask my Nuking parents. stuff? Me. I, uh, yeah, here's here's my pops, actually. I was about to text my parents. They're tuning in this morning. Got their first microwave in the mid-70s. There you go, Buck. That's what you – there it is, mid-70s. All right. So you're off the hook there, I guess. So Pop-Tarts, Pop-Tarts have been around for that long? That I didn't I realize. Can, I can see Pop-Tarts being around, yeah, because when I was – when I was yeah, definitely in the 70s and late 60s, Pop-Tarts were around because, as I said, no microwave for me, but toaster – Toaster rubbins, oh hell yeah, with butter on the plate. God, Pop Tarts invented in 1963. There you go. Okay, the more you know. Then they didn't have that. I don't know if the I don't know if the Pop Tarts I had early had the glaze over it. You know the the you know where the lady falls and hits her head. The black ice. I don't mm-hmm. remember. I don't remember them having black ice on them. It, the cinnamon didn't originally. It just I'll was the seven. I guess, you know, but look, Martin Luther King had his own dream that year, but uh, the Kellogg CEO had a dream of his own. Yeah. To put a uh, little filling or icing inside of a toaster pastry. That, two, very, yeah. two very important dreams, monumental dreams yes, that absolutely. were had in our nation's history. Dr. King and Pop-Tarts with a little yes. something in the inside. Well, that's got to be what the three biggest events of 1963, right? Uh, you know, MLK, I have a dream speech, part of the civil rights movement, the invention of the Pop Tart, and then JFK's assassination, probably in that order. <laughs> oh, yeah, right in that order. Pop Tart in the middle. Yeah, I think so. Like MLK is okay. number one, of course. You know, and it's February, so I'm definitely going to say that. There you Pop-Tart go. Pop Tart number two, and then LBJ. Congratulations, murderer. <laughs> deciding to murder. JFK. Oh, wow. It's number three. <laughs> oh, he's out there. He's got the history going this morning for the people. The history is out. Yes, indeed. I'm surprised I knew. Well, I knew two of those things. I don't know. Two, yes. Start, but I knew I knew the uh, the I have a dream speech and the JFK assassination. I by by Steve Wilkes Booth. Oh, wait, Steve no, that's Wilkes. the wrong. Yeah. Hey. That's the wrong. I mean, what was there with Pop Tarts? Just nothing. You didn't need anything with them. No grits, no gravy, no. Eggs with that. It was a pop tart, just a thing itself, right? Because you're always on the run as a kid to get out, get your ass to school, get on the bus. If you're taking the bus, couldn't miss it. So you could take those things on the bus and just eat them plain. Your parents and I would eat them at the kitchen table, but your parents, like, look, you would. Your parents had eight kids. My parents had four kids. Like they were not trying to cook us super nice breakfasts. Yeah, my little Catholic school was only three blocks away. I walked right to school until I got to high school and I had to get on that damn bus. Oh. For all those alcoholics turn me into alcohol turn me into an alcoholic on the bus you, you kids in high trainer. school just drinking on the bus on their way to school so we used to drink potato brandy somebody's dad was making mash in the basement they'd bring a an old, a jar in there you sit on the bus and be slammed by the time you got <laughs> that's where it all started for me potato yeah. brandy oh that stuff was hard it was moonshine basically i should have taken the bus to school i've made a mistake it was pure grain alcohol. Oh, that is nasty, dude. Oh, it is nasty. It, it just tastes like opening up a bottle of plain old alcohol and drinking it. It was you were, nasty. You were chasing your moonshine brandy with Pop-Tarts? <laughs> yes. Get on there with a Pop-Tart and some moonshine. That's a great breakfast. Breakfast of champions. Oh, that is so gross. And really. drunkards. Yeah, it sounds like it. My gosh, I don't know how we got there. Oh, yeah, shout out to 7-Eleven who sells Pop-Tarts. That probably <laughs> yeah. is the longest live read in the history of live That was reading. great. They have them. They've got them, too. They do, indeed. Yep, tons of flavors. I bought Pop-Tarts at the, that 7-Eleven before. Yes. Oh, my God. All right, Buck. I can't, to the- to I can't go back to Pop-Tarts, baby. No, no, too much sugar in those bad boys. Too much. On your diet. We'll get to some things people are giving up for Lent here in a few minutes. But we do have an article from our friends over at Horns 24-7. Hank South put this one together. You can catch Hank on with Chip and Zay every Tuesday. And Hank's been a great fill-in guest for us on Texas Sports Unfiltered a couple of times. He's one of the recruiting gurus over there who does great work 24-7. No pun intended. Uh, Ten reasons Texas fans should love where UT is sitting entering the 2025 recruiting cycle. So that's what it is. In honor of Valentine's Day being yesterday, they released this article yesterday afternoon for why Texas Longhorn fans should love 
kind of where recruiting is right now for Steve Sarkeesian and company. Some of these are specific to the class of 2025, but some of these just are kind of state of the program reasons why Longhorn fans should be feeling optimistic right now. Uh, number one has to do with the class of 2025 itself. You don't need to leave the state for offensive linemen. So there Texas signed three offensive linemen in the class of 2024, including the five-star Brandon Baker out of California. Look, the offensive line is always a big need. And, Buck, there are one, two, three, four, five, five, four or five-star offensive linemen in the state of Texas in this upcoming class of 2025. So if the Longhorns recruit the way that they have been recruiting – you yes. should be able to bring in a really talented class of big uglies, which is huge for the SEC. Yeah, I had that as my number two on my list after you said those top ten. And I, I put down as number one is the coach quarterback return. Number two is the offensive line foundation of the offensive line returns everyone. So that's good. Now that, now that you just said that with all these, re, all these recruits that are in this state, I know they're going to get who they want to get. Yeah, you know? that's big because – like Texas' struggles, everybody looked at quarterback, right, and the fact that you went from, like, Colt McCoy to Sam Ellinger without having really any consistent quarterback play. But a huge part of why the Longhorns were down as long as they were was because the offensive line just stunk yes. year in and year out. So now you finally got that figured out, and it feels like it should stay figured out. I'm with you. That's uh, definitely a reason for optimism. Number two. Horns 24-7. This also has to do more with recruiting than with the team itself. The wide receiver recruiting class is about to be really, really good. And look, that's it was kind of a weird year for Texas, right? Right after the Sugar Bowl, they lost Xavier Worthy and Adonai Mitchell yep. and Jordan Whittington. It's like, oh, those are your three top receivers. What are you going to do? Well, they went out and got three receivers from the portal. They also brought in a five-star in Ryan Wingo. They've got, you know, guys coming back, including the five-star last year and John Tay Cook. You know, by the way, there are a number of really talented four- and five-star recruits, once again, in the state of Texas in this upcoming recruiting class as well. With the job that wide receivers coach Chris Jackson did in year yeah. one, feels like that's another reason to be ecstatic, Buck. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, this is a group that you're going to still, no matter what, the guys that you lost, you're going to have to build confidence in some very young players. I don't know what returns. I mean, I we didn't see enough of them. We, you know, they're on this in this program, but I know we know about Cooks. We know about the little guy. We know about one guy on here who's coming back. The other guys, I don't know enough about. I don't know four star, three stars. I, I really couldn't say. And I think it's too it's too soon to start saying no. He's not good enough, or he's not going to be this. Give him another year. We just don't know. We haven't. We didn't see enough of them last year. Play. We'll have to see what the spring looks like. We'll have to see what Coach Jackson does because they'll have to have confidence. You're going to have that, and Sark will have to have confidence in some new kids. Now, he's already got one coming from Houston. He's got confidence. That's a veteran player. You know, so you've got a veteran coming back. You've got a star in the making, possibly, that has been on your roster already. You just didn't use him enough because you didn't have to use him enough last year. But there are other guys that are here we just don't know about. Oh, man, you know? I'm excited for spring ball for a million reasons. But, yeah, that uh, wide receiver battle is going to be fun. And everyone is pretty much on campus except for Silas Bolden, the Oregon State transfer who won't get here until the summer because he's finishing up classes up there in Corvallis. So he's going to graduate before he makes his way to Austin. Still playing so, school? Yeah, still playing school, I guess. So he'll be at a little bit of a disadvantage. But, I mean, that guy was Oregon State's best receiver the last two yeah. years. And Oregon State's been a pretty good football team the last two years. So uh, I expect him to come in and compete but, yeah, you look at uh, Matthew Golden out of Houston. You look at Isaiah Bond coming in yeah. from Alabama. Absolutely. Obviously, John Tay Cook, only eight catches this past season, but five-star recruit. You've got DeAndre Moore. You've got Ryan Niblett. And then Ryan and I'm Wingo. good with the tight end position. I'm good. Yeah. Hell, they yeah. Didn't use the For me, they didn't use the tight end anyway, so what's the difference? I know. And when they did use him, it was very it was very successful. When they used a the kid who's going to be the starter now, he had very good success at that position. He didn't have to catch many, but the ones he caught really counted. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a uh, name to look out for, a couple of names to look out for on the recruiting front. DeCorian Moore, five-star out of Duncanville. He's currently committed to LSU as part of next year's class, but Texas is pressing. And it sounds like that recruitment has a long way to go. Also, Andrew Marsh, a five-star out of Fulcher in the Houston area. 
another name to uh, to look out for there on the recruiting front. Uh, number three, and this is uh, sort of the last one that has to do with the recruiting class of 2025. Texas already has an elite quarterback in place in that recruiting class to build around. So that's a big deal, right? Anytime you get a big time blue chip QB committed early, that guy becomes one of your best recruiters. Like yes. we saw that with Arch Manning. Now, KJ no Lacey doubt. doesn't have the name or brand power that Arch Manning does. Nobody does. But like if you get that quarterback committed, they'll they will be huge recruiters for you. We saw the Arch Manning effect. How many guys wanted to be yes. teammates with Arch Manning as soon as he decided to commit to Texas? Like with KJ Lacey in the fold early, if that guy stays true to his word and remains committed to UT, then that's only going to help bring in some other talented players who want to play with a quarterback as talented as him. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. I mean, you you always got to – I mean, every class needs to have a quarterback and needs to have a star because, as we said, 70-some percent of the guys don't stay there anyway. They go somewhere else before their career is up. But you got to keep recruiting them. It doesn't stop you from recruiting the best you can get. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Texas lost two QBs this offseason. Just goes yep. to show you the importance of stockpiling bodies in that no room doubt. as often as you can. So you feel Texas is good with Ewers and Manning, but – uh, losing Murphy and Wright, you lose some of the depth that you had. You got to make sure you replenish that as often as possible. Uh, number four reasons to love where Texas sits right now. Oh, the college football playoff trip that is going to translate to recruiting momentum, isn't it? I mean, that's there have been two serious indictments on this Texas football program for the last decade and change. And the, the two easiest things to use to negatively recruit against Texas have been Oh, they're not competing for anything in college and they're not developing guys into NFL players. Both of those things have changed. This team just won a conference title. They just made it to the college football playoff. And obviously they just had 11 guys invited to the combine, which is tied with Georgia for the fourth most in the country. Uh, the success that Texas had in 2023, that's going to pay massive dividends. Yeah. And that's why they have to continue that success into 2024. It, it just has to happen. You can't take a step back now, no yep. matter what, no matter if you've got all the receivers gone, it does. That won't, that won't work. They have to continue forward. You got your coach back. You got your quarterback back. A That's lot right. of the other you got your contenders. Offensive line back. Yeah. Four or five Oh linemen are back. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the other expected contenders this fall are having to replace at least one, if not both of those two important positions. And, yeah, look, Texas loses guys, of course. Once again, 11 dudes at the Combine. Those guys won't be easy to replace, but when you compare returning production here in Austin to some of the other places around college football, Texas is in a good spot. Number five, Arch Manning, waiting in the wings. Yeah, that helps. I mean, pumped that Quinn Ewers is back for year three. Yep. Anytime you get a three-year starter in today's college football, that feels like a big deal, especially with the move to the SEC. Having that experience, uh, that's a big, big deal. But, yeah, with uh, Arch Manning, I mean, it, it goes without saying people are excited about what he's doing. Well, yeah, that continues, that continues your recruiting. That continues into your recruiting also. He's not done recruiting. He hadn't even got his chance to start yet. So there will be wide receivers, great young wide receivers, or, or in the portal that will say, listen, you know, I got another year. I think I'll spend my last year at Texas with that quarterback in that system. Mm -hmm. That thing is going to open up. When that guy becomes the start, starting quarterback, that will open up again too. So the wide receivers, well, not only in your state, not only five stars that you're recruiting out of high school, but others from other colleges will want to come and play for him. Yeah, agreed. 100%. 100%. And uh, we'll see some Arch Manning in 2024. Yes, we I will, because lunch. this quarterback will not play the entire season. They never That's, do. That's how it's worked. Number six, national recruits taking notice. I'm going to read this as, you know, Steve Sarkeesian doing a good job putting together his coaching staff. I mean, yes. they've, done a, they've done a great job, obviously. Uh, but you look at where some of these guys are from and when it comes to recruiting, right? Like Terry Joseph is a Louisiana guy to mm -hmm. choice, uh, coached at Georgia. He's got strong ties there. You know, Johnny Nansen, the guy you just brought in from Arizona has crushed it on the West coast. Obviously Steve Sarkeesian is a West coast guy. Kyle flood is a Northeast guy. Uh, Kenny pay Kenny Baker, the new D line coach has that NFL experience is coming over from the state of Florida. Like you've got, a bunch of really good recruiters on staff. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but you also have a lot of guys on staff from various pockets of recruiting hotbeds across college football. And that's going to help, you know, Texas get 
to pick and choose the guys that they want from all over the country. Sure. You've talked about that a lot, Buck. Well, I mean, what you're doing in Florida already, I mean, Florida is one of your one of your hotbeds right now. You're getting some of the best running backs in the state of Texas, Florida, and California are the three hotbeds anyway. So you've got a foothold. Well, and might as well throw in Arizona. You've, you've had tight ends from there, and you've had one of your best running backs of all time come out of Arizona. So you've yeah. got you've got the spots. And for me, most of the times, you don't even need to leave the state of Texas when it comes to running backs. They've got they've got Texas. They've got their home base surrounded, which is important, especially when you're playing in this conference and you've got to go against A and M and LSU, who walk right into your backyard, and Oklahoma, who sure. live in your backyard all the time. So if you can encircle, you know, all the great players in the state, now you can go and pick and choose the guys you want that still love you outside of this state. And Florida seems to be the one now. All of a sudden, you know. Have you even got a kid from Jersey on your team? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They've dominated in Florida, especially at IMG Academy with some of those yeah. running backs. And yet yeah, Tashar Choice has done a fantastic job pretty much getting whoever he wants at running back to come to Texas. Uh, number seven reasons to be in love with where Texas football is entering the class of 2025, the move to the SEC. Yes. That's huge. I mean, every, every recruit, when they commit to an SEC school, talks about playing in the SEC being one of the biggest reasons why they made their decision. And the SEC buck, it sends more players to the NFL every year than any other conference. And it's usually not close. So you get to play in the best conference in the sport. You get to get battle tested. NFL teams are in love with guys who have SEC experience like that. That is massive. And we've already seen that with Texas uh, play a big role on the recruiting front. Oh, yeah. it, just means, it just means more, as Tanner says. You know what they say. Number eight, I mentioned this one earlier, so we don't need to spend too much time on this. Texas will shine on the NFL draft stage this spring, and the Longhorns could have five, maybe six, maybe seven, maybe eight players selected in the first three rounds of the NFL draft. That's wow. it's been a long time since Texas has had that, and there aren't a lot of schools across college football who can – state claim to something like that either that's gonna look really really good for texas number nine the texas one fund is already one of the most organized well-oiled machines in the nil collective space yeah that that helps i mean texas has always had money buck but the fact that you can actually legally use it and the longhorns clearly have their puppies in order when it yep. comes to this nil deal um, it helped in the portal this year. We've definitely seen it help in all kinds of recruiting the last few years since name, image, and likeness became a thing. And Texas is in a great spot with football, but really with every sport in that front. I and agree. Finally, finally, number 10. Uh, yeah, Texas is already in the top 25 for the 24-7 sports recruiting rankings. Believe it or not, even though the Longhorns finished with the top five or six class this past year, they weren't in the top 25 until last summer. Texas right now for the class of 2025 already has the 12th ranked class in the nation. So we haven't even got to June. That's that's when Texas usually dominates. Oh, my goodness. It's a good sign that uh, the Longhorns usually don't like come blasting right out the gate. They've yes. already done a good job bringing in five pretty talented commitments for uh, the class of 2025. So there you go. I mean, there's a lot of burnt orange Kool-Aid being consumed around Longhorn Nation right now, but I think it's with reason. This, this doesn't feel like one of those years where it's like, ah, you're just hyping yourself up because you're hoping that Texas finally figures it out. Now you've expected that Texas finally has figured it out and that they will keep it figured out in uh, 2024 and well, beyond. Well, they have to. That's their biggest moneymaker. That's the university's biggest moneymaker is the football program and. I think with the faculty and the people and the management uh, from, you know, President Hartzell and CDC, that thing is all together now. Usually I think was, there's been some divide here or there. Are they really into this? Okay, if football is just all right, we're all right. But now it's no. Football has to be at the top of its game. And I think all the, the main characters within the program are all together, which, which makes an awful lot of sense. I don't think there's any stray dogs out there. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's all together, so – it looks like this is what you, this is this is how it this is how it should be and this is how it needs to be. What did Mac Brown say about getting the BBs back in the box? Oh, yeah, they're back. They're back in the box. And you're right. I mean, look, 
football is what matters more than anything else. I'm not breaking any news to anybody, no. right? Football is king. And we're talking about all of the money that's pouring into the Texas one fund. Uh, that's happening because football has it figured out. Like it's yeah. awesome that volleyball has won back-to-back championships. It's awesome that softball is ranked number two in the country. Uh, you know, it's awesome that baseball is really good. It's awesome that swimming and diving and track and field and a ton of the other sports on the UT campus are just crushing it right now. But, you know, let's call a spade a spade. If football is not right, the whole athletic department is struggling a little bit. Uh, now that football is right, they've got to keep it right. That money will Absolutely. come in and that, that will help everything. It won't just help football. It will help all of the other sports teams at UT. And it'll also help the university itself too, because uh, the money that comes in from the athletics department also helps the academics for the university of Texas. Cause people you do say go to you, said, you said the word academics. Yep. Like school. They, they got to help out the five-star journalism recruits like me. Oh, I got you. I got it. I got yeah, it. I was highly I touted. It. Remember I did a hat selection video in my backyard one time because I had so I'm many. I've not seen that yet still. Are we, is that, when is that going to make the, the oh, video? I still need to, to chop yes, that one up. Good. Yes. That still needs to be done. I forgot about that. That might be our throwback Thursday for next week. Nice. And that, uh, that could be our Maybe. video there. It was a big deal. ESPN was there. Fox was there. CBS was there. It was a huge wow. deal to watch me pick where I was going to go to college for academics. No, nah, I wish. Oh my God. Could you imagine? I'd, I'd love to be Alan Bowman or that, oh, that tight end for Miami. who's was entering his ninth year. 28 years old. Wow. Yeah, give me that. That's the dream what right guy. there. What a guy. Everyone's like talking trash about that, dude. Really, everyone's just jealous that that guy got to do that much free college. Free college, free girls. I mean, seriously, for another year, he free gets girl. older. They just keep getting younger. Uh, yep. He's doing the whole uh, McConaughey yeah. dazed and confused bit, you know? I get older, wow. they stay the same age. I don't know if they're getting younger. I don't think we have like a Benjamin Button situation going on in <laughs> Miami right now. <laughs> That'd be a bigger storyline if that's what was going on in Coral Gables. But I, know, I believe they, uh, they guy stay. That 28 years old, still scooping girls. That is awful. I mean, I was doing that at 28. That was last year. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the move. He's waiting for incoming freshmen, though. Come on, tight end. Yeah, no, I wasn't doing out. that. I wasn't going no. for the Fred. That, that felt too weird. I wanted More 21. I wanted 20. They could be in college, but like 21, 22. 21. No yeah. 19s or eight. No 18s. No 19s. I didn't say no 18s or 19s, but. You just didn't want to do that. I was hoping. 20 always sounded better. The 20 always sounds good. Yeah. 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 That felt right. It feels right. All right. Um, Shifting gears here. Yes, sir. Before we uh, get into, what do we need to get into next? Oh, the top 10 things people are giving up for Lent this year. Yeah. We uh, got to give some shout outs to some of our fantastic sponsors, Buck. Yes, our good friends at Texas Orthopedics. If you're seeking that specialized patient-focused orthopedic care, contact the experts and, of course, our friends at Texas Orthopedics. Their physicians offer comprehensive surgical and non Surgical, get this, non-surgical orthopedic care for adults and children. That means they don't really want to operate on you, but when it's time to get that operation, these are the folks you definitely want to go to. Spinal care, sports medicine, trauma care, joint replacement, rheumatology, and even more. Dr. Christopher, uh, Christopher Danny and, of course, Chris Stockton are dedicated orthopedic surgeons there, and their goal is to get you back into good health and that great quality of life that you deserve. Visit them at TXOrtho.com. Texas Orthopedics is the largest independent orthopedic practice in the state of Texas. Once again, for more information, go to TXOrtho.com. Oh, yeah. I was texting back and forth with Dr. Danny yesterday. Great dude who does great work. Love our friends at Texas Orthopedics. Trey is loving him right now because he's got him all set up and his hip is feeling better. Oh, yeah. Trey's now able to go to the water park for vacation this oh, week. Oh, yeah. Calamari. I don't oh, think no, Kalahari, there. where they have calamari, is that what it is? I don't know if they're serving uh, calamari there. That's where the kids all go, where they're all snotted up and stuff, getting in the pool. Somebody's peeing in the pool. You know that, right? No, it's not just one person who's peeing in the pool. You got a <laughs> bunch of people peeing in the pool. Uh, the tray's probably peeing in the pool out there. Yeah, I forgot about that. There's the main culprit. 
Like you're safe at a water park to pee in the pool, right? Because everyone else is doing it. If no, you're in like someone's, that's not how that you're works. Someone's like backyard pool, you can't pee in the pool. That's gross. But you're in a water park, everyone else is doing it. You're doing it. No, right? you still can't pee in the pool. Get but, out and pee. But like just Nobody stand up, stand does. on the side and whip it out and pee in the pool. <laughs> no, they have bathrooms around the pool that like if you go to the public pool, you know. It's a far you, walk, you man. Don't, you don't pee. Now the kiddie pool, kids are gonna pee in the kiddie pool. But if you're an adult, you have to get out. Now, none of you do. I don't recall getting out that many times. Especially when you were drunk, man. I'm not getting up. I'm <laughs> peeing right here. Come on. No, no. What everybody does. That's the beauty of the water park as an adult. Oh, it's like the ones that say, I don't pee in my shower. Really? Well, people You've still never say peed that. in your shower, huh? People still say that they don't do that? Of course they do. Yeah, everyone does that, right? I don't know if everyone does it. I'm not going to say everyone. I'm not going to go to the everyone pees in their own shower. I'm just going to say that I'm going to go the vast majority of people pee in the shower. Well, only the environmentalists, right? I mean, if you're trying to not waste as much water, then, you know, you're already using the water in the shower. There's no need to add a toilet flush on top of it. Just You know what? That is a great idea. That is a great thought right there. I never thought about it that way. Why get out, go sit down and use up more water? Oh, yeah. when you can just go right down the t right there. You're showering and washing up anyway. I'm a green guy, man. I'm an environmentalist. I have been for years. All right. Just, I'll just say this. I can't explain that to my wife. She doesn't buy that. Joyce does not buy that. No. No. What's the argument against peeing in the shower? Like it's. I, I don't know. It's gross. Just, yeah. That's it comes across as gross. But doesn't it go down the drain? I think so. It doesn't like hang out there, does it? No. Like. You're wiping all the crap I'm, off your body, too, that's going down the drain. Like, you're standing in that also. So I don't get why people take baths. Like, baths, oh, my God, just sitting in your own filth. That that's me. Nasty. I'm a cowboy. I used to be – I haven't since we got to the new house. I've had one bath. I mean, I used to – remember, I used to do tubby time all the – tubby time was it. I used, to, I used to wash up in my own filth. Right, yeah, you used to have dudes over to wash you in the bathtub. You would like you and Jeff George would rinse each other off and yeah, Mark Honey, me and Mark Honey used to shave our heads together, play oh, switch man. in the bathtub. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to waste any water, so I he'd do my hair and then I'd switch around. Oh, you and Honig, that is like yeah, two dudes I, on a motorcycle. Two dudes on a motorcycle. Yeah, that's about as gay as two dudes on a sea do right there. Come on, man. Oh. No, you can't do it. You can't. I can't talk about that. I can't. Those things okay. I can't say. I can't go. If I'm in the bathroom, I can't go. Uh, I'm never in the bathroom the same time my wife. We, we just, we're really, I'm not private because I walk around naked. My wife's yeah. real private like that. She don't, we won't, she won't do those kind of things. She like locks you out of the bathroom while she's in there? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I can't come in. No, oh, no, don't do that. Or while she's dressing and stuff, my wife's real private like that. It's just. It's just weird to me because I'm like a naturalist. I'm like, let's go out there. I can walk around the house naked. No, my wife doesn't do that. And, you know, the, the whole peeing in the shower thing, it's like she can tell if I peed in the shower, even if it goes down the drain. It's like, you did, didn't you? I'm like, huh? How? I don't know. I don't squeal on myself. There's just something about there. it. Must be she's me in smelling. there with you. She could smell it, I guess. But if she's not in there at the same time, too you many emollients. I use too many different emollients on my, you know, my body for that. No smell. And mm -hmm. there's just something, there's something about it. Maybe just the look on my face, like ah, <laughs> I did. You know, it. you yep. did it. You did it, didn't you? <laughs> oh, the puppy no. dog look. Just uh, yeah. something you weren't supposed to do. Why did? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Sure you did. You, you pee in the bathtub or just the shower? I never did that in the tub. I mean, I got to sit in that. It's bad enough if I do tubby time. I'm going to sit in my own filth. I'm not going to pee in the tub. No, oh I'll get God. out. All right. Nasty. I don't know how we got there. Um, Texas Orthopedics, Trey, Kalahari. There it is. Hey, shout out to Altstadt Beer. Yeah, man. I'm rocking this Altstadt hat yesterday. You know, I've been battling the crud this week. So what did it's I do? To try to, did what did I do to try to make myself feel better? I went to Kelly's Irish Pub on Old Torf and had a bunch of Altstadt beers yesterday. There you go. How did that work? I actually, this is the best I felt all week. There you go. 
Yeah, I think I got to credit it all to Altstadt. It's the best beer in the world, and apparently it's got healing powers too. That's wow. how good this stuff is. It's liquid gold. Now, shout out to uh, Altstadt Brewery. If you're looking for something to do this weekend, make a trek down to the Altstadt Brewery. It's in Fredericksburg, right in the heart of the beautiful Central Texas Hill Country. There's so much to do at that brewery. They've got the outdoor beer garden. They've got live music every weekend. They've got a German-style restaurant featuring not only German food, but food from all over Europe. they got a Michelin-trained chef. You know, the guy who sells the tires? Now, apparently, he's cooking shit, too. He's out there <laughs> at the Altstadt Brewery whipping up some incredible food. Uh, of course, you get to see how the beer is made. You get plenty of samples of all of the Altstadt brews as well. It's the perfect day trip for the beer drinkers in your life. And hey, if you can't make it down there, just make it to your local pub or bar or restaurant. They've got Altstadt beer. It's so good. It's growing like crazy. One sip and you won't go back to the other beers you've been drinking in the past. I've been a believer in Altstadt since day one, and they thankfully have been a believer in me as well. So love those guys. Love their beer. It's the easiest thing in the world for me to sell. You're going to love it, too. It's old stat beer. No impurities. No regrets. All right, Coach. I've got a list of 101 things people are giving up for Lent this year. We're not reading all 101 okay. of them because that's ridiculous. We're just going to do the top 10 things that people are giving up for Lent here in 2024, which, of course, Ash Wednesday was yesterday, so the Lentil season has started yeah i gotta ask you because yesterday you had not made a decision about what you were going to give up for lent this year did you make one yeah i'm gonna stay with the sweets thing that's easy enough i don't want to just make up something that I, I i try not to make up something i know i'm not gonna keep you know what i mean um you know i go to i go to a, a kind of all denomination church now you know i grew up as a catholic but i don't attend catholic church anymore but i still feel like I'm a Catholic at heart, so I'll do the no eating meat on Friday thing. I'm going to – because it's filet of fish season. That's right. Mickey D's bucks are coming tomorrow. filet of fish You know, I tried – you know, every every Friday there all around, there's people who are doing the catfish. I did one at the Catholic Church here last year at – in, in uh, Dripping Springs, BK. So I went to their fish fry, like on the, the first Friday of Lent. Wasn't as good as I thought it would be. Mm. So, but you know what's always good? Filet of fish, baby. You know what you should give up for Lent? You should give up the filet of fish. No, there's no no way. There's not a chance. Go, there go is to, not a chance. Go to Jack Allen's and get you some good fish. Why are you going to McDonald's and getting fish? No, man. No, no, I'm no. I'm a huge no. McDonald's fan. I'm the biggest Once fast again, food fan in the world. Why are you getting fish? fish? From Man fresh fish from Maine shipped in here. For Fridays, all over the state of Texas, don't think that you. What do you think that 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 fish that you get, that fillet of fish that you get at McDonald's tomorrow, folks? Don't think that that stuff been sitting in the freezer for a week or so. It will have just arrived. That's exactly right from Maine. That's How could it right. Possibly be fresh if it's coming from Maine. You know where Maine is? Yes, I do. It's How up at the would corner. It be fresh if it's way up there. Can't get any fresher than that main fresh cod that you'll have on your plate tomorrow or on your bun. Oh, with a little tartar sauce. Got some tata on there. Put That's, a little tata. It's not tata sauce. It's tartar it's, sauce. I love the tatas. I love the tatas. Yeah, little, I do too, but I don't want that sauce on my fish. <laughs> I'm putting, I can't wait. I'm going to Mickey D's tomorrow. The thing is, which one am I going to? Somebody needs to tell me the best McDonald's because. Not the one where you live. You know, I boycotted that that little one there at your little corners there, okay? I boycotted that. Somebody's starting to tell me I need to go to Arby's has, you know, they don't only have the meats. They got the fish, too, from what I hear. Maybe yeah. I'll have to try Arby's. But first McDonald's I'm going to, I'm going to give, I'm going to give the Dirty Drip their, their chance tomorrow. You know, mm. they have one right here in Dripping Springs, right on 290. That's going to be my first. Friday filet of fish with fries. Oh, Mrs. Paul's. I, I used to go with Mrs. Paul's fish sticks. That's what we used to have in my at my house. Friday. Oh, you was, like you like fish sticks, huh? Fish sticks. That's well. That's what that's what it was at my house every Friday, growing up as a Catholic, growing up as an altar boy. Hey, fish sticks and fries. 
And we didn't go to, we made those fries. You know, the ones you put in the freezer department, you put them in the oven. Those things were so you, nasty. What half are you, done. Are, you a, are you a gay fish? You like fish sticks? <laughs> Dude, I love fish sticks were delicious. Mrs. Paul's was the best. Not Billy Paul's, Mrs. Paul's. Uh, Chris Paul, Cliff Paul. No, I, no, I don't... no. <laughs> no not, Pope, not Pope Paul. Pope Mrs. John Paul. Paul. All right, nope. so you're, going to, you're going to McDonald's to get your fish tomorrow. Yes, yes Arby's, you're, you're about to start seeing more Arby's fish commercials. You're about to start seeing more fish sandwich commercials in general because they uh, they take advantage of the lentil season when everyone's got to eat fish or at least can't eat meat. But, God, is there a long line when you go to get these fillet of fish sandwiches? You know, if, if, if somebody would have a place – now, if you go to uh, – what is the place on Airport Road? Quality Seafoods. I guarantee you they've got a great fish sandwich over there. They great they spot. do a fantastic job. I, you know, about a month ago I was there for the first time in a couple of years. That that food is so good. The fish at Quality uh, Seafoods over there off of Airport is absolutely. I bet you they have a fish sandwich. Why am I not going there? Because I live in Dripping Dam Springs. That's why I'm not going all the way over there. That's why I'm going just right down to my local McDonald's and have the best sandwich made somebody on the coda text line a 915 number shout out to el paso text in are you gonna go to the mcdonald's on dorset with our girl carla excuse me <laughs> bitch no i'm not going there on friday or thursday tuesday if she's around there's not a chance and i'm not going to the one where the lady has a gun where when you pull up if you say something to her she's gonna she's packing i'm not going that, any that no that's Jack in the Box. Oh. If you're getting fish from Jack in the Box, no then way. you're digging your own. We're gonna reach right back there. there. Uh oh, she just reached back. She reached back in one of those folds and said, "Hey, you want to play? You want to play? Play with this." Oh. Bang! <laughs> I look about the other lady. The other lady's getting the hell out of there. She's like, "I ain't messing with this. This uh, eight dollar an hour job ain't worth oh. this shit." No, I'm not messing with Dorothy here. Uh uh-uh. uh. God bless. Somebody's got to right. somebody. Somebody has. To, I need to be moved to go someplace on a Friday to get me really, besides quality seafood. That's a that's a haul over there, you know, from where I am. It is. I think we were. What were we, I think we were doing something at. Uh, oh no, we were having a show at. Where was it? We had this show over there near. We're at the link for something. Like pluckers. Pluckers. We were at pluckers. And that's why I went over to lunch over at Quality. That's where I hit that because that was on the way over there at the link. Go I don't to, just uh, go to Salt Traders by Zilker. I mean, it's it's a little closer right, to you. Right. Yeah, that's close. I'd go by there. Yeah, that's a, you know Jack Gilmore spot. All right, now fish on a plate is different. I need to have a sandwich. That's what I need. I bet uh, they've got I, a sandwich there. You think so? Yeah, dude, you're, eating, you're eating filet of fish. You might as well go to Town Lake and cast a line and just eat that shit. Dude, I, first of all, I know people, this is the state of Texas, and people have their catfish fry. I don't eat a lot of catfish. I just don't. I, I don't know what it is. I'm not. I don't either. I'm not a catfish eater. I'm a, yeah. give me some eat, nice. They trout. eat shit. They eat, they eat their they're own shit. Feeder. They eat everyone else's shit. Like, they're like first Shooter all, McGavin, just, dude. I'm not you Shooter McGavin. I'm not that. eating piece of shit for breakfast like he is. All fish eat shit. They all live in this. They all live in the water. What do you think? The rest of trout don't have some shit every once in a while. They're dodging them. No, they're they're, they're moving out of that. No, they get some in their gills too. So all fish eat shit. So it's just I'm not going for the ones that make their primary meal on the bottom. You know, mm. I just I won't do it. Yes, because yeah, you I'll keep kosher. You. I'll bring you some while you're at. Where are, we, where are you headed to? You'd be headed to uh... tomorrow. Yeah, I'll probably go to McDonald's and get a bunch of cheeseburgers. <laughs> cheeseburgers, that's right. Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, celebrate. You need to Lent. do. You can celebrate Lent this year. Give it forty days. I'll make you a deal. Yes, I will celebrate Lent. I will give up something for forty days if you celebrate Passover. That's the eight-day Jewish holiday where we can't have bread or any sort of bread-like ingredients. 
any does that mean noodles like like spaghetti no, no noodles no rice no spaghetti no like you can't even have corn syrup no spaghetti you gotta eat that cardboard you gotta eat that matzo remember that stuff i brought it to oh, the studio yeah. a couple times. oh like the manna from heaven you know 40 loaves and 30 40 fishes and all that shit no oh i mean no lasagna no lasagna No, that's, easy. That's, no, no, that's that ain't easy. That's I, I want to do something I have a chance at. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't like to struggle when I know it's not going to happen. That's not right. The Lord it's doesn't only... like you. You don't play around with the Lord that way where you know, hey, you say you're going to do something. You know you're not doing it yeah. already. Before you even say it, you know you're not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But okay. I can do I've, I've done. I've done the no ice cream for 40. But, but I can't do. I got to go way past 40 days on the ice cream. The cookies and all that stuff. The big man's already gained two. So look out. Watch yourself out there. Don't bump into me on the streets and don't try to kick sand in my face at the beach. I'll whip your ass. That's right. Yeah. Mm, That's no right. Way. I yeah, will. What beach are you talking? There's no beaches here. I'll go down to Galveston for, for spring break because the big man has put on a few pounds. You know what okay. I mean? Yeah. Watch out, Mike McCarthy. Someone's coming for you on the scale. <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> top 10 things that people are giving up for lent this year i promise we'll get back into some sports we got world series odds we got a video of travis kelsey singing garth brooks at the chiefs parade of course we got to mention the tragedy that happened wow. at the chiefs parade in downtown kansas city what a freaking nightmare that was putting a, a mar on what should have been a great day of celebrating in kc the top 10 things people are giving up for Lent this year. Number one, chocolate. Okay, I can see that. I guess you're kind of doing that since you're... I am. I'm off that. that. Check, check that chocolate. I'm good. I'm off that. Number two, this is interesting, buying lunch at work. So People instead are like bringing their own lunch instead of, you know, taking a lunch break, spending money at a restaurant. Could you, gotcha. do that? Could you eat at lunch every day for the next eat home for lunch every day for the next 40 days? Could I? Yeah. Yeah, I think I could do that. Okay. Number three, this one I could yeah. not do. Right. Television. Oh how the hell, how the hell you give up TV for 40 days. You can't I, I couldn't give up TV for a week. You'd have to See, pay that's, me that's like the one, that's one of those ones. Don't even attempt to do that. Think you're gonna be good at it. You're not. Yeah, the no. Pope has gone 34 years without watching TV, so you could do it for... I mean, if you told me I could only watch sports on TV, well, that's all I do anyways, so that's... I could do that, but... I have to give up no. court TV, no. Can't, can't do it. Number four, soda. Yes, I can do that. Yep, we got deal. Olipop. If Olipop counts, I could be in trouble, but... No, Olipop does Well, no, Olipop's considered soda now. You'd have to give no, that up. Sorry. I can't do that. I like Olipop too much. Uh, number five, elevators. And you take the stairs instead. Ooh. You know, back at that old place I worked at where they threw me out without my, you know, in sandals. That used to be, that used to be, I tried that going to go up in where were we? I was on the fourth floor. I tried mm -hmm. to do that in the morning as a, a way to wake up to go there when I was going there at 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I did that shit for two days and I said, I'm not doing this. This is a long haul up these steps. Four flights of stairs. No, instead of the elevator. Well, half the time the damn elevator didn't work anyway. So yeah. no. I always took the stairs at that place. Did you really? Mainly, yeah, every every time. Going up, going down, every time. Mainly because I didn't want to oh, talk. Right. To was that just, uh, is that is that a tough guy deal or you just didn't want to see people? Yeah, way more of the latter. I don't know if that's a tough guy thing. I guess that'd be like, oh, shit, that's my workout for the day. I just, you know, climb three flights of stairs. That's all I need now to I do. Now I can go to lunch. Now I can go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> now I can go to Taco Bell on BK. Wow. Yeah, okay. just like that. RIP to that Taco Bell. I could uh, probably, that's a good bit. That's, that's a good a bit good giving bit. up elevators. Yes. Uh, what number are we on? Number six, six sugar yeah. in your coffee. I don't put sugar in the coffee anyway. Okay. That's, I don't drink coffee, so that's not affecting me. Uh, number seven, added salt. So just putting extra salt on food more than what already 
you know, comes with it. Don't do that. I'm a pepper guy. I add pepper, but I don't do salt because your food's salted enough. There's enough salt in your food naturally anyway. So I'm you good. Know, I'm good. I can't taste the salt in the food. I got to throw some salt on there. I need that. It's weird because I hate salt on drinks. You know, margaritas. I know you haven't had one of those in 23 years, but they serve them with salt. Oh, yeah. Around and the rim there. Oh. Gross. I hate that. I hate that. Takes away from the alcohol taste. I'm like you. Why are we wasting, why are we wasting, wasting the salt? salt? Who's wasting salt? I don't need to be wasting salt. Yeah, that's how I feel. Like I just, you know, getting whiskey. I, I get it on ice. You don't like wasting the ice. I don't like no, wasting I don't the like soda water. Right. That's the water. Just a waste of good water, yes. Yeah. I'm about the energy, yes. Yep. Number eight. Eight. Sw swearing. Bullshit. That can't happen. 40 <laughs> days. 40 days and no cussing. Well, let's yeah. ask Wags and Rodney to try that one. Let's see if Wags and Rodney can go 40 minutes without cussing. No, they can't. No, that's not even a full show. They couldn't make it uh, half a no. show without dropping a bomb somewhere. Uh, number nine. I don't like. Why would you even want to give this up? Listening to music and podcasts. Who that's just made that up? That's just. I mean, somebody just made that one up. Why would you want to give that up? Like that's. I mean, I guess if you like listen to music too much or you stop doing stuff you need to do in favor of listening to music. But that, that means when you get in your car, you have to have silence in your car. You can't be playing Bob FM. No, nope. you can't be listening to the Texas sports unfiltered app either. No. So what do you do? You that's, that's an automatic. No. Yeah. Sit in silence in the car. No, thank you. Uh, and then last but not least, number 10, the top 10 things people are giving up for Lent in 2024. The snooze button on the alarm clock. Wow. I don't ever hit that anyway. I just, once mine goes, I'm up. Mm. Yeah, I'm not a big snoozer, but I also have, I think I've got like four different alarms that go off every morning. Every morning so, you do? Yeah. I've got mine like three different devices that, that play alarms too. I've got the Alexa that does an alarm. I've got the iPhone. That has a couple of alarms, and then I've got the clock radio. I'm the youngest person in the world with the clock radio. Oh, that and loud I'm, son of a bitch! That's the loudest one of all. No, it's uh, it doesn't play the buzz. It plays Bob FM. No, so I get to wake really? up to Corey Hart. I wear my sunglasses. There you go. Me. That's that's what I heard this morning. I'm like, all right, next. <laughs> You'll hear it again. Believe me, you'll be on about 15 minutes after that. Yeah, five more times today. What else? I heard. No, I don't use. Girl. I have an alarm. I just have it on my phone, and I don't. I'm I'm up before the alarm. I look. I eyeball mm -hmm. the clock, because when you're old like me and you get up in the middle of the night to go pee, it's just you look at the you look at the clock and you have this mental clock going on that you know you only have about two hours left to go, and so you're you know every turn I take I look over eyeball the clock again. I mean I don't I don't sleep that I'm not a great sleeper. I hear I hear a lot at night. I don't I I mean you can't you're not sneaking up on me. That's not gonna happen. I, I know all the movements, I know all the sounds of a house. I mean, it's just the way I've just the way I've always slept that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sucks. I, I'm but lucky. I don't I can't imagine sleeping that alarm clock has to wake me up when it's time to go. Wow. Even even at the old place when you like woke up at four in the morning? I never had any problems. I would always be up before that. My body would always, once I got into the routine, my body would always get me up probably 15 to 20 minutes before that thing even went off. Dude. And even, even now, because, you know, I'm feeding the big dogs, you know, I'm trying to get up at, you know, uh, at six right on the nose. At about quarter to six, I start to eyeball over saying to myself, you got 10 minutes. Plus, my clock is two minutes slower than it really supposed to be. So I, it just, it's just, I play weird games. I play, you don't play games like that. You go to sleep. My wife doesn't play games. She sleeps. I don't. I play sleep games. You know, uh -oh. oh, you got 15 kinda, minutes. You can get something playing, in. Are you playing pocket pool under the covers? What do you mean, sleep games? You've got 15 minutes. That's enough time to get a nap in. I'm like, no, it's oh. not. No, it, yeah, it's, I don't it, do that. Or, no. No. Power nap bit. It's a bad bit right there. And I'm with you. Yeah, if I do wake up a couple of minutes before my alarm goes off, I'm not like, oh, I got 10 minutes. I'll close my eyes. It's like, no, I'll, just, I'll wake up. You yeah, I will I can go back and close my eyes for that 15 and still make it I don't need I don't reset a little alarm. I just go. 
kind of games are you talking about in there? That's because I've been a, I've been a fisherman, and you know, as I said, being a fisherman, I was always you know you had to be at the dock, you had to be out front, ready to go. And as as my son, who learned the lesson the hard way in New Hampshire, that he had to be up at five o'clock on the on the dock when we're on vacation. I said, if you're not there, I'm gone. Dude came out at like eight minutes after five. Guess who was already out in the middle of the lake? And guess who never came back for the little kid? Me. Hmm. Gone. And from that point on, and from that point on, dude was out there like four thirty in the morning, Smart. just sitting there waiting. And he yeah. learned, and he's been on time ever since. That's great. That's great. Hey, you want to watch a uh, drunk Travis Kelsey? Oh yeah. Let me let me hear. This. I mean that that party got screwed up yesterday. Somebody got loose. Couldn't help yeah. themselves. Yeah, obviously uh, the parade in Kansas City marred by tragedy yesterday as uh, one killed and 21 injured in a shooting incident towards the end of the parade near Union Station in downtown Kansas City. Uh, a couple of guys are in custody right now. Uh, there's an incredibly brave local who actually tackled one of the uh, alleged shooters as he was trying to flee the scene. Which, uh, you know, shout out to that guy. I'm going to get that guy's name, make sure he gets the credit he deserves. I think it was um, Paul Contreras is the guy who tackled uh, one of the shooters. Um, but, yeah, obviously a horrible, horrible situation. Uh, and thoughts and prayers are with everybody who's impacted by uh, by what went down. Once again, a, just a black guy on what should have been an amazing day for Absolutely. Kansas City and Chiefs fans everywhere. Uh, but there was some fun, of course, had before that horrible incident. And, yeah, Travis Kelsey, we all we all remember this, Buck. This is uh, – I'll play this again for the people. This is Travis Kelsey on stage in Vegas Sunday night right after the Super Bowl when he was talking to Jim Nance on CBS. He did some singing then. Oh! Y'all hear this? We've been fighting for all right all day. How about a little fever? Viva Las Vegas! Viva! Viva Las Vegas! Wow. <laughs> yeah. What a maniac. A lot of bad Elvis impersonators out there. That was the worst. Yeah, it was. So that was, I don't know how he got drunk that quick right after the game. <laughs> Even drinking the Gatorade. Your Gatorade was spiked the whole time. I guess so. Maybe that's why he tried to fight Andy Reid on the sideline. Wow. Drunk. Well, he was definitely drunk yesterday. And this is hilarious. I got the video of this one, too. He's like trying to sing Friends in Low Places, of course, a jam. Feels like everyone should know the words to that song. Feels like everyone does know the words to that song. Yes, except for him. If you're going to sing a song like that in front of that many people, like hundreds of thousands of fans in person, and obviously they aired this on international television, Probably would help to know the words. Here's Kelsey, a little over a minute long, and well, his quarterback had to help him out here. You know this song, sing along. Blame it all on my roots. I showed up in boots and ruined the Niners affair. The last one to know. We were the last one to show. We were the last ones they thought they'd see there. And I saw the surprise, that fear in their eyes. They when we took that glass of champagne. Pat, Pat took that glass of champagne, I promise you. When I took, and I toasted you. Honey, we threw what I never, what? I got friends in low places. That dude is a meathead. <laughs> that dude was dude. a meathead and still is a meathead. I mean, he is hammered, and so is Pat. Like, both of oh, those guys are kind of holding each other up right there, but wow. God, what a disaster. I mean, he just he Victor forgot goes that was... to, Victor goes to spoils, and there it is. 
Victor you get to be hammered alcohol. in front of you get to be in hammered in front of thousands of people all over. How funny that, that man. Oh my god, yeah. Pat had to help him out, and then Pat started singing the chorus too early, and then Travis Kelsey took the mic back, and he didn't know what was going on. I mean, what a hilarious disaster on stage yesterday. So hey, they've earned it. Oh, they yeah, have earned it. That I wonder what. Fun. What do you think Taylor thought of that? She was nowhere in sight. She's gone. She's on her way now. You know, they're they're working on the breakup now. That fun is over with. Oh. Oh, yeah. The fun's over. Hey, the fun and games are over with now. Nice season, Taylor. Appreciate you joining the NFL for the season, but you can move along now. Man, you have waffled like a politician on this take a lot over the last week. Like, last week you said that, yeah, the relationship is going to end in the offseason. Then on Monday, you said, no, nah, I think the relationship's going to last. And now it's Thursday, and you're saying once again, it's over? It's over. It's over. It's going to go. I mean, we may. It, she may do this for the NFL, you know, to keep the NFL alive a little bit now that the last game has been played. She may hang in there for a month or two. But by the time summertime, by the time June comes, this thing's over with. She's not going out on tour, although she's had the biggest tour ever. She's not going somewhere by June, and that meathead is along for the ride. That dude is gone. So she's dumping him? Yes. Wow. Well, you you think he's dumping her? That dude ain't dumping know. anybody. That dude ain't dumping whoever's coming to clean the, the, the sheets at the hotel. What are you, <laughs> you talking? That guy, he dumped his last girlfriend who was super hot. Maybe no. he's not dumping it. He's Travis Kelsey. He's like one of the most successful he's, dudes in the world. Dude, he's not dumb. her, of course. She's way bigger than he is, but it's not like he's some scrub who can't find another attractive superstar. Or he can find another scrub like he is, like another meathead like him, but he's done. My pen pal is done with that guy. Uh, oh, this is you trying to swoop in. No, that's, I'm just trying to take care of, of, of a young girl. Keep her away from that man. That guy's a maniac. I'm trying to take care of a young girl. Oh, not in that way. Ew. Fatherly. Fatherly. Yeah, you, know, she is a pen God pal you know, she is yeah. a pen pal of mine. I should write her and say, hey, the gig is up. Done with that dude. That when's, dude's the last time, when's the last time either of you have written the other a letter, pen pal? No, we can't tell everybody that. We don't want people... I don't want I don't want her people after me again. You know what I'm saying? I don't want these Swifties coming after me. Again. Again. No. I think they are coming after you because the Swifties want this relationship to last. No, they don't. Yeah. Swifties don't want him to have anything to do with her. Of course. Look at all the Chiefs fans there are now because of Taylor Swift. Neither the one Swift of them need each no, they don't need this. The Chiefs fans don't knew that they need that. And she doesn't need Chiefs fans. Believe it me. Helped, it helped both of them. The NFL made a bunch of money. The Chiefs made yes, a bunch of did. money. Kelsey's now in every commercial. And Taylor made some money off of it, too. She didn't so, need that, dude. She could still make the money. They stay together. She still makes the money. And also, it's love, man. What do you got against yeah. love? You know what? I don't like to break up couples like that if it's true love. But it's not. They're done. Okay. You'll see. You'll, you'll, you'll see. It's right. it's like my weather. I mean, I feel that in my bones. You know what I mean? It's like the weather, like the rain. I, I know when it's coming, and it's it's coming to an end. Mm. Now, you have no idea when the weather is coming anymore. You, you've lost your weather privileges with uh, your poor display that you've she, had. She is done. She's done with the sporting, the sporting life. She's moving on. You know, it's time for her to get to an actor or an actress's. Hmm. Longhorn Bear says, don't think those guys will be invited to the White House after that display. What are you talking about? They sound just like the guy in charge of the White House right now. <laughs> Sounds drunk. Zing. Oh. oh, man. We don't do politics, but I had to mention that one. That was Yeah, you, are you saying he wouldn't remember the words to that song either? Uh, just, that's that's <laughs> kind of sounds like right now when he talks, sadly. It's uh, very disappointing. Oh, uh, Kelsey was so drunk. That is so much fun. It's got to be a fun day. Oh my God! Yeah, the parade. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago with Tom Brady, almost throwing the trophy into the into the harbor. Yeah, from well, I don't know if they have harbors in Tampa, but 
Yeah, they were going boat to boat with the Lombardi oh, yeah. Trophy. Yeah, Tom Brady was hey, they had to like take him home early. He was that drunk. Of course they did. And then they yeah, have Pat and Kelsey were. I'm sure there were well, a few other think, guys. Why do you think now Giselle's hanging out with the Jiu Jitsu coach and stuff? Because he got drunk. I'm telling you, they don't take that. They don't take kindly to all that that over the top drunkenness. Women don't like that. Well, she they left like him because Brady wouldn't retire, right? He wouldn't hang out with the, while she's had the kids. Yeah, he kept saying he was going to retire to spend more time with the family. Then he's like, Lies. Yeah. yeah. I, sorry, I lied. Mm -hmm. Came back for that one last year and he lost Giselle because of it. But he's doing all right. I think she's probably doing all right as well. Okay. Uh, before we get into a way too early college football playoff prediction for the upcoming 2024 season. And, of course, we still have our TBT video at the end of today's show. Buck, how about uh, some more love to another one of our great sponsors? How about giving me the, the Coverts? How about giving me the, the, wonderful, the wonderful pair at the Coverts? I love those folks. Okay. You got them? Bring them up. We, we got them. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert BK. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Going to see those folks today. Can't wait. I haven't seen them for a while. Can't wait to say hello to, to the gang out. Seeing Stacy and the gang out there at Coverts out in B Caves. And of course, Big Hat Spirits.com and the Big Hat Mocktails, baby. Tasty, tasty, tasty. I went for a nice long run. No, people were saying, you drink that after a, after a, uh, well, I didn't go for a run. Let's just call it what it was. I went for a walk yesterday. So I did try to jog. I did get it. I did probably, I'm going to say I got close to a quarter of a mile, BK, in jogging. Which isn't nice. great for my back on the hard on the hard pan, but oh, let me tell you something. I got to that mocktail when I got back over ice, the ginger taste, the lemon, the orange in it. It was delicious. For those that are trying to be alcohol free, which I have been for 23 years and always wanted to have a really, really special drink for myself. Well, a big hat has made one for me. And it is absolutely delicious. And they're making more, along with the unbelievable canned cocktails that they have. The mocktail is fabulous, and you can find it at H E B. Love the folks at Big Hat. Yep. I'm going to get you. Oh, that's maybe what you could do. Do you think maybe you could go 40 days with just mocktails? That's not going to work for you. 40 days with no booze? That's a long time for you. That, that's a long stretch. No, because my birthday is in these 40 days. Yes. It's just around the corner. Yeah. I. I think we're having a little birthday bash, by the way. Now you're courtesy talking. Of our, courtesy of our friends at Altstad Beer. I think they might Sweet. be throwing me a little something, something. A little something, something? A little something, something. This is maybe a little bar tab to pay back the people who have been supporting nice. me over my first three decades. More details on that coming up. Love that. Um, could I go 40 days without? God, that'd be tough. Like People do dry January every year, right? And that's, what, 31 days? I've never done that. I could, but I don't, I don't really want to. That's why it's for me to have quit alcohol in just one sitting. That was it. I mean, after I had gone to my six weeks of classes that were four hours every night, Monday mm -hmm. through Friday, when I lived in Lakeway and I had to drive all the way to Anderson Lane every day. You went to I, meetings every day? I had to go to, I, I was, yeah, I went to a, called La, La Hacienda Solutions. It was a oh. outpatient place, six weeks Every day, if you miss, you had to you would have to start all over. Like if you missed in week four, and there was some you know something that came up, dude, you couldn't miss. Whether you had COVID, there wasn't even COVID around. It was just the flu, which I'll never have the flu again. But you would have to start all over again, dude. I was in there with drug addicts. I was in there with people that were shooting up heroin. After I came out of that, never again. Not one drink, not one sip of alcohol since. They did such a fantastic job. And that, that was, I thought that was hard to do. And it was hard to do for the first, probably BK the first week. But after about the first week, I was done. That was it. Yeah. Oh. And, there, and the only time I get an urge to 
even think about stinking drinking is when I go to Pennsylvania where it all started. Mm. Cause I inevitably somebody will say, nobody's going to know. Come on. You know, you want to go have one. Of yeah. The, just uh, get on this school bus and drink this potato brandy. Yeah. You remember like you the day, back in the day. Yeah. Back in the day when you'd come home from Boston college and we down a bottle of Jack straight up, nobody's going to know you can be fine. I always get that. I'm like, and these are my, and these are my friends. Bad bit. That is a terrible bit. No, but I wouldn't put that on anybody. If that, if you're not ready to do that, I wouldn't do that for 40 days because after 40 days, there's no reason to come back. Um, yeah, for, for me, maybe there would be, but yeah, you, what you've done not, is, that's, not gonna, that's not one of your, that wouldn't be one of your deals. No. What you, what you've done is incredibly impressive and how much you've offered your help to folks who are also trying to quit has been very impressive too. So, um, yeah, don't try that. that shit, don't try that shit on me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm look, I'm fortunate. Like I, I don't have a very addictive personality. So like addiction is a disease. It is. Yes. So yes, it like, is. I, I, I feel very fortunate that like I am able to consume alcohol and other things in moderation. Uh, but obviously it's a huge, serious problem that affects people everywhere. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. I got other demons. Don't get me wrong. I ain't perfect. But uh, in that regard, I, I am lucky that that is something that has avoided me, at least to this point in my life. Uh, something yeah. that has not avoided me to this point in my life is cover three. There Thank you go. God. Thank God it hasn't avoided me because it's the best sports bar in town. So if you're looking for a place to watch any of the basketball, any of the hockey, any of the baseball when it comes back. Hopefully uh, they have live golf. They have live golf there, too. They got to live golf. Come on, man. Of course, they've got the real golf tour. They also have the fake golf, the PGA there. Uh, all the sports all year round, the fantastic food. They've got drinks, non-alcoholic and alcoholic, whatever you're drinking they've got. Uh, but the food, I'm telling you, that is what separates Cover 3 from the rest of the sports bars. Of course, they've got the wings and the burgers and the classic sports bar food. But, man, they've got some great flatbreads. They've got some enchiladas. They've got some awesome tacos. The Sean Adams prime rib sandwich is ridiculously good. I'm looking at the menu right now. I'm salivating. They've got the grilled ruby trout that the buck loves following the lentil season. They've got the salmon. Yeah. They've got just everything. Seriously, it's sports bar food elevated to another level. Uh, you're going to have a fantastic time every time you go into cover three. Three Austin area locations plus the one in San Antonio as well. It's cover three dining spirits sports. Let me ask, let me ask you this, BK. The, uh, and we haven't talked much about it. When Tiger Woods has left Nike for all the even Nike apparel, and now he's got tailor-made apparel, that's that's different. You know, he doesn't. He's not wearing it. He's not wearing. There's nothing to do with Nike anymore. None of the none of the you know the hats, the shirts. Tailor-made has made a shirt with a tiger, like a little tiger on it. I don't know if you've seen that yet, but that's an ugly little thing. It's like a lizard. It doesn't even look like a tiger. That really surprised me that he would go to another apparel group. I guess TaylorMade has a bunch of money too, but I thought Tiger would come out with his own brand or maybe that's what TaylorMade is making this, his own brand, because he's, he can't take anything from Nike. I don't think he can take that that deal with the cap, you know, the, the Tiger Woods, the TW hat. I, I don't think he's allowed to have any of that stuff from Nike. Yeah, I'm, I'm very curious because we haven't really heard much from Tiger Woods about why he left Nike, right? I wonder if that's a fallout or, I mean, I can't imagine 24, 24 years – both both parties have made tons of money off of each other for sure. Sure, yeah, and you know Tiger, I guess, is doing his own thing. He's got his own brand, as Double D says, called Sunday Red. Um, so maybe he just wanted to go on his own, or maybe he kind of wanted to pick and choose like different apparel. But is Sunday Red is, is Sunday Red. I mean, is that his apparel line? I mean, or or, or does it come under the heading of Taylor Made? I, I think Taylor Made uh -huh. is the one who who makes that that one with that little goofy tiger that looks not like a tiger yeah i don't 15, know 15 majors 15 stripes or whatever it's got on it i think it's its own separate thing but maybe he doesn't uh, have enough apparel to rock all sunday red stuff so he's mixing and matching with taylor made mm -hmm. i don't know is tiger playing this weekend is genesis this weekend yeah he's playing he's okay, playing nice today so yeah today's thursday yeah this this week has flown by um no, he yeah. won't be playing in that fake golf league of yours with the music where they're rocking music. Yeah, because he's too scared. And shorts. 
there's too much talent on the live tour. He's worried he doesn't have a chance to compete. His best shot of winning now is on the PGA. With those guys. With those guys, yep. The pants wearers. You ought to be able to beat Xander Schauffele. Yeah, the uh, the pompous pants wearers who don't like people yelling during their golf tournaments. Zach oh, Johnson. Come on, so, man. Yeah, come on, right? Baba, Boo, Baba Booey. Come on now. Yeah, Tiger doesn't need that live money. I guess he doesn't need that Nike money either. That dude's no, doing he doesn't. Right. That's, that, that really surprised me that he didn't need that money. Yeah. He said goodbye to that. I guess he's still doing okay, even though he's uh, not at the top of the golf world like he used to be. All right, how about this, Buck? A way too early 12-team college football playoff projection. Who I thought you were going to say a 12-team parlay. I was about to come out of my seat. Now we're talking. Oh, man. If you have a 12-team parlay, let me know. My yeah, buddy man. almost my buddy put down 15 bucks on a 16 parlay to win like fourteen hundred dollars. And he was he was like one point away from winning. Oh no. He had Syracuse money line over North Carolina the other night. That was like the big one. Yeah. And he it, like the team that screwed him was Nevada. Like he had Nevada money line and they lost by one point. Way to go late night, Nevada. Yeah. And this he guy he, stayed up for the game. He did, yeah. He's the guy I lived with in Houston. He's one of my best friends, and he like ne- he always goes to bed early. And he's like, I stayed up for that only to get my heart broken. And I was like, should have gone to bed. You blew it. Bed. Here's uh, the Action Network. Brett McMurphy. He was actually kind of a piece of shit. Uh, responsible for the worst radio interview I think I've ever done in my entire life, and I will never forgive him for that. But I guess I'm promoting his content, so maybe I have. Uh, the 12 team playoff projection, of course. 2024 will be the first year that we have the expanded playoff in college football. And here's what you've got. So Texas is in as the number five seed. Now you've got the top four seeds all coming from different conferences. We're still trying to figure out exactly what the format's going to look like, but you've got Georgia as the one, Ohio State two, Florida State three, and Utah four. Of course, Utah will be in the Big 12. So you've got an SEC, you've got a Big Ten, you've got an ACC, and you've got a Big 12 as your top four seeds. It's and not McMurphy, Texas, Tech, Texas Tech is not the representative? No, Texas Tech is not the uh, Big 12's representative, even though the conference runs through Lubbock. So I guess Brett McMurphy wow. also forgot about that. That's on him. Yep. Um, but, yeah, they've got Texas as, like, the number, the highest ranked, probably a better way to put it, the highest ranked non-conference champion. The Longhorns as the number five seed opening up against Boise State in the 5-12 matchup. That would be on campus, by by the way. That'd be a game at DKR. And then Texas playing Utah in the Fiesta Bowl in the round of eight. And then Texas beating Utah and then losing to Georgia in the college football playoff semifinal game at the Orange Bowl. So your thoughts on this? He's got Georgia and Ohio State in the national championship. That's probably your preseason number one and two. So uh, really going out yep. on a limb there, Brett, loser. Uh, but your thoughts on uh, on this projection for the 12-team CFP? So you get to play Georgia twice in a year. Yep. Hell, maybe three times. Maybe hey, three the SEC times. championship, too. That's right. Possibility of three times. Ooh. Yeah, you're going to have that now in college football. That's obviously never been a thing before. It's rare you play the same team twice in a year, but it could happen, I guess, three times now going forward. And we know we know Ohio State's not going anywhere because they don't win when they have to. Well, he's got like a national that. championship. I like it. Where Texas is? I like where Texas is, yeah. I think that's a good spot. Yeah, I mean, I, I – and it's, it's hard to expect Texas to be in the final four, but if Texas has a great shot to be in the final four, don't they? Yeah. Well, we'll know about that pretty early in the season too. It sucks. Like it sucks that they might not have a first round buy, right? Just like if they don't win their conference, which is going to be tough to win the conference, especially because Georgia's in it. Uh, and I like they, they would have to play one more game than a team that's probably worse than them. But you know, they get Boise State and Utah as their first two playoff games. I would expect Texas to beat those two teams, right? Yes. And then, yeah, that's a pretty loaded Final Four. I mean, that's that's going to be your preseason top four teams in the country, I think, in terms of the AP ranking. 
in, in some order. I like Georgia will be number one. I think Ohio State will be two, and then Texas, Oregon, in some form or fashion, will be three and four. That's my yep. expectation. So, uh, obviously, the numbers next to those teams are different because of the whole conference rules. Sure, but I like that. Any surprises there? You look at it, the uh, the twelve teams that are in, and Boise State's the G five team. So. Well, you have to have a G5 team as part of the new playoff rules. So I guess McMurphy's going with them. Any other shockers for you? No, I see Notre Dame squeeze its way in there too. Notre Dame at seven. Michigan at 11. Like, I get it. They just won it all. I don't, I don't think Michigan's making the playoff next year. No. Even in a 12-teamer. Mizzou. Penn State. Penn State. <laughs> They're going to lose it twice again. Anyway, they're going to lose to Ohio State and Michigan. I don't care what Michigan brings back. Penn State's they, not going to beat them. They could expand the playoff to 64, and Penn State would find a way to not get in. No, that's not happening. But James Franklin. Yeah, Mizzou coming off of a great year. I think Ole Miss is a decently notable omission. Are we just not seeing anything from the beloved Pac-12 after everybody's gone now? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, there are two teams oh. in the Pac-12. It's Wazoo and Oregon State. So neither of them are in there. I mean, you've wow. got like Utah and Oregon were in the Pac-12 last year. They're, and they're that's right. In, but they're both, uh, you know, Oregon's Big Ten now and Utah's Big 12. So, yeah, I'd, I'd sign up for this. I'd sign up for Texas as a five getting to play Boise State and Utah in the first two games. Boy, Missouri must bring back an awful lot of players. Yeah, they lose their running back, uh, but they got their quarterback, Brady Cook, coming back for another year. Yeah. That uh, defense Luther, is coming back. Luther Burden, the stud receiver. They lost their defensive coordinator, though. LSU hired that dude. That's right. Uh, it was a big-time coup for the Tigers. But they have players coming back on that Stealing defense. The they played good yeah. defense last year. It's a great team. Hey, they won 11 games. I hate Mizzou. They were a great team. They won 11 games. They beat Ohio State in a game that I don't think Ohio State cared much about. Uh, mm -hmm. Look at me. I'm an SEC fan now, so I got to start saying stuff like that, don't I? Uh, yes, but, you that's, do. but that's, uh, yeah, I like this project, uh, projection, and it's hard to disagree with the Final Four. I mean, I look, college football very rarely goes exactly according to plan. I know there's less parity in this sport than there are in some other sports, but uh, I have a hard time thinking it will, the Final Four will be exactly this, but it's hard to argue too much against, once again, the preseason top four more than likely being the top four at the end of the year. So, of course, Florida State represents the ACC. No Clemson around there anymore. No Clemson? Mm-mm. No North Carolina. Sorry, Mac. No Oklahoma. Which no I, Oklahoma. I, I have no, like, Oklahoma's – I don't think we talked about this yet. Yeah. Oklahoma's win total in Vegas – for their first year in the SEC, we told you that Texas is at 10 and a half. I saw one sports book that had six and a half for Oklahoma. Most of them have seven and a half as the over under for the Sooners. But I saw one that had six and a half. They're not, they're not, they're not sold on games. that quarterback. They're not sold. The nation's not sold on that quarterback. That's what that's it is. Abs that's absurd, man. I think they're winning at least eight. And you're right. Like it's a new quarterback and. I mean, Oklahoma had a cakewalk schedule in the Big 12. They've got a gauntlet in year one. I mean, the SEC, the SEC hooked Texas up a little bit with the schedule in the first year. Uh, they did not give Oklahoma that same reward. Yeah, Brent was be drinking, drinking that from a fire hose, you know what I mean? Up his nose with the mm. fire hose. So what does yeah, that he's mean? Gonna be, that's where he's going to be. That's yeah, where he's going to be this year. Uh, it's been just yeah, like you would expect. The fire hose is fully inserted uh, in my mouth here, and uh, we've been blowing and going. And so they've been blowing and going. All right, yeah. and making t-shirts. That is that is insane. That it's six and a half or even seven and a half for OU. That's I like seeing that. I hope they underachieve, but that to me feels too low for them. But I don't think it's a playoff year for Oklahoma. I don't know how many Oklahoma fans expect it to be a playoff year this year. Well, they feel pretty good about Penn State, don't they, in that in the in the Big Ten with those teams? How about wow. Alabama at number 10 also? That's low. I mean, they're still in the playoff. You've got what one, two, three, four, four SEC teams. In mm -hmm. this playoff with Texas, with Georgia, with Bama, and with Mizzou. Yep. You've got one, two, 
three Big Ten teams, four Big Ten teams. I don't know how to count. I should have done this math earlier. Yeah, four Big Ten teams with Michigan, Oregon, Ohio State, and Penn State. So four SEC, four Big Ten. And then one ACC, one Big 12, one Independent with Notre Dame, and then your G5 champ with Boise State. So yep. two-thirds of the playoff are going to be for the SEC and the Big Ten. Of course. Well, I man, it's going to be like that every year. Probably right. Probably right. Yeah. You're going to see that just about every year now. Unless they uh, change the rules. All right, so there's that from Brett McMurphy. I like the, it for uh, Texas. Yeah, I do too. Get in the playoff, man. I mean, you, uh, you want to be a top four so you get that first round bye. That goes without saying. And then if you're not top four, you really want to be top eight. So at least you get a – uh. Now, your, your first round game is at home on your campus versus having to travel on the road for the first road playoff game in the history of the sport. You want to so avoid like that. Be playing Georgia in Georgia for the title, having to play them three times. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the national title next year is in Atlanta. So that's a road Where game. Atlanta. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that's what that said. Did I read that right? Yeah, it says the national championships in Atlanta next year. So wow. that's a home game for the dogs. I mean, Texas almost had that opportunity this year, and we screwed it up. Could have played in Houston for a national title this year. Right in Houston, you're right. Our secondary decided they didn't want to cover anybody. Yeah, next year, Mercedes Benz Stadium. Uh oh. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, yikes. Yikes, yikes, yikes. All right. Um, before we get to our TBT video of the day, another shout out to another great sponsor. How about uh, how about uh, Dr. Ecker, Dr. Greg Ecker? Yeah. He is a fine dentist. He's got an all-star group of professionals that do everything from general dentistry to the most advanced work. Most advanced work, restoring teeth. Had mine done in just two visits with the good doctor. But if you've got uh, if you've got general dentistry to be done, extractions, teeth cleaning, teeth whitening, tooth loss solution then give him a call today at 512-345-3166. And if you may not be interested in veneers, how about dental implants? The good doctor is doing plenty of those. Find out if you're a candidate for dental implants also. Over 1,500 cases of restoring teeth, 28 years of service in Central Texas. Folks, don't let your dental health screw up your regular health. If you need IV sedation in order to get your dental health done, do it. And Dr. Eckert has no problems doing that for you. He wants to take good care of you as he's done for me and hundreds of others once again 512-345-3166 he's our dentist to be your dentist also absolutely shout out to doc you also shout out to our great friends at bet us even though the super bowl is over the winning doesn't have to be you can make money on the biggest sporting events all year round over at bet us if you're watching on youtube there's a sign up link in the video description below us you sign up you deposit 50 bucks and BetUS is going to hook you up with free money. That's right. They're going to match your first deposit so you'll have extra money to play with, which means you'll have more money that you can win over at Oh, the madness of March is just around the corner, folks. Oh, yeah. College basketball, the NBA, the NHL. If you want to place your futures bets for baseball, you can do that right now on site. Plus, they got the casino games, too. Check them out. And if you're listening on the app, just click Explore Our Socials on the homepage of the app. Then hit the link for BetUS, and uh, you could sign up there. Once again, you deposit 50 bucks or more, you're going to be given some free money, and you will be on your way to winning money on the biggest sports of the year. Well, they'll be a part of the Triple Crown also. The, you know, horse racing is just around the corner too. Kentucky Derby in May, so they'll be a – BetUS is a wonderful place to go when it comes to those betting, especially if you don't know exactly what you're doing. They will help. If you actually call – and talk to them. They will help you out. They'll go step by step, uh, and you'll get great service from them. They've been fantastic. I've done that before, and will continue to do it. They're fantastic, especially during that triple count crown time. They have all Absolutely. the numbers. They got everything that you need that you may not know about, but you want to put a little cash on that for sure. Hey, man. Shout out to Top Gun as well. Our great friends over at Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Their new location in Buda is now open. If you've got something you need to do, the weather's nice outside. Get it done this weekend. 
You got uh, some jobs around the house that you need to tackle. Go see our friends at Top Gun. They've got all the tools you need, of course, for rent or for purchase. The biggest brands, the best selection, the best prices, great people as well. Topgun.net, the Buda location down south, and, of course, the uh, Anderson Square location, the OG spot is still there as well. It's topgun.net. They will shoot you straight. Yes, yeah, that time, you know that, for all my gardening friends out there, time to prune those roses back. Valentine's Day is over. It comes up this weekend. Good time to chop them in half just about. Got to cut them low so they grow out nice and bushy, and you get the beautiful roses that you want to get in the spring. Yeah, we chop them back right now, BK. We have them right now. They go in, we chop them in half, maybe even lower. Oh, you like the bush, huh? I like it when it comes out bushy like that. Yeah, especially with my roses. The long, the long, straggly ones. It won't take long, and you know, for this, for the heat when it gets here to get them all straggly. But just generally after Valentine's Day, that's what I was always told. Now I've been the guy who does it kind of just before Valentine's Day, but I'm going with the flow this year. This weekend will be the weekend I'll chop my roses back in half. You know, mulch them over a little bit, put in some fertilizer and have that nice rose garden for the spring. So you used to trim your bushes before Valentine's Day, but now you do it after? Yes. That doesn't feel right. Doesn't feel right at all, no. I think you're supposed to do it that way, but did yeah, you leave you like a card? Long... Did you leave a card for the person to put the light bulb in your place for getting that done finally? A little Valentine's Day. That... <laughs> that was my Valentine, the maintenance man at my apartment complex. You should. My wife was not happy that you didn't get up there and do that. She well, couldn't come understand. Come on. She hey, you guys. That. Hey, it's all right. Hey, y'all are jealous. That's fine. You're jealous. That's okay. It's tough to admit jealousy at times, but you wish you had somebody else to do that stuff for you. And I do. So I'm taking advantage of it. You people, you homos out there, you have to do <laughs> that stuff yourself. You'll stay in the dark. You didn't, right. you would stay in the dark a week before you would just get up on a stool and change the light bulb yourself. Yeah. It's principle, man. It's principle. Yeah, I, I really, that's that's why like changing oil, I don't like to take people's jobs away from them. That's ridiculous. No. I mean, they need exactly. a job. I'm too. a man of the people. That maintenance man, no. he thanked me. He owes me a Valentine's Day gift. <laughs> True. He's buy you a box of chocolates. If he wouldn't have a man. job to take care of his loved ones if it weren't for me needing a new light bulb. God. Somebody asked me yesterday if I gave him a $20 tip. Hell no. What? 20 bucks? I would, have, I would have changed the damn thing myself if that's what it cost. You could bought break. six pack of light bulbs for that. 100%. Yeah. All right. Shout out to all of our great sponsors out there. We, uh, love, we love each and every one of them. How about a TBT video today, Buck? You got it. I don't know if you're going to like this one as much as last week. You were a big fan of the, uh, the black guy last week. But we've got a two-parter here. This is a newscast. This is an oldie but a goodie. As good as your They're, old guy from the last time. It, it, it's a sketch artist. So it's a local news anchor who gets a, you know, a, a police sketch, police sketch. I think that's it. Just pasted on the screen for him to look at. And you get okay. to see this guy's reaction to the police <laughs> sketch. This thing is cut into two parts. And I think both of them are pretty funny. Here's part one. Now this just in, police uh, officers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, were asking people to be on the lookout for a man who robbed a store. And I think, yeah, I think we do, we do have his description. Can we take that? Let's take his description. Okay, this is the guy. They're, uh, they want, they wanted people in Pennsylvania to be out on the lookout for. He's got, uh, he's got a nose and some hair that goes like that, and he was, uh, he was wearing a hat at the time of this particular particular crime. It's got kind of a chin that comes down to a almost a point. Stands about five feet four inches tall. There it is. Get a good look for yourself. So there's the wow, first that, half. Of, and there's more. I mean how before we show you part two, I mean this is this is terrible. That's a police sketch that they sent out to try to find some sort of criminal. That's what it was. Who the hell is this artist there? They paid somebody to do that. No way. Yeah. They got well, that from a that's a third professional. Grade. 
I know. Well, here's part two. They actually found the guy. Wow. And you tell me if uh, you know, the, the sketch artist actually did a half decent job here. Oh, and now I'm getting word that police actually caught this guy. Thanks to the sketch, no doubt. So here's a picture of the real guy next to the sketch that led to his arrest. Where's the pointy chin? It's uncanny, Lisa. <laughs> uh, the, the guy uh, on the left is now charged with two counts of theft and is being held in the Lancaster jail. And I say give that sketch artist a raise. This wouldn't be so funny, except it's a real sketch. That was actually the sketch that the police sent out to the good folks in Lancaster. <laughs> and, hey, to their credit, they got him. They came through. <laughs> okay. Minus the hat. Uh. It's the hat that's the thing. If you stuck that hat on that dude, they would look just alike. Come on now. Lancaster, you know, that's right down the street from Bethlehem. That's about 15 minutes from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That dude looks like a guy should be in a buggy, in, a, in an Amish buggy right there. That's one, of, that's one of the Quakers right there. I figured, yeah, you might know where that is. That's your neck of the woods. That's right down the street from, that's, that's not very far from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So how do you think the sketch artist right. did? I think he did just fine. You got one of the Amish like guys. The the oh my God. That's, that guy, the news, like anchor, the news anchor drops so many funny lines, too. After he's like, oh, they caught the guy. Thanks to the sketch, no doubt. Yes, like, of course. It's uncanny. Well, one thing is the hair looks the, the hair looks for sure the same. It's so bad, but like it actually kind of looks like the grill. Yes. Doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. The, the chin, hair? Great job. Yeah, the chin yeah, the chin isn't great. I don't know what those lines are. Like, does he have whiskers or something? What are those lines sticking out of his? Supposed face? to be the cheekbones. No. Yeah. I love. Good I job. love the, Yeah, the producers just messed with the anchor. They showed him the sketch first, and then they showed the side by side. But I love the. Uh, I'll show just the start of the first part again. How long of a pause the anchor has after he oh looks at the goodness. picture. He's just like, what the hell is this? Now this just in, police uh, officers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, were asking people to be on the lookout for a man who robbed a store. And I think, yeah, I think we do, we do have his description. Can we take that? Let's take his description. <laughs> I think I was like, what the? Oh my goodness. He just pauses, like stares at it for a while, then he turns back to the camera and is like, Is this serious? Like, am I getting punked yeah, well, right now? He's not gonna be like those people that we too low. He's not falling for it. He's been yeah. around. That's a that guy's a professional. He's he's he saw the ones where we too low, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Holy he's food. not going for that. He's like, this can't be a joke. You're not getting me. Oh, I'm going to show that part again. And then just the brief description he gives. Now this just in, police uh, officers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, were asking people to be on the lookout for a man who robbed a store. And I think, yeah, I think we do, we do have his description. Can we take that? Let's take his description. Okay. This is the guy. They're, uh. They wanted, they wanted people in Pennsylvania to be out on the lookout for. He's got, uh, he's got a nose and some hair that goes like that, and he was, uh, he was wearing a hat at the time of this particular, particular crime. He's got kind of a chin that comes down to a, almost a point. Stan he's trying to be <laughs> serious, but it's too hard for him. He's trying his best. Uh, he's got oh, a man. nose. He's got hair that goes like that. Uh that is awful. Yep. Great job by the reporter. He's got nose and hair. Great, great description there, guy. He's got a right ear that's like a triangle. No, what is that? Is that a square? Did they put two squares for ears on that dude? Looks like he doesn't even have a left ear. He only has that's one ear. Good. It's all hair on the other side. Oh, man. This, this has been funny to me forever. Have you never seen this before? No, I've never seen that. That sketch right there? No. Oh, Other my God. In the buggy that was robbing banks? No, in Lancaster? Come on. The Quaker. Let me see what year this uh, video came out. I wonder if I can find it. Maybe I can't. I'm not going to waste much more time looking for that. But there you go. There's your TBT of the day. The uh, worst police sketch of all time that somehow led to the finding of 
this criminal in Pennsylvania, close to where you're from. Yeah, if you saw that guy at the clean mall, you would go alien. Guess what you'd say? There's one right there. Look at his eyes. Which guy, oh, left or right? Huh? Which guy, left or right? Right. Forget the yeah. one on the left. The left one is a great character of somebody. The one on the right is the scary alien, isn't he? Yeah. yeah he's a regular at the clean yeah. mall, huh? If you saw that guy shopping at the mall, at the clean mall, you'd think that they just jumped, just dumped him out of a spaceship, dude. But he is white. He's not shopping at the white people mall? No, no, no. Clean mall. Clean mall is, is a mixture. It's a mixture mall. Okay. Oh, when you say aliens, you're not got you okay yeah, yeah from the spaceship don't don't no don't no not border patrol i'm talking about those the real ones out just of space sure just making sure man it's messed up he's saying stuff like that <laughs> that's I'm, don't even get me there don't even hey don't be saying that that's messed up <laughs> that's, that's that's what you said you, you're calling them that it's disrespectful dude no dude that's where the the one from the spaceships come to the clean they're, they're mall. Looking at you go to you go to clean mall they're there to witness humans walking around that's the and that's the place where the aliens land they land in colleen texas yes in the state of texas that's that's their hub that's the, <laughs> <laughs> that's the hub no not fiesta no no i'm talking about the clean mall that's no. <laughs> that's offensive right <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, aliens at Fiesta? What? I, 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 can't, no. I can't shop there? Yes, you can. Absolutely. But if, oh, you're, if you were to see that guy at the clean mall, you'd say, I come in peace. Nanu, Nanu, or whatever you have to say to him. He would understand nanu. your language. Yes. Oh, man. Let's bring, on Rodney Rod Let's bring on Rodney Rodriguez here, and I promise our recent conversation has nothing to do with rodney coming on right now <laughs> let me tell you guys that's double offensive because number one number one obviously the fiesta thing i what? get it that's funny ha 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 number two number two i was born on fort well i guess now fort cavazos so yeah. uh you, you, you've kind of got the uh the double for me right there uh wow you, old, but if, you, great if, you to, if you go to clean mall i'm telling you rodney you go in there you'll see People with their eyes really close together, these monster foreheads. I'm just saying, that's the hub in the state of Texas for wow. spaceships and stuff. They come down to to talk. They come and look at people and observe people at that mall. They don't go to the bar. You think they go to the Barton Creek Mall? If they want to get <laughs> no, the normal no, I bet people. Not. I get well, <laughs> Rodney, what planet are you from? Well, I'm beginning to wonder. Um, I, I don't really know where the fuck I'm from. Um, I, I, I know where I'm from. I'm from Uranus. <laughs> Ooh, there it is right there. Right Classic. there. Planet Uranus. No, that, uh, yeah, malls are different. I mean, I always liked, I mean, when, when I was a youngster, I mean, we go to the Highland Mall. We go to the Black Mall. Is the, the Black one Mall, that we, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Black Mall was pretty cool. See, BK doesn't know. BK doesn't remember that. Like, even when he's oh, in school, no. he didn't know that was the Black Mall. No, he didn't know that was Black Mall, but that was no. definitely the Black Mall. I mean, now you come ACC. rolling up in there. ACC yeah. took it over. Yeah, they did. And, and then when, when Barton Creek came about, it was like, well, you know, that 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 was the White Mall right there. And then and then Lakeline, holy moly, Lakeline oh. is like, oh, that's everybody's mall. <laughs> that's everybody's mall. Yeah, no kidding. God, yeah. Austin was way behind. They were segregating in malls until like what the nineties? <laughs> pretty much, pretty yeah, much. Man. When 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 somebody figured out you had all this acreage out in uh, Cedar Park, it's like let's drop them all there. And, yeah, and there you go. That's right kind there. of the one that tied them all together. Everybody goes there. That's everybody's mall. Everybody's <laughs> mall. The mixer mall. Yes, the mixer indeed. mall. And, and Bucky, I'm still laughing about you with the filet of fish. Uh, you, you know, with with all of that coming up, I'm telling you, I'll tell you again. You say it comes from Maine. I'm telling you, it comes from Maine or Mainer. Mainer <laughs> Lake. You, know, it, dude, you better get on. Hey, let me tell you something. The first batch is the ba best batch tomorrow. Get on that filet of fish tomorrow, at Mickey D's, uh -huh. because that's it. I don't eat meat from Mickey D's. I don't do. I don't do plain burgers i don't do cheeseburgers i don't do the the big mac i don't do any of that stuff the mcrib excuse oh. me please 
I don't do any of that stuff. I do that fresh filet of fish from Maine, shipped in from Maine, day before Maine. here on Thursdays. Maine. Ready to go. Maine. Nur. Maine. Maine. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, maybe maybe Main Street in downtown Buda is where it's coming from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Main Street Pflugerville. Did you ever do Mrs. Paul's fish sticks? We did. We used to we used to get those all the time, and and that was that was like a big deal because I grew up Catholic, so it was yeah. like okay. And right. I, You're I not Catholic get, anymore. Well, you know, um, I, I'm everything. I'm like Bucky. I'm, I'm non everything. I'm non criminal or denominal or whatever you want to call yes. it. So. It's like, you know, I, I just kind of do do whatever. But it's like, yeah, I remember it was always on Friday, those fish sticks. My aunt would roll those things out. And I'm like, oh, man, those, <laughs> those Mrs. And, Paul's, man. And they had to be cooked, right? Every once in a while you get one that wasn't totally done out of the oven. Oh, and bite into oh. that sucker. And you could oh. taste that. You could taste that fresh fish. Oh, you man. That, you, you take that one bite and you get that crunch. It's like, oh, my God, oh. what the hell was that? Is that a bone? <laughs> this was bone got a in, bone in it. What the bone fuck? Fish. Bone in filet of fish. Oh, I'm going tomorrow. I'm going. And I'm going to Dripping Springs, my main source. Dripping Springs McDonald's there on 290. They're getting my first shot. But never will I go to that place where BK lives around that corner there. No. No, 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 I don't go there no. ever since they gave he's me in the a good area. Spot. He's in a good spot. No, he's not. That McDonald's there. Not good. I'm sorry about sorry about it, McDonald's. But <laughs> excuse me, that place in that corner. They once he's gave me there. fries. I know that look like like dead little fingers in the, and they were cold. I went back around and I, that lady should have just started shooting at me because I was giving her such grief about their fries. I said, this is the reason I come here for your fries. And they're all cribbled up, you know, like arthritic fingers and stuff. And they're cold. I'm like, this is bullshit. Excuse I did. I had me, a beef bitch. with them at that McDonald's. <laughs> and, somebody told, and then somebody told me, they said, order fresh French fries every time you go. I'm like, you mean they're going to put that whole thing in that greasy ass bucket and they're going to do that just for me every time? They're not going to just dish it out? Somebody, I said, no, well, they're not. They're going to give me the ones that's been sitting in there for like 45 minutes and put it in my little container, right? And here's and here's a pro tip that I was told a couple of years ago about McDonald's. If you want to go and you go, you want to get the chicken nuggies. If you want to get the chicken nuggies, always order 20 because likely what's going to happen in the little thing over there, there's not 20 in there. So they're always going to drop you 20. So it's like always order oh, 20. Even if you nice. don't want them, you're going to get 20 fresh. Pro tip from Double R. That is, that's a pro that? tip right there. Love that tip. Good tip. That's yes, the shit sir. you get right here on this program. I was, I was I going to do the light. Oh, no, I will not be stopping salt. cussing for Lent. <laughs> light salt on the fries. That way they got to make a brand new batch of fries. What was that? What was that tip with the fries? Light salt on the fries. Look at this, Bucky. These guys. A whole fresh batch and put a new. I mean, I've like, they actually got to put like paper and stuff. It's a, it's a, you're a pain in the ass when you do this, but you get your fresh fries. Mm, those, look at this. those are great tips, but I'm still boycotting O'Kills McDonald's. No, not going. I'm not, yeah, I haven't been there for three, four years. Not going by. Wags and no. Ronnie are giving you their tips on Valentine's Day. That's pretty nice of them. So I, I, so I, I tried it. Yes, I tried to get Katie to go to Taco Bell for thank or uh, for Valentine's Day. I the Nuggets. I want the Nuggets. We needed to try it. They're not out stop, yet. Stop, stop. We needed to try. I just threw it out there. We didn't go. We didn't we didn't actually fucking go. I just threw it out there. They're, they're not out <laughs> yet. They announced that they will be out. You can't no, even get I them thought yet. they were, man. I tried. I said, hey, you know, Taco Bell's got some new chicken nuggets that you can dip in some queso. You want to try it? The fuck the boom bostic side eye I got from that woman last <laughs> night. <laughs> Holy shit. Well, so I, <laughs> I, I, I went for home. Valentine's Day. That was your I deal? I had to try it, Buck. We didn't have any plans. I wasn't getting off until about 9 o'clock anyways. We had to make plans somewhere. There getting off go. at 9? Nice. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, usually I prefer nooners, but, I mean, I'll I'm take impressed. nooners. <laughs> I'm saying, yeah, it's a, for me, it's like 7 a.m. when I get off. But I, I, I want to – so I did want to say, so for Tracy, what, what I did, so we were, like, not going to do anything. I know, BK, I messaged you last night that we had a dinner thing. It, that was actually at home, so we couldn't do what we were going to do. But uh, I got her the best gift of them all, Bucky. I got her two boxes of peanut butter Girl Scout patties 
delivered oh. to the crib. Wow. I thought you were going to say he gave her the rod of God. No, man. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. And, <laughs> Dude, and, I have and, the rod of God. And I didn't butter her muffin either. So yeah. it, I, did, uh, I, did two, I did two cards for my wife. I've been doing flowers all week. So I did two cards for her. And the one was in the AM and one was in the PM. And that that was – she enjoyed the one that was on her desk in the morning. And then in the, in the evening, I gave her another card. Double, I doubled the cards, but the flower's been coming in all week from HEB. So look at that. And HEB is the place to go. I was telling yeah, the folks. Yeah, tell, tell them, come the floors at HEB. They're doing a fantastic job, aren't they, Rodney? They do a really good job. They do a really good job. And and the whole thing is, for a while, I would do, you remember a lot of the radio stations, you would like, like Pro Flowers, and they'd give you the code. Yes. You know, oh, code yeah. Bucky or whatever it was, and you'd order that shit. Yeah, absolutely. And it was like, I did that for a couple of years and my wife was like, Oh, I love the cinnamon and everything that you're doing, but I got to fucking put them together. I've got to take the vase out. I've got to oh, yeah. put them in there. I mean, I'd rather have, you know, it ready to go. And so, those things die out in about three or four days, by the way, they don't yeah. last very long. Yeah. yeah they, they, what's yeah, the they, point in buying all that stuff? It's just going to die. Yeah. No, they, they, say no. they, they, they say they get it from the best growers. It's kind of no, like that don't. Mainer fish that we're talking oh, about. Oh, the oh, best growers. That's that's so wrong. Wait, wait till you see the smile on my face on Monday after having that fresh filet of fish sandwich with fries from a different Mickey D's. Not that one, not communist Mickey D's around that corner down there where BK lives. All right. I did, better, I, better, I did a better, I get better fries from 7 Eleven if they start serving them. And what's up with that, Ashish? Why can't we have fries at 7 Eleven? We got a rotisserie there. <laughs> I, I, I'm Lee. Let these guys do their show. Stop complaining right, about it. Bye, y'all. I got to go anyway. Bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm grateful that they went on a little bit longer today, man. I was a little bit late today. Dude, no, it's all right. Um, I, uh, I can't get this fucking con Like, there's like a contact. Or I don't know if it's a sty in my eye or a contact, man, but I can't get it out, dude. So you know, are, are struggling, are struggling with it for about 10 minutes, man, trying to get it out. I've said that so many times to, to like, what would happen to me is man, when I first started using those, I mean, they would get like pushed like on the side of my skull, dude. And it was like, I would have to sit and dig these things out. And, and there so were random damn time. aggravating, man. It is. It's just all it's, it's all, it's not debilitating, but damn, like it will mess. It'll mess dude, with you. You know what I mean? Dude, it, 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 like, it takes your concentration away. It was What's like, up, what? guys? How are we doing, everybody? Watching Chaos Theory here. Everybody chiming in. Sal already. Chris, Michael C., the usual suspects. Ruse, Groovy, Growing. We love you here uh, on Chaos Theory on this wonderful Thursday here on February 15th, my guy. If you're on 15. Instagram or all the other social media stuff, you know where to follow us at. I'm on uh, Twitter, not the fake wags. Rodney's on there at the Rodney R. And then on Instagram, he's on there at the underscore Rodney R, and I'm at the Wagner Wire. Everybody that's mobile, make sure you hit us up on that code of text line, 512-222-9328. Smash that subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And uh, let's get ready for the conversation on this Thursday. What's up, my guy? How are you doing? Man, look, looking forward to a good day right here is uh, conversation continuing. You know, it's funny, Wags. I think people were listening in to us yesterday because I think that uh, we were, and, and you brought it up, I think one of the first ones to report the validity of that whole possible LeBron James trade over to the Golden State Warriors because I, I had to get out in the morning and, and and go to a couple of places, do some driving. And I turned on some radio and they're like, imagine what would have happened with this and what would happen with Golden State. And then I turned the TV on when I got back to the studio and they're like, oh my good, uh, goodness, almost a massive trade happening in the NBA. It's like, yeah, that, that shit seemed really close, dude. Speak it, in, speak it into existence, right? Yeah, yeah, it seemed like it was really close. And the whole thing is, I mean, looking at it now, I mean, I'm watching what the Lakers are doing. I mean, the Lakers in the last, I think I saw six and one in the last seven games. I mean, I think LeBron has leveraged himself into a spot right here to where he can maybe go add pieces here, and maybe this will put the Lakers in a better spot. And and like you were saying, I mean, it's a good thing for him to stay there. With everything that he's got going on right now, that's the best place for him at the moment. No, I agree with you there. Hey, let me ask you a question about this draft, though, coming up. Um we talked a little bit about it yesterday. Would you consider this? And I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear everybody that's in the chat too, and that's listening to us on the code text line. Um, would you, would you guys say that this is a strong quarterback draft class? Because we kind of talked, we we flirted with it a little bit yesterday uh, when we talked about, you know, the hypothetical what 
Chicago should do with Justin Fields. Um, and again, we're probably going to talk about that as as the draft gets closer and closer and narrows in. Um, but is this con- like would you guys really consider this a strong quarterback draft class? Uh, you know, I, I think it is. I, I mean, the, the whole thing is, I mean, we are and now we're getting from the uh, Coda text line. Now it's all going on about uh, the malls. Hoop dog says Lake Line Mall is dying. Yes, it absolutely is. Uh, the aren't all malls, are, aren't, hold on, but aren't all malls dying or all Amazon apartment Amazon. stores, wherever you can go and get your clothing or wherever store that's physically open? I mean. Yeah. Like we, we've, we kind of started seeing like, if you're not, especially like in, and I'm not trying to make this a political thing or anything, but if, especially if you own a store in California or whatnot, and you're not even allowed to protect your store, you're not even allowed to stand up and, and uh, stop people from robbing your shops and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And that's law. Like that's, that's yeah. law in California. You're not allowed to stop people robbing your store. Um, why would shop owners, why would even people want to, be in that environment uh, when you can, yeah, it sucks that you're probably not getting the right size or you're not trying on clothes that are going to fit you properly or whatnot. And you probably got to mail them back and get them mailed back to you uh, for the proper size or proper fit. And that takes longer than what it usually does, but nobody wants to deal with that bullshit, that, that yeah. stuff that's out there in, in, in crazy country. Nobody wants that shit. I, agree. I don't want I, that, I, Hell, that's why I don't, I don't, I don't go out anymore. I don't want to be put in a position to where I have to, hurt somebody or do something to somebody yeah. like yeah just shit case uneasy point, feeling uh the cheese parade i know like i don't like i don't want to be put in that situation where you know my life's threatened or i got to take somebody's life i, I don't want to do that yeah i was that, so that's that was 20 we we don't need to go down these paths anymore man well i was so disappointed with that and and yeah i'll, I'll just kind of you know book in that with this uh, I, I was i was so disappointed yesterday when i saw that because you know obviously with with the great fans of kansas city what a great fan base they have right there but but still here we are and we're having that conversation to where that happened there where it's supposed to be you know a joyous time and the bad part about it is you know i, I know we had one that 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 unfortunately passed away but I know a lot of the injuries, some of the injuries, not ha- maybe not quite half of them, but some of the injuries were to kids, you know? And that's where, you know, it's just so fucked up right now. To well, where there, were three, like, there were three shooters. I think there were three gunmen. Yeah, yeah. And, that you know, the, the fact that you had you had some folks that went and, and tackled and put their own lives in their hands uh, for that. And, and they, and they had to get the cops' attention. Like, they actually had to get the, the cops' attention. Like, hey, we got – one of the gunmen down here on the lawn, you might want to come get him. So, yeah, yeah, it, it's very much, it's very much a reason why I, uh, I, I don't leave the house a lot. I'm not comfortable in in certain social environments. I'm, I'm just not comfortable anymore. And and you know, it, it's not, it's not how a much, matter. Of, how much sooner will you be conditioned to where you won't even go to like live events or live games? Well, and the funny thing is that that's where it, it's. And I guess this is just bias where I feel comfortable at an NFL game. I feel comfortable at a NASCAR race. Um, it, and I guess simply because we haven't had God bless knock on wood. We haven't had an instance like we've had at malls and like we've had at parades and marathons and all this my, other my stuff. Head is con- my, ca- my head's constantly on a swivel. Yeah. Like yeah, I, I can't, it, when I'm in a lot. Yeah. I, and I found myself doing this at the Texas stars game and I know I was safe, you know what I mean? But I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm constantly checking my left and my right and that's not because i I felt like i was you know in in a bad situation or anything like that i think one because of my damn training or whatnot i just it's just second nature for me to always you know be on the alert and keeping you know a look out to my left and to my right but i mean my 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 senses are my alert is is way up these days man like i just i can't i can't go out in the live venue or or a live sporting event and and actually enjoy it um to the much to the extent that I would, that I would, I guess, in the confines of my own home. So, and, and, you know, Wags, I I've never been, I, I was never a good, I was never a good, um, air traveler in the first place. I was never comfortable with it as time went on and I got on medication for other stuff. It eased a lot of the uneasiness of the, of the air travel, just not being in control. But I mean, now it's one of those things where, where, as I've grown to have to do a lot of traveling, you know, during the summer seasons, it's, it's one of those things to where it's just like, 
you know, you see all the shit that happens and, and, and it's one of those things. And, and, and I was telling somebody this one day and it's like, well, you're stereotyping. If you look over and see whatever, I'm like, no, I'm not stereotyping. No, shit. I'm, I'm, but, I'm seeing facts. I'm right. seeing what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being observant. See right. What the hell's going down. Right. What I'm stereotyping is that all this shit is so messed up right now that you just don't know. And you just don't know everything's out of our hands, but uh, anyway, so that's, uh, man, we go on for days on that one, but, um, I do like this quarterback class. Um, and I see the comment right there. Uh, I lost it. I think it's Ike that says it, the, the, the backup. I, I think that a lot of these guys are starters. These guys can be starters. I don't. I don't. I think they're. I think at most they might be backups. Well, May, uh, I mean, I, Caleb Williams is sensational talent. Even yeah. even da like Daniels, like is he going to start immediately? That's that's a whole thing, and I think that's where it sucks for some of these guys because you're going to have to. He's going to be the Heisman. He's the Heisman Trophy winner. You're going to have to roll him out there and tote him out there to but, to but take let, clicks, right? Let's say if Daniels. Let's say if Jaden Daniels goes to the to the to the Commanders. Um, I, I think, in a sense, that's a good thing because we talked about Sam Howell. I think we both agree that Sam Howell is a very capable starting quarterback. Y you know, um, the East is going to be tough. I think the East is going to be up for grabs again because everybody's in limbo. I do like the Mike Zimmer thing that that's finally inked in there. But I think that's a situation with Daniels, for example, where you can put him in and let him sit a little bit. Uh, I mean, the thing with Caleb Williams um, if he's going to go to Chicago, he's going to be thrust in. If he goes to Atlanta, he's going to be thrust in. But then again, th those are good landing places, and I think the, the table is set for him to be able to do good shit. But a lot of these quarter here here's as much as I like Drake May, I think this, the fact that if he ends up with the Patriots, you know, that's he's going to get beat up. He's going to get beat up. It's going to be like the Troy Aikman thing. Troy Aikman, not only just because he's a, the quarterback of my team, he's the best example that I can go back to. What, two concussions, uh, five or six missed games, uh, you know, his rookie year. I mean, that's what some of these guys are going to have to go through. The fact, if you can go in and sit, I think it just, it just really helps you so much further moving on to, to, to have a sustainable career. I just don't think, I, I agree with that, um, but I just don't think that, this rookie class or this this draft class for or excuse me this quarterback class is the strength that everybody is toting them out to be um may, maybe you know two quarterbacks immediately start uh i don't think bo nix is going to be in the first round either um at like at first i thought you know with with like a month to play or going into bowl season that all these quarterbacks would be in the you know in the first round or whatnot but honestly rodney i think it's just Daniels and Williams to me that stick out that are actually going to have a chance to be starters here. Um, and if you're the commanders, you just talked about it. I'm not sure which quarterback is going number one out of all these uh, quarterbacks here, out of uh, especially the three between Daniels, May, and, and yeah. Williams here. Um, and uh, One, it's the uncertainty for the Bears. I'm not too sure that the bears actually go with Caleb Williams. And if the commanders do wind up, you know, w with the pick between Daniels and may, I, I, I kind of think that they're going to go with, with Daniels over Drake may. I mean, that's just, it, it feels like Daniels is propelled himself or, or kind of ascended to the number two quarterback out of, I, I guess the top three, which would be Williams, Daniels and Drake may. Um, yeah. I don't know, and and if you're the Commanders, who are you actually taking a quarterback? Like seriously, like are you taking a quarterback? Because you just you had a really good point that you brought up there with uh with homeboy from with with Hal with Sam Hal yeah. from the Commanders. So I mean, regardless, Washington should be in a good quarterback spot if they do elect to take a quarterback. You'll have two really talented and young quarterbacks uh, with a lot of growth, a lot of potential. That could be going down. The Giants are still in a problem. Like with all these quarterbacks, you think that they would they might want to make a move. But even if you do that, you're going to be pulling in somebody. Probably going to be backing up Daniel Jones for the remainder or the duration of that contract, right? You don't think anybody's going to be able to take on or would want to elect to take on that contract of Daniel Jones. Um, you're not getting a franchise quarterback, and you're you got to pay out 160 million when it's all said and done with. And that's, it's not a franchise friendly 
contract, as we like to discuss on this show. Um, yeah. I think the Giants are in the market for a new quarterback. It's probably hell if if Bo Nix could find himself in a New York Giants uniform at the second round. I would be very very pleased because Daniel Jones is not the answer. Hell, I'd be. We talk about how weak, or I talked about how I think how weak this quarterback is or how weak this quarterback draft class is. Um, I even saying that I would be happy if, if Bo Nix or, Ooh, God, um, I don't think it'll happen, but if Penix jr. Were to wind up in, in New York, I would, uh, I would be very happy. I would be pleased. Uh, that would kind of be a steal or just something that kind of fell into our lap. Yeah. And, and one of the names that I've been real curious about that, that has kind of been trickling up and gaining some momentum just from stuff that I've read. And, and, and I think even on this, uh, latest mock draft that we're talking about on ESPN, let me verify right here before I talk out of my ass. Yeah. JJ McCarthy going 12th to the Denver Broncos. And, and I think that, that a lot of that we heard, um, we heard Jim Harbaugh talk about that, that the dude's very much a starting quarterback and that, he wasn't able to be utilized this year at Michigan, which is kind of the, just kind of the way that offense ran. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, with, with the accuracy, he, he's, he's accurate. He's mobile enough. It, it, it seems like from all the word that I'm hearing about with him. So I think McCarthy is kind of one of those guys where we sit here and we talk about all these guys, uh, all, all these quarterbacks that are in positions right here. We talk about the first top three or four, and then we trickle in Penix and some of these guys is, is, What's going to happen with J.J. McCarthy? And I think the landing spot with him possibly to Denver, um, I, I think that is makes something sense. That, that, that makes that, that, that's a fit for him. But I don't yeah. like. Do you think McCarthy's a, a pro quarterback? I don't know. You know, I, I don't think that that we've had enough of an opportunity to be able to see that because he didn't have to be one really at Michigan. I mean, the, I, don't, the, I do not think that McCarthy is a pro quarterback. I could be absolutely wrong, but af after what I saw of this season. I do not think McCarthy is a quarterback. Let's pull that comment up right there. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Uh, more teams should take the Aaron Rodgers approach, sit new quarterbacks for one to two years and let them figure it out instead of throwing them to the fire and restarting them. I agree with this sentiment. Um, this is the approach that we had talked about probably a month ago uh, with the success of Jordan Love and just with Green Bay having a really good succession plan. Um Three quarterbacks, three yeah. franchise quarterbacks in 30 years. That's kind of the way to go. But here's the thing, right? We all talk about finding these quarterbacks on these rookie deals. Chicago, a la Chicago, right? Yeah. Case in point, Chicago. They want to go away from Justin Fields because they feel like, you know, or, or you know, Zidic, to your point yesterday, you don't know what 2025 is going to look like. You don't know how, what the purse is going to be on Justin Fields. Could he have, you know, could he work out a franchise friendly contract for Chicago we, we still don't know that but is Chicago willing to go back to their rookie quarterback and if they were to do that they don't really have a they don't really have a quarterback in place right now for uh Williams to learn from right um that would be the best optimal approach if you could you know sit your quarterback your rookie quarterback behind a decent or a manageable backup quarterback to learn from or a veteran quarterback to learn from but the caveat to that is you've lost what maybe one to two years now on that window of success to kind of build around that rookie. Right. I, I think there's two philosophies of approach to this. You can either, you know, tout your quarterback or tote your quarterback out there too early and have, you know, there's a chance of him, you know, coming up a little bit short or lame or whatnot and not having a really good success, uh, successful season, or you could wind up like CJ Stroud. You know what I mean? Where you get a whole bunch of experience and you become offensive rookie of the year and uh, and it works out uh, best for you and you're on that rookie contract. You, you got that large window now with the with your rookie quarterback to, to build around that. I I agree with your approach. I think quarterbacks should sit oh, um, yeah. and you shouldn't put that much stock and invest that much stock in building the quarterback or building the team up around the rookie contract. Um, I just... You got to have manageable moments, or else your your ro your roster and your personnel is going to fall out. Yeah, and it, and it gets so hard because a lot of times with these guys, I mean, because yes, I, I love the the sitting idea, and and Green Bay has done it well, and, and I mean, it's one of those things to where, I mean, the luck that they've had right there, it's like the luck that I talk about with the Cowboys. You fall into these. 
two quarterbacks that you had and they weren't supposed to be your franchise quarterbacks and boom, here they are, whether you want to call them franchise quarterbacks or not. But it's like, you know, a lot of these guys, when they get drafted and when they're drafted early on in the draft, there's not the opportunity to, to sit. Uh, but I think where this year is a little bit different, I think where this year is a little bit different is that with the free with with the quarterback free agent pool that we're about to see, that does afford some of these teams to where you bring in an experienced veteran and and let them kind of let them kind of groom the person that's going to replace them. What do they say in business? You're grooming your replacement, and and that's tough. That's a tough pill to swallow right there when you're brought in to for your replacement. That latest mock that we're talking about, I see at number twenty, Pittsburgh going to to Bo Nix. Um, I like that pick, but damn it, I like Caleb Williams going to the Steelers better. And and that's that's starting to catch some momentum if, if that deal can be put together. Because I think I, I think Will or not Williams, I'm sorry, uh, Fields. I, I think Fields going to to Pittsburgh. Man, that's a home run. That is a home run for the Steelers and for Justin Fields. What? Well, I mean, I I, I don't think that's a home run for. Uh, for Chicago, though, the, I, I thought you said that was a home run for everybody, but my bad. Maybe you just said it was the two parties involved. I think Chicago loses out if they trade that. We talked about that yesterday. Um, again, like this, this all this all stemmed from the question I had: like, what would the Giants do, or what can the Giants do this year going after a quarterback? Would they actually, you know, be in the market for taking a quarterback with Daniel Jones's, you know, lopsided contract? And I think that the question to that is yes. The Giants are in the move, the, or the Giants are in the market for a quarterback. I just don't know which one falls to them, or falls to them. Um, the the Patriots are another team that are a little bit intriguing to me. Um, I don't necessarily think they need a quarterback. I would probably think that they want to move on from Mac Jones. I I think Mac Jones is fixable. He had a lot of success in his rookie year. I just don't know if he's had the right quarterback tutelage around now like I, I thought bill o'brien was a decent quarterback coach but I, apparently i'm wrong or or i could just be absolutely wrong on mac jones and think that he's just beyond repair uh but you know be that as it may the patriots seem like they are in the market as well for a quarterback i would like to see a quarterback like bo nix or i would I'm, I'm telling you, i would like to see michael Penix jr I, I, if Michael Penix Jr. were able to, to find his way into a Patriots uh, locker room, I don't think the Patriots are going to take you know Penix Jr. at three overall or, or two overall, wherever they, they fall at here. Um, but I think they could address some other needs around there if yeah. they wanted to go get Penix Jr. later in the second or third round, maybe find himself into a Patriots locker room that way. That would be a really interesting approach to the draft. Uh, I I, I think everybody's going to be knee jerk reactions though to these quarterbacks and wanting to to pull the trigger really quick right before um, right before I guess the the chaos gets going there in the draft. Again, I think a lot of people are thinking that this quarterback draft class is way superior than what it is. I kind of agree with Zidic here. I think it looks strong on paper, but when you get down to it and you're pulling back uh peeling back the onion or whatnot, you're going to see a little bit of the rotten shit. Yeah, and and I think with with the Patriots situation because they don't have that luxury that we're talking about about letting whoever sit, yeah, you know, because uh, like we're talking about, I mean, Mac Jones, I think he just needs a clean slate. He's got to go somewhere else. I mean, it's got to he's got to. Is, is that the same thing for Daniel Jones too? I think so too. Like, does I mean, Daniel Jones just need a clean slate. Yeah, well, I mean, man. I don't think Daniel Jones can play. Well, I, I think both of those guys. I mean, even if it's you're going to be in a backup role, if you're going to be maybe, I, I don't have the confidence right now that either yeah, one of those guys the, is going to the league as backups. Back. They can stay yeah. in the league as backups. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what what I think about, I, I still with the Patriots, I, I like the Drake May thing there. Now, now with Gerard Mayo coming in as the as the head coach there with that with the new system, new regime, everything that's going to be going on right there. Maybe that's how you start building that offense because that that offense was horrible and and it needs a total facelift it needs it needs new tits it needs a new ass it needs a new everything and maybe you can go in with that right there to where that could be the cog that you kind of start building around but i think with him with may going to the patriots man i still think it, it, it would be imperative if you could find a veteran to come in that could groom him that that, that could start it, and kind of kind of let him feel out maybe how, he can, maybe he can learn from mac jones for a year maybe so but i mean you know a, a lot of, maybe that makes max mac jones better i mean it should 
I mean, I like honestly, let's be real. I thought I thought that elevated Mac Jones's play a little bit when they went with Bailey or uh, with Zappy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and it, I think it, it's only it's only natural, right? Like you see your succession plan kind of start to take yeah. over, and you're Riding just like, oh, you know, I better elevate my game, or else you know it's it's off to Chuck and Crabs or wherever the hell you're from. I don't fucking know. Yeah. Uh, well. And, and the thing about it is, I mean, I think a lot of it with, with Mac Jones, if he stays with the Patriots, if he is going to be in New England, I mean, I, I think that Bill Belichick moving on is probably something that's going to help him. You know, it's like, okay, fresh start, same place. Let me go in here and try to develop myself. And in a, in a per, <clears throat> excuse me, perfect world, you get Drake May, Mac Jones elevates his game, and, and, and Drake May gets to sit for a year. But we don't know if that'll happen because based on what we've seen from Mac Jones, that doesn't appear the trajectory that he has been on at this point. No. Uh, what do you think about the Jets? Do they give up a mill funner or do they give up on the mill funner and draft another replacement um, for Aaron Rodgers? Um, I don't know here. I mean, that, I, I mean, I think I, I don't know. Is Zach, is Zach Wilson absolutely broken? Is is this guy can can he not play quarterback in the NFL? Or is it I, just I, under bad? Is he under bad tutelage in in New York? I think I think if you get Aaron healthy, I mean, if you if you have Aaron for a year, I, I think Aaron Rodgers can help him if he chooses to, um, and, and and I think Aaron Rodgers would really want to help him if Aaron Rodgers is able to play. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is a whole different story with him. But I, I think for Zach Wilson to sit behind Aaron and, and get to watch him and get to learn from him and get to work out with him and practice with him, you know, weekly, I think that's... Well, I mean, that's not, not the question. Do, do the Jets actually stick with, with Zach Wilson here? Um, the front... Uh, I, Woody came out and, and said that uh, that they didn't... The, the reason why they didn't win last year is because they did not even have a backup quarterback. And yeah. he was pointing fingers or alluding to the play of Zach Wilson. Uh, yeah. Just how terrible and how pissed yeah. it was. Um, but also... The, the guy don't only have the, the guy does not have an offensive line. He's got tremendous. He's got some talent around him. He's got some studs, but he doesn't have a line to for for pass blocks for pass protection. Uh, Brees Hall is a sensational talent that can make a lot of guys miss in small spaces. That's why he's able to get the production that he is on the field with the ground and pound. But Zach Wilson, uh, yeah, a lot has to happen. A lot has to come together in in uh, in chunks for the Jets yeah. in order for yeah. for Zach Wilson to to play well. Hell. Aaron Rodgers four plays. Like we we went back to this four plays. Aaron Rodgers had four plays. Yeah, four plays until he got hurt. Uh, yeah. Achilles or whatnot because too much pressure. Uh, you could argue that was too much pressure, and he had to move, and that's what caused the the tear or whatnot. But still, the Jets need to shore up some stuff on the offensive line. They can't all be on the shoulders of Zach Wilson. It just can't. Yeah, and and this is a this is a spot where you you know with Cooper Rush, Cooper Rush. I look at and I'm thinking, man, if Cooper Rush went to the Jets. It'd be a great spot for him. I mean, he he could back up. He could back up Aaron Rodgers. If Aaron Rodgers goes down, you got a very capable quarterback that could come in and win games. You, you know, and, and and probably take an Aaron Rodgers offense and fall right into it very nicely. I mean, you don't have to alter that a lot. But you make Cooper Rush your 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 second your backup quarterback right there. That's a great landing spot for him. I mean, I don't want him to leave Dallas. I don't know what Trey Lance is capable of doing. I mean, that's just it. Trey about, Lance hadn't answered any questions, and that's the whole thing. And, and what do you Sam, do with him? Sam, I mean, San Francisco got rid of their number one draft pick, their yeah. number one dra their first round draft pick, uh, in order to go and and elect to go with their third string quarterback. I mean, I think that should tell you everything that you need to know about Trey Lance. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. Um, when you missed that bad on a quarterback, and you you realize you no, know, you and of course you're going to say that he's good. You know what I mean? You don't want to lose that that investment that uh, i guess the worth or um the value on your investment right um you want to get as much a big of return as you can for him uh, i i i don't think trey lance is is a pro quarterback at all i think you're going to see out of that draft class i, I think you're seeing a lot that's going to unfold with this draft class yeah not yeah, much but, not much yeah. And, and that's the thing there with with Trey Lance. I mean, if you're the Cowboys, I mean, because I, I guarantee you that that the market is going to be hot for Cooper Rush. I mean, because people have seen what he's able to do. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't dazzle you like Lamar Jackson. Uh, I mean, he doesn't do all of that shit. But man, that dude can come in and take take 
take a hold of a football game and be a leader and, and, and keep you winning. I mean, look what he did right there with Dak's offense. And that's, that's something that's going to be interesting with the Cowboys is what do you do with Trey Lance? Uh, I mean, what, I, I'm not sure why they got him in the first place. I'm not really sure what the plan was with that, but back to Trey Lance, when, you know, talking about all the things with the 49ers and how great they've been and everything that they've done. I know we're questioning Shano right here. Well, when I I'm mean, done with this, I'm going to go we, quiet. We, we got, dog down. But what's that? <laughs> I said, when I'm done with this point, I'm going to go quiet that dog down. There's somebody out in the yard, but the, nobody the, can hear. Nobody can hear the dog, Rodney. Oh, good. Okay, perfect. Because he's loud as hell on my yeah, side. No, um, nobody can hear. The the thing is with the 49ers, man, they've done a lot of good things, but man, that was a big mistake right there that they made with that one. And they still keep winning. They still keep winning. So let me ask you. Let me ask you that. Um, San Francisco was in the news over the night or overnight last night. Um, Shanahan fired Stephen Wilkes, or Steve Wilkes, rather, defense yeah. coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers. I thought Wilkes had a pretty decent game plan and a, you know, rolled out decent execution for the Super Bowl, uh, holding, re retaining the Chiefs to, uh, to the, I guess, few amount of points that they had was uh, you could call a, a moral victory if you would for for Wilkes in that defense, right? You got to keep. You got to keep, you know, the the notion or the thought that Dre Greenlaw wasn't on the field. I I, I don't know. I think it was a big knee jerk reaction to the firing of Wilkes. Um, I I think it was uncalled for, unnecessary. I think you could have worked out a little bit of the kinks. Maybe just gone back and looked at some of the game film and be like, all right, in this situation, we need to bring a little bit more pressure here on first and yeah. second down, and not just dictate, not allow them to dictate what we're going to do, and just fire off on third down with blitzes. Right? That's kind of predictable. Um. I think they played a little bit conservative on that last drive, but all in all, I thought he called a fantastic game and had great preparation for Patrick Mahomes in that offense for the Kansas City Chiefs. The only problem is you you had a really piss poor, mm -hmm. uberly conservative. You played not to lose. You played not to lose in that last drive in overtime, and I think that that obviously came back to bite him in the ass. I just don't know if it was – if it was worth a a firing or if, if he actually needed to be fired. I think it was a knee-jerk reaction to a highlighted incident to where Shanahan kind of came up short again. Again, it's not all on Shanahan. It's on your defense coordinator. But I don't think that he needed to be fired. Yeah, I, I kind of see Steve Wilkes in this scenario uh, being the fall guy, honestly. Giants yeah, I, need a defense coordinator. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that happens right there. I mean, look, look at that defense this year. I mean, they did some pretty good things. I mean, I mean, De D'Amico Ryan's left them a pretty good uh, blueprint right there to work with. So uh, I, I don't think that firing was validated at all. And, and like you said, I, I think that's some damage control maybe on the part of the organization. I mean, I don't want to put it all on Shano, but when you get in situations like this, I mean, it's somebody, so it, it's got to fall on somebody's ass. I mean, it's got to fall on somebody. And I think this is a scenario because we see it so many different times in football to where it, uh, I mean, it is, it's always one of the coordinators first, and then it's going to be the head coach. And I, I called it right here. And, and, I, and I heard this where he said it wasn't the right fit. You know what? It that, fucking worked pretty good in the regular. Yeah, season. I was gonna say it, look, it looked it looked pretty. It, it looked like it fit pretty damn good all year long. You know yeah. what I mean? All yeah. year long. Um, yeah. I, I, and maybe they had discussions going into the Super Bowl on firing off and being a little bit more aggressive, and it just didn't happen. Um, but now, uh, look. So, wait, wink. Uh, wink Martindale. He's out at Giants defense coordinator, in which you could argue that you know, most of the success that came from the Giants this year was on their defense and Wink's no longer there. And he got a job got though, that he? somehow. And look, I'm a, I'm a fan of Steve Wilkes. I just was not a fan of Steve Wilkes on that last play and, or that last drive in overtime. You want to come over to the New York Giants, baby? Well, we, welcome arms. I'm, I'm hugging you right now. I'm giving you that digital hug right now there, Mr. Wilkes. Uh, come over and lead this defense to a championship, man, or help get this defense to a championship level. Um, Giants are a long ways away. Uh, yeah. more, more, um, than, more than just a, a, a prayer of a quarterback in this draft, that's for sure, man. Um, no, we uh, good conversations. They, you know, a lot of hypotheticals, but of course, the hypotheticals are going to be coming up here until we at least get to draft land or or the area or I guess the time era when we 
had the draft up around what may april when the hell does mm-hmm. the, the draft come out? I, I think uh, it's april. into april into april I in think. april in into april yeah. early may um yeah. we'll have a job so 100 oh, I'm, I'm with you there ike's gonna have a job uh that's a good possibility my guy that's another good that possibility thought. that was my first thought right there dude it's like oh man houston here you go buddy here you go wait a wait bit of a dead area in sports if you're not into hockey or you know college basketball or the nba but it is the best time if you're people like me or rodney or whatever and you watch all kinds of sports and the best way to do that is with the best company in all of audio visual automation it is the best in the business AV Consultations, 512-255-8678. That's avconsultations.com. For the past 35 years, they've been setting the standard in audiovisual automation. If you don't have an idea of what you want in your house, you can check out my screen right now and see the two flat screen televisions that I have, courtesy of audiovisual consultations. Or seeing what BK has, he's got the four TV rollout, almost like quads right there. Big. And sometimes those four TVs can turn into one large TV to give you a, the mass viewing uh, that you need for you know all four TVs. But you can also get some arcade machines that I have. You see the little arcade cabinets behind me as well. Also downstairs, I have a mantle mount that goes over the chimney, or go, excuse me, goes over the fireplace there. Fantastic for watching those late nights. Uh, late night, I, I guess, what, um, Real Housewives of any damn city in the world or whatnot or below deck. All the types of stuff that you want to watch with your significant other, especially on a great Valentine's Day. You do that with a romantic scene and a romantic setting with the fireplace stuff. All available with audiovisual consultations. Now, that's just the visual side. You got to talk about the audio side, too, man. Ask Tom and ask AV Consultations about that Sonos surround sound system. It's best in the world, baby. It's not just about the video. It's about the audio, too. It's avconsultations.com. 512 512- Two five five eight six seven eight. That's avconsultations.com. Wags watching late night Skinamax. Um, I, I I mean, you know, Skinamax isn't exactly the best in the business anymore, guys. You got to go to the hub. You got to go to the hub of porn. That's where I usually go for all my. Yeah. Own stuff. No need for that stuff. No need for Skinamax. What are you talking about? Sometimes you got to get in there. When you get the Shannon Tweed nights, you guys know what I'm oh. talking about. Nights with Shannon Tweed. Shannon they Tweed. Put like five five shows, five of, five of the best shows of Shannon Tweed. Shannon Tweed, Shannon Wiry. Ooh. I don't know who the hell Shannon Wiry is. I just remember Shannon Tweed up. from back in the, the Skinamax days. She, she was right in that same time. And, and I still go back to, even though this, was, this really isn't like Skinamax, but I go back to Wags, and I think we've talked about this before, man. Silk Stockings. Oh, my God, I love that show. Remember that on the USA Network? Was that you and I talking about that or somebody? I remember else? Silk Stockings. Um, what was Alcapoco Heat is what I was trying to remember. <laughs> Alcapoco <laughs> Heat. <laughs> right before Hell Silk yeah. Stockings. I mean, Al- it was Baywatch, Alcapoco Heat, then Silk Stockings, man. Yeah, yeah. Nip Tuck. Nick- Nip Tuck, yeah. the thing about Nip Tuck. Nip Nip Tuck was fantastic. Kimberly had Kimber on there. Yeah. Um, oh, Rona Mitra. That's where I, that's where I was intro- introduced to Rona Mitra there. Um, yeah. Nip Tuck was cool, but it lost its believability when I had when I had what facial reconstruction surgery uh, doctor. Um, what what are they? What the hell? Plastic surgeons. When I had yeah. plastic surgeons going around taking down mob bosses and yeah. stuff like that, I'm like, yeah. all right, now. Now you're telling me these two plastic surgeons in Miami are taking down gangs and whatnot. That's where I kind of lost believability, and, and I thought the show lost credibility. But I look entertaining for the first two seasons or whatnot. Um, but yeah, Nick Nip Tuck was 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 good for about two seasons. Um, yeah. Had some some good Those guests. Good shows. Had some really good guests. Hell, that's where I saw uh, Tyrion Lannister for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, a little, a little risque. I can't remember his. I can't remember Peter, Dink, back in the Peter day. Dinklage. Uh, that's where I, I saw Peter Dinklage for the first time. Hey, uh, Wags, I, I do want to mention because, uh, like I said, when I was getting blood drawn here uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Miss Gloria stuck uh, a needle in my arm and said, "Oh yeah, you're from Texas Sports Unfiltered. Y'all don't talk about Texas women's sports enough." As she's drawing blood with the long needle in my vein, uh, I do want to say, how about them Texas women? Uh, bad Texas women's basketball. I mean, we talk about we talk about women every 
every Wednesday. We well, talk I about told her. I said we cover women in in, in great uh fashion. To uh, a T. Tech, to, to a T and A. To a T and A. To a, <laughs> to a T and, T and A, a my man. Um Texas women, women's basketball team, 82 to 66 last night. Uh, Vic Schaefer's ladies, 23 and three with that big win over Houston. They're on a roll. They're on a roll. And they're doing that without their main cog in the wheel. Pretty damn impressive right there, those, those ladies. Hope they keep that going. 100%. You know what else is impressive? Um, Joey Logano winning the poll for the Daytona 500. That could be also impressive. But talk, talking about cars and places to get cars, that's a pretty impressive place to get some cars it really is a great going place. out there to covert style bk style rodney great place to get cars and how about i mean we're talking about uh great ladies how about the queen of texas sports unfiltered how about hayden and uh and our man dan Culver. hi i'm dan covert with my wife hayden welcome to covert bk our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes buick gmc cadillac chrysler dodge jeep and ram and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from we have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car truck or suv with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about covert born and raised in austin that's right. Good stuff right there. And as I You've was been calling her the queen for about two weeks or something, you guys, uh, she's paying you a little bit under the table. Well, you know, I, I can't reveal my sources. I, I can't right. talk about it. I can't talk about it. I don't need Dan to get mad at me, but, uh, she definitely is. I, I know, I, I know our fans love her. So that that's why I like to talk about that. Hey guys, bet us is the best place online. Uh, your sports book, your casino, all of that is out there, game lines, props, everything. I know the NFL is done right now, but Major League Baseball is going to be firing up. The NBA, the Sweet 16, all of that is there. Like I was talking about, NASCAR laid a little bit of money down last night on Joey Logano winning the poll. I just had that that feeling in my gut, and I have a lot of gut. Something said the 22 Pennzoil uh, Mustang Dark Horse was going to win the poll, and yes, he did. It was a Ford sweep, and uh, a little bit of, little, little bit of cabbage went right there into my account off of that uh, bet right there. If you're checking out uh, on YouTube right here, click at the bottom of the video description, and that will get you set in there if you're on the uh, free app where you can also dive into the code of text line. Explore our socials. That link is right there. Bet US. Once again, the best place to bet on sports is Bet US. Dive in and be a part of the fun. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, just took Sorry. my took my comment down there. I don't know where, where the hell was that. <laughs> Boom. All right. So yeah, college football officially coming this summer. Um, guys, I thought I told you. You know, like yeah, you said it. I thought I told you around the start of this season that. Be looking for a July drop or something like that, right around August 15th or something like that. Um, didn't give you the date verbatim, but I, I, I thought we kind of narrowed it down when it was coming. I, I can't tell you guys officially when anything drops. Like, I will get fired if, if that happens. Um, you, have <laughs> I to know. Take, you, you have to take this seriously. Like, if you're in the dev world, you have to take secrecy. Um, seriously, you, I mean, it's it's got to be confidential. You cannot have any leaks, or else you will not find yourself in the industry at all. It's worse. It, it, it's it's more top secret than being in the damn military or being in the CIA. Yeah. It, it really is. Um, everybody's everybody's liking your girl there, Rodney. No, not my girl. That's Dan's girl. Get I that. I, hey, man, I just <laughs> I just going with what I hear. <laughs> we have to get her on here. I have to have her as a guest. Have her break down some sports. Yeah, well, hold I, uh, on, hold on, hold on. You wish EA wasn't the developer. Who, who, which studio would you want out there besides EA? And stop talking about that about my family, there, buddy. Carissa Thompson, if not Aaron Andrews, Carissa Thompson can be the developer. Rodney, that's not what we're talking about here, oh, man. Right. Aaron Andrews is not going to work on code. What are you talking about, my guy? Not going to work on Coke. No, code, code, <laughs> oh, Rodney. Oh, code. okay. All right. All right. We can't so, wait until... No, I got you. I, I, there's a lot, a lot of love here for college football. I get it, man. You guys, look, I want a, I want a perfect game to be rolled out too, but remember what we talked about. Um, I don't know if you guys tuned into the show on Saturday or whatnot, or excuse me, on Sunday for the Wagner Wire, but I kind of talked a little bit about this with Madden. 
Um, why people wonder why Madden's constantly broke all the time or why it can't get fixed. Okay. There is, tr there's tons of code that goes into programming these games. And what you're seeing with Madden is there's so, there's so much code piled up on top of the bug or a little bit of the glitch or that whatever needs to be fixed inside of that coding or inside of the game that it would be, it would not be worth the value of their dollar or would not be worth bang for their buck to go and undo all of this code to fix one little blemish when you can kind of just get by, you know, a bad player too. And it looks a little glitchy or you have a little, what we call ragdoll yeah. um, in the gaming industry where the, the texture and the articles um, are kind of, you know, flailing or whatnot. And, and Wags, walk me through this part, because I know you've talked about it in the past, you know, only telling me, telling me what you can tell me. I, I don't want you to get yourself in trouble. But, like, if you're developing a game, I mean, I can only imagine that there's stuff that's being developed right now that is going to come out in two years. You, you know, that is that far out. I mean, yeah. how in the hell, I mean, like, when you're talking about code, you're constantly having, how do you, how do you, build something that's going to be because i see in the auto industry all the time i get I'm, I'm privy to chevrolet information i've seen the 1920 or the 2027 model whatever but i mean how do you do that in video games to where you're to where you're trying to do things where we're not even in that area? cycle plans oh, um have have you know how people have 90 day planners and have you know rollouts for you know their you know fiscal year and, and whatnot and uh, that's essentially what you're doing for your your launch. You have a launch plan, you have a cycle plan. Um, and yeah, uh there like there's stuff that I'm working on right now that's not gonna drop for two years. So unbelievable. It's crazy. It's absolutely and I gotta shut up like um my when my kid comes in a room, I got I can't let him see any of it. Mm. I mean, can you imagine like one slip of the tongue yeah. of him in a a school oh. of forty five hundred? Like he's Oh, I almost let something fly for a, I almost let something slip for Apex. Yeah. Uh yeah, yeah. man. But uh, there's there's a lot of fun stuff that's coming out in the next year and two um that we're working on right now. So it's you you're not allowed to let any of it slip or else you will it's be crazy. slipping and yeah. say bye bye. Um, a lot of fans more. hold on, what we got here? A lot of us fans would be okay with the same engine from NC AA fourteen with just a roster update. No, I I'm I'm with you there. Um, but look, I think did we get back to did I get back to double D's uh comment? All the big ones are trash now. All the big ones are trash now. What EA oh, are you talking about the EA games or are you just talking about the developers in general there? Uh double D. What what we got going on here? Um no, I'm with you there, Jake. Uh look, the rollout in 14, I think the the code in 14 was pretty damn good. Um but that was also the last time that NCAA was out. I think you're probably going to see a lot of the Madden code be implemented into the NCAA code, um, which, you know, there, there's been a lot of success with Madden here the past couple of years. You just have to be able to look past a little, a little of those blemishes. And there, there's not, and that's the thing. There's not many blemishes at all with Madden. It's, it's starting to kind of fix itself, I guess. Uh, just the developers. No, I got you there. Uh, but when you speak to that, did you want, you, you want a small studio to pick up, you know, the biggest football title or arguably one of the biggest football titles in all of the that's, gaming industry? That's a question I had for you right now. It, it's going it's going to compete against Madden. It will compete against Madden and give you the same type of numbers against Madden just so you can just because you'll be able to do the uh, the drafting from taking a dynasty quarter or a dynasty football player and putting them into your Madden roster now. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk about the competition part. Cause I, cause I've seen this on the streaming side wags. Cause I, you know, I, man, dude, I've been streaming shit since 2005 before people ever knew about any of this shit, but like with YouTube, with Streamyard, with restream with, uh, I mean, just all the different things T talk about the competitive, the competitiveness right now, because man, there's a lot of smart people like you. You talking about are, with, with like esports and shit like yeah, that? Yeah. With, oh with, yeah. With, with you video can make game, a million gaming, dollars off of that. That's the thing. Like if you're, if you were the best, Madden player in the world you can be you can be a millionaire you really can um yeah. and of course there's you know th there's messed up play there's there's breakable plays or broken plays cheap plays if, if you want to call them that in Madden where you know you got you got your zone busters or if they're rolling out in zone you play this one play 
or you roll out this one play that's just not coverable, right? Because it allows yeah. your – because of the coding in yeah. the game, it allows yeah. the defensive back to backpedal too far to where they just can't get into the window to intercept the pass. There's a lot of players out there that know this type of shit. And if you you know how to exploit a couple of the the stuff in the game or a couple of the uh, I guess we'll we'll say bugs in the game, then you're able to to get a win almost in any time. But that's it's more than just one people. It's more than just one group that know about these these bugs and Madden or whatnot. But yeah, dude, EA Sports the competition level it's it's thriving, man. It's not just in Madden. It's with you know the the game that I work on is the number one uh, competitive game in all of the gaming industry, which is Apex Legends. So um league of legends is another game that's out there like you, you know we joked about it two years ago um talking about how ea you know esports is starting to become an actual sport uh, you know these these kids are sitting in more than just kids now they're you know yeah. young adults they're yep. sitting in a chair for what nine nine hours you know having to hydrate or in having to focus mm -hmm. and sure it's not a physical activity or whatnot but you're putting your you're putting your, your eyes brain. through the ringer. Yeah. I, I, you're putting your mind through the ringer, that's for sure. I can't wait until it actually evolves into virtual reality gaming to where you, you got to actual you got to see physicality come in play to where you got to move, shoot, and communicate through a virtual setting. That that's to, that to me is the ultimate goal. I want to be Flynn, guys. I don't know if anybody ever seen the movie Tron or whatnot, but I want to be Flynn. I want to I want to get into the grid and make my own little digital world, my own little digital frontier. Got so a lot you wanted to here, guys. you want it to be you want it to be like like the Wii where I have to get up and actually swing the golf club. No, I want it to be like Ready Player One. Mm. Nice. I, I I mean I I absolutely want to help evolve a world like that, a digital frontier. I yeah. absolutely do. More like Tron, honestly, where you can just be your own creator in yeah. a digital landscape. Um, imagine the possibilities, guys. Like I love I love reality, of course, but. I'm also, I consider myself an artist and uh, I like being creative as well. Yeah. I'm telling you, Wags. Thank, when you for the, thank you for the nerd conversation. I appreciate that. It allows me, like, I'm so much more than just a sports guy. Um, I'm so much more than just a beautiful just, man. It's just one little thing of me, as yeah. a matter of fact. Just, just one, one little, one little part of Wags is sports. I'm telling you, dude, study that sim racing thing. Dude, dude it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Look at that I'll stuff. It, especially if I can make money in it. You know that. Yeah, and that's I, shit. I, I think, I you want to talk should. about, you know, competition. It's only a matter of time before we get racing competitions. And 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 help me help me be one of your developers. Give me a give me some pedals, give me a steering wheel, uh, give me a shifter, give me all that shit, and I'll sit over here with all these things and 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 help you develop that thing. Uh, that would be the dream, my guy. That is the plan. Some really good stuff. Really good stuff. Um, and uh, I do want to remind you guys because I have gotten some messages on that Sunday at noon, uh, Daytona 500 preview show, getting you ready for the Great American Race. Logano on the pole, Michael McDowell on the outside. Thursday tonight, we're qualifying uh, the rest of the field three through 36 all the way back with those qualifying races. Jimmy Johnson did not get in on time last night. So Jimmy Johnson's going to have to race his way in. So you've got some storylines that, that are going to be happening right there, but that'll be Sunday following the Wagner wire at noon, diving in Daytona 500 preview, probably be a dirty air brand. I'm assuming the, the dirty air brand and we'll dive in and get you ready for the Daytona 500 great American doesn't have to do with sports but i'm ready for gta 6 yeah i think everybody's been ready for gta 6 mike um i've been ready for gta 6 in, since 2015 um since two th this was this game was made in 2011 gta 5 i believe it was g i believe it was 2011 um but look, it's it's been one of the most one of the best grossing games uh that rockstar has ever put out there i still personally think red dead redemption 2 is rockstar's best game um, but look, uh, grand, grand theft auto six is it's going to break the internet for a little while. It's, it's going to bog a lot of things down. It's going to be massive. It's going to be huge. I, it's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to see this. Rodney, if you're, if you're Wags. not into gaming, we got to get you into gaming. My guy. Wags, do you, do you guys, uh, EA sports, do you guys have a, have a super cross game by chance? Is there a super cross live sort of game? Um, I, th I think we got one let me pull it up here yeah i think we do have one because I, I gotta tell you um i mean ba back i mean many years ago i i would play i would play supercross you know on i think it was xbox 
And dude, it, it was so, I mean, back in those days, I mean, mid two thousands, that stuff was so real, so virtual right there where you'd like scrape bars with a guy and it's like, holy shit. I, I mean, it really felt like you were on the bike and you'd, you'd hit a jump and you'd come down and then you do the whoops and all that. And it was like, holy moly, we, your ribs hurt just sitting there watching it. We don't have any super cross, but we, yeah. we, we got motocross. Yeah. But. Motocross. Yeah. That, that, that'd be the one that'd be the one. I think Mike got it right there. Yeah. Motocross that, um, that's some fun shit that's that's the one yeah yeah i, I gotta start doing these racing games yeah, so we got we got i don't know if i'm allowed to say that i don't think no, i can say that yet don't get yourself in trouble no no nope, yep. nope. can't say nope. that yet guys but we yeah we got some games coming out yeah <laughs> yeah man yeah um as far as rockstar games uh go la noir was kind of fun okay okay old school la noir that was good that was a little bit of a slower pace for me where you had to go around basically just um being being that actual detective and fun thing about that game most of those people most of that cast was from Mad Men. Mm. most of the voiceover actors was from Mad Men on that game so hmm. I don't know if anybody's ever played that or not, but yeah, L.A. Noir that was a pretty good, pretty good game for. I guess that was originally for PlayStation Three. Maybe I can't remember. I can't remember which console that actually came out. Mm -hmm. But um, what do we got? Moto X. Yeah. Red Dead fan. Okay, a lot of a lot of good video game talk. I didn't realize we had a lot of these video game nerds in here. Welcome, guys. Welcome. You're in nerd kingdom, and all nerds are welcome. We will be kings, all of us. All these sports jocks, they're nothing. They're second rate. The nerds, the nerds will win, guys. We're the one with the big brains. The smart ones. They're the smart, the smart ones. The smart ones. Hey, good show today, man. Fun show. Um, I really do appreciate when you guys allow us to to talk a little bit of nerd stuff in Nerd City here and getting into the whole gaming atmosphere. That's a big part of my life, and I like sharing that with you guys. Hey, uh, whatever I can do on this show to bring you the joy and happiness of college football 2025 when it does roll out, I will do so. I make that pack to you guys. I I make that promise. Um, if I can get some codes, some free codes for you guys, uh, I'd be happy to do so. Um, so, yeah, Wag, gotta... is, that, is, that, is that why Tom McKay says the really smart people that don't make you feel stupid? Uh, because that, that, listening that, that, to you that, right there, I don't feel stupid. And I don't know shit, but I don't feel stupid listening to you. I can totally relate to what you're talking about right there, even though good. I know Hopefully, hopefully I put you in the same type of you know ballpark and area. Make me feel I mean, maybe you're as, as dumb as me now. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. I don't think I'm quite that smart to be that dumb, my man. Uh, Wish they my came out with a Star Wars open world game like Assassin's Creed. Uh, I'm kind of with you there. So I think Jedi Survivor was a little bit more open world. Nothing's going to be open world like Star Wars Galaxies was. Um, back in the day, that was, that was more of a big MMO, um, almost like your, almost like your your World of Warcraft, right? Um, which was Star Wars Galaxies, uh, but also, you know, Knights of the Old Republic, that's kind of got to play like Star Wars Galaxies as well, but nothing's going to be that that MMO, that massive MMO, um, like uh, like Assassin's Creed kind of has with the open world grant. But now that's a good idea, but if you're looking for something similar and you haven't played it before, I would check out uh, Jedi Survivor. Hey, uh, last sports thing before we uh, turn it over to the guys. Um, hey, Tiger Woods back on the golf course today. How about that? So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, looking forward to that. Curious to see. I mean, his durability is going to be the whole question for me. Um, but, man, it, it's one of those things where when, when we talk about the pop and when you talk about wanting to get eyeballs and attention, um, anytime Tiger Woods shows up, I don't give a shit if he's wearing Nike red or his old Sunday red or whatever it's called. Um, that's that's definitely good for the game of golf. Have you ever have you ever seen him play live? I've never seen him play live. I mean, like, have. yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's one where it's like now, I mean, that's uh, obviously I jump at the chance to see him play live. Same, it's like, man, I, I would, I would, I would stop him. everything I'm doing to go watch Tiger Woods play golf. Yeah. I'll tell you that that is one of those dudes where we talk about athletes, transcending athletes. I mean, what that dude, he's must, he's must watch television. Is he not? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a, it's like, I mean, you look at golf ratings. It's like anytime he's in whoosh, through the roof, 100. through the roof. And that's, I mean, that's a badass. That's a badass. So yeah, back on the course is Tiger in the new it's, red. I, I'm wondering if if Tiger's still the only golfer that can actually just intimidate the hell. Out. Like when you hear that roar, if you're a golfer and you're 
finishing your your what on hole 16 and you're finishing up your your back nine or whatever and you know that that tiger's maybe one or two strokes behind oh. you and you hear that roar oh. you know what i mean that that's just yeah. it's got to make your game just, it's got to make your game be destroyed it, 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 when when you're talking about a game like you're, you're not playing the other field right you're playing the course bullshit you're playing yep. your mind when you hear that roar and you know tiger woods is on the yep. on the back nine coming up what's up fellas how we doing today guys so we're having a little little Eldrick convo. Yeah, uh, yeah he's back today. Yeah. Back yeah. today. Talk a little bit about <laughs> video games and everything like that. You know, the only thing we didn't get into was wrestling. We didn't pick our nose fully, but I mean, we got some booger content. It's all good. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes in this slow atmosphere of sports and you know the revolving world of sports, you got to fit a little bit of a video game talk in there or whatnot. Well, exactly. What we got on the docket today, boys? I got to get me one of those Mortal Kombat cabinets for my office. That's all, I, that's all I know. I think we can make that happen. You have uh, is it just is it having like multiple games on it or just yeah, so one? it's got it's got tw- what 12, 12 games. Each cabinet has twelve games. Oh, um, but there's great. like there's four Mortal Kombat games on the one unit, and there's four uh, or there's actually six Street Fighter games on the other unit too. So, but you got Dude. like Commando, you got your all all your Midway classics. Um, you got like Beer Tapper, uh, Rampage. That's on the Midway stuff. Little Paper Pac-Man. Boy. Little Pac-Man. And then on Capcom, Pac-Man. you got uh, that is Capcom. You got Commando. You got 1944. Uh, you know the the damn the airplane game or whatever where you're back in World War II or whatnot. It's fun. I mean, I highly recommend it, man. And call Audiovisual Consultations; they can get it for you. What about Miss Pac-Man? You have Miss Pac-Man on there? No, that would that's Bandy. That's that's a different developer. You have that's to go to Pizza Hut for that. That's at Pizza Hut. <laughs> that and Galga. Yeah. That and Galga. No, same 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 stuff we uh same stuff we deal with every day. Pretty much all Longhorns, and that's where we'll start and see where we go from there. Right on. That's boys. what I'm talking about, boys. Well, you guys have a great show, man. Enjoy your all's Thursday, everybody else. We'll see you tomorrow. Be good. Outstanding. All right. Big thanks to the Chaos Theory crew. It's Jeff. It's Jordan. It's only an hour. Jordan, you got your setup finished. I see that. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna put something on this wall. I haven't figured out what it'll be yet, but it'll probably be some posters or something like that. But not gonna. Be yeah, no card thing again, probably. No, nah, I'll probably leave that at a at the parents' house. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I haven't figured out what I'll do with this space yet. But uh, these are most like ninety percent of the credentials I have from like the last two to three years. So. Made pretty good space, but this one is the funniest one <laughs> because uh, Lake Which Travis. This it's Charlie Brewer in a Utah uniform with the Lake Travis logo over the Utah uniform. Oh yeah, and it's because uh, that was a 2021 year, and that was actually the game I met like Nick Harris at, and like the whole butterfly effect of that changed my life. But mm-hmm. um, no, they they gave me a season pass, a season media pass, and said it just for one game. And I figured out that all their other season media passes were like players or past like Travis players who are currently oh. playing in college. But they gave it out in week one of 2021 when Charlie Brewer was still at Utah and he cleaned out his locker and left the program like a week after that. <laughs> nice. So oh, yeah. it's like a little collector's item. One of the few uh, Utah Charlie Brewer photos probably. The, the one that I had like that was uh, last basketball season. The – season credentials for men's basketball I had a picture of chris beard on there and i was like man this is a you just put this on ebay and just see where it goes but i was told if i wanted to keep my season credential i had to hand in the one with chris beard's picture on it to get to get a new one so i figured my job was more right. important than making making a little bit of coin on ebay so i think i made the right call i think i'm good hey, i don't know you wouldn't you wouldn't want to have some random Texas fan that bought it from you in the press box with you? No, no, no. No. I think I think they were on the lookout for those. Maybe I'm pretty sure they all got uh as a matter of fact, uh I don't want to speak for him. Chip might have been the last one to turn his in, not because for any nefarious purposes. He just you know, I, I didn't see him and it needed to be one of those deals where like it had to be an in person credential for a credential swap. So I told Chip, mm-hmm. like, hey, when you you know, when you come in, they're gonna ask for your credential, they'll give you a new one, but they'll be they'll be taking that one. So, yeah, just one of those deals. Uh, so that's the only thing like that that I have. What, what year was the uh, what year was Garrett Gilbert on the meet on the season media passes? Shit, man, I don't even know. I was actually thinking about that this morning, um, just because uh, 
next weekend I'm probably going to go down to Houston. And I was supposed to go down to Houston this weekend, but I changed plans and I'm going mm-hmm. to Atlanta now to uh, cover the Under Armour Atlanta camp on Sunday. Um, with Hudson Standish and Colin Kennedy, we'll be yeah. driving from from Dallas up there. So it right, should nice. be a fun weekend. But uh, next weekend I'm going to try to get to some schools in Houston, um, see some kids down in that area. Um, and I'm also going to stop by P&G, um, which isn't Houston, Southeast Texas, Beaumont area. And the offensive coordinator at uh, Port Natchez Groves is none other than uh, McCrary, who played hey. with Garrett Gilbert at, at Lake Travis. And I was just thinking about how I'm going to do uh, content for um, whenever it's AM and UT, whenever they're playing again. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to do a lot of content with, with McCrary just because I know him pretty well. And, um, you know, he coached me and I have a relationship there. And, I was just kind of thinking in my head, what could that look like? And asking about other guys who played with Justin Tucker. And then I was like, I forgot Garrett Gilbert existed. I need to ask Jeff about that recruitment because I don't know anything about it. I know he obviously ended up at Texas before transferring to SMU. Yeah. But outside of that, like I know pretty much nothing about Garrett Gilbert. And if anything went on at, at Texas besides his poor play or whatever, I don't I know mean, about that either. There wasn't much to it. Uh, you know, Texas – Kind of the mistake that that was made was a uh, quarterback got, I don't want to say neglected, but it wasn't uh, a priority, as high a priority as it should have been in 2008. And, you know, two of your instincts. I, I won't knock Texas as much for the RG3 thing because the only college coach that really recruited him to play quarterback was Art Bryles. So it was kind of one of those deals that wherever – I mean, if Art Bryles had stayed at Houston – Robert Griffin would have gone to Houston, but Browse got the Baylor job, so that's where RG3 ended up. The the other quarterback in state in that class that you can't fault Texas where was Andrew Luck. And, you know, whether, you know, I, it's a revisionist history. Some people on that staff will say they didn't push hard enough. They didn't make him a priority. The other people on that staff will say we figured he wasn't coming here anyway, so we didn't really push. The bottom line was the, the safety net was they knew they had Garrett Gilbert in 2009. And, that that offer, the verbal offer went out early. The commitment was made early. It's no coincidence that Mac used to do the deal where you'd have one signing day, right? So like the class of 08 signs. The next day, they FedEx the written offers to the 2009 recruits. It's no coincidence that Garrett committed to Texas, I think maybe less than a week after the written offer went out. So, yeah, it, it was there wasn't a whole lot to it. And uh, what, what? So he was he was oh nine and in oh eight they just whiffed on Andrew Luck and whatever happened with RJ three obviously and they were cool with it just because they were like we know we got Garrett Gilbert who was like rated as the number one player the right guy. the guy I mean that I I forget the 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 nomenclature but at the Elite Eleven camp he went to he was voted I think most likely to win a national championship of all the Elite Eleven quarterbacks that were there every I mean you had. Uh, you know, you had guys like Jackie Sherrill went on record saying Garrett Gilbert was the best high school quarterback he had seen since Dan Marino. I mean, you had, you had people saying stuff like that. And I think what really sold me on him was he had had a labrum injury that he had had surgically repaired that spring, spring of 08. And then I watched him at the state 707 tournament. Actually, Garrett Gilbert's actually the the recruit that changed everything for me because I wrote a story for Inside Texas. Do they found out I was going to be at the state tournament? And then I, I actually got in touch with them and they said, Hey, can you write a story on Garrett? Since that's that'll be the first time he throws publicly since the surgery. I went down there, wrote the story, and then ended up getting hired by them to do recruiting full time later that fall. And you know, here I am now. But at any rate, you know. After the shoulder surgery, man, he looked as good as ever. Like it didn't. I, I figured it was one of those Drew Brees things where Drew Brees had like a labrum tear, I think, then gets a surgery. And then he's got like this bionic arm, you know, when he gets to New Orleans and is is fine and is now on his way to the Hall of Fame. You know, Garrett had a great senior year, and it, it was just kind of expected. Okay, he's going to step in and be the guy. I, I do the two things with him. I wonder if. If he didn't have to go in and play that national championship game, how different things would have been for him. And if Texas didn't change the offense completely from his freshman year to his sophomore year, how different things might have been. And then by the end, I mean, him 
on I'll be honest, man, I, I love Texas fans, but him getting booed out of the stadium at the BYU game in 2011 is it's one of the most disgusting things I've seen from Texas fans. I mean, you got you just it wasn't like a little bit of booze. It was like a hundred thousand people basically telling you to piss off and you're terrible is what it was. I don't I don't I was not in the stadium for yeah. that. I don't really remember it. Yeah. Um, so it just ended bad for him. He went to SMU, got in an offense that June Jones in a run and shoot fit him perfectly, and he ended up getting drafted. Shit, dude. He, he was in the league like six, seven years, something a, like that. A, being yeah, got him, a, got him a Super Bowl ring with the Patriots. I remember yeah. the 2020, the, tw- the COVID year where, you know, with the Cowboys where Dak gets hurt and they're trying to, they're going through quarterbacks. Garrett Gilbert ends up starting a game against the Steelers and almost won that game. The Cowboys were terrible that year, but. I remember Garrett Gilbert's start against the Steelers. So, yeah, it's – so I say all that to say, Jordan, there wasn't a whole lot to the recruitment. It was pretty much open and shut from the jump. Mm. Hey, you know what they say. Country's going to find out everything runs through Lake Travis. <laughs> is, that what, but, is that what they say? What, what they say? Hell no. No one says that except no. for me. Um, yeah, dude, I don't know. Like, I just – I remember him. I don't. I might have seen him play in high school. I don't remember it if I did. Um, but I do remember, like, it was a huge deal around town whenever he won Gatorade Player of the Year, um, not yeah. just for the state, but the country. Yeah. Um, and I remember that being, a, I think he might have had a parade for that if I don't, or they might have just done it at the state championship parade that year or something like that. Yeah. Like but you, you can't go revisionist history on him. <clears throat> There were so many people in the market, uh, whether it's website writers, TV people, newspaper people. Everybody thought he was the guy. No, nobody expected it to go wrong. And at that point, at Texas man, why would you? You know, like they, they Mac was rattling off double digit win seasons, and I mean, everybody, everybody got that was the hard thing to swallow about 2010 and the downfall was. Everybody kind of got lulled into a, into a false sense of security about where the program was, which is usually what happens when a dynasty starts to go downhill or suddenly ends. I remember in the summer of 2010 talking to uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of early summer 2010, and there was a – I take that back. I take that back. This was after the fact. It was a recruit in the 2011 class, and – Texas got in the mix for some guys that they ended up having to really fight for. This guy was one of them. And the kid's highly recruited kid, and he's deciding between Texas and some other schools. And the high school coach tells me, man, just go to Texas because you know they're always going to be good. That was the high school staff's advice to him. And he ends up going to Texas. Ended up having a good career at Texas, but Texas wasn't always good because <laughs> that fall they ended up winning five games. So. Yeah, we all kind of got lulled into a false sense of security. I I take the who point was the recruit? Uh, I mean, I I guess I can say it. Well, I no, I I I'll I'll keep that between me and the high school coach. But the uh, you really, I'll I'll tell you off there who it is, who it was. It's not it's not a huge deal. I just don't want to don't want to burn anybody like that. But at any rate, um. I'll take the blame for the downfall as much as anybody and for in terms of getting lulled into a false sense of security. If you go find the sporting news, the recruiting issue, the sporting news for the 20 heading into the fall of 2010, I had the feature story in that thing. And it was basically like how Texas had recruited, how Mac was doing it different than everybody else. And I had quotes from recruits and high school coaches about how this is a fail. This is a foolproof plan. And, the Texas offer is so special and you know, they get all these great recruits and then it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe some of these guys they were offering early probably shouldn't have had Texas offers. Yeah. And I'm, what I'm interested is, can you like break down how the written offers work? Cause nowadays it's like, um, so the, the rules are you can't have an official offer from the school until August 1st of your senior year and mm-hmm. the school will send out graphics and shit. Yeah. But there's also the rule um, that until, August 1st of a recruits junior uh, year of high school. It is technically against NCAA rules <laughs> for a kid to directly communicate with a coach unless it's uh, the coach at the kid's school or the kid at the coach's school on a visit. 
And even then, you um, got the you got the bump the bump rule. I'm yeah. gonna bump into the kid and say hi and talk to him for 45 minutes. Yeah, and there's also, um, you know, like because it's against NCAA rules for I don't know, let's say uh, Mike Elko to call KJ Ford, who's the number one player in 26 in Texas by us. Mm-hmm. It's against the rules, NCAA rules for Elko to call his phone. Mm-hmm. But it's not against the rules for him to call his trainer and say, put it on speaker. Yeah. Or call his mom and dad and say, hand the phone to KJ. Or to call the high school coach and say. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. sometimes they'll just straight up call the kid because they won't care. Um, yeah. And every coach in America does the same thing. It's not or it's, I'm trying or to throw deal. Elko or AM under the bus. Literally every coach in America does this. The other deal I've heard of, too, I've heard of coaches, you know, you'll call the trainer of the high school coach and say, hey, have so-and-so call me at such and such time. So that way the coach knows he's in the office or at home or wherever that he can take the call. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, too. so I don't remember Jordan when they changed the rule on the written offer thing. I want to say that was like 2012 or 13, something like that, somewhere around there. I forget the exact year might've been after that, but it used to be, you could extend. I don't remember what the date was on the written offer, but that's how Texas would do it. I think the written offer could come, I want to say September 1st your ju- of your junior year. So basically like the fall of your junior year, starting September 1st, I think is when you could get the written offer. The NCAA, I remember it was almost a year where they backed it up because for some reason they thought, oh, well, if we just back up when the written offers are extended, we'll curb recruiting. Like, no, you actually in a lot of ways made it worse because then the term uncommittable offer got brought into nomenclature and once you've got that written offer unless you do something to screw it up you've got an offer so that's how texas did it they didn't offer anybody early they took their time and that's how they did it either mac would they they would fedex some guys their offers they literally got them in like fedex envelopes they were fedex to the school and guys would get them um or the other big thing they did was the junior day they would take the junior day and that's when guys would get formally offered and you know, everything would go down. But the one thing that I never really – does that answer your question? Was there anything you wanted to know on the written offer part? Mm-mm. Sounds pretty much the same protocol, just yeah. dated 15 years ago or however yeah, long ago. Yeah, pretty much. The the thing that always, like, I initially uh, – hold on. I got to adjust the contact lens. Hold on. I got to touch the eyeball real quick. That's bugging the hell out of me. Oh, God, that's better. Um the one thing that I, I I used to be like, wow, that's awesome. But then in hindsight, I'm like, dude, that was terrible. Was on signing day, Mac would get up. And really it changed. The time frame when it changed was kind of 2005 to really 07. Because Mac got burned on signing day by Ryan Paraloo, Martellus Bennett, Fred Rouse. There was that whole class that basically the signing day 2005 was a dumpster fire. And that ended up being pound for pound Mac's best class. It's like Jamal Charles, Colt, Roy Miller. Like I think of the uh, the fifteen signings, I think eleven of them played in the NFL. So, it, but it was a dumpster fire. So Matt got burned there, and then he had guys like when guys started getting in trouble on campus. It was uh, James Henry, Robert Joseph, Dre, Dre Jones, guys. Jordan, you probably never even heard of. Guys were getting arrested. Guys that were messing up publicly. Mac just started recruiting a certain type of kid, and there were certain type of kids that, based on the background Texas did, they would be off the board completely, really talented guys, but they would be off the board. They wouldn't even be considered. That changed a little bit once Texas started losing games, but the bottom line is the one stat that I always thought was cool that in hindsight just was terrible was every signing day Mac would get up there and say, well, you know, we extended 32 offers and we've got 24 signees. Like, wow, they only missed on eight guys. Well, dude, you you narrowed the scope so much and made decisions so early that again, like there are some of those classes where like a third of that class, kind of like you were talking about the twenty two class. This was Mac almost every year. A third of that class, by the time they sign, you probably wouldn't have taken them, and you probably shouldn't have taken them because you know, like, dude, they're not going to be. There's so many guys in the state that are better than this guy at whatever position. So it was like, oh, man, Texas, they, they really know who they want. Well, yeah, cherry pick and recruit sounds great until you completely screw it up. Yeah, like I'm just trying to think of like a, a coach trying to <laughs> – like like the thought of, of a coach in today's world getting on the press conference for signing day and be like, yeah, 
sent out like 250 offers this year, <laughs> but we got the the top 32 guys that we wanted. We got yeah. them all, all 32 of the top top guys. Yeah, we got them. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's, Texas it's Tech. I, yeah. Let's see. Let's see how many offers Texas Tech sent out while in you're doing that. 2024. And while you're doing that, mind, with yeah. This is all this likely a chance this isn't accurate and it's missing about 20 of them right. just because offers show up on here based off them getting put in. Not every single one gets put in. Um, but in 24, uh, sorry, I don't know why it's taking forever. <laughs> They sent out 149 offers in the state of Texas. Sent out how many? 149. And how many Texas Texas signees were in the Texas signees were in their class? In 2025, they've sent out 122 so far. Yeah. In Texas alone. Like I I couldn't tell you how many offers the Texas staff extended in 2024, and I don't really care, you know, yeah. like because I trust I trust what the staff is doing. That that died pretty much after the 20, probably the 2011 class was the last time where that that number was said. Because in 2012, Max started to they started recruiting JUCO guys. It kind of changed how they were doing things. Texas uh, offered 55 kids in the in state, state of Texas in 2024. Yeah. By the way. Yeah, and I think even I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Sark has said this publicly. He might have. I don't know. And I, I'm not even saying he told me privately or anything. I'm just saying it's it's a thing. When Texas offers a kid in state, they have to be really careful because uh, Texas and Texas ain't in both. Because if you offer a kid in state and that kid thinks he has an offer and then all of a sudden he doesn't without a really good reason, um you're going to get blasted by the high school coach. You're going to get blasted by the trainer. You're going to get blasted by the kid. You're going to get blasted by the kids at that school kids on that kids select seven on seven team, whatever it is, you've got to be really careful. That's why, you know, you've got some out of state schools that'll offer Texas caliber kids in state early, just because Texas has to make really sure. Okay. Yes. We want this kid. That's why Texas, that's why they can be late to the table on some, and you'll see AM be late to the table on, on some kids too, because you can't screw up that offer process. If you're Baylor or any, basically anybody else, you can afford to just shell out however many offers you want. But AM yeah, with, just can't. With, with Texas, I mean, dude, like that's a thing that really doesn't get ever talked about or written about is like the amount of offers that schools send out. And then the amount of kids that try to commit like within a week and are mm -hmm. told to wait. And it's like they understand. And sometimes those kids can they end up committing to the school they're originally trying to commit to. Yeah. But it's like. I don't know. Just one thing that, that really bothers me is kids are getting offered way too early nowadays. Yeah. And way too many school or schools are offering way too many kids. And I'm not, it's not like I have nothing wrong with kids getting offers. The reason I say the, the offers early is because we'll see kids with 30 offers as a freshman that end up signing with SFA or Purdue as a senior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the writer is saying signs with Purdue over offers from Alabama, UT, Oklahoma, but everyone knows what really went on, right? Yeah. And like, I don't even like, just think about what that does to a kid. You know what I mean? And like his head, he can't, you know, he thought he was a top player in the country is at 14, 15. And as time moves on, people physically develop, catch up to him. And now all his buddies are going to wherever and he has to go to Purdue when he was getting recruited and called by Nick Saban and Sarkeesian as a freshman or whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's hard on kids. And I don't even know how that could be covered in a way, but I would love – someone to try i'm not going to be the person to do it um no but, but i'll tell you i'll it, tell you the sport where it's worse is basketball that's been going on in men's basketball for years because you're you're getting more exposure as a as a middle school kid as a seventh and eighth grader and you'll get big time offers and some guys will even commit or whatever and then by the time you're a senior maybe you were great because 
you were 6'2 in the seventh grade. Well, guess what? As a junior, you're still 6'2, and everybody in your peer group is now like 6'4 plus, so you're just a guy. That that happens all the time in men's basketball. Yeah, and, and with, with football too, like, I don't know. Like, for example, this is – Okay, I'm 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 cool with saying his name. I don't think it's a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. There's a kid from spring in the 2022 class named Dorian Friend, uh, also went by DK. Um, was part of a really fun spring high 2022 class that year. They went uh, like four deep in the playoffs and got stomped by Duncan Bell at the star. Um, but ended up at Houston. His dream school growing up the whole time was a And M, right? Um, a And M knew that they were his dream school and that they could get him as soon as they offered. And keep in mind, he was like a six foot, probably 170, maybe 5'11", 170, uh, like 87, 88, three star. Like mm -hmm. not an amazing prospect, not a bad one either though, right? Yeah. Like there'll be about, I don't know, a handful of those kids in each class that Texas and A&M signs each year. Like that's not out of the blue. Yeah. And A&M had him visit a bunch, still wasn't offering him. After a year of him visiting for like – he visited like four times in one year without an offer. And usually by that time nowadays, kids and parents will be like, bro, like fuck a and We're not going there anymore after we've been there twice and they haven't offered. Yeah. A lot of families will do that. Mm -hmm. um, but they kept going because that was his dream school and he wanted to play there, right? So when it came time for them to finally offer him, they do it in Jimbo Fisher's office in the summer going into his senior year after a camp. They offer him. Tell him we're going to recruit you. You're going to be one of our top guys. He goes, okay, I want to commit. And they tell him he can't. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like, what yeah. the actual f – <laughs> you're like, what? Yeah. If like, you're waiting that long, like, you yeah, just, you should be ready to take the commitment at that point. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And it's funny because A&M – uh, had some uh, apologizing to do because the spring high head coach at the time was Trent Miller. DK's senior year was Trent Miller's last year mm -hmm. at spring. After that, he went and took a job to be the head coach at Willis where he coached DJ Lagway. Yeah. Ooh, so yeah. A&M had, a had some apologizing to do uh, to Mr. Mr. Coach Miller. But, um, yeah, that's what went down and – after that, DK never returned to AM, and I think AM and him kind of went their separate ways, and he ended up coming to Houston on signing day. He could have gone somewhere better than Houston, but to be honest, he just took too long to commit. And that's another thing that, like, really upsets me with so many of these kids is, like, dude, I'm never going to tell you what to do. I'm never going to advise you anything. But it, you're going to have more options on where you can commit if you do it in the summer rather than in November. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And, you know – it's almost like I know what I'm talking about. Like I do this for money and to make a living, right? And it like yeah. I don't blame them. I've been a 15, 16, 17 year old kid too. Nobody can tell me shit, right? <laughs> but it's very annoying and upsetting to see when a kid tells you, "No, I'm good. I'm gonna commit to this school in November," and then you tell him if you get hurt, you're gonna lose all your offers, and that's what happens. And he has to walk on somewhere. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the piece I've stopped giving advice because nobody yeah, ever yeah. takes my advice. Like my advice to, especially it's mostly the kids off the radar. It's really weird. Like I've had, <laughs> I've had kids over the years call me and like, it's even not necessarily Texas, it's just other schools. Like, Hey, how do, uh, how do I commit to fill in the blank school? I'm like, well, would you call the coach? No. I'm like, yeah, you probably need to call the coach. I'm like, have you talked to your, you know, your parents? No. Like, well, who have you told? Like, well, me and, you know, my trainer talked about them. Okay. You go home, talk to your parents, and then you need to go ahead and call the coach because if you're going to commit, the head coach is the only one that can take the commitment and it matters. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. So I'm like, dude, to, some, to your point, you talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Like, some kids just have no concept whatsoever of how the recruiting process works. Yeah, no. So, um, you know, we talk about Micah Hudson a lot. I had a close relationship with him, but I also had a close relationship with Selman Bridges. Mm -hmm. And I filmed his commitment video. And um, part of the video, it ends by Selman, you know, it ends he's committed to Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever I've done commitment videos, I always try to, I mean, I have a vision for what I think it should look like, but I always try to kind of let the kid decide because, um, you know, it's his announcement. It's his life, right? 
And for Selman, I'm like, okay, you know, how do you want it to end? How do you want to commit? And he's like, I don't know, like, how, how do I commit? And like, he's like, I just like post a graphic. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I knew Arkansas was obviously going to take his commitment and yeah. they loved him. But I was just like, dog, you got to call Pittman or something. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so we yeah. ended up, uh, uh, our, our conclusion was uh, to end the video. The way it ends is it's Selman FaceTiming uh, uh, Sam Pittman to tell him he's committing. And Sam Pittman gets all happy and everything. Because at the time, was the highest rated commit Arkansas landed in eight years. Um, but it ended Dang. up getting bummed down in the rankings a bit. So, because eight years of yeah. that, uh, Alex, would that have been Alex Collins? Maybe. Yeah. I don't remember. Only reason but, I remember Alex Collins is he, he's the one that, uh, his mom ran off with his letter of intent on signing day, just took it and wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't give it back. Yeah. There's a five star whose mother did that in, uh, 2023 um peyton bowen is the kid's name yeah yeah that dude i'm telling you what man if like i think i could write a book on micah hudson's recruitment because i know everything yeah peyton bowen i don't i don't know much but i know someone who knows mostly everything and it's mm -hmm. like i want them to write a book yeah because like the the stuff i've been told i it like can't really ever be reported unless it's like 30 years from now yeah <laughs> It's funny, man. Whenever, whenever Mike. By the way, any Texas fan, if you haven't bought Mike Roach's book, uh, "The Road to Texas," you got it on the right. shelf. Jordan, mine's yeah. over here on the. I, I have a shelf with a bunch of books. Some I've read, some I haven't. But I figure it makes me look smarter, but it really just doesn't. Uh, but no, if you haven't picked up Mike's book, please make sure you pick it up. But it was funny, like hearing how recruiting has kind of evolved. Like, I don't know if it made it into the. I don't remember if it made it into the book or not, or just Mike has told me and it, it just, it's just ingrained in my head. But like uh, BJ Johnson told the story of there was a coach who was a position coach at a pretty prominent school who went on to be a very prominent head coach at other schools. <laughs> Basically locked BJ like in a broom closet and wouldn't let him out until he committed to said school. Like, like you're not leaving here until you commit. It's like, no, I don't, I want to get out of here. Like, let me like, it's yeah. just really weird. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I was in the middle of, of reading something. Um, but it looks like, uh, per Rappaport that, um, Dan Quinn is hiring William Gay, who was Texas's replacement for Joey Thomas as cornerbacks analyst, um, okay. had played in the NFL. Some yeah. played under Dan Quinn, I believe, which is why that makes sense, but not 100% sure. Um, but it's, because it's a loss, that, but yeah, yeah, definitely a loss. I mean, he's only been there about a month, so you yeah. know, if you're gonna have to replace him now, is a good time. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it just means they got to go out and get another coach again, which I'm sure Sark and everyone is like tired of, <laughs> yeah. So, this because this will be Sark's third attempt to hire uh, the, the defensive back analyst position the senior analyst position because it was going to be Dwayne Aquina and then it's William then it was going to be William Gay and now it's going to be somebody else so and I you know we've talked about it here but I think it bears repeating man Joey Thomas played a really pivotal role like even when you go to practice like you'd see him out there working with guys you know doing kind of what he can within the rules uh man he was really important to it just seemed like I heard more about Joey Tom I, when I heard guys talk about what Terry Joseph did. It was more of actual like game plan stuff, like watching tape, what you're looking at on tape, like stuff happening during the game. Whereas it seemed like if I heard Joey Thomas's name, it was more about the technique, fundamentals, all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Someone said Jay Valai for DB analyst. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about all that. Um, I'll just, I'll just take yeah, I'll just take your hot sports opinion on Jay Valai. I'll take it right here. We'll just put it over here on the shelf, save it for yeah. another day. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So who's the story of, of BJ? And can you can you restart the story? Which yeah. BJ no, it, it was just there was a a, a coach who was a, a, a position coach at a pretty prominent school, who went on to become a head coach at other prominent schools, who basically locked BJ in a closet locked himself in a closet with BJ and wouldn't let him out until he committed to the school that the guy was at. You miss BJ Foster? BJ Johnson. 
Johnson. Back in 90, 99, 2000. Yeah. All right. You, once we get off, you're going to have to tell me which coach did. Like I said, I can't like remember if that story made it into the Mike's book or Mike's just told me about it and it's just ingrained in my head. Hmm. I'll go look at the BJ Johnson chapter in the book when we get done and see if it's in there. If not, I'll have to. That's why I didn't want to say who it was because I don't remember. I really don't remember if that's in the book or not. It's been a minute since I read the book. Mm. Uh, but no, get you get stuff like that in Mike's book, so it's it's all good. But um, on the William Gay thing, uh, if someone is being locked in a closet, Mike Leach has to be involved. Man, hey, I I actually uh, there's a coach in the Juice program who played at Tech. <laughs> it was at practice that day when the whole closet thing happened, and has gone in depth with me about uh how the whole Red Raiders team treated that and and Craig James afterwards. If there is if there is anybody in Lubbock who's more or actually is more persona non grata in Lubbock than Chris Beard, it's Adam James. <laughs> I don't even know what that word means, but basically means you're not allowed sure. here. Mm. They don't want yeah. you there. Yeah. The only- yeah, CB, thank you for that. I pretty appreciate that. Um, but no, man, that's dude, that that's just it's crazy how that one incident, like, and then you read the the all the stuff about you know, Leach didn't really want to take Adam James and it's kind of pressured into taking him, and then it just became a nightmare. And that one kid basically brought down the most prosperous era of Texas Tech football we've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Rex St. Carl says, I need to get you a dictionary for your next birthday. You got a thesaurus, Jordan? Or maybe I'll get you one of those. Uh, get those you can still get one of those combo bits, right? Like the thesaurus slash dictionary. I remember having one of those back in the day for like fourth grade English class. <laughs> Do you own a dictionary or a thesaurus? No, I have uh, something called Google. Okay. But anytime I need to look something. So don't up. look at me funny when you ask me the it same question. Proves to be a pretty a pretty handy source if I need to look something up. So yeah, oh, yeah. and the Google machine. Let the Google machine take care of it. Uh, but no, yeah. I want to on the on the William Gay thing. I mean, I it, it's a loss, yes, but I don't know, Jordan. On a scale of one to ten in terms of importance, I'd put it at like <laughs> a, like a six, six and a half. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw CB's comment. Dude, oh, CB, I got, Man, I that caught good. me way off guard. That caught me yeah. way off guard. Sorry, sorry. That's the <laughs> yeah. That's supposedly the the deal about Craig James. That's been kind of one of the urban legends. That's been about Craig James and ladies of the night at SMU. So yeah, y'all stop throwing Jordan off in the chat. We're trying to we're trying to do quality live broadcasting live streaming which we always fail to do but y'all aren't yeah. making, y'all aren't making it easy on a scale of one to ten on the william gay thing jordan i'd put it at like a six and a half in terms of how important it is uh, I, i'd say like five um oh i'm overshooting it okay my my thing is just look he it's been less than a month yeah yeah like we no one knows the value he, he's truly going to bring. Also, Joey Thomas, you know, it's not like he was super involved in a ton of recruitments, but he was a part of recruiting some of the DBs. Mm-hmm. We don't know William Gay if that was going to be a thing for him or how much he's willing to help or how much he could actually help. Um, so, like, it's a pain in the ass. You got to replace that position. It's an important position. Joey yeah. Thomas brought a shit ton of value in being on the staff. Yeah. And – you know, you basically had two in my – Joey Thomas is going to coach, coach defensive backs at the Power 5 level in the next five years. So, in my opinion, you effectively had two cornerbacks coaches – or two Power 5 cornerbacks coaches yeah. on your team. You just had one of them for 50 or 60 K or however much an analyst makes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That position is very important. Yeah. But in terms of gay, he hasn't yeah. shown was- kind of – how much he's worth. So I got to go with five just because yeah. the having to replace that position is going to be I a said, pain in the ass. I said six and a half thinking more about the position, the value of the position than William Gay specifically. Cause I'm with you. Like if you're there, if you're there for a month, how much of an impact can you really have? Like the, it, does any Texas defensive back that was at Texas when Jerry Gray was the DB's coach for like three weeks. Does anybody remember that? Was anybody really impacted by Jerry Gray? Yeah. 
Um, actually, with William Gay leaving, uh, I think we could maybe see Andrew McCuba in the portal. <laughs> that was sarcasm, by the way. Somebody's going to run. Somebody's going to run to Orange Bloods with that or something, or or you'll yeah, get an no. angry thread on our board. Why are you dropping intel on on the YouTube show and not on the board? Yeah, yeah, no. Um, Speaking yeah. of intel, uh, I do want to get your take on some stuff that uh, Chip had in the Insider. It was kind of a staff big big staff contribution week with the insider but i wanted to get your take on some of the freshmen and see if any of this surprises you chip's got plenty of winter conditioning notes in here uh some stuff on maurice blackwell some stuff on uh, kendrick blackshire but stuff that i wanted to get your take on are there are basically five freshmen who chip mentioned something about this week that he heard uh some of them i don't think will take us as long to go over but I just want to run these down, Jordan, and get your thoughts on them. Yeah, I um, haven't so, read it, so this is all going to be new to me, by the way. From a source on Xavier Filsamy, attacks, quote, attacks every workout, great energy, end quote. Mm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, in this job, you can kind of – like, once you've been doing it enough, you can get a good sense of who is going to have an easier transition to college and who isn't. Mm -hmm. um, and not on field stuff, but what you said, Jeff, and how they attack day to day stuff. Yeah. Phil Smee was never a guy I was worried about with that. Um, and for him, uh, when, I, when I'd go to his games or other McKinney games to go see Pettijohn, um, before they had offered him, which is kind of crazy because he's a year younger. Yeah. Um, he would always kind of, I would notice, like the coaches at McKinney are talking a lot less to him than the other kids on defense. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and whenever it's – there's motions or stuff is changing. I remember they were playing Prosper, which is one of the best coach teams in Texas high school football. Um, him and Pettijohn are the ones calling everything out, right? The coaches aren't really screaming anything from the sideline, none of that. It's Phil Smee pointing everything out. And I could just tell then, you know, like I don't – I have no idea what the hell he's saying, but <laughs> high school safeties usually don't act like that or carry themselves like that. Right. So. Uh, not super surprised, but, uh, you know, happy to hear it. Uh, the next one is on Colin Simmons. Uh, and, again, these are early and early freshmen who've been standing out in winter workouts. You can get this in the Insider Horns 24-7. On Colin Simmons, quote, he's put on at least 10 pounds of good weight already. I know Colin's mom came out on Twitter yeah. and said that he's gained 20 pounds. And I'm like, all right, 20 pounds in, you know, three, four weeks, I don't I don't know if that could be all good weight or, or what, what the deal is, but uh, Colin Sim is building on his frame nonetheless. Look, I like it, um, especially that they're able to do it this early, but it's going to be very important that it's good weight. Um, yeah. the, the 10 pounds of good weight and the mom tweeting 20 pounds kind of gives me a little hesitance, mm -hmm. um, but – you know, I mean, like I said from the jump, I know people weren't super happy with my take on Colin Simmons as a prospect, but what I did say is that if he's going to be a first rounder, he needs to put on at least 20 to 30 more pounds mm -hmm. while also retaining his explosiveness and his speed because that's the best part of his game. That's what makes him who he is, is his speed and explosiveness, his burst off the edge. So if they can get 10 pounds of good weight on him or even, I guess, just 20 pounds of weight, um, before summer, that's good. But the most important thing out of all this isn't how much weight is going on him. It's how explosive, like how much of his explosiveness can he retain yeah. while continuing to add weight. Um, because, again, uh, he's under six. He's probably six, two and a half barefoot. Um, he's going to run into to tackles like Kelvin Banks. Not that every SEC tackle is going to be a top 15 draft pick like Kelvin Banks. But you're going to be facing – dudes of that size of that stature of sure. uh, yeah. that talent you know once every few games in the sec so it's incredibly crucial that he retains his explosiveness and you know we're not going to be able to tell that until the game start in the fall or spring ball you know but yeah um you know it's something that needed to happen no matter what with colin simmons and you know it's it's a good thing that it's happening before the first month is even over you think about a guy like and kind of my 
my best case scenario for Colin Simmons in terms of a comp was Von Miller, just because I think the body types are kind of similar coming out of mm-hmm. high school from the same part of the state. And Von Miller is a Hall of Fame defensive end at 250 pounds. Well, how do you get to be a Hall of Fame defensive end at 250 pounds? To your point, you put on that weight, but you maintain your explosiveness, your ability to strike and you know make an impact at the point of attack. Uh, because it's not just about, especially at that level, it's not just about running the arc and getting to the quarterback. You got to be a five tool guy to be as good as Von Miller has been throughout his career, and and that's the, that's going to be the deal for Colin Simmons. You know, like you said, can you can you gain that kind of weight and still be, you know, still be able to have that kind of explosiveness that makes you a really good prospect? You know, that, that's kind of where those those edge guys, those linebackers are. You know, uh, like I look at a guy like. I'm looking at Khalil Mack right now. Khalil Mack, when he went to the combine, was 251 pounds. So what you're saying about the 20 – you said, what, 25 to 30 is what Colin Simmons needed to gain somewhere in that area? That, yeah. Yeah, so uh, majority of his um, high school career, we had him listed 6'3", 225. Uh, but the 225 was actually verified at like 221. Okay. Um, and the 6'3 was really, I think, like – six two and a half okay. and then we got his verifieds at under armor and i believe we got him above um 230 let me see um got arm we got arm him arm six two, two two we got him six two two thirty so yeah. that means they must have verified him at six two barefoot what do you have for arm length on him jordan uh i'm not sure i don't have you access have to our database with all that stuff and okay. i have someone's told me but i don't know what it is off the top of my head it's de- definitely over 34 though or else oh. he probably wouldn't be a five star okay because i'm looking uh khalil mack was von miller was 33 and a half at the combine with arm length khalil mack 33 and a quarter so i don't know maybe maybe i'm wrong then i just i know for our scouting team Having plus 34 inch arms is like one of the most important things, and yeah. especially at edge and offensive line. And unless Colin has to be in the 33s, I feel like, yeah, because if he was 32, I doubt they would want to keep him as a five yeah. star. It's, it's going to depend on the body type because, like, you look at arm length. I'm, I'm just looking at the, the defensive ends, the edge guys, not ends, but you know, outside backers who were hybrid guys that were on the NFL all decade team. You know, I mentioned Khalil Mack and Von Miller. They got Chandler Jones, 35 and a half inch arms, but Chandler Jones is almost 6'6 legitimately. So yeah, and he lost his mind. <laughs> that those those Jones those Jones brothers, man. Yeah, who knows? Uh, yeah. Who were um another thing before before we get done talking about Colin? Um another thing that I really like for him as a freshman is that Texas doesn't need him to play a ton of snaps. They don't. He can come in and be a situational pass rusher, which is the best case scenario. Yeah. Um, and, you know, start him off in the first few weeks, just a couple plays a game, just like Anthony Hill, where he was effectively kind of a situational pass rusher. Um, there obviously are different players, different positions, but as the season goes on, acclimate him more and get him more involved. But to start the season off, like nobody's – Colin Simmons isn't starting. He, he's not. Um and if you expect that, then you're probably the same people who thought Arch Manning might be leaving in the portal. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I guess that's for calling it. The thing I, and for him, um, I've always wanted to see him care more for the run in high school. If, if it wasn't a pass, he kind of would just stop sometimes, you know, um, yeah. he, he, he took, he took plays off. I, I talked about it before, but, uh, his freshman year, you don't got to worry about him being committed to stopping the run because you're only going to play him as a situational pass rusher. Um, but as he continues into year two and on, they need to get him to commit to you know playing all four downs because he's the type of athlete that can do that. Very different so. backgrounds with the guy I'm going to mention, but that's that's basically what Jackson Jeffcoat was as a freshman situational edge guy, and then as a sophomore, you know, he was starting. So that's so. And and that's just a five star to five star comparison. If you want to look at what the the arc should be for Colin Simmons' career, uh, the other guy, Jarrett Gibson, quote, he's trying to outwork everyone. End quote. Yeah, um, man, IMG. You know they. <laughs> I, I believe I believe Jarek got to IM or started at IMG um, 
or started his career at IMG, my bad, as a sophomore. I know he's originally – actually, no, I think he might have been as a junior – because I believe he's originally from Gainesville, went to a school in Gainesville as a freshman, then went to a school in Georgia as a sophomore. Mm-hmm. But I might be mistaken. Um, but anyways, I'm not surprised at all. It's IMG, man. Um, like they, it's. I have never seen a team warm up with like such efficiency, and <laughs> also, uh, it, it's like everyone is moving together and in sync at the same time. Like everyone steps with the right foot and their left foot. That's what it was like seeing IMG warm up. Um, so, you know, anytime you can get a kid from there, it's a plus because they're going to come in discipline and ready to bust their ass off just like Jared Gibson is. When you win stretch, if you win stretch before the game, I would imagine that's how you win most of your games if somebody looks over there and sees how you're dominating stretch. Daniel Cruz, this fits Jordan pretty much exactly what you said he was going to be from the early impressions. And again, you can get over to the insider horns 24 seven and get all of the winter workout notes on Daniel Cruz quote. He's a strong kid, good head on his shoulders. Pretty much exactly what you said he was going to be at Texas. Yeah, dude, Daniel Cruz is one of my favorites. Um, you know, he, he's kind of a, a quieter kid. Um, he showed up wearing the I'm horny shirt. So I think, uh, you know, a lot of Texas fans might think he's more of a jokester than anything. But, uh, you know, quieter kid, really humble. Um, and kind of from the from the time Kyle Flood first saw his film, he, he treated Daniel Cruz like he was a top offensive lineman in the country. And it's because Kyle Flood viewed Daniel Cruz as a top offensive lineman in the country mm-hmm. um, and as the best center in the country. Yeah. Like from the moment they saw him, their thought was, "This is the the center of our future." I'm serious. Like I had that for sources. That's what they were yeah. calling Daniel Cruz, the center of our future, is what coaches at Texas were saying. Yeah, and no disrespect to to Connor Robertson or anybody else, but they've been waiting to find that guy. And yeah, and, and they, Daniel they Cruz, twenty four. Yeah, Daniel Cruz is that guy. Um, and, yeah. And also the thing that made him special, he started all four years at Richland and he started at all five positions. That is incredibly mm-hmm. rare that you're going to do four years and at five different positions. Um, and, you know, a lot of fans have different opinions about NIL. Um, for him, it was always going to be Texas just because you can't bet against Kyle Flood. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, you know, his family doesn't have the most financially stable background. So yeah. – Whenever he was getting offers from every school in America, he would say, you know, NIL is going to be important because I feel like I have to provide for my family. Yeah. Once that became a thing, we knew, you know, this might be the number one offensive lineman on the board as a center. Yeah. He also loves Kyle Flood. They're also in staying close by. And if it really comes down to it, we know Texas is going to have more than anyone else in NIL. And around that time is when kind of the whole industry started to feel confident that it was going to be Texas for him. And the last guy on the list that uh, Chip got from the sources of the five newcomers, Brandon Baker, quote, super athletic, needs to get stronger, but you can see it, end quote. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, that that was the – anyone in California you ever talked to about Brandon Baker, anyone you ever asked about him, what do you like his game? Like the first thing that's ever, like always brought up is athleticism. Yeah. Um. I always thought it was weird how he didn't really play like any left tackle in high school. He only played right tackle. Um, but I mean, I believe he also got in some reps at guard in his time in modern day. And he also, it's becoming a big thing. I don't think we've ever talked about it, but five on five competitions yeah. where it's the same concept as seven on seven, except it's offensive and defensive linemen. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like select clubs. I know with him, he went all across the country playing in those two, um, and he would play at different positions as well. So he has versatility without pads on. Um, <laughs> but with his athleticism, man, like that, as long as Brandon Baker is playing football, that is going to be the first thing brought up about him. Um, and, you know, outside of DJ Campbell, he's probably the most athletic lineman at Texas right now. Yeah. And I'm saying DJ Campbell just because I've never seen someone as athletic and over. I've never seen someone be over like 300 pounds or even 250 and be that athletic. Like, so it was three days before he was supposed to move into Texas in June um, of what would have been 2022. Mm -hmm. And I went and saw him work out in a training session with his trainer. And I was out there to see a few other kids, but DJ was also there. Um, And they were just doing ladder drills. And like, it was, 
I mean, I can't describe it, but it was genuinely ridiculous how much faster he was than the other kids that were there. And the old, the other kids that were there were all college. Like I was there to take photos, um, mm-hmm. and not to cover for recruiting, to take photos. And DJ going into his freshman year at Texas was faster than like three linemen from Tech who were going to like their senior years, linemen from Houston, SMU. He was better than all of them and yeah. more athletic and faster. And if you want to see some true athleticism with DJ Campbell, you go watch his high school basketball tape because he was punching it as well at like however big, tall, and fat he is. I love I love those offensive linemen that play basketball. Like I remember watching uh I remember watching Ashawn Robinson hoop back in the day. And that's when I was like, dude, this dude is a is a unique athlete, man. I, I always figured he would have been he I mean, look, he's an NFL player. He was a good player at Alabama, saying a second round draft pick. He's been an NFL player as a defensive lineman. I just always thought, man, if dude, if you put Ashawn Robinson at offensive tackle, I felt he could have been a dude that plays double digit years in the NFL. And that's mostly from what just watching his feet on the basketball court. That long arms. I thought he would have been a, a really good offensive tackle. Uh time will tell with Baker in terms of the arm length, you know, the his NFL upside as a tackle. But I think at Texas, man, the athleticism is going to give him a chance to play left or right tackle, whichever one. And man, it, it's it's nice that we're talking about offensive linemen, not just that Texas is in a position where they can stockpile guys. But that they they keep stockpiling guys, and you're going to have some really good linemen at some point transfer out of this program because you're going to want to get on the field, you're going to want to play, and there's just not going to be a spot for you at Texas. But the way Kyle Flood's done it, man, he's he has completely transformed that room since he's been here, and I've been I've been waiting on it far too long, and you know we probably don't see Brandon Baker until 2025, and I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. For sure. BK, how's it going? It's good, gentlemen. How are y'all doing today? Terrific. Terrific. I actually have to get off here a little bit early because I got to get going to uh, Dish Falk for baseball availability at nice. uh, 145 today. So you boys know how that South Austin traffic can be. Yes. Mm. Good, good luck getting off, Jeff. I uh, I usually do have a problem with that, but I'll try to make it, try to make it snappy today. So. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you guys, you guys can look in the chat. CB's in there talking about Craig James doing something with Ladies of the Night at SMU and all kinds of stuff. So I'm sure you guys will have something good in store. Uh, I heard Jordan cracking up a few minutes ago. I like left the room for a minute. And I was like, "What did I miss?" And then, oh yeah, it was hookers. Jordan loves yeah. his hookers. We know that. Oh man, look at that! <laughs> oh my god, this guy. Yeah. Poor Jordan. Yeah. He's like, Where's the spot to go in Dallas, BK? Some more off like Harry Hines or Harry something. Hines. <laughs> and get go get caught over there with Jerry Jones. Mm. Yeah, Harry Hines doesn't have the same uh, ring that it used to, right? It lost a little bit of the flash that it had back when I was growing up, and I'm sure by that point it had already lost a lot of the flash that it had before I was yeah. born. So, uh, but you could still get into some trouble, some good kind of trouble. Something down Harry Hines. Hines. Yeah. Indeed. All right, boys, I will uh, get out of the way. BK, Rodney, you guys have a good show, and uh, we'll be back to do it tomorrow. Yes, sir. sir. Great show, fellas. As always, there they go, Jeff and Jordan. It's only an hour. Now time for the award-winning midday program right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. It is not Trey and BK today. It is my man, Double R and BK today. Trey on vacation for the rest of the week. Doing a little staycation, Rodney. He's at the uh, Kalahari Resort Park thing with the family this week the tourist trap yeah that thing is right down the road you know i i go down i go down 79 all the time and and it's like i've never been to that place uh we did the uh when our kids were small we did the uh lost wolf resort or whatever that thing is uh up in dfw but have not done the kalahari but man, I see people posting pictures all the time, and it's like it's it's like being in a different country. It's like being in a different state. So, you know, I hope Trey behaves himself over there. I, I guarantee you, he's gonna piss somebody off over there. I promise you, he's gonna piss somebody off in that place. I bet he already has. Yeah, the vacation yeah. just started. I bet he's already pissed multiple people off. Yeah, just yeah. how he operates. Yeah, he may be back tomorrow because they're going to be like, get the hell out of here. Go home. Uh, So, uh, yeah, you may have him back on here tomorrow. 
as a no matter kidding. of fact. We've got some fun shows. So this afternoon, Kevin will be a part of the afternoon show like he always is on Thursdays. But it'll be Joe Cook from inside Texas from 3 to 4. And then former KVU sportscaster Sean Clinch nice. will be with KD from 4 to 5. So, uh, yeah, we're bringing in some new faces over these next couple of days while Trey is out. I love it. I love it, man. I love having those dudes on. I, I know like, um, you know, with Clinch, I've tried to get Clinch on a couple of different times, but that poor guy has a real job. Uh, I, I mean, not that this isn't a real job. He, he, he has his gig that he has to do. And he's like, man, I can't, I can't jump on, man. I want to jump on. So having him on here, you know, I know we had a, you know, suplex stew on here. We got a, we got a pretty nice bullpen right here of badass dudes um bk that hell they're they're better than we are yeah <laughs> you know we get the the pretty low. and it's like man that that's the real that's the real talent right there here on texas sports unfiltered oh yeah no doubt about that yeah great wolf lodge that's the name of the place you're thinking of that's the one that is the one yeah. we had a really good time there they had the arcade they had all that stuff uh, at that point our girls were little and uh we kind of went and did everything and but they got some pretty massive um some pretty massive water slides and all that stuff. And and that's one of those BK where it's uh you just kind of sit back, get a cocktail and just sit there and watch, uh, watch the moms do their thing. Mm. You know what? Watch them escort the kids around and, and, and do all that. It's like, okay, I'm going to just sit over, I'm going to just sit over here and, 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 and take in all the activity going on around here. The smell of the chlorine, the smell of the chlorine and the, um, uh, beauty, of mm. the, mm, whatever. I think that I think that's child's piss that you're smelling there, Rodney. <laughs> and uh, yeah, interesting. I didn't realize they had escorts there, but uh, the more you know. Thank you for letting us know. That's oh, yeah. huge. I went to the Great Wolf Lodge, I think, one time as a kid, and I only remember it because I was in the room watching Kansas beat Virginia Tech in the Orange Bowl. The end yep. of the 2008 season on the tiny ass TV in the room at the yeah, a little bit of thing. Yep. Uh, my parents spent, I'm sure, a bunch of money for my sisters and I to go there. And literally, my memory is watching sports. Like that's that's me in a nutshell, right there. Uh, I guess well, I realized it was a big deal that Kansas was playing in a new uh, BCS bowl at the time. Knew that wasn't going to happen often. Well, that's about right for you. I mean, I can only imagine you as a kiddo j j just sitting there checking out sports. I, I mean, that, and that's really the the main thing. I mean, that's what's important. I mean, going to all these different things and the Kalahari, I mean, that's great. But, uh, I mean, hell, take me across the street. Take me to the Dell Diamond. Take me to a baseball game. You know, dollar hot dog. Well, I, I don't know if it's dollar hot dog night or yeah. any of that anymore. But uh, take me over there. I'd rather go across the street, man. I, I, I want to be watching sports. That That's that's go. all I've ever done. That's all that's I've ever it. done. That's all I'm good at. That is all mm -hmm. I'm good at. Speaking of sports, I want to talk some baseball with you, yeah. Rodney. Okay. If that's all right. You're a big Astros fan. I'm a big Rangers fan. Of course, sure. the two defending champions in Major League Baseball, pitchers and catchers, reported for both squads yesterday and i've got some uh world series odds for mm. the upcoming 2024 season which is just over a month away i mean it yep. feels like baseball just ended and honestly i'm yeah. still on cloud nine from the rangers first ever title that i'm not sure i ever want baseball to come back because like, i want my last ever <laughs> yeah, baseball be fan memory be to, yeah. yeah to be like the last baseball game i've watched to this point is the rangers beating the diamondbacks to win the yeah. world series like in yeah. person that, that's my baseball fanhood will never top that. Even if the Rangers win another World Series, which they won't because they're the Rangers. But like, yeah. it, it's your first is better, right? You know what they say? There's nothing like your first. That's so, right. like, if, if baseball, told. if baseball just stopped happening at the major league level, I don't know if I'd be too upset about it. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's not how that's not how it works. Well, that's not, that's, that's not how it works. All right, here we go. <laughs> And Take here are your odds for this upcoming season, which uh, will happen. I think most people are grateful that, uh, yeah, baseball is coming back pretty soon. Uh, no surprise who's at the top, Double R. I know it's been a few years since the Dodgers have won one. I know it's been a long time since they've won, you know, a real non-pandemic shortened season one. But oh, they were one of the best teams in baseball last year. They obviously added the best player in baseball this offseason with Shohei Otani coming across town the L.A. Dodgers of Anaheim plus 320. Any qualms with them at the top? Um, you know, I, I think that when you look at this, I mean, because every, everything's on paper right now. I mean, I mean, that's the whole part of this. I mean, when when we get into uh, 
uh, you know, pitchers and catchers, you know, about to report. I mean, all that we can do is is be prognosticators, as I talk about. And I mean, you can't you can't dispute the fact right there with with L.A. I mean, look what they're doing. But at the same time, I mean, I kind of wanted to tell you, I mean, looking right there, Atlanta at plus 460. I was uh, checking out the athletic dot com uh, a little bit earlier today and looking at their numbers. It's like Atlanta is the number one power ranked team coming into this mm-hmm. so I, I think with la and atlanta i mean there you go with the nl um and then the phillies man how about that balance right there uh g- good shake up right there al nl all represented nicely in there and uh i think man i i love i love the shift of power to where it's kind of equal uh you know in, in both in both sides of the of the, of the leagues yeah, it's going to be a fun year. There's no doubt about that. You've got some big-time division races. Of course, the AL West one will be the one that we're focused yeah. on the most, right? I mean, Astros and Rangers, it went down to the final day of the season last season. Wouldn't be stunned if that happened again. Obviously, Seattle, you see them tied with the eighth-best odds. They should be a force again this year. So, you know, Oakland's going to suck. The Angels are probably going to suck. It's really a three-horse race, but it's going to be fun in the AL West, I think, all season long. But yeah, the Dodgers, like, they should be the favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, plus 320 is not great odds when you're talking about a preseason champion. I don't know if Ike's being facetious or not there. I mean, the Dodgers, like, that's as close to a super team as you could possibly have. Yeah. Once again, they were already loaded. They added Shohei. They added Glass now. They added Yamamoto. Like, they still have Mookie Betts and Max Muncy and uh, Will Smith and obviously Freddie Freeman. Like, the, the, the team is just loaded with talent. It's not great value, so I'm not going to advise people to put money on the Dodgers because your ROI is not great. But yeah. I don't know if I can advise people to not bet on the Dodgers either because they're so freaking talented. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you the one that kind of surprises me looking at that right there is Baltimore. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know with uh, Baltimore made the move right there, you know, with Corbin Burns, uh, I mean, to get him in there and kind of going back to that, the uh, the athletic thing that I was looking at, I mean, that, that they're number three in power rankings. So the fact that that Baltimore is plus 1400, I think that that's uh, that's a little surprising there. But again, I mean, I think that's a lot of um, that's that's the fun part about this is. We ain't even swung a bat yet, so um, we we can kind of sit here and and talk about what could be or what couldn't be, and and there there could be somebody that comes up here and, and sneaks up and does stuff. And and Tampa Bay is one of those teams. When when you look at the Rays, I mean that, that's one where it's like maybe they they're not going to be whatever, but da- damn, you look up, you're past the All Star break, and there they are. I mean they're yeah. sitting right there. So th- that that's the beauty of baseball. It's so fucking long the season, BK. It's like uh, I mean who. Who, who's who's going to make the move at the right time? Absolutely. Yeah, and the Rays are always in the mix, right? They they haven't found a way to win a World Series, but it feels like they're always in the playoffs every single year. And for those listening on the app, we'll give you the top five of these odds right here, and then we'll dive into some more of the conversation. The Dodgers are favored at plus 320. Once again, this is World Series odds yep. for the 2024 MLB season. The Braves right behind the Dodgers at plus 460. The Astros come in at number three, plus 700. The Yankees, suckers bet, plus 850. And then, yeah, two teams tied for fifth. You've got the Orioles, who you talked about, Rodney, and then, of course, the defending champion Rangers at plus 1,400. That's that's pretty decent odds for the Rangers. Like, yeah. they, they just won the World Series. They beat the Astros to get there. They won the World Series in just five games. And, you know, they haven't re-signed Jordan Montgomery. He's still a free agent. But most of the team is back for Texas, and it's the highest payroll they've ever had as a franchise. So, you know, plus fourteen hundred for a defending champ, at not not horrible odds, right? Yeah, no, that, that that's not a bad odd at all. I mean, that that's something right now that you could probably dive into that early on, and and, and that could uh, really work itself out. Um, you mentioned the AL West. I mean, that that really is going to be the one to watch. I mean, obviously, we're going to hone into it like you mentioned there, but I mean, just the fact. I mean, Houston, you, you know, with with Josh Hader, uh, you know, the 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 signing right there. I think that's something that that that's really going to. I mean, with uh, Abreu and 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 Ryan Presley. I mean, that's really going to help, um, you know, with the bullpen. I mean, obviously all of that, but, you know, here you go with uh, with Altuve. He signed on. I mean, he's going to be a lifetime uh, uh, Astro. 
I mean, what do you do with Bregman and, and these guys and, and, and Kyle Tucker and, and Diaz? I mean, I, I know that's way down the road right here, but this could very well be an opportunity for the Astros. I mean, depending on what happens as a, as a year shakes itself out, this could be their time where I, I don't want to say as an Astros fan, it could be one of their last runs, but depending on what happens with player personnel, I mean, you might want to stand on it right here because uh, time time could be ticking, especially with the uptick with what we're seeing in Arlington. Yeah. I'm, I'm always going to assume the Astros are going to be relevant. Like as long as Jim Crane is owning the team yeah. and, and they've got so much talent. Now they've obviously lost a ton of talent in the last four or five years, but I mean, here they go once again, making it to the ALCS this past season. So uh, in game seven of the ALCS too, like they're loaded. I still think they're going to be in the mix. I think their window is going to stay open for at least a few more years, but at some point, every dynastic run comes to an end, right? Like at some point, what the Braves did for seemingly forever, it, it came to an end. Uh, so that's, yeah, the Astros' father time or whatever will catch up to Houston at some point. But I fully expect the Astros to, to have another great season. I would pick them to win the American League West, even though the defending champs are in that same division. Like if you ask me right now who I think is going to win the West, I would go with Houston. Uh, and I love the offseason they had. I still think they could use another outfield bat. Yeah. Like even though spring training's kind of getting going, the free agency is still going on, and there are a lot of big names, both bats and pitchers, that are still available. I'd love it if the Strohs got another outfield bat to help give a little bit of depth and prevent Jordan from having to play so much left field. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, re-signing Altuve is obviously big. Bringing in Josh Hader is big. And the hope is that Justin Verlander is okay. Uh, I saw him. I saw him warming up today, which is good news if you're an Astros fan. But uh, yeah, I mean, if there is something wrong with that shoulder, with his recent injury history, that obviously is a, a major cause for concern. Yeah, and that's uh, that's really kind of the, the the key right there with with that rotation. I mean, because that that's your guy uh, that's going to be at the top right there. But if, if something if something is really wrong, uh, I mean, you just don't know what you're going to get right there. And you know, it, it's it's so often with Verlander. I mean, we've watched him. He is really good during the regular season. I mean, you know what he's going to get you. It's that playoff time where it seems like he kind of has some of those issues, but. Um, it really does revolve around Verlander. And I think this is Verlander's time as he's going to continue to be a part of the Astros to where, you know, cement the legacy right here. Um, when he came over to Houston the first time, I mean, that was really what put them over the over the top right there and, and made that move. But it's, uh, it, it is curious because, uh, I mean, the, the, the dude's long in the tooth. He is yeah. long in the tooth now. And that shit doesn't heal the way it used to when you're a kid. BK, I've got a frozen shoulder, and I'm over here having to swing around a golf club and do all these exercises. In the old days, I'd have been fine. I'd have been mm -hmm. fine. So it, uh, it it changes as you get older. Yeah, yeah. He was throwing off a mound today. Didn't look like he was throwing, you know, full speed, full force, anything like that. But, uh, yeah, JV a couple of days ago said he had a hiccup recently. That's a scary yep. thought for a guy at his age, yep. like you said, with all the tread on those tires. Um, but look, as long as he's good, if he has to miss the start of the season, I think that's fine. As long as Absolutely. you have him for the majority of the season, I think uh, you would take that as an Astros fan. And here's fan graphs before we uh, shift gears and get into an NFL mock draft that's given the Longhorns a little bit of love, a new one from ESPN. Uh, fan graphs disagrees with Vegas. So we mentioned the Vegas favorite to win it all is the L.A. Dodgers, but fan graphs and their analytics, uh, they go with the Atlanta Braves as the favorite they give the braves almost a 25 percent chance to wow. win the commissioner's trophy this year of course they won it what three years ago now yep. uh they got upset by the phillies in the playoffs last year as the top seed in the national league but that's i don't think anybody's sleeping on the braves if you are you're making a mistake they're going to be a factor once again yep. and van graffs has them as the favorite yeah they always are i mean you, you can never sleep on those guys and and that's that you know we see those teams struggle in the postseason that seems to be you know whether it's time off and and that's a conversation that that was had last year when you had when you had teams that that, that you know didn't have to play coming right off of the regular season what happens there i'd like to ask you because your time there in houston to me mauricio dubon is is just fantastic for the astros and is um the center field spot, the center field position there. I mean, is that a, what do the Astros do with 
Mauricio Dubon. Number one, you got to hold on to him because it, the dude is a utility player. Do you cement him into a spot like center field or do you let him where he's playing? Hell, he played first base. He played first base this year. He played a bunch of different spots right there. Dubon is an interesting uh, character to me because, man, there are so many different things that he can do for that club. Yep. I called him the doctor last year because his yep, initials were M- MD or Mauricio DiMaggio because he was hitting like Joe DiMaggio yep. at times yep. last year. I mean, if he keeps yep. playing like he did in 2023, then you have to find a spot for him in the lineup every single day. Mm-hmm. And like you said, he's so versatile, right? When Altuve was hurt, he was playing second. When Abreu was hurt, he was playing first, and he can play everywhere in the outfield as well. Uh, yeah, you love having a guy like that on your team. And Astros obviously had Marwin Gonzalez, right? He was a guy who served that role the first time they yeah, won a title. Yep. Mauricio Dubon is kind of the uh, the new version of that. So can he replicate what he did last year? I don't know. Like last year was Dubon's best year of his career. So if he kind of resorts back to the guy he was before then, then all right, maybe you don't need a spot for him all the time. But if he does anything close to what he did last year, once again, he should be an everyday player. Uh, that's why I think they need another outfield bat, right? Like yep. I, I like Chaz McCormick a lot, but yep. I don't like the idea of Jordan being an everyday outfielder. Obviously he's in the lineup every day. He's maybe the best hitter in the game, but I want that guy to be a DH. I know he likes playing left field. I think Joe Espada, the new manager came out last week and said he wants Jordan playing more in left field. But for me, he's just, he's the most valuable person on that team. And I do not want him getting hurt. And he's got injury history. He's got knee issues. He's got oblique issues. He's had hand issues. Like he's and he's in his mid twenties. Yeah, that stuff doesn't get healthier as you get older. So for me, it's like I want Jordan off of his feet as much as possible. That's why you get another outfield bat so Jordan can be basically full time DH. It doesn't sound like that's what the Astros want to do. That's what I would do. But I want an extra bat, an extra outfielder. Uh, really to keep Jordan healthy, but also just to add a little extra spunk to that lineup. Yeah, no doubt about it. And and it is, you know, with 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 that center field spot with the Astros, I mean, it's Jake Myers. I mean, I mean, that's a dude that, that sits out there and it's like, okay, is Jake Myers going to be your guy? And it's like, okay, he's going to make you some plays. Every now and then he's going to get you a clutch hit. But when you when you look at that center field lineup, and I think that that's why, like you're talking about, that's why it's such a cluster right there because you do. I mean, you, you've got to get a good bat out there. Myers is going to make you some plays. But, man, when you need the production from the plate, it, it seems like in center field it's either McCormick or Dubon. Yep. And, and I think you need the consistency of having a good bat out in center field because that position is huge. I'm with you. Yeah, I don't have any faith in Jake Myers. No. Um, man, I'd, I'd love for him to bounce back. He was awesome in his first year before he got hurt, what, in the DS against the White Sox, yeah. right? In Chicago, yeah. he tried to go rob a, a ball in center field that effed up his shoulder. And he just hasn't been the same player since then. Uh, yeah, I've got more faith in those other two guys, like you said, with uh, with Chaz and with Dubon, Doobie Doo, instead yep. of um, instead of Jake Meyer. So we'll see. Uh, Ryan Presley was asked, I think today, I saw this quote today, at least from Brian McTaggart, who does a great job covering the Strohs. Mm-hmm. You know, you bring in Josh Hader in the offseason, you give him that huge money contract, and it's like, well, is Presley going to be pissed? Like, Presley's been the closer the last few years, and he's been the dominant arm in that Astros bullpen. Like, what's he going to think about the team going to get another closer? And Presley's like, no, I'm good. Like, my job is to get three outs, whether it's the fourth inning or the ninth inning. My job is to get three outs. So that's that's what you want, right? You do not want to piss Ryan Presley off and have that whole, like, oh, what's going to happen here with Hayter and Presley? Who's getting the eighth? Who's getting the ninth? I mean, Presley's just like, dude, like, Hayter makes our team better. He does. Uh, Just – I'll go out there and do my job, whatever inning it is. I will get three guys out, and I'll pass the baton to Josh Hader. It's fine with me. Yeah, no, no, I love that because that that was that was my first thought when Hader comes over. I'm like, well, you know, that kind of has been Presley's uh, bit right there to be able to get in there and do that job. But you know, we can talk about the Astros all we want, but I just think that as the Rangers continue to grow, it's um, man, uh, Texas is in a great spot. 
we've said it three times already in this hour, BK, the, the AL West, man, that, that is going to be so fun to watch. And, and we're just talking about two teams. We're just talking yeah. about two teams. You know, somebody's going to sneak into that race and, 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 and keep this thing and keep this thing and keep those teams on us. So man, I, I'm just ready for them to get going because yeah. this is kind of that period where it's like football's done. Yeah. NBA, we're doing what we're doing. College basketball, we're fixing to fire up pretty good, but uh, it's like, you get baseball going. Get some baseball. Yep. Get some grapefruit league. Just let's let's watch some baseball, man. That's what I'm all about at this point. I'm ready. I'm with you. Yeah, the Astros, the favorites to win the AOS, 61.3%, according to Fangraph. Mm. Then Seattle at 26.3%. The Rangers, even though they held the division lead for most of the year, and even though they just won the World Series, mm. only a 9.2% chance to win the AL West this coming season, and only a 1.3% chance to win it all. Of course, it's been a long time. Since we've seen an MLB team go back to back, you got to yep. go to the Yankees, ninety eight yep. to two thousand, when they won three in a row. Uh, hey, well, maybe the Chiefs just laid the blueprint for the Rangers. It had been a long time since any NFL team had won two straight Lombardies. The Rangers uh, trying to do the same in baseball. I wouldn't bet on it, but man, they're not getting a whole lot of love with the analytics community right now. That's that's kind of weird to see. No, and I got to tell you, because I know Wags and I have talked about on Chaos Theory, we're talking about like the Orioles with the ownership change and now with, with the big move that they just made. It really seems like, I mean, what Texas has done that is so impressive is that you see the organizational moves that they've been making right there, acquiring players, bringing folks in, and they continue to do that. I mean, obviously, you're going you're, you're gonna to lose. I mean, attrition is going to set itself in. But, you know, I, I go to when 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 we really start looking at baseball analytics and looking at what's going to happen with baseball and all this. The first thing that I do, BK, man, I go I go to the farm system. I'm like, mm. okay, let's let's go look. Let's take a look and see. Let, let, let's take a look what Double A is doing or or has in place. Let's let's look at Triple A because that's where it is right there. That's the feeder system and that's kind of the difference right there. I know we have the G League or whatever the hell they call it in the NBA and you know with 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 the NFL we've got college football. I don't count the UFL as kind of that that feeder league, but that's where you go right there to really see the health of these organizations in Texas. It's in a really good spot, dude. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, they're very healthy when it comes to looking at that part. Yep, that's where the uh, yeah the Rangers are better positioned than the Astros with the farm system, right? The Rangers, uh, according to some websites, I saw a ranking the other day that said the Rangers have the third best farm yeah. in baseball. That's what I crazy, and, yep. and that's like that's where the Orioles could be scary, and that's why Wags has every right to be excited about the ownership change because if they bring in owners who are willing to spend money. Now, they just were the one seed in the AL last year, and they've got the number one farm system in yep. baseball. Like, if they play their cards right, they've got a chance to maybe win more than one, yep. but definitely one. So, yeah, the farm system, that's always big. If you could be in that spot where, yeah, your major league club is really good, but also your feeder system is really good, that's where, uh, you know, you become the Braves or the Astros to where it just feels like you are in the mix every single year. And, uh, yeah, the Astros obviously have traded a lot of their farm away because well, they've gone after it and they should have yep. gone after it. It's led them to two world series, but yeah, the Rangers right now in a, uh, in a very good spot. So there's some baseball going to be exciting. Uh, didn't realize monkey five, one, two was a burner account for Bucky. I didn't realize Bucky. Oh, oh, oh. where's that little, uh, yeah, I'm waiting for Jeter. Jeter. <laughs> Little Jeets figurine. Yeah, I got some like Rangers bobbleheads up behind me in the corner of my screen. Maybe I got to bring out like an Adrian Beltre or a Michael Young to uh, to compete. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the last time that I went to the old place, um, I, I kind of raided the closet right there, and I've got some Ranger stuff put away over there. That uh, there you go. Yeah, uh, like stuff that. sitting around that was never given away for whatever reason. That's how it goes. That's how it went at that place. All right, before we shift gears and get to some mock draft talk, a uh, quick word to some of our great sponsors, our friends at Audiovisual Consultations. If you are in the market for a new TV setup, hey, if you want to make sure your TV setup is done by the time opening day gets here, call AV Consultations so you can watch your favorite team at your house all season long. Stop going to the sports bars. Stop going to your friends' places. God forbid you're going to your in-laws' place to watch the big sporting events. Make sure your home is the place to be for friends, for family, most importantly, for yourself with that custom TV setup from AV Consultations. Just give them a call, 512-255-8678. That's 
888-888-8678 or check them out online at avconsultations.com. Also, shout out to the Altstat Brewery, Altstat Beer, the best beer that you can find. Hey, Rodney, I've been dealing with the crud this week. I've, I've noticed. You, you well, sound kind of a little rough right there, man. I was kind yeah. of wondering what was going on with you there. Yeah, we're getting better. This is the best I've sounded, I think, all week. And I think I know why I'm feeling so good and at least sounding a little better than what I have been sounding. That's Altstat beer. I went and drank a bunch of Altstat yesterday out it. at uh, Kelly's Irish Pub. And well, that's better than any it's OTC medicine I could find, better than any prescription meds I could find. That's that's what cured me right there. Yeah, Altstat absolutely. beer. That's the best cure for anything. Go get you some HEB Specs, Twin Liquors, Total Wine. Wherever you buy your beer, you can find the liquid gold that is Altstad beer. No impurities, no regrets. All right, Double R. Um, man, you listening to you and Wax talk NFL draft, it's awesome, but it also <laughs> has me wanting to pull my hair out. Yeah. Not, mainly because of Wax, not because of you. <laughs> I just he he is so down on this quarterback class, and I am so high on this quarterback. I love this class. class. Yeah, I and I think you're closer to me. I, I, like, I feel like I'm higher than both of y'all, more ways than one. Oh, but I think it's uh, I think it's a great QB class, man. I mean, anytime you have quarterbacks projected to go one, two, and three in the draft, and look, nobody knows. We've talked about this a lot, right? Like, you think Patrick Mahomes would have fallen to the tenth pick if people knew how good he was going to be? Right, the Bears took Mitch Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. You think Tom Brady? He's obviously the prime example. You think he would have fallen to the sixth round? If people knew how good he was going to be, like nobody really knows. It's all a guessing game when it comes to these quarterbacks. But man, I, I feel like all three of these guys, like in a lot of years, would be the number one pick in the draft. So, you know, I, odds all three of them are great players, very slim. It's just not how the league has worked. But I feel like any of the three guys has a chance to be really, really good at the next level. I totally agree. And, and uh, like I was saying this morning, ideally for these guys to, to come in and be able to sit behind a veteran, to learn a system, all of that is, is great. But that's not what happens. When you're one of these top guys, you're probably going to have to come in and, and get your bell rung and get your nuts kicked, and you're going to have to play. You have to be ready to play. Um, but but I really am. I mean, I like this class. I mean, I, I think all of these guys and, and just kind of the, the the differentiation between all of them. And, and I was looking, you know, you, you've got you've got the same guys that we're talking about. I was looking at Joel Klatt's mock draft today, and and he obviously has Caleb Williams going number one to Chicago. And I and I absolutely cannot wait for the Chicago thing to play itself out. Because that, whenever it happens, whenever it happens, and I think the longer that this dragged itself out is is telling me, okay, Chicago is going to possibly keep Justin Fields because it, it is it, it, the brand new OC. Maybe that's what's going to happen right there. But but with Williams, and, and it kind of shakes around a little bit. That, then you have to the Commanders. What are the Commanders? I, you know, I, I've said Jaden Daniels and Joe Klatt's thing. He's got Drake May going there. To where I think Drake May is a better fit for the for the for the Patriots, and it, it, the bottom line is, I mean, all of these guys, I think that they are they are NFL ready, and it, they're going to fall into systems to where it's going to be whether it's the Commanders or the Patriots. And I've said this numerous times on Chaos Theory, they're falling into a situation where they're going to have to be one of the cogs that's going to have to make this thing right because they're not. Uh, this is where. Uh, you know, one of these guys going to a middle to a middle team. All, all the different quarterbacks projected to go to Seattle. Mm. Those guys are going to be in great shape because you've got pieces in place. God forbid whoever goes to Atlanta. Holy moly! That yeah. right there. That that that's that's a dozen eggs right there waiting to happen, man. So I love this class. I think this is a great class of quarterbacks. Yeah, I do too, man. And we could see five, maybe six. Yep. Go in the first round, right? I mean, you talked about the big three, and then there's J.J. McCarthy out of Michigan. There's Bo Nix out of Oregon. There's Michael Penix Jr., of course, from Washington. Like, all of those guys might hear their name called on night one of the draft. So I think there's a pretty clear gap between the top three and the other three that I mentioned. But, man, I mean, it, it could be history made in the first round of the draft at the end of April. And, yeah, like, the Bears obviously hold all the cards. I I, I – I know Wags likes Justin Fields. Trey likes Justin Fields. I, I'm not high on Justin Fields, man. Like, do I think he's good? Yeah. Do I think he's good enough to win you a Super Bowl? No. And not even close. So what's the point of keeping him around? Like, it's literally two years in a row 
where once the Bears are like out of playoff contention, he plays really, really well and like gives the Bears fans just this false sense of, oh, he's really good. Yeah. He's a franchise guy. Like last year, they lucked out because they probably would have taken Bryce Young if they stuck at number one. <laughs> Instead, they <laughs> traded that pick and they got the number one pick this year because of yeah. it and a bunch of other stuff too, including DJ Moore. Turned out to be a great move for Chicago. But for me, it's like, I, I, I've seen enough out of Justin Fields. I think he's fine, but I don't think he's like good enough to be a true franchise QB in this league. I would trade him. I would draft a quarterback number one overall, but obviously they hold the keys to this draft because they could do what they did last year. Like, yeah. I don't think they're going to stay at one and take Marvin Harrison. That's bad business. All right. Marvin Harrison's great, but if you want to take him or Roma Dunze or Malik neighbors or any non QB, you don't do it at number one. You trade right. down, you get a few extra firsts and draft picks, and then you take that player. Uh, obviously, what the Bears do, if they run it back with Justin Fields, then that shakes everything else up. But I, I got a hunch Justin Fields is going to be on a new team, and the Bears are going to end up agreeing with me. It, it, and I think I honestly think that that Fields now with the Bears is is and I and I've said this I, I think that that is the spot for him uh, I think that maybe maybe through everything that, that he has finally grown into that role being with the Bears but at the same time I say time after time to where when you've been through so many I mean you you name the quarterbacks I mean we can go through a list of people that that. You get them into a different place, get them into a different scenery, get them into a different system, get them into a different OC, a different head coach, get them into a different mindset where they excel. That really does happen when we yeah. talk about quarterbacks that are quote unquote broken, like Mac Jones, Justin Fields in the past, they've said he's broken. But like you mentioned right there, he does tend to turn it up once the shit hits a fan and it's over. So I really like to to me, BK, the 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 Justin Fields to the Steelers thing is something that I keep seeing. And yeah. it's like, okay, that could be a really good place for him simply because you still got Mike Tomlin there. And I think Mike Tomlin is a guy that can get in the back pocket of that dude, get up his ass, and really make him be a more elite quarterback, in my opinion. Mm, get up his ass, you say. Whatever it takes to win, BK. Mm. Whatever yeah. it takes oh, up his that's... ass. Hmm. Um, that's why Antonio Brown wanted out, I guess, huh? <laughs> that was it. Ben Roethlisberger would maybe like that stuff. Uh, ben Roethlisberger liked it. I think that's why he thrived there, my man. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Like Pittsburgh, that'd be an upgrade for Pittsburgh. Uh, Justin Fields is better than Tiny Hands Pickett or Rudolph or Red Nose Trubisky. Rain. Yeah, like, there's no doubt about that, but. You know, for them, he's probably the best option in the short term for the Steelers because they're not yeah. drafting high enough to get one of the top guys in this class. And, you know, that, I don't think there's going to be any, like, big-name free agent. Like, Kirk Cousins would be available. He'd be a good mm -hmm. fit for Pittsburgh. but it's A lot of money. That's I don't think Minnesota yeah, – yeah, I don't know if Minnesota wants to let him go, number one, and he's going to cost him a lot of money, number two. So, yeah, Justin Fields feels like a, a realistic fit there. And the thing is, though, if you're Pittsburgh, do you do that? Like it's once again, it's an upgrade, but think about the quarterbacks in the AFC. It's like you trade for fields, you're giving up draft picks, maybe yeah. picks plural. And then that guy's one year away from a payday. So you're probably trading him with the anticipation of giving him a long-term contract. Is Justin Fields good enough to compete with Mahomes, Jackson, Tua, Burrow, Allen, Tua, Stroud, like Rogers? Yeah. That's the thing. Like at best, Justin Fields is like the ninth or tenth best quarterback in his conference, right? Yeah. yeah. Speaking speaking of Tua, and speaking of this Joel Klatt mock draft that, that that I'm looking at right now. Yeah. He's got 21. He's got Michael Penix Jr. going to Miami. Oh. Um, what do you think about that? I, I mean, that you want to talk about turning up the wick on some stuff right there. I, I think Michael Penix Jr. probably a better quarterback, but you're going to have the the injury stuff is is what's going to be the the question right there for that uh, going into the NFL. But man, if, if Miami and see that that's where Dallas is so stupid because the Cowboys. If I were the Cowboys, I'd go out and try to find a quarterback and turn up the heat a little bit. I mean, I know you've got a couple of guys on the on on the roster right now. Earlier today, I said if 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 the Jets went out and got uh, what's his name backup quarterback number ten. I I, I cannot think of his name right now for the Cowboys. Uh, oh, Cooper Rush. 
Cooper Rush. Mm-hmm. You you get Cooper Rush over to the Jets, and I mean that that that's what you need right there. But man, when I saw that, I'm like Penix to the Dolphins. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, my guess Dolphins. is that's injury related for Tua, because be. you know Tua is also going into the final year of his contract. I don't know if Miami's going to pay him this off season or not. He actually did stay healthy last year and was playing really well for most of the year, but faded hard down the stretch. Uh, that'd be interesting yeah i mean i I don't think the cowboys are going to draft a quarterback i I don't think the dolphins will either for the record no i don't think the cowboys should though like Mm -hmm. you're trying to win now what's the point of drafting a guy who's going to sit on the bench for you you know like mike mccarthy's going into the last year of his deal he doesn't have the luxury to afford like a future quarterback throw away a year yeah yeah so, no i mean and dak dak's obviously not going to be real happy with that so yeah, yeah the cowboys I, I wouldn't take a quarterback that high they just traded a fourth for trey lance can that count as their quarterback that they that's, got in this draft can we do that instead that's kind of what i'm thinking it, it your thoughts on jj mccarthy uh, because I was, I was talking about that this morning to where obviously he's gotten the great vote of confidence right there from his college coach that has moved on, but kind of the thoughts right there. I mean, this, this mock has him going to Seattle. Uh, I know the ESPN one has him going to Denver, I, man. I think the Denver one, that might be a pretty damn good fit right there. But I, I think with McCarthy, that that's where you see a lot of back and forth to where it's like, he doesn't have the skills. And then the other stuff that I've been told and that I've read, it's like, he does have the skills. He just didn't have to use them at, at Michigan. Yeah. Um, so I, I think McCarthy is a very interesting um, quarterback floating around in this thing that could move up, that could move up on draft night and uh, round number one, as we get closer to, to the draft. Yeah. It sounds like he could end up in the top 10, right? That's what I've like, heard. That's what it I've feels heard. like, feels like the league is way higher on McCarthy. Than they are on Knicks or Penix, yep. right? Which yep. if you, if you watch the three yep. of those guys in college, like I'd go Penix one, Knicks two, McCarthy three, and like a distant three. Yes. But you know, that's, that's not how the NFL draft always works, right? They draft for potential sometimes more than production, but it's just weird. Yeah. The eye test would have JJ number three out of that crop and he's going to end up going first of those three guys. So you're right, man. Like since the season ended, JJ McCarthy has ascended a lot yeah. in these mock drafts and we haven't even had the combine yet or pro days yet or the pre-draft workouts yet. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I assume that's only going to help his stock. He's got the measurables. He's got good arm talent. There's no debate there. The accuracy has got to get better. And yeah, I mean, uh, there are going to be questions about, oh, you didn't do a whole lot at Michigan last year. Like how, how good actually are you? Um, but yeah, that'll be a fascinating one to watch where McCarthy goes. He, he could be one of those guys who goes to a team that already has a quarterback in place, but a team that's not sure about the current guy that they have. And, Hey, they're willing to let McCarthy sit on the bench for a year, and then boom, in 2025, he's the guy. And isn't that the best part? You know, because when you fall into maybe going to to Denver or to Seattle, or I mean, what are the Saints going to do? I mean, I see yeah. them going edge or whatever. They're they're more going to the defense. But when 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 you're in a in a position like that, I mean, I, I think if I were one of these quarterbacks, I'd rather be the, the middle of the first round because if you go to the Commanders, you're going to Geez, I mean, you're starting over. It's brand new. I mean, you go to the Patriots, you're starting over. I mean, it's one of those things to where, yeah, maybe maybe that middle of the first round, and if you can ascend right there, and and I am, I'm going to be so interested on draft night, uh, night number one, to watch what happens with J.J. McCarthy because we sit here and we watch this. You never know. He might do the Aaron Rodgers. He might fall to the bottom of the first round or into day two. You just don't know. You just don't know. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of variables that – Again, all this is on paper. That's that's the best part about this. It's right. it's so fun to sit here and watch this stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, there are a few teams in the middle of the first round that I just I have no idea what they're going to do. Yep. Right? Like, they could take yep. quarterbacks, which that would really shake things up. Like, the Giants are picking sixth. Like, I, I don't expect them to take a quarterback, but would it be the most shocking thing in the world if they did? I don't think so. Uh, Minnesota at 11. Like if they let Kirk cousins walk, they could take a quarterback Denver at 12. Maybe yeah. they move on from Russ. Maybe they don't, but either way they could take a quarterback, right? You brought up Seattle at 16. You brought up the saints at 14. The Raiders are picking 13th. Like all of these teams 
in the I think it's obvious that the top three teams are are going quarterback if if the Bears decide to move on from Justin Fields. But man, there's like five or six, maybe even seven teams kind of in that mid first round where it's like they could. Yeah. They could. You just they you could. have no idea. Like, do they want to try to win now with the guy that they have, or do they focus on the future? It's gonna be uh it's gonna be fun. I mean, the NFL draft is always fun, and I'm a mock slut. I love looking yeah. at mock drafts. Um, yeah. a real slut too, I think. But yeah, you are. It's, it's uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah it's, yeah, it's 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 gonna be a fun couple of months. There's no doubt about it. Well, and taking taking a look. Uh, I mean, let, let's talk about some of the Texas uh, players in in these mocks. I mean, no, no matter which one you look at. I mean, uh, Byron Murphy sitting right there. He seems to be the the kind of the unanimous one that's going to go first uh, with everything that I'm looking at. I mean, in this one, he's 25 to Green Bay, and yeah. I mean, shit, that's fall into that, that dude. Yeah, you're right. That would scare the crap out of me, and I don't want to root against yeah. Byron Murphy, but I would have to if he was at Green Bay. Oh, um, but that's that's like as low as I've seen Byron Murphy in mm -hmm. one of these mocks in a while. And to me, this yeah. is more evidence of Joel Klatt just hating Texas. He is yeah. a tried and true Texas Longhorn hater. I mean, like, I feel like most of the mocks I'm looking at have Murphy going like 12 or 13. Yeah, that's and what here I you go. He's going 25. But for him, be a great fit. The Green Bay looks like one of the best young teams in football right now. And that organization seemingly always finds ways to win. So, yeah, that's the good thing about being picked late in the first round, right? You don't get as much money. You don't get as much hoopla but you get to go to a good team i heard you talking about this earlier like that you know byron murphy i don't think would be complaining too much if he ended up playing for the packers next season yeah yeah and and the whole thing is uh, i mean it, it doesn't matter the 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 mock that you look at i mean just look at look at all these longhorns man and and how long has it been since yeah. shit how long has it been since we had uh one or two guys on this list i mean but my God, right now, I mean, you got JB on these lists right now as a running back, and hell, he didn't even finish a year out. And, right. and that tells you with, with these receivers, I mean, look what this program is doing. And you continue to supplement and add and, and everything that's going on right here. If if you want a true, I think if you want a true definition and you want a true visual as to how much the program has improved right now, take a look at mock drafts. Because yep. when you have this volume of players, dude, that that tells you how good this program has gotten. For sure. You saw it with the uh, list of combine invites yesterday, right? Texas had 11 guys invited to the combine. That was tied with Georgia for the fourth most in the country. Tied with Georgia, like the premier program in college football right now. Uh, this thing has come a long way. And, yeah, just the snowball effect that on-field success is having with the whole program, with recruiting, with everything. I mean, it's huge. And that's – uh that's why a lot of Texas fans are excited. We've been waiting a long time for this, right? Yeah. Like to find a way to put it all together and win some games. And with games that are won comes championships, conference championships, competing for national championships. That's all great. But it also comes, yeah, NFL draft picks, and it comes more success on the recruiting front as well. And Texas has it all rolling for them right now. So, yeah, you're seeing those dividends paid off, and the Longhorns will have six, seven, eight – Yep. Guys drafted on the first two nights of the NFL draft, which is yep. awesome. It's been a long time, and there aren't a lot of programs across the country that can say that, but it's been a really long time. There have been years where Texas has had zero players drafted yep. in the first two days of the draft. This year, once again, I mean, it, it's at least five, but it could be seven or eight, if not more than that. It's awesome. Is there one of these guys, you know, whether it be A.D. Mitchell or, 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 or you pick the player, is there one of these guys that, you know, looking at the different uh, projections, whatever, that, that that you think is going to be the sleeper of this bunch? I mean, I know that some of these guys are, you know, maybe into the second day or whatever the case may be, but is there one that kind of jumps out at you that, that, that just kind of says this is going to be the Texas player that just – jumps in makes an immediate impact to wherever he may land because a lot of these guys like we were talking about they may go to teams that are um not so uh deficient as a as a patriots commanders that sort of mess yeah you know it's uh it's funny if you asked me this question two months ago i would have given an answer that i'm not allowed to give right now like two months ago 
during the season, I would have said Byron Murphy is that guy. Byron Murphy. Yeah. And like at that time, I think people expected Tavondre Sweat to be drafted ahead of Byron Murphy. I don't think people viewed Byron Murphy as a first round pick at all. And I've been high on him forever. I just, I love his game and I love what he does from the interior of a defensive line. He would have been that guy, but I can't call him a sleeper anymore because he's going to be the first Texas player selected more than likely. So, mm -hmm. man, I'll go with, that's tough. Like, I, it's tough to call any of these guys sleepers. I mean, T Sweat could be in that mix because we know how good he is. I'll go with JT Sanders, yeah. right? Like, I, I don't think Sanders is going to be a first round pick. But I think he's really good. And we've seen young tight ends, plural, come into this league and have immediate success. We get a guy like Sam Laporta this past season. Hell, there were three or four tight ends who took the league by storm this year. Kincaid and Buffalo, another guy. Uh, yeah, Jatavion Sanders might be cheating a little bit, but it feels like he's a second, maybe a third round pick right now in some of these mock drafts. I, I still think that guy is a, a total weapon. And a matchup nightmare, so I'll go with him. And I like that pick of Sanders because Sanders is that brand-new tight end that we talk about. I mean, you, you can go down the list. Uh, I've talked about it so many different times, whether it be on high school football broadcast or here uh, on Chaos Theory on uh, Texas Sports Unfiltered to where it's like uh, the tight end now is a very different tight end than it was even 10 years ago. I mean, it, it's an athlete capable of doing so many different things, and, and I said it a bunch. Underutilized, it seemed like, here at UT – but I think that's something if he does kind of slip and fall into one of those spots, I mean, he can, I mean, he can do some really good things. And again, probably going to fall into a good situation where he's going to, he's going to be given everything that he needs to, to be on a winning club happening right off the bat. As soon as he's yep. drafted. I'm with you. All right. Before we get to where are we at in society today, even though Trey's not here, we still have to get to that segment. Uh, quick shout out to our friends at Covert Bee Cave. Matter of fact, we'll let you see some of our great friends at Covert Bee Cave. Hi, I'm Dan Covert with my wife, Hayden. Welcome to Covert Bee Cave. Our newest location in the gorgeous hill country includes Buick, GMC, Cadillac, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram, and hundreds of pre-owned and certified vehicles for you to choose from. We have three service departments that are ready to take care of your car, truck, or SUV with 86 service bays to accommodate any repair and get you in and out quickly. Come visit us today to select the vehicle you've been dreaming about. Covert, born and raised in Austin. Oh, yeah. Love the Coverts. Love Dan, love Hayden, love the entire team out at Covert Bee Cave. We also love our guy, Steve, a.k.a. Cooter, at Pest Wrangler. Hey, it's Steve from Pest Wranglers, and I don't know of a single mosquito that owns a home with a backyard, but they sure like to hang out in your yard and make you miserable. Pest Wranglers can fix that for you. Our mosquito treatments are designed to kill adult mosquitoes as well as keep mosquito larvae from developing for up to three weeks. Use us all summer or just once before that big party. No contract, no hassles, no blood-sucking mosquitoes. Check out our reviews and see what others are saying about Pest Wranglers. Pest Wranglers, effective, reliable, affordable. Online at PestWranglers.com. Where are we at in society today? All right, Double R. I've got right. to, two things to show you for where are we at in society today. Uh, one of them is a meme that I think you'll find funny. And the other one is something happening at the NBA All-Star Game, which apparently is this weekend. Did you know that? All I know this weekend is Daytona 500. But yeah. but they're, they're always on the same weekend. So, so, yes. Yes, I did know that. I did know that. Okay, well, that, uh, that makes one of us. Yeah, I knew Daytona was this weekend. I did not know <laughs> the NBA All-Star game is this weekend. I don't even know where the game is being played. It's be a shootout. I bet it's going to be a shootout, BK. I bet it's going to be high scoring. I bet there's going to be no defense. Same old shit as always, I'm sure. Is mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. Apparently, the game is in Indianapolis this year, so great. Make your, make your plans now. No, um, and it's East-West. They're going back to the East versus West format. They're getting rid of the fantasy draft bit that they've gone God, that with, was stupid with yeah. the last couple of years. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't care too much either way. But anyways, we'll get to that in a second. First, a screen share of a meme where a woman posted some love to her longtime spouse of 20 years on okay. social media. Okay. And uh, I want you to give me your thoughts on this. The caption reads, 20 years of marriage. He never raised his voice on me. He's so caring and loving. <laughs> I don't think that um, I don't think that I would say an ill word to that person whatsoever. <laughs> Look at that. Is that that looks like fucking Hulk Hogan. Is that Hulk Hogan on the right side? My God, that. Um, 
man, that is one monstrous, uh, nice lady right there. Holy shit. shit. She is yoked, dude. Man, that, um, my God. That like that almost looks photoshopped, but it's it, not. But it, it really looks does. Like it. I mean, look at that. That is that that is full muscle. I mean, I would even question if you know if it was a lady, but apparently she has breasts. Um, so yeah, that looks like a real deal. And and that poor sucker sitting right next to her, he's, he's she's like, You stand there, you just stand there, don't say yeah. shit, you don't say <laughs> anything. Yeah, I see why he's never raised his voice on her at all. I mean, I almost feel like we need the Austin Powers. That's a man, man, kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm not no sure doubt. if it is or not. So man, that yeah. um, look at those guns. Look I'm telling you, guns. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that thing with a ten foot pole unless it threatened to kick my ass. Then I'd be a little nervous. I guess I'd yeah. have to. Yeah, no, I, I would definitely be uh, when it's like when I'm told to do something. I'm like, yeah. What time, where, when, uh, how? I ain't raising yep. no shit with her because I don't want no odds problems. Are, odds are she might uh, she might be on PEDs, so that's going to make it even worse. Uh, it's definitely know. PEDs right there. That is, there's a lot of enhancements going on with Whoa. that thing. Yeah, terrifying. That's a lot, that's a lot of. Work. All right, now the uh, the NBA All Star game. So this this could be the future of basketball. No. This is apparently what the court is going to look like on Sunday at the All-Star Game in Indianapolis. Like, during the game, the court is going to be, like, changing logos, and apparently... The court's going to display replays on the court in real time. And it's also going to show stats on the floor in real time. You're going to get some sponsors on there as well. Speaking of NASCAR, I mean, how about that? The court itself it's going like has like moving videos on it. How insane is that? Dude, I'd rather go play at TCU on that ugly ass <laughs> piece of shit of a court. Oh, man. it You know, the part of... Again, I, I've gotten back into NBA. I've gotten back into NBA to, to, to follow this stuff, to, to be in the know with what we're doing. But part of part of my disdain for the NBA is shit like that. It's like you you see that kind of stuff, and it's like it's a concert. It's a, it's a whatever. And I'm like, man, I don't care about that. I want to watch basketball. How are these guys going to be able to? I mean, I, I guess it really doesn't matter. I mean, we're 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 still on the whole premise here that this is going to be a constructed strategy basketball game to where strategy would actually count for something. But for what we're going to get in that game, that that only fits perfect with that. That that's ridiculous. But you know what? It, 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 I get. It. What are the dignitaries that are going to be there? What, what I don't know what the entertainment's going to be for this thing. Yeah, I don't either, but I wonder if this is like the future of basketball. Like, is the NBA testing this? And if it works out, are they going to make this on every floor across the association? Like, oh. is that not distracting to the players, too, with all these graphics and replays and stats showing up? Like, will they still be able to see where the... Yeah, it, it would have to be. It's like you're dribbling down the court, and then you look up, and there's somebody's fucking stats. I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute here. Yeah. yeah, that 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 is a huge distraction. Changing colors, doing all this stuff. Uh, what, what's this right here? Longhorn Bear is asking. Uh, I love this. How the uh, how the hell do you see the three point line and half court yeah. line? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the other part right there. It's like, because is it's, that it's a the, real? It's, that's a real thing. It's the floor itself. Yeah, it's the it's NBA's new interactive LED glass court. So it's not like TV cameras that are throwing shit on like you sometimes. You know, you know, watch a game on Ballet Sports yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. You'll see like logos and stuff superimposed on the court, or the shot clock will be superimposed on the court. Now, this is actually the court itself. You know, I was watching a football game a while back with a friend, and you know, not not very well versed in football. And Ed, dude, had a long run, and he's like, "How did he not trip over that yellow line?" I said, "The yellow line really isn't there." I said, "That's <laughs> there. For, that's there, that's there for TV. That that's not really yeah. there." But Man, that's a lot. All these lights and it, pyrotechnics and all this shit. And, and just wait. I'll tell you the fun part of this. Here's what I hope happens. I hope something goes wrong. I hope like mm. uh, the, the lights go out and, uh, you know, all this other. Uh, and now, now that would be fun. 
that would make it entertaining to me if something went wrong there. Yeah, Not that I'm trying to be, you know, Mr. You know, Debbie download, but um, yeah, I'd like to see something go wrong there. I mean, what happens if somebody gets hurt on that court? You know, like that's that's the end of it right there. And I think they've done courts like this at the FIBA level. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if somebody gets hurt in the all-star game, that's already a problem. But if someone, yeah, trips up on that court, you know, we, we will never see anything like that again. So Yeah, yeah. Oh. I don't want that to happen, but I also don't want that court to be a thing moving forward. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, no so doubt. Something to, something to look out for on Sunday. I want to get Zay's thoughts on this. Yeah, that, that, that's the one to ask. That's the one to ask. All right, Zay, have you seen the uh, the LED glass court coming to the All-Star game this weekend? Have you seen this, either of y'all? Yeah, I saw it. Does it look better than TCU's floor? Did y'all play on that at Bowie? Hell no. <laughs> Let me tell you all, here's a little video, Chip. This is uh, the NBA All-Star Games this Sunday in Indy. And here's what the court is going to look like. Yeah, so basically, LED glass court that will display replays and stats in real time during the game. While yeah. dudes are playing? While dudes yeah. are playing. They're not going to know where the out-of-bounds line is. That's We're trying Who to figure cares? that out, too. It's the All-Star game. Doesn't matter, right? Yeah, it don't matter. They don't play hard for the All-Star game. The All-Star game is so weak. It's an and you one know. tape. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Like back in the day with Mike and Olajuwon and all those greats in the 90s, those dudes played hard, man. Like it was physical. It was tough to get buckets. And now all these guys are worth so much money, kind of like what we saw with the Pro Bowl a couple of weeks ago that they just water it down because nobody's really trying to play or get hurt or anything, which I get. But also, come on now, like just give the fans what they want to see. Yeah. We're not uh, we're not worried about this being a tester for the NBA. Like, ah, oh, if this goes well and the fans like it, maybe we put it on every court in the na in the nation. Do you well, imagine? It, that's too Chip, much, man. I Chip, agree. Chip, that's what I said. I'm like, man, I'd rather go play at TCU. Shit. Yeah. Suddenly, right? TCU's floor looks dreamy. Yeah. Yo, I like TC uh, TCU's floor. They got the red three point line for the. Hog frog eyes. I like the that. Blood, it's different. The blood. Yeah, right. yeah. It, it's well, different. That's uh that's a first. Um <laughs> you like it better than Oregon sport? Hell yeah. Play on the blue yeah. field. Yeah. There's there's TCU. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing Look wrong with that. Frog yeah, scale. Be... Or the yeah. It looks yeah, like a I don't understand. Huh? Where's the knock? Why are we hating on TCU's court? Is it I like it. All, all those little like scales everywhere. Oh. Yeah, it's TCU, man. They're not going to be perfect. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Looks I'm like get concrete. off the lawn guy. Looks like concrete. Looks like playing out on the uh, on the school ground right there. Kind of the concrete feel to that shit. Yeah, it takes Am you I back to the roots. Now that looks like we're all going into a vortex. Yeah, what in the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> that I feel like I'm getting sucked into like that Fanville commercial. You're that, going into the portal. Yeah, that that looks like shit stained underwear right there. Yeah, that's, that, oh. that, is that duck shit? <laughs> like oh. splattered? Is that what that's supposed to be? Like Whoa. that's just, that's tidy wow. waddies with shit stains right Whoa. there. Yeah, yeah. When, when and I they think got God, like a new, they got a new arena these last few years. They used to have like the old pit what they called it back in the Luke Rittenhauer days. And that place was jumping. That was a tough place to play. It just yep. got outdated. But yep. yeah, what they tried to do with the new stuff, nah. Come on, Phil. Walton loves everything to do oh, with yeah, the I Conference guess. of Champions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what's, Doesn't matter. What's going to happen to Bill Walton after this year when he's, the Pac-12 goes away? We're gonna have to do a wellness check like mm -hmm. every week. On yeah. Bill Man, I'm gonna miss. I'm gonna miss him. We need him on games. That's right. Yeah. I don't know where he's gonna end up. They Just they should him. throw him. Bring him on in the Big Ten. 
you know, with all those other schools that are going, UCLA, yep. USC, Oregon, Washington, let him jump in the Big Ten because he was a UCLA but, guy. He'll be but weird only, still. only when they come to California. Correct. Yeah. Or Correct. to the West Coast. Yeah. 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 I, I think he just do Oregon, West Washington, USC, he'd UCLA. Freak out in Assembly Hall. He'd probably like get the hives. Oh, yeah. He'd have a panic Bulls. attack. <laughs> yeah. Fall over. Need CPR. Uh, it doesn't feel like the conference of <laughs> champion. <laughs> yeah, every single game he calls, he's going to be complaining about the Pac-12 not existing anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> be calling it the Pac-12. The Pac-12, Pac-12 basketball. Shit, dude, that that's gone. <laughs> how, how did the conference of champions end up in Champagne Urbana? <laughs> <laughs> uh, shoot. All right, that's fellas. Awesome. We'll uh, we'll get out of y'all's hair. Y'all have a great show. See you later. Yeah, boys, Double Cheers. R, Good job, day. fellas. Good job. Yeah. Hey, in the immortal words of Judy Brown, happiness is a choice, and we're happy you're spending some time with us. Chip and Zay holding it down middays right here on Texas Sports Unfiltered. Set an alarm in your phone for one o'clock. Of course, you know that's just the easiest way to remember that your friends Chip and Zay are here to talk a little sport with you to, to come is, you know, we're, uh, Zay and I are both texting each other because of course football season never ends here on Chip and Zay and Amon Ross St. Brown is apparently in discussions with the Detroit Lions on a three-year contract extension that would pay him 25 million a year. And Zay, this is exactly where we thought he would end up. Yep. So yeah, we called it. You know, they, and we and we also said they better jump on it now before is, agency, uh, right. is uh, yeah. We, and they're doing that. They're they're jumping on it now. They know they're not dumb. Maybe they've been listening, Chip. Maybe, maybe. they've been listening. You know, come on, so man. Just I mean, everybody's listening. I mean, yeah. it's it's going crazy. People are loving on Texas Sports Unfiltered, the app, uh, the YouTube channel. But Amon Ross St. Brown, you know, friend of the show. We like to call him a friend of the show. We'll get him on eventually, off season. The Sun God. We talked to his pops on Wednesdays, and this news popped right after John Brown made his appearance on the show yesterday. He was. He was cranked up yesterday. It was, it was, was epic. Great. It was epic. If you missed that show, make sure you check it out uh, on the podcast, wherever you listen to your podcast. While you're at it, feel free to give us a five star review. Maybe, you know, just uh, helps with the bosses and whatnot. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this Texas Sports Unfiltered YouTube channel. And of course, if you're making your bets. Go to BetUS right there, that link right there on the Texas Sports Unfiltered YouTube page. And if you're listening on the app, go to Explore Our Socials, and it'll take you right to the BetUS app. And uh, you'll you'll be glad you did get all kinds of promotional bets where you're, you know, betting a little with a chance to win a lot. They'll give you incentives to, to bet with them. It's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, Zay, we had, uh, we had, um, a chance to talk to Rodney Terry and Dylan DeZu right before we came on the air. And, you know, before we talk to our man, Lance Taylor at one we'll also talk to Glenn Stretch Smith about the Cowboys hiring Mike Zimmer, get, get Stretch, former Cowboys offensive assistant coach. Um, get his thoughts on the Super Bowl, uh, get LT's thoughts on the Super Bowl. But you got Texas going to Houston on Saturday. But really, Dylan DeZoo, I mean, we need to talk about Dylan DeZoo because last three halves, he's been freaking amazing. 17 points in the final eight minutes of the Iowa State game. He dragged them back from an 18 point deficit, cut it to three. Uh, they couldn't quite um, get over the hump, 
But then he comes in against West Virginia, hits his first eight shots, including his first six three-point shots. And what we're seeing now from the ATX product is alpha. Alpha. I mean, this is what we saw from Zake Hollier back in the day at Bowie High School. Huge, man. Huh? One every 20 games, maybe. I wish I had the talent that Dylan DeSue has, but when are we getting CC yeah. on the show? Uh, well, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to him after the show. I'm after the show. I'm gonna talk to him. We'll see if we get him tomorrow. Tomorrow, I just, right. saw, him. I just saw him yesterday. I don't know why I didn't talk to him about it. We were at my niece's soccer game, but I don't uh, know if I did something to no, piss him off. Or... No, no, you're good. <laughs> I think we're. I think we're playing golf together in the mullet open. Yeah, man. Yeah. So I want to get to know my my golf partner, you know? Yeah, I feel you. Yeah, we'll definitely have him on. But, yeah, I wish I had the talent Dylan DeSue has. I mean, you're right. He's turning into the alpha. I think he's embracing being the top guy on this team as a leader. I mean, we know what Max Aismas brings to the table, but Max Aismas, he just got here. Like, this is – he's going to be in the ATX for nine months. So, Dylan DeSue, like, he's born here. You know, he reps just everything that Texas brings to the table. Like, he bleeds burn orange. And you can see that with the enthusiasm he plays with like when he took Emmanuel Miller in Fort Worth against TCU off the dribble and dunked on them and then just like yelled into the crowd and sucked the life out of all of those Horn Frog fans like that's what Texas needs we've been looking for that chip and if you go back to the time when he wasn't playing go watch him on the bench like Dylan DeSue is an extra coach out there trying to get his guys going, giving his guys advice, being there, you know. You'll see him bark at some of the players on the team throughout the game if, you know, some of them might slip up. He'll hold you accountable. And I appreciate that with Dylan DeSue because his play is backing it up. And there's not one shot that he can't make. When his three is hitting, that changes everything for this Texas basketball team. Everything. Because we know he has a good push shot, a little floater. We know his inside game is solid. His mid-range is solid. The three-point shot, now that we're seeing it at a more consistent rate, and now you got to go out on them. Like, big men, they don't want to do that, especially at the college level. You know, it's very few big men around the nation that want to guard another center on the perimeter that has the ability to knock down that outside shot, but also beat you off the dribble and make plays happen for his teammates, you know? So he's a mismatch nightmare. And when him and Max Aismas get in that two man game and pick and roll, and you got to worry about Aismas coming off that screen and knocking down the shot or getting to the cup, or you got to worry about Dylan DeSue. Sometimes he'll roll. Sometimes he'll pick and pop. Like that's good action there. That's a lot to worry about for a defense that puts a lot of pressure on these opposing teams. So, yeah, Dylan DeSue, he's got to keep it rolling. Like, I think he understands that, hey, whatever shot I shoot isn't a bad shot. Like, Max Aismas, he's always had that mindset. That's why he's a top 20 scorer in the nation. But now Dylan DeSue, he has that confidence. His legs are completely under him. He knows he's not on no minutes restriction. You know, I think he's comfortable with not thinking about the injuries that he had in the March Madness tournament with the foot because that could be a mind month too, Chip. You know that. Some guys, mentally, they might not be there, even though physically they are. And well, I think that, you have to deal with that a little bit. That's what I found interesting today, Rodney Terry saying that, that Dylan DeZu, they don't put him through everything in practice. Like he's not in on every rep. They're managing him in practice, not in games. And – RT said that that might be why, you know, sometimes he'd get off to a slow start. But when he jumped him at the Iowa State game at halftime and said, you're not being aggressive enough. The guy just turned it on and then he turned it on from the beginning against West Virginia. And I'm fascinated to see, OK, you're going up against the best defensive team in college basketball in Houston on Saturday, in Houston. And can Dylan DeZue keep this going? Because that matchup 
that's a tough, tougher matchup for sure. Yeah, I mean, you've got guys like Roberts and Francis. You know, those dudes are just so physical, and they do such a good job at moving their feet as big. So it's a little bit more difficult than, you know, some of the guys that he's played, Jesse Edwards with West Virginia and such. Um, and then just their team defense for the Cougars is immaculate. Like Kelvin Sampson, all those guys play so hard, and they're so athletic and physical. It's hard to get buckets. So – yeah, I think that if Tyrese Hunter plays how he did against West Virginia, like just be aggressive. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes yeah. you're going to struggle, but if you're aggressive and attacking with the attention that Max Acemas and DeSue get, you know, the team's better off. Same with Dylan Mitchell. You know, he was really aggressive uh, this against West Virginia, cutting to the basket at the right times and taking it to the hole, putting in his predominant left hand. And Kendall Weaver, you don't even have to say nothing about him. You know what you're going to get, an absolute junkyard dog. So, yeah, I I mean, it shouldn't have taken the Iowa State game for Rodney Terry to jump Dylan DeSue. Like, he should know, bro, you got the green light. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're, we need you to go for at least 20 a game for us to have a chance in the Big 12 and once March Madness comes around. So if he can take that mindset and know you're not going to come out when you take bad shots, really nothing's a bad shot for you. If the guy's close to you, you can shoot over him because you're 6'9", six, 6'10". Six, like, that's the luxury that you have. That's Dirk Nowinski. Like, that's the luxury that you have of being a very tall player and having that touch. You could shoot over a lot of guys. So for other guys that might be bad shots, for the suit, it's not. So, yeah, he, got, he has to keep playing with that aggression. And, again, I know it's West Virginia, but if the Horns play with that enthusiasm, they play with that heart and that toughness, like we've seen multiple times this season against the Cougars, which they – put them in the overtime here at the mood. Like you can play with these guys, get, go get you an upset and let the committee know, okay, we don't got to worry about Texas. No more they in. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Texas is, is, uh, is fighting. Um, yeah. Look at this. So it was a Jason. Jason doesn't like the Colorado state basketball court. Hmm. A longhorn know. bear. Longhorn bear. Yeah, we do a bootleg around here. Uh, okay. If, if you're watching on the YouTube channel. Yo, I, I dig that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I don't See, but that, that's the thing. It might look different on a screen like we're seeing now than it does on TV. You know? Because I can't stand Baylor's setup. With their new gym, I can't stand that where you're just looking down on guys like this. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> I, you know, that's just yeah. – it, it might be one of those where the camera makes the court look weirder than it should. I don't know. But the way it looked like up top just now, yo, that's a dope court if you ask me. But the yeah, I'm going to have to – I think I'm going to have to go to the Baylor game on March 4th. I need to see this new – arena because they they kind of patterned it after fog allen field house a little smaller version of it where everything is just stacked right on the court they even have the little airplane hanger windows up there um but yeah they got to figure out the camera angle in that in that arena because that's what you're talking about right yep that's exactly what i'm talking about that the camera angle for television in the new, what is it? The Foster Center. Um, it's it's steep. It's steep. <laughs> yeah, we gotta figure that out. Yeah, we gotta figure that out. Yeah, that's not a good look. Not a good look at all. But um, yeah, anything else, Coach Terry say? Dylan Dessou say that stick out. I, I I find it interesting too that he's not doing practice stuff, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know. Um, well. I, I wanted to ask you because it's one thing for a coach to say, be aggressive. It's another thing for a player to just be able to turn it on like Dylan DeZoo has. Like we saw this in the NCAA tournament. We saw this in the postseason last year. The guy 
just got locked in. It looks like he's entering that zone again. And this time after a serious foot surgery, a serious rehab of that foot surgery that involved him shooting from a chair from, you know, the charge circle, he'd make 50 there. Then he'd go halfway to the free throw line, make 50 there and keep going back. And he did this from um, April to August where he's, he, he said his goal was to make 300 shots a day from that chair, from the charge circle on back, angles, bank shots. Um, so, you know, Rodney Terry said, look, you put in all that work. We trust your shot. Be aggressive. Don't turn down that three-pointer early in the shot clock because it might be the best shot we get. That's what he told him against Iowa State. And Iowa State's defense was definitely a problem. But then when DeZoo came out in the second half, he took over, scores 17 points in an eight-minute span, gets them back from an 18-point deficit to three. And, and then there's, you know, a turnover that he did not commit that uh, that hurt them. But, um, yeah, this we now know. You can count on Max Asmus. You can count on Dylan DeZu. I think you can count on Kendall Weaver. You know you're going to get nonstop perimeter defense. You may you're going to get a guy attacking the rim, hopefully finishing, but probably going to the free throw line. But you're going to get offensive rebounds. The guy who you really need to be able to count on, and he's getting closer over the last four games, is Dylan Mitchell. For sure. He's averaging almost a double-double. He's averaging 8.6 points um, and 8.5 rebounds the last four games. And he needs to stay aggressive, too, because his he's got that little hook shot. You know, I mean, he's got to be a difference maker for this Texas team to not be a bubble NCAA tournament team. Yeah. And with him, like he plays hard. He's been showing that athleticism, especially with his defense, like that breakaway steal where he did a signature dunk jumping off the left foot with the left hand windmill. That is so ridiculous, man. Like the slam dunk contest is coming up this weekend. And I know people have seen that before, but when Dylan Mitchell makes it to the NBA, don't be surprised if he's in like the 2028 slam dunk contest or 2027 slam dunk contest or some shit. Like he is that bouncy. And I just think it's the dumb things that he does that you're like, dude, what the hell was that? Like dribbling the half court, just picking up your uh. dribble and getting trapped and then turning the ball over. Like he's done that a couple of times these last few weeks. Or the question that you asked Roddy Terry after the Iowa State game where he bit on the pump fake and with his athleticism and length, instead of just staying on the ground and using that, he jumps and then it allows the offensive player to lean into him and get the foul and go to the free throw line. You know, it's those things are getting beat back door because he's ball watching and then his man just like hits him from behind. Like that's one of those things that's that happens too much. And if he can limit all those just dumb mistakes, then he'll be fine. But that's yeah, he's been a lot better. You know, just stay aggressive, attack the rim when guys drive and, you know, move without the ball, cut when Max Acemas picks up his dribble when he drives because Max Acemas is a really good passer, man. Like, it's so easy to talk about Max Acemas scoring, but he finds the right man majority of the time. And that just came with being a point guard his whole life. Like, he's a scoring point, but he makes the right decision when guys are cutting. Like, he's – especially now. Like, again, those guys with the transfer portal, you're still figuring stuff out as a coach on which guys play together the best, like which matchups can we take advantage of on each possession due to the talent and personnel that we have on the court. Like Rodney Terry and the coaching staff, they're still figuring all that shit out game by game. So is everybody else in the country. But 
Max Aismas figuring out his teammates and where they like the ball, that's getting better and better game by game. And if you're Kendall Weaver and Dylan Mitchell, guys that don't rely on the outside shot, you got to play off other guys and be ready to cut, which Kendall Weaver's done an excellent job at that as of late, and Dylan Mitchell has gotten a lot better. They got to continue that if the Horns want to have success. Well, Texas is now 18th in adjusted offensive efficiency which is awesome. Like, I don't think many fans realize that. And the teams that are top 20 in both offensive, adjusted offensive efficiency and adjusted defensive efficiency are the teams that are competing for the Final Four. Texas was 13th and 15th last year. Now, their adjusted defensive efficiency is 56th. And that's that's where they've got to, they got to be better. Dylan Mitchell's got to be better. Everybody's got to be better. Everybody's got to hit the boards a little harder and limit these, you know, second chance points and, um, you know, be a better rebounding team. I mean, watch Houston hit the glass. Yeah. That, that, that's the biggest knock. Like rebounding, that, that still has to get a little bit better. Against Iowa State. Like against if Kendall Weaver State. can do it, and he does it every game, Hell, he had seven rebounds against Iowa State, five of them on the offensive end. It, I mean, come on, you know? Like, I, I think teams, opposing teams, I think they're sending like four to five guys at a time. Like, Taman Lipsy's the point guard for Iowa State. He was crashing the boards like Dennis freaking Rodman. You know, that's not normal things. That's understanding that, okay, Max Aismas, are you going to box me out every play? You know, like Max Aismas, he's a smaller guy. He's trying to be healthy for March. So sometimes you got to make a business decision on if I want to take this contact and try to box a guy out that's going full speed to the rim, or if I just kind of get a body on him but not enough to really hurt myself. Like, you you got to be very strategical about how you go for rebounds. And Max Aceman has gotten better crashing the glass, but he's one of those guys to where he wants to crash without getting the body on anyone because he's a guard. You know, when you have Dylan DeSue, he's trying to clear guys out so those other guys could jump on the boards, like a Kendall Weaver, like a Tyrese Hunter. But those guys are still small. As tough as Kendall Weaver is, he's 6'2". As tough as Tyrese Hunter is, he's six foot. Max Aismas might be 5'10", 5'11". So those are your three guards that you'll die with right now if you're Rodney well, Terry. That's tough. How about this? How about this? Against West Virginia, okay? This was blowout city, 94 to 58. Dylan DeZoo had one rebound. Aismas had six. Hunter had five. Kendall Weaver had six. Dylan Mitchell had eight. And Brock had four. So as good as Dylan DeZue was, 10 of 16 shooting, 7 of 10 from three, my man got one rebound. I, that's unacceptable. I understand that. But again, Dylan DeZue is battling with these centers. So if the game plan is, okay, guys, I'm going to clear these guys out. But when I'm clearing them out, I don't have time to all clear them out and jump for the ball. That's very difficult to do. Like, only guys like Wes Unseld and shit like that did it on the elite level. Like, Rodman, some of the best rebounds of all time. So, those other guards, they could crash the boards and jump on those boards, man, because it's a clear lane. Everybody's out the way because the big men are doing their thing. All right, we bring in Lance Taylor. The Lance Taylor on social media, lanceslock.com, where you go for the picks from the man. And Lance, I don't want to bring up your Super Bowl record, <laughs> but I'm going to bring up your Super Bowl record. You did not listen to me. I know. It's it's uncanny. I, I You know, first of all, a couple of things. It's tough to bet against Patrick Mahomes. Now I've lost nine consecutive sides on the Super Bowl. I am four and 18 over my last 22. I did have San Francisco. I had some other props that came through. I had the under in the game, which it went off at 47. I saw that. 
We got the under there, uh, but Mahomes is 4-0 against San Francisco in all three of his Super Bowl championships. He's trailed by double digits. He's been able to come back and win these games. On the other side, Kyle Shanahan. I even said he was a better play caller than my man, Sean McVay. But I just think the moment, it might too, be too big for Shanahan. Why did he mm. stop running the ball in the third quarter? Yeah, even on like the last two, like – uh, what was the final possession of the of the um, in regulation? regulation? Third and four. Give the ball to Ma- uh, McCaffrey. Uh, yeah. third, third down uh, when they ended up kicking the field goal in overtime. Give the ball to McCaffrey. I, I just I'm with you. I know it's easy to play armchair quarterback in these situations, but McCaffrey's your best player riding. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the moment, I was like, why are they throwing it all the time? Like this is. He had three possessions in the third quarter. It was three and out central. What, six passes, two runs? I mean, I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. Yeah. Dude. I, uh, and, and I don't know. I mean, maybe it's me. Like, maybe if I would have bet on Kansas City, San Francisco wins this. Game. <laughs> How does Kansas City have five fumbles and they only lose one of them? I just, uh, you know, I mean, Jake Moody gets um, an extra point blocked. Harrison Butker drills the longest field goal in Super Bowl history of 57 yard. I mean, it's just like everything went the right way. And, you know, and we've seen the fallout now. Steve Wilkes uh, was fired yesterday. And those defense played great in the Super Bowl. Yeah, what? It's so dumb. I mean, think about it like this. If, if for whatever reason, a ball gets tipped on that final possession, or if Kansas City just doesn't pick up the fourth and one you know, on the read option. If they don't pick that up, Steve Wilkes still got a job. Like, oh, yeah. I, I just – and when you start to look at the numbers, like they led the NFL in interceptions. They were third in total turnovers. They were third in points per game, only giving up one more point than D'Amico's uh, unit last year. Look, and I do I, – I will say this. I think if D'Amico Rines was your defensive coordinator on Sunday, I don't think Kansas City scores on the final four possessions. But – if you're Kyle Shanahan, you got to be accountable for how they blundered overtime altogether. And I'll admit, I forgot the rule change. So when it went to overtime, I was pulling for Sam Fran to win the coin toss, to go down, get a touchdown. I thought the game would be over. And then in the middle of action, I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, I don't remember this. And then it started to seep in. But I don't think Kyle Shanahan remembered. Yeah. Well, and that's that's – the very odd thing because you hear on the Kansas City side, like that's all they talked about. It makes it seem like Chris Jones said, they, damn, we've talked about this so much. Like, are y'all serious? This is a lot. And then you hear Harvard grad Kyle Juszczyk out here saying he don't know the rules. That's how you know there's yeah. a huge disconnect there, Lance. And that's one of those. And I said this, you know, Monday, and I was thinking about this Sunday night, like, You've got to have every scenario planned out and whether and and whether he was going to defer or not or take the ball, whatever he was going to do. But like if you whip Kansas City in the first half and then Kansas City plays like they do in the second half, what is your plan in overtime? If you get dominated in the first half, but you dominate in the second half and take it overtime, what's your plan? Like it shouldn't have been a spontaneous like there's got to be some gut that plays into it. But it's almost like you've got a note card and you're like. I know exactly what we're doing in this scenario. And it it seemed like they played this like you would play it in the regular season. You win the toss, you take the ball. And in this scenario, this new format, to me, you just can't take the ball there. Yeah. Well, and, and I get his rationale that he wanted the ball first so that if they end up tied after each possession, they get the ball first in sudden death. But why do you put that mentality? Like, my mentality is we're going to end this in this first overtime. And even Kansas City said this. Like, we were prepared. If they scored, we were going for two for the walk. Yeah. And I almost think you got to do that if you're San Francisco. Like, that's why they get the field goal. We know we've got to score a touchdown. Uh, Worst case, we'll go to a double overtime. Um, They get the touchdown. We're going for two. Yeah. 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 Man. Kyle Stanahan. I mean, it's about running the football. The Falcons, if he runs the ball, they win. He could have taken a knee. I mean, I don't if get he it. Runs the ball in the fourth quarter four years ago with Garoppolo. They win that game. Yeah. yeah. Here, can mm. I flip this around on you because I see your Detroit Lions hat. And I <laughs> we had a Lions fan in our chat today saying that they have gone up like 
400% on their season tickets. And Chris Del Conte seems like a really good businessman, but you're rolling into the SEC and you're going to drop season ticket prices when you've got Georgia coming to town? Like, I don't get this. Like, a win for me is you release a statement. We love the direction of this program. Uh, we love what Sarkeesian was able to do in year three. We're going into the SEC. We're excited about these home games. But what we're not going to do is go up in season ticket prices. To go backwards? Help me out here. That's not a yeah, good thing. I mean, it's like five bucks. And they get an extra <laughs> home. They get an extra home game. So it kind of equals out. It's it's more optics than anything. Because if you really look at the ticket price drop, it's literally like five bucks. And I was but, told this, like, I can't tell watching a home game in Austin, like all of the time. Like, are they really having a problem filling up that stadium? No. Okay. Not, I didn't think so. Like, I wouldn't think so. I mean, it's a good fact. Problem. Get this power move. So they had a waiting list of 3,577 for season tickets. And Del Conte tracked down 4,102 season tickets that were being sold to brokers. And reclaimed them, took them back and is selling them to fans so that they're not getting gouged, which I got to imagine there's going to be, there could be some legal action on that end of it, but yeah, it's my tickets. Like if that's not, yeah, Del Conte is rolling the dice here because if that is not in fine print, you, you do have, uh, you got some litigious people out there that are in, you talk about like a class action, on that, that'll be interesting to see how that thing plays out because we had the discussion today um, and I forgot, I guess it was Texas related about if you want to flip your tickets, like, do you have a problem with doing that? Like, if I pay for my tickets and I want to sell them to an Oklahoma fan or an Arkansas fan, to me, that's my prerogative. People might not like it, but if I'm paying my hard earned money and I want to flip it on the secondary market, that's that's just capitalism. Yeah, no, you can do that. You can do that. Now, Steve Patterson, when he was the AD, he said, we're going to track you down. And if you're selling your tickets to the opposing team, you may not have those tickets next year. Patterson also took away the professor's season tickets. I mean, he was just like, how can I get everyone to hate me as quickly as possible? So now that'll be fascinating to see how that plays out. I still don't understand the logic of going backwards when you've got a better uh, schedule that you're going to be playing. I know this this year's and by the way, looking at Texas schedule, that's a beneficial schedule. First year in the SEC, like you get by Michigan on the road, things really open up. Yeah, right. Because you're getting Georgia and Florida at home. You're you're at A and M, Arkansas. Those are rivalries, but those programs are in flux. Um. Arkansas almost fired its coach. AM did fire its coach. Um, oh, you guys know Dylan Gabriel? Yeah, OU's going to get roll the dice with Jackson Arnold. Um, yeah, I mean, he must be good. I mean, if Gabriel bounces to Oregon, I know that's a pretty good situation too. I see Jason in y'all's uh, chat room saying that I haven't seen the stadium during North Texas, Louisiana, Monroe. But I'll say this, Alabama has some of those home games. And Alabama, in a coaching change, going from the greatest ever – to Kalen DeBoer, they've raised their prices again. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Del Conte was also talking about him wanting a lot of fans to put in for NIL. So I don't know if that's a part of it. Like, all right, well, we're going to lower these ticket prices a little bit. So the money that y'all are saving, y'all put to the NIL fund. But Zay, is a better way not to do this? to say, hey, look, we're raising tickets $10 across the board per game, but your $10 is going to our collective. And we're going to show you by raising $10, it's going to equate to this dollar amount that will go straight to the athletes. And to me, instead of taking a $5 cut and asking me to re-up for the collective, I'd rather it just be clean cut, turnkey. Um, here, yeah, you took me up 10 bucks, but I know it's going to the collective, and now you don't have to hit me up. Yeah, he's not he's not there yet because and you know this Lance, it's a slippery slope for an AD with the collective because that's money that goes to the foundation for facility upgrades and now there's competition, money going to the collective to help with NIL opportunity for student athletes and you know, I know 
Del Conte is thanking his, I mean, he's thankful that he got 750 million in facility upgrades done in five years before NIL really showed up because he's got pretty much all the heavy lifting done from a facilities upgrade standpoint. They're doing a new football practice facility that'll be done in the spring of 2025. Uh, and then he's pretty clear of all the major hurdles. But I mean, I, he I, did. I, I'm not worried about you. Um, like, I feel like you guys were pretty secure financially. And now you're rolling into a league that just cut up even Vanderbilt, $51 million, Mississippi State, $51 million, Missouri, $51 million. So I think Del Conte probably looks at this and it, it probably is good PR. We're going backwards. We're probably the only major, probably the only team that's been in a college football playoff that's ever gone backwards on their season tickets. So look, well, I don't think anybody's going to worry about the financial state that the Texas athletic programs in. Well, they were not the biggest spenders in NIL. That's for sure. That would have been Ole Miss, Ohio State, Oregon. I mean, Missouri, like they, all those programs emptied the vault to get players. I mean, Caleb Downs goes to Ohio State. Yeah, he got, I mean, from what I hear, he got seven figures, whether or not that's, and I heard that Alabama said, look, there's no, there's nothing we won't match. And Caleb said, look, I wanted to play for Saban and, you know, I want to take it and go elsewhere. And he decided to do that. And I think you're going to see more and more of that. There's not going to be, and, and for Caleb, it wasn't about money. So, you know, this is probably a bad example, but I think you're going to see a lot less loyalty moving forward. And I, I think the, the true anomaly, the, the white Buffalo, so to speak, is going to be a guy that stays three or four years at one university. Yeah. It was not about the money for Caleb. That's what I hear. Like Alabama would have given him basically a blank check, but he was like, I just, I wanted to play for Saban. I did that. And now it's time to do some other stuff. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know him personally. This is what I heard. Good source, but who knows? What do you think of the Chip Kelly to Ohio State? It's crazy. I, I think a couple of things on that. Chip Kelly, I don't want to call the dude lazy because you don't get to where you are if you're lazy. Maybe he was lazy on recruiting, just didn't like recruiting. And it's gotten so much worse, especially for a program like UCLA. Like UCLA, I think for like around our age, we just remember this great basketball program. And it still seems to be a big brand, but they've never had a commitment for football. They just haven't. And nothing's going to continue with that. They've got a shitty collective. They're just never going to have those resources. And I think Chip Kelly looked at this. I think with what he was given, you know, winning eight games is not terrible. But making the transition from the Pac-12 to now the Big Ten, where if you look at the pecking order, at best, they're kind of middle of the conference. He just didn't think that, you know, he was basically bringing knife to gunfight. And now he doesn't have to deal with recruiting as much. He can go in, draw up his offense. And he's a great offensive mind. I mean, we remember that from the Oregon days. And these offenses weren't bad. He was. What's ahead? He was a great offensive mind at Oregon. But hasn't – I mean, the way that the – that spread offenses have evolved. I think they've gone past him. Yeah, but I still think his ability to run the football, and I think that's what Ryan Day, they want to run first. They want to throw second. You got a quarterback like Will Howard that's got that skill set that will compound that when you've got Quinshawn Judkins and you've got Travion Henderson. Um, I'm fascinated. That is the most fascinating team for me to see. Uh, Ohio State, because the expectation is always championship or bust. He's getting a, a lot of grief right now. People are saying he's not the right guy for the job. Them and Ole Miss are almost the two teams I can't wait to see because Ole Miss is out of excuses. Lane Kiffin's got to win a big game. Ryan Day has got to beat Michigan. He's got to get to a college football playoff. I mean, Ryan Day could go 9-3, and three, miss the playoff, and he's out with an incredible, maybe the best active winning uh, percentage to ever get fired. So um, I think it's a good hire. I think more surprising is Bill O'Brien takes the Boston College job. Like you see so many sitting coaches and we had another one uh, with Sean Elliott leaving Georgia State to go to South Carolina. You're seeing these sitting coaches. They just don't want to deal with the headaches right now. Um, so the Chip Kelly thing, although it was surprising to some, he was kind of getting out in front of the posse. A lot of people believed he could have lost his job after this season. And he just knew that UCLA right now can't compete in the Big Ten. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think he's mailed it in for about the last eight years. I mean, he destroyed the Eagles and the 49ers. And then 
UCLA was like, oh, wow, Chip Kelly. And I was like, yeah, but I still like I'm on the other side of this. I'm not a Chip Kelly fan by any means. But if you start to look and let's throw 2020 out because we always do that. But each and every year they got better. Just a little bit. It wasn't great. It was like a C plus job, B job. But I still think when he's just focused on offense, I think Ohio State's going to be really good this year. Now, maybe this is like a San Francisco situation. The pressure ultimately is just too much for Ryan Day. And, you know, he throws up on his shoes, but I, they, they've got everything they need right now. Will Howard. So you don't put them in the – go ahead, Chip. What's that? You like, the, you like the quarterback? I do like Will Howard. Um, I mean, I think he's going to be a little upgrade from Kyle McCord. He's not going to be C.J. Stroud, but I think what they're wanting to do offensively, I, I think this is – I mean, to me, it's – I mean, Oregon's going to be good. But it's Ohio State. Michigan's obviously going to tail off. Washington's tailing off. I don't think you've got anybody. Like, I'll believe Penn State when James Franklin, again, can win a big game. And that's the good thing about Ryan Day. Like, everybody's critical of him not winning a big game. Uh, this is a guy that just played for a national championship. So he's won a game in a college football playoff. Um, he's beaten. Um, I mean, he's won a Big Ten championship. But you look around, other guys, Dan Lanning's never won a big game. Um, you know, Lincoln Riley, it seems like they're taking on water right now at USC. James Franklin can't win a big game. You know, this was the narrative surrounding Harbaugh until he finally beat Ohio State and got to where he was the last couple of years. But I don't know, Big Ten's fascinating to me this coming season. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of Dan Lane, how do you think Oregon's going to be? Because I don't think he has that same pressure that you just put on Ole Miss and Ohio State, but he does have a – Dan Campbell-like feel with his play calling and his just, you know, gambling <laughs> mindset when it comes to calling for his team. I – all the guys that he has, Muhammad, you bring in Dylan Gabriel, all this NIL money getting thrown around. Is he given a little grace since they're jumping to the Big Ten, Lance? Well, and I, I do think, Zay, like Oregon fans, they were right there in the mix. If I'm an Oregon fan, I'm a little upset 0-3 against Kalen DeBoer in Washington the last couple of years, and that ultimately cost him going to a postseason as far as a college football playoff. I think that game in September where they're hosting Ohio State is everything. It's such a massive game for both brands. Now, obviously, when you're in the Big Ten and the SEC, you can go 10-2 and two and you're in a college football playoff, especially when you're one of those brands. 9-3 and three is kind of that cutoff. Depending on who you lose to, who you beat, how you're playing at the end of the year, I think 9-3 and three could still sneak you in. But I think early on in Austin, you know, if, if Ohio State was going there and make a statement, if I'm an Oregon fan, then I'm like, damn, what's going on? Because I do think, like Dylan Gabriel, I've been a big fan, and he's going to have more experience than any quarterback coming back this year. But is he an upgrade from what you saw from Bo Nix? I mean, Bo Nix completed 82% of his passes. So I don't think you really get an upgrade. If anything, it's kind of a, it's kind of a push. Yeah. You think Bo Nix is going to be a good NFL quarterback? I don't, but, you know, I mean, I doubted Bo Nix when he went from Auburn to Oregon. I was like, what's going to happen here? And he was really, really good, borderline incredible the last couple of years. He's got to be in the right system. Um, you know, those tight windows, I still don't see him making those NFL throws. He's got a strong arm. He's got great athleticism. He's a big-time competitor, and he's got a ton of experience. Um, and I can't figure out who's good quarterback and who's not going to be a good quarterback in the NFL. I didn't think Pat Mahomes would work out. You guys – I mean, Pat Mahomes has been pretty good, right? So I'm probably <laughs> no one's talking about Michael Penix. It's like he's the old man with the busted, you know, busted limbs. And well, here's the way I would go like, I would go Caleb Williams, then I would go Jaden Daniels, and then it gets a little tricky for me. Now, maybe Drake May is the next Ben Roethlisberger, and some people have compared him to that guy or Justin Herbert. Um, but a healthy Michael Penix, I think his game fits in the NFL. I and I think J.J. McCarthy, I don't think we've seen enough. I think his ceiling is really, really high. Whether or not you ever get to that, we'll see. Um, but this is much like the Big Ten this year. This quarterback, this class is going to be fascinating as well. But I think the only guys that I for sure feel like are going to be really, really good elite franchise guys – I think it is Caleb Williams, and I think Jay Daniels is going to be that guy. Just watching him week out, week in, week out in the SEC. He's a competitor. He can fly. He he can take a hit, doesn't get hurt. Um, it got so accurate as his career went on. Um, I just think Jay Daniels is going to be really good. Yeah. Lance, I've been hearing a lot of positive things on Spencer Rattler. I know he was the – 
um, MVP of the Senior Bowl game, and we know his history getting benched for Caleb Williams and then transferring from Oklahoma to South Carolina. He got all the hype coming out of high school, but there's still upside about him. Do you think that he could become something in the NFL? I, I guess. Again, I go back like Aiden O'Connell that I think, you know, the former Purdue quarterback would be starting in the NFL this year for the Raiders after an injury. No. So, yeah, I think there's there, there's potentially something there. Um, I don't know. Again, it's just such it, – it, it, to me, is by far the most difficult position to figure out. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely some upside there. How it plays out, we'll see. I watched Spencer Rattler have a near nervous breakdown in the middle of the Texas OU game that Caleb Williams yeah, came in. Into. Yeah, but, you know, you go back to Rattler not this season – but last year, what South Carolina did to Tennessee and Clemson in those final two games, I mean, that, if you could get that Spencer Rattler, you've got an NFL quarterback. I just – I didn't see enough consistency. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Lance, I know you got to go. Um, appreciate your dog. Yeah, you guys are the best. Uh, we'll talk next week, I guess, hoops, something fun like that. Yeah, man. Lance's live.com. Uh, we have seven and one on our last eight free plays. So we've got a free play up right now at lanceslike.com. We've got four total plays tonight. Jump on board. Coming off a three and two with another free winner last night. But we've got one up for you right now in the American Conference. So jump on board, lanceslike.com. There you go. Yes, sir. Lance Taylor. LT, appreciate you, Doc. Yeah, always. Thanks, Lance. Be cool, man. Um, all right, Zay, let's get a couple of words in here for our uh, for our peeps. You know, Apple Leasing, getting you into the car you really want to be driving. Apple Leasing, I mean, they lease every make and model of car. So they don't care what car you pick. And that's the magic of this new car experience that you've probably never had before. Because you go to a dealership, you got to kind of put the gloves on, be ready to fend off. You know, they're going to try and sell you one of their cars. They should. That's what they do. Um, but Apple leasing, they're just going to ask you, are you sure? And then you're going to say, yes, this is the car I want. You're going to pick it, everything, interior, exterior, get that new car smell. And you're not paying for the future trade-in value of that car. So you're getting into a better car than you thought you could afford, and it's brand new. So whether you want to keep your payments in the $400 range or get a Range Rover, Apple leasing has got you covered. Give them a call today, 346-9977, or visit AppleLeasing.com. Tell them Chip Brown sent you. And Brain Vault, Brain Vault mouth guard. It's the mouth guard that's revolutionizing mouth guards. We're talking about a mouth guard fitted for you by a dentist. I started right here in Austin by Austin's dentist, Dr. Greg Eckert, Dr. U-E-C-K-E-R-T. Um, and this is the mouth guard that is proven, patented, to protect your competitors from the effects of concussion. So whether you've got a flag football player, a cheerleader, a lacrosse player, or maybe you're in a flag football league, you need to protect yourself. You need to play hard, but you need to play safe. And the Brain Vault mouth guard is the only way to go if you want to protect that noggin. And look, if you're the manager of the team, they'll do group fittings. They'll come to you to do group fittings. Just go to brainvault.com to set up that fitting. And audiovisual consultations, our man Tom McKay, making sure that you've got the big screen of your dreams. You don't have to go shopping. You don't need to go borrow a truck to lug some 80 inch. No, no, no. Don't do that. Just call 255-8678. Let Tom and his crew bring everything to you. They've set me up in three different houses. They've set up your some of your favorite restaurants. They're the pros. They're the best. Just call 255-8678 from the free consultation to installation. Tom and his crew bring everything to you. It is so simple. And then, of course, we're heading into the weekend. Cover three. Make sure you get that brunch. I mean, of course, going for the Sean Adams prime rib sandwich and the Parmesan fries. You'll thank us later. Um, but brunch on the weekends, this is the spot to be. You want to watch Tiger Woods and the Genesis Open? Hopefully he's still playing in it at that point. Um, go to Cover 3 and check it out and get that do-it-yourself Bloody Mary bar. You're going to love it. Um, yeah. Zay, 
Um, I see you're muted there. There you go. There you are. I'm I'm fascinated by Ohio State this year. Fascinated. They got Quinshawn Judkins from Ole Miss and Travian Henderson. They've got Will Howard. They've got um, what Caleb Downs at safety. I mean, they went all in to make sure that they can do everything they can to beat the team from up north. Because Ryan Day is on the, I don't want to say on the hot seat, but he's on the, he's on the skids a little bit. If Michigan didn't win the national championship, he might be all right. The fact that they won it all, yeah, that seats. <laughs> and now, more, well, more. it's like Texas fans. They think, oh, well, Jim Harbaugh's not there anymore. It's Sharon Moore. Oh, we're we'll win that game now. Well, I mean, usually the the culture that was established by the coach can hang around for one year after he leaves, and then it might start to slip. Um, you know, we kind of talk about that with Texas basketball. Like Beard had this fearsome edge to him, and everybody's gonna play defense. MFers played it. I don't know if I told you this story. So I'm in Vegas for that game that Texas played against Stanford two years ago. And there's no one at the game. And like, this was a big 12 pack 12 showdown and beard is cussing his players so badly. You can hear it across the arena. Grab a fucking rebound. And you're like, Whoa. But, man, those guys stuck around, and they played with that edge last year without them. And now, RT's having to, you know, build his own culture. He brought in a bunch of new guys. But, Zay, look at the guys who are leaving the Texas basketball program after this season. Dazu, Ace Miss, Brock, um, you know, maybe Dylan Mitchell, but uh, yeah, D- Dylan Mitchell's gone. Dylan DeZoo, Max A. Smith, Brock. I mean, there's four dudes right there. Oh, Shedrick is gone. Like, e- IT Horton's gone. Those are all grad students. There's six dudes walking out the door. Yep. And no wonder. Hank's telling us yesterday about how Trey Johnson's dad is like in touch with the coaching staff. Like there are going to be players next year with Trey, right? Yeah. Yeah. You got to recruit your ass off in the transfer portal. You know what I'm saying? Especially when you get a bunch of one year rentals. Now look, these, these guys may be finding something, maybe their best basketball is ahead of them and they're a dangerous team potentially in the tournament because of the pick and pop action that you can get with Max and in Dizu. But man, it better come together. Otherwise you did all this one year rentals and you didn't get anything out of it. And now you got to start from scratch. You're like John Calipari bringing in a bunch of one and dones every year. You got to reset your culture, reset everything. Like yeah. people dog Calipari. I'm like, Calipari is amazing. For a while there, he was having to teach his culture year after year after year. It's exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. Transfer portal messed him up. If there were no transfer portal, he'd still be doing it. You know, that that hit him pretty hard. Cause now and the COVID year, that that hit him hard too. Because now those 18-year-olds that he could coach up that had crazy talent and NBA potential, now when they go against the 24-year-olds, there's a disadvantage there just by size and experience. Oh, our man CB who lives in Washington. Penix to the Seahawks. He does give you a Geno Smith vibe. Yeah, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. And uh, I love this. Ryan Day had a seat in college football. CB says, 
Chip, why did John Cooper get fired from Ohio State? And then he gives you the answer. Cooper, 2-10-1 versus Michigan. Yeah, the story there is that he got 13 years. Like in this day and age, it's amazing that Harbaugh got eight years. Michigan Mac got Brown. Mac Brown didn't win a national title until his, what, eighth season. And Mac got lit the F up by OU in 2000, 2003, got shut out in 2004, but Mac was such a good politician and he was so good at schmoozing the big money guys who would normally be like, get this guy out of here, that Mac made it 17 years. Incredible. I know the last, the last four not so good. So you're saying that John Brown and Mac Brown have the same smooth talking game to get out of stuff. Like yeah. how John Brown said he gets out of speeding tickets with the popo. Mac Brown was getting out of situations with the boosters after getting blown out by OU multiple years. Mm. Yeah. Some guys just have it, man. Some guys just have it. What do you do when a cop pulls you over? Um, hands on the steering wheel, move very slowly when they ask me to get certain things and be very respectful. That's what I do. Yeah. You just take it. I just take it. <laughs> so I apologize, officer. I try to tell the truth as much as I can. I'm like, yeah, girl waiting for me. I'm late, you know. I try. I've got. I've gotten a lot of warnings, more warnings than tickets, you know. But sometimes, hey man, gotta hit that quota. You don't say, <laughs> hey, you wouldn't give your friend a ticket. We got ten minutes to become friends. So what do you like to do? No. Hell no. We got ten like minutes to, do? to become friends. What do you do with your free time? No oh, man, that dude probably think, oh, is this guy high, sir. Can I search the car? What's your favorite movie? I mean, I'm probably going to try that next time. Hopefully it doesn't happen anytime soon, but I'm sure it will eventually. But yeah. How about you? Just keep it. You go the John Brown route or you just try? I've to tried that a couple times. Um, sometimes, you know, usually when I get popped, I'm in a rush, which is my own fault. I've tried to be better about leaving earlier to get places so that I'm not late because that's what's gotten me. I haven't had a ticket in probably six, seven years. Oh, yeah. I'm around there, too. Yeah. And a big part of that was making a commitment to be places early. Like, usually I was always working on a story and I'm like, I can take my laptop and get there early and work on the story. I don't need to, you know, wait till I'm late and then get in the car and go do something stupid like get pulled over. Yeah. You know what? I take that back. I got a ticket like four years ago, producer for B&E, you know, those early mornings and I was going in running red lights and stuff, <laughs> not thinking anybody, no one was around. That cop hey. was invisible. He popped out Dark of out. nowhere. Yeah. Got my ass, man. He's like, oh, you ran multiple red lights. I'm like, what you doing out here? It's 4 a.m. He was following you? I don't know what they were. I don't know where he came from. He but... said multiple red lights. Oh, yeah, I was running lights. Yeah, I was running lights. Oh, he must have been following you. Yeah, once you get around Barton Creek Mall area, yeah. Either that or they were radioing to each other. Oh, man, what were you driving then? Uh, same car I'm driving now. A little cruise, a little Chevy cruise. Hey, we got a Chevy cruise hot through this red light coming ah. your way. Coming your way, Ponch. Okay, John, thanks. Look at, oh, yeah, he just ran this red light. That's which I, I messed up. I shouldn't be running red lights, I know. But 
the big reason why I have my Chevy Cruze, which could pass as a car given to a 17-year-old girl. The reason why I have that is so I don't cause attention to myself. I would love to be driving in a 6 foe Impala down the street, but that ain't for me. I don't want to cause that attention. So I tried to be invisible, and yeah, it was on me. I mucked up, man. You know. All right. What have you learned? Not to, to leave early like you. Yeah. Leave early. Take my time. Yeah. You know. Enjoy life. Keep your blood pressure down. Okay. So look at me. I'm talking a little bit of basketball. But the whole LeBron thing, we talked about it a little bit. The fact that the Warriors and LeBron, the Warriors approached the Lakers about a trade for LeBron. And then Jeannie Buss said, well, ask LeBron. Ask Rich Paul if he's happy. And LeBron said, no, I'm not. I'm not doing that. What the hell were the Warriors going to give up to get LeBron? Probably Clay Thompson and some other pieces. I don't think they would have given up Draymond because Draymond and LeBron are close. I think that would have been part of the deal. And obviously Steph Curry, he's the greatest Golden State Warrior of all time. They're never going to give him up. So, yeah, I think it's Clay Thompson. And if you go and watch the Warriors play. And Kaminga and who else? Yeah, Kaminga. Um Probably the Santa Clara dude. I can't pronounce his name. The yeah, rookie. Pete Znotsky. Oh, Pete Znotsky. I like him. He's nice, man. The lefty, he's nice. I love his game. They probably throw him in there. And, you know, since LeBron's close with Chris Paul, they probably would have kept him. So, yeah, those guys and draft picks that go all the way to 2032 and shit like that, you know. Um, I LeBron mean, LeBron has said he wants to play with Steph Curry. Yep. And they'll he do that, that in the Olympics. On, he said that on a podcast recently. Yeah. Is there one guy out there you'd like to play with? And he's like, yeah, Steph. Yeah. Yo, the but, Olympics is going to be a movie. KD, LeBron, probably Kawhi, Steph. Yo, the Olympics, what this last team did in the FIBA World Cup was a disgrace with Anthony Edwards and Van Caro and all of those Villanova guys, Hart and Brunson with New York. They were terrible. They were awful. They were getting beat down. I don't even think they got any medals, yet alone gold. So, yeah, we got to bring some serious talent over there because, hey, you heard John Brown yesterday. Was John Brown, he was preaching. There's some things I didn't agree with when he talked to the NBA, but he said top five players in the league are all European. That's true. <laughs> like, the game is so global now when you play the Spains and the Serbias and the Slovenias because of Luka and France with, who have Victor Wimbenyama on their team. Like, you better bring it because those teams, it's not like the dream team that blew out everybody by 50. Times have changed. So you got to bring your top dogs. And, yeah, Steph and Braun, they'll play together for Team USA this summer. But that's about it. And Clay Thompson, he, again, he looks so disgruntled, Chip. He looks completely out of it. His shot's not where it used to be. Him with all those injuries are catching up and stuff. Like, he, there's a clip going around from last night's game where they were up by double digits but ended up losing to a Kawhi-less uh, Los Angeles Clippers team where Steph's putting this hand out to hot five Clay. Clay looks at him. And then, like, kind of puts his hand out, but then takes it back and, like, keeps on walking. It was so petty. And Steph, you know, Steph, he's not going to cause a scene. But there's just – you see the clip and the captions under it saying, Splash Bros run is over. And, again, if you hear the Warriors talking, like, Clay Thompson is very – you know, he's a very confident guy, but also he could be a little delusional. You know, just – I think he thinks – very highly of himself, which he should, but I don't think he understands everything that he's gone through to be playing in his 30s. Like, he wasn't very athletic to begin with. So to tear your Achilles and your ACL and expect to get back to that Hall of Fame guy that you were, that's not realistic. Not many guys can do that. So now he's hearing that, oh, y'all are going to trade me for LeBron? 
Y'all are supposed to keep me here forever. I'm supposed to be a Warriors guy forever. Don't y'all owe me this? I got. I helped y'all get four rings. Like I deserve more respect than this. Which, nah, Clay. I feel you, but this is a business, bro. You're washed now. I'm sorry. You're washed. You're not that dude no more. So teams are taking advantage of you on defense and offense. And now you got the Warriors saying that what? 10th spot in the standings? And they gave up another 15-point lead last night. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's with no Kawhi. No At Kawhi home, on that team. Against the Clippers with no Kawhi. They got they got Powell last night. Yeah, Norman Powell's good, man. Powell was draining threes. Yeah, he'll, he'll probably get six men of the year. All right, did he'll you probably. see – did you see Kendrick Perkins say that the Lakers, he he's, he will not reveal the player, but he said the Lakers are getting a another star this offseason? No, I didn't see that. Um, so apparently that's making the rounds. So Kendrick Perkins has scoop. Let me see if I can find it here. It says, yeah. uh, um, I don't know who that would another be. Another superstar is headed to the Lakers this offseason. Kendrick I mean, Perkins says. Trey Young is the first person that comes to mind. Um, I don't know what his contract situation is exactly, but it seems like Atlanta with Quinn Snyder as their coach, they're just not where they should be. You know, like this is a team that was – and the Easter Conference Finals a few years Quinn ago. Quinn Snyder looked like he was always sweating, like he was on something when he was the coach of Missouri. Missouri. <laughs> yeah. Like he always was like manic and sweaty. Yeah. And he's he's still coaching. Like, he's the most un-Duke looking Dukey I've ever seen in my life. Like, they're always just so professional looking and clean cut. Like, that's a big reason why you hate, you know, Duke players, former Duke players. Quinn Snyder, yeah, he does always look like he's on drugs and stuff. And he must be a brilliant basketball mind because he's been at multiple places. Yeah. Utah, yes. Austin Toros, he coached them for a little bit. Austin Toros. You know, like, box. yeah. So I, I, they got Murray, Dejounte Murray over there, and him and Trey Young. They both need the ball in their hands. You know, like if those two are your best players, you're not gonna be very good. And I think Trey Young's a terrific player, but he, he just he'll get abused because he's small guy. Yeah, I, I see the Spurs going after him too. I heard he wants to. Play with somebody like Victor Wimbanyama. I think that'd be a terrific match. Like pick and roll, Wimby and Trey Young. That's unstoppable right there. But yeah, Atlanta, that's not it. And I could see multiple teams going after the former Sooner, who is from Norman. From Norman. I don't know how that's his again, dad played at tech. Yeah, that was nice. That was a solid yeah. player. But yeah, I don't know how he got that talent dad out there. Norman. Yeah. I have no idea how he got that talent coming out of Norman. That's ridiculous, man. <laughs> Roy says Snyder has the haircut that makes him look strung out. Yes. Yes, he does. Um, you know who is never strung out, always strung in? That is our man. Len, stretch. Smith, former Cowboys offensive assistant coach, Stretch. How you doing, my man? I'm good, fellas. How you guys today? Man, we're good doing stretch. all right. I wanted to get your, uh, of course, you know, we got Cowboys fans airware, and you were a member of the Cowboys staff with Mike Zimmer, right? Correct. Eight years. Eight years you two shared a locker eight room. Eight years, eight years. I know uh, we've, we've shared a locker room, a, a, a few uh, words that would make a sailor blush, all the things that go with it, absolutely. Well, what uh, 
What was your reaction when Mike Zimmer, former head coach of the Minnesota Vikings, is signed on as the Cowboys' new defensive coordinator? I mean, I think this is a really good hire. I, I, I think you've got a guy that has head coaching experience, uh, took a year off from, uh, from those head coaching duties after getting let go in Minnesota. I'm sure studied a lot of film, a lot of tape. Uh, with his background in Dallas, you know he watched a lot of the Cowboys. So familiarity with the personnel, familiarity with the organization, uh, how to you know deal with Jerry and Stephen, Will McClay. I mean, all the inner workings that happen at the Star. I think this is a good hire. I was really afraid when I heard that it wasn't done as of Monday because I know how Mike is, and I'm sure he wanted to be able to have some uh, availability to bring some of his guys in, his guys that know his system, whether that be, and I'm just giving you, for instance, names. I, I don't know this for sure. You know, a guy like George Edwards, a guy like Andre Patterson, who I saw the Giants have blocked Cowboys from talking to Andre. He's got to be able to get to those guys who have familiarity with him um, and then be able to make the transition into being the defensive coordinator. Um, I think when you see the personnel that the Cowboys have, understanding they're going to have to go draft uh, linebackers, understanding they're going to have to draft a couple safeties. The other thing that Zim does is he does a good job with personnel. He's got a great understanding of what it takes to play at the highest level, and he'll do a great job of evaluating all of those guys and all of those uh, draft picks. So you have to uh, you have to take all those things into consideration and know that Zim is a tough ass. He's going to ruffle some feathers. He's going to challenge guys, which I think. Uh, and I'm not saying Dan Quinn didn't do. What I'm saying is I know Mike Zimmer, and I know he will do. He'll challenge those guys and be able to, um, I think, get the most out of them. <clears throat> I also think that, you know, he's a guy that is going to be emphasizing turnovers in the same way that, you know, that Dan Quinn did. So I really see this being a smooth transition for Mike Zimmer. How do you see the personnel right now matching up with what Zimmer wants to do. Well, he's going to, we're going to have to, you know, he's going to have to go get some linebackers. I mean, that's the, that's the bottom line. I mean, Zim is a big, you know, he likes to, he likes to spread out his four down linemen, then bring his two linebackers into those eight gaps, twist them, be able to stun them, be able to put the pressure on your center to block one of them. And then your back's got to step up and block the other. He likes getting that matchup. Now, well, that being said, he's going to have to adjust the personnel some. I mean, they, you know, other than Clark, obviously, you know, they've got, you know, the former Longhorn who's going to come back, Overshone who will come back off of his injury. I don't believe uh, Van Der Esch will be back here. I hope I'm wrong, but I think, uh, you know, I think his neck issue is too is too big of a health risk. And so, uh, you know, depending on whether they can re- uh, you know, re-up and redo Dak's contract will uh, allow them to maybe be able to do something in free agency. But I really think it's going to be, it's going to have to be built through the draft because when you're going to pay him the kind of money you're going to pay him, you still got to pay CD, still got to, you know, you're still going to have to pay Parsons. So all of those things are going to have to be taken into consideration. But I can tell you this, Micah Parsons will do great in Mike Zimmer's defensive scheme. Why? Just how they move him around. Just his ability to get, not only can he get on the edge, but Parsons can come inside and be able to do some of those things. So I think all of that lends to uh, Micah continuing to grow a as a football player. And then if you team up, you know, Clark, maybe one other linebacker, I really do believe that defensively the Cowboys will make some strides <clears throat> excuse me with Mike Zimmer being the coordinator yeah 
Well, Stretch, one thing that stuck out to me was the fact that Zimmer never burned any bridges with anybody. You know, for him to go off and do his own thing as a head coach after he had his career early as a coordinator and stuff from the 2000s era, for him to be accepted back, as you said, he knows Jerry, knows Steven. Like, that says a lot about who he is and the relationship that he has with the front office. Well, I, I, and, and, and you're right, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, and I don't ever like to – I don't like to be, feel like I'm correcting anybody, but I promise you when – when go back, go back and look when Bobby Petrino left the Atlanta Falcons and took the Arkansas Razorback job and left Atlanta midseason, Zimmer threatened to whip his ass. So whether you call that burning a bridge or not, I don't know. But Zimmer, Zimmer said, Zimmer said if he ever crossed Bobby Petrino again, he was gonna give him a good country ass whipping. And you know what? I don't think I don't think that ever goes away. So you're right. He he didn't burn. He didn't burn the wrong bridges. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that Zim told me he thought that was what was keeping him from getting a head coaching job for years. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm you talking about what Bobby Petrino did? Yeah, when Petrino yeah. left the Falcons in the middle of the night. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I mean, it was Zimmer. I mean, you could tell the next day. You know, they're talking to him, and and, and I mean, he was hotter than fish grease. So he, he, yeah, he, he did. He threatened to, he threatened to give him an ass whipping. And, and, and I tell you what, I, Zimmer might be the guy to give you one if you need one. Yeah. Yeah. Zimmer is hot. <laughs> I mean, there's a great clip of him in a preseason game with the Bengals defense. And he's like, I told you this quarterback runs. And if you don't fucking stop him, I'm going to pull your ass out of the game and get someone in there who will. And by God, they went in there and stopped the quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I, I, he, he will. I mean, that's the one thing about Mike. He got the immediate respect of, you know, the, the players, the George Teagues. Deion Sanders loved Mike Zimmer. I mean, because, yeah. you know, Mike would allow him to, you know, do his thing, play on the edge, play, you know, match against whoever, the, you know, the best receiver was we were playing that week. Yeah, Zim will. I mean, he, he is definitely going to be – I think a good choice for the Cowboys, and uh, he'll he'll do a hell of a job. Now, that's not taking anything away from Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn did a great job with the Dallas Cowboys. There's no doubt about that. And you think about Dan Quinn took a job from Mike Nolan, who, I mean, uh, it was it was way beyond him. And that I'm not being critical of Mike Nolan, but I'm saying he he was he was not a fit to be the Dallas defense coordinator, Mike McCarthy's first year. Mike McCarthy felt he owed uh, Mike Nolan a favor because Mike Nolan had hired him in San Francisco. See, he hired him with the Cowboys, and, I mean, it was a one-and-done situation. And so when Dan Quinn came in, I mean, he had some retooling to do, and he and he did it in a very quick, fast manner because the Cowboys defense every year made improvements under Dan Quinn, and I believe that – Zimmer here will be able to transition from Dan Quinn, what they did with a four down scheme scheme and be able to say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to, uh, we're going to take this to the next level. And, uh, with the good young talent that the Cowboys have, I, I mean, I, I, I really believe that Mike Zimmer was the right guy for the job. All right. What'd you think of the Super Bowl? Um, you know, I, it was a little bit, Frustrating. I mean, I, I thought San Francisco had the better team uh, and didn't win the football game. We know Pat Mahomes should give him so many chances, and then eventually he's going to burn you. I thought the one play where, uh, you know, the one special teams for the hold-up guy gets hit on the foot and, you know, they have to turn the ball over there, to me, was a huge factor in the football game. But uh, – I'm kind of more intrigued by the fact that Kyle Shanahan fired Steve Wilkes today. I mean, literally right out of going to the Super Bowl, he fires his defensive coordinator. And then you start wondering, well, is that because he's, you know, he, he thinks it's a better fit with Mike Vrabel? Uh, does he think that, uh, you know, the, the, that, that San Francisco's window is shutting, which I tell you what, it may be, guys. When you think about all the draft picks they gave up, to get Trey Lance, to get 
McCaffrey. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't believe San Francisco gets back to that level, but, uh, you know, him firing Steve Wilkes after going to the Super Bowl for sure is a head scratcher. Yeah, I mean, the, the defense gave up, you know, played bad against the Packers and the Lions early, but they played really well in the Super Bowl, I thought. Gave up, I think, about 17 points a game. But, you know, it's not – what that tells you is it's not just – you know, it's not just how or the scheme that they're coaching. You got to – you know, maybe they didn't get along with one another. I have no idea. But there's something that certainly doesn't uh, – <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't smell right in that situation and the fact that they choose to move on from Steve Wilkes a week after going to the Super Bowl. Man. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Patrick Mahomes? Where would you put him now? Third Super Bowl under 30 years old. Pretty ridiculous what number 15 has been doing out there these last few years. I mean, six six straight AFC championship games. I mean, that, think about that. Six straight AFC championship games. I, I you know, I, I don't know whether I – I, it's, it's unbelievable what he's done, but I, I also look at a guy like Dan Quinn who just hired Cliff Kingsbury, <clears throat> excuse me, to be his offensive coordinator in Washington. Cliff Kingsbury was 13 and 19 with Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. You going to read, well, read between the lines there? I don't know. Well, no, they put points up on the board. He couldn't find a defensive coordinator to save his life. He waited too long to hire David Gibbs. He hired his buddies, and they were giving up, you know, 40, 50 points a game. It was – Mahomes was out there slinging it. Remember that overtime game they played with OU? It was like 64-59. Oh, yeah. Here's – and all that oh, – and, 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 I, and I know what you're saying, and all that's cute. You know what the bottom line is? 13 and 19. <laughs> that ain't worth a whiskey shit. Not worth a whiskey shit. Let me say it again. No good. So, uh, yeah, for whatever reason, and, you know, David Gibbs, Alex Gibbs. Uh, Barry Gibbs. Yeah, yeah. Andy exactly. Gibbs. Exactly, exactly. Can we, can we go on and on and on? And I, I get it. They couldn't, they couldn't stop anybody. But, you know, part of me thinks you got to work on that side of the ball, too. I, I don't give a crap who the coach is. I mean, you gotta, you got to practice defense, but – uh, I also think that uh, maybe Kingsbury ought to be mailing part of his check to Johnny Manziel. I think that's <laughs> Johnny Johnny Manziel made Cliff Kingsbury. Man, you dogging on my New Braunfels unicorn. <laughs> okay, so did you ever like closely look at Art Bryles' offense at Baylor? Uh, I can say. Not, and I'm not saying. I'm saying yes. I didn't. I didn't study his offense like I'm studying. And I'll let you guys in on a little something. So Mac, Mac Jones is in Alito training right now, and uh, I, I'm sharing this with you because it's really, really interesting to see how uh, that situation has transpired. And then I, I'm leading into a little bit of Baylor and their concepts through some of the things that, you know, Mac Jones is comfortable with um, out there. And, and I want you to think about this. As a rookie, he, he wins the national championship at Alabama. He goes to New England under Josh McDaniels and goes to the Pro Bowl. The Pro Bowl is rookie year. Okay. Josh McDaniels takes the Raiders job. They hire Matt Patricia. Dumbest. A, a defensive coordinator as his <laughs> offensive coordinator, and they hire Joe Judge, who was the previous head coach of the Giants, who had special teams only experience to be the quarterback coach. How, how do you think year two goes under that scenario? That's where it all went to hell for Belichick. And then, and then, and then they try to bring 
Bill O'Brien back in there with the same offensive line who couldn't block you in a phone booth. So, you know, I, I'm studying all of this, watching all this with Mac Jones, going through all of his interceptions, all of his completions. You know, he's up on the board. I mean, we it, it's been a think tank, two-week experience. It really has. It's, I tell you, it's done me a bunch of good to listen to some football. They brought the quarterback coach in from uh, from Maryland, who was a uh, he, he was a Max GA when 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 they were at Alabama. Went with Loxley to Maryland, listening to how they call the offense, the West Coast offense, what they do, how they have certain sides of the ball are, and and this is where I'm getting back to the Baylor issue. Certain sides of the ball, they'll just cut off half of the field, and those receivers. Who, who, who are dead on that side of the field literally will walk off the football and yeah. then they got and then they got two blowing off the other side and so what's interesting is uh, you know somebody's done a great job of saying hey we're only making this a half field read or we're doing this with only this side as being our hot side so uh, yeah it, it, it's uh, it's certainly different but to give you a long answer to your question that would be you know, so far, my uh, time that I've spent really looking and dissecting what Baylor used to do and what some other guys are doing now as far as half field reads and the things that they're doing to uh, to keep their receivers fresh and knowing they got to go. Yeah, because I, I, no one stopped our Bryles offense except a Baylor football scandal. And He's never going to get a head coaching job again because he, he won't show any contrition about what happened during that time. But I'm still fascinated by that offense because he spread everybody out. He put the receivers out at the numbers. You're right. The calls were so simple. It was like one or two. And it was either a go route or a slant. And if the box was light, he was handing it off, and they ran for 300 yards a game. I mean, it was – he was evil genius, but well, yeah, and that's a, that's a lot of the. If you go back and and look at so, you know a lot of the Mike Leach stuff was the same way. Let's spread it out. I don't want a bunch of tight ends in the box. Let's let's clean this box up, and we'll count we'll count how many are in here. We they 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 only put five in there. Guess what? We'll put our five on there. Five will run the ball. They want to bring six in the box. We're throwing it here. They want to do this. We'll throw it there. So, yeah, he. he I mean, Art Browles it, he did an unbelievable job with getting Baylor, uh, to, you know, headed in the direction that they needed to go. I don't know Art Browles from a personal standpoint. I mean, I've met uh, Kendall a couple of times, but offensively, as good as anybody with understanding. Uh, how to simplify the game, how to dummy it down, and then how to get your players to where they play fast. They don't have to. They don't have to wonder. Hey, okay, well, I, I, I've got an out route called here, but if they press up, it's going to convert to here. And if I see the world pass me by, which means the they bring the Sam in the short corner, I've got to break this hot. They 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 dummied it down and they played really fast. And yeah, they, they they hung a lot of points on a lot of good defensive coordinators. Yeah, and I think that offense is dead with our Bryles' inability to show any contrition over what happened at Baylor. It's amazing. No, no, it's it's really sad, and it, 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 it's a lot like you know, it's a lot like uh, you know, a few situations that we've seen in college football where I don't I don't think the uh, I don't think the punishment fit what happened. Now, I don't know exactly. I'm sure there were some people that were hurt, uh, you know, in, some, in, in, in those situations, but I'm not sure that it fit just basically jettison him out of the game of football. And the foot, football's not a better game without Art Browles. It's a better game when Art Browles was around. Yeah, they paid him $20 million to never talk about this. And, and there were other people involved in that administration. It wasn't just Art, but Art had his 
He brought Tevin Elliott in and that kid raped five girls and Art's got to live with that. That's the part he's got to live with. But the university didn't have a Title IX officer because they were trying to get Kenneth Starr fired as the president. And meanwhile, girls are getting raped and it was sick, but it wasn't all Art's fault, but they paid him 20 million never to talk about it. And he sure could have said, hey, I'm sick that this happened. I have a daughter. I'm going to spend the rest of my life making sure this never happens again. And he'd have gotten hired. But he couldn't even get to that point. Well, so. and it, again, there, I, I mean, I think there's always, and you know this, Chip, there are two sides to the story. So uh, we'll just have to, you know, at some point, I'm sure, like a lot of other things in this country right now, whether it be the Kennedy assassination, the moon landing. <laughs> I mean, so, so, someday somebody's going to come out and tell the truth with all of it. Yeah. Right. Well, what do you think about Mac Jones? You think he's going to be – I mean, I don't know what the hell's going on up there in uh, New England. I, I'll tell you this, and that's just for whatever it's worth. My time with the Cowboys – in the quarterback room was Jason Garrett, who we know has been a 10-year NFL head coach, Princeton graduate, smart, smart football guy. Wade Wilson played 17, 18 years in the NFL. I didn't say coached. I said played the quarterback position in every offense you could play it in. West Coast offense, Ernie Zampezi's offense, he, he played in all of them. And then – I run it and played in the run and shoot. And then Troy Aikman, who we know is as smart a football guy as there is. I'll tell you, having spent multiple weeks in meetings with Mac Jones, he has as good a football acumen as those guys. Now, take it, take it for what it's worth. He can get on the board. He can draw everything imaginable. He understands the West Coast offense. He understands... Uh, the digital system, which means he can speak multiple languages, verbiage, when you can do that. He can translate it to on the board. I've always thought when you could take what's in your frontal lobe and you could let it run down to your index finger and into a expo pen and you could draw it up and explain it, you're a next level guy. Football acumen there. Be able for the football to come out of his hand, it's there. Uh, footwork, there. Just was in a tough situation, and I, I'm i not here to, you know, throw anybody under the bus from a coaching standpoint. I know how hard the job is, but I'll tell you this, that his football ability and his football acumen is as good as anybody, and whoever gets Mac Jones – Tag this date on the show right here, the day after Valentine's Day when those stretch told you, I can promise you that kid has got a chance to do it for a while if injury doesn't catch up to him and if he can get in the right position. He's just been in a tough situation in New England. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a pretty interesting stretch because, again, they rolled him off there basically and – you think about just the shoes that he had to fill, like everybody's expecting him, okay, you're never going to be Brady. That's what he always has to hear. And then, as you mentioned, you're bringing in Patricia and just all that cluster stuff you got going on with Belichick. Like, does that make you think of why Belichick might not be getting opportunities with just the history and credibility that he has that the game just might have passed him up? Because, again, you're telling us that Mac Jones – this guy's a real deal guy. He is. He is. He is for real. I'm just telling you guys. I don't. I. I. I know you guys. We joke around and him all around and, and and have a good time. I'm telling you right now, if this young man gets in the right position, that means with the right team, the right coach. I'm telling you right now, you'll see him spread his wings and take off like nobody's business. Now. You know, where might that be? Is it still? I don't think it's still in New England. They have the, you know, they they own the third pick. I could absolutely see them going Jaden Daniels or or uh, J.J. McCarthy or 
you know, wh- whoever, Drake May, whoever is up there after Caleb Williams. And if, if uh, you know, if, if you know Chicago's wanting to go quarterback, you know that, uh, you know, New England at three is probably wanting to go quarterback. So I could see, uh, you know, I could see New England uh, trying to trade Mac Jones. I'm just letting you know. Just from my, all I, all we all have, guys, is our own point of reference. That, that's all we have. We, 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 we can sit and read about other things, and, and all of that sounds cute and sounds good, but all we really have is our own point of reference and our own experience. And I'm just sharing with you my own point of reference and my own experience. And, you know, it, it's caused me to be, uh, you know, in the Dallas media, it's caused me to be difficult on uh on Dak a lot of times I I and, and I'm difficult on him because guess what in the time I was with the Dallas Cowboys I saw Troy Aikman now you can say well that's unfair stretch he's the first pick he's a hall of famer I'm just telling you that's my point of reference that's it that's it and so when you apply that to what I'm telling you about Mac Jones is that I believe Mac Jones in the right system will be one hell of a quarterback. And you know what? One day uh, down the road here in a few years, we'll have a chance to get on the radio and uh, and chop it up in a little bit. And either I'll be, either I'll be uh, drinking the wine or, or my feet will be purple. I got no problem either way. Hey, that's a guy who makes a lot of sense in Big D Dallas. But they went and uh, could, could, traded for Trey Lance. Absolutely. Absolutely, he would make sense. He'd, I, I could make, I could tell you, he'd make sense in twenty different places. I really could. You think he wouldn't make sense in at the Raiders? You think he wouldn't make sense in Denver? You think he wouldn't make sense in uh, or Kubiak is just taken over as the offensive coordinator in in New Orleans? I mean, absolutely. So yeah, we could. We could say a lot of places that it makes sense. And, well, the real and question think, is who's going to do the homework to realize that he got screwed up when Bill Belichick inexplicably brought in old pencil head, Matt Patricia, defensive coordinator, to be the offensive coordinator and just ran Bill Belichick's career into the ground. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, to answer that question, I don't know. I don't know who will – I mean, I'm sure – that is smart as a guy like Mickey Loomis or Jeff Ireland are down in New Orleans. I'm sure is smart as, you know, uh, we could sit here and go on and on and on. Uh, Will McClay, the Cowboys. I mean, all of those guys are, are going to do their homework. I don't know how many of them understand it to the level that I'm telling you, but I'm just, uh, I'm just sharing with you what old stretch's mentality is and i just try to you know help my boys out with a little heads up whenever i can so i'm going to give it to you again heads up heads up <laughs> write it down write it down day after valentine's day 2024 <laughs> hey, hey, hey stretch i know you gotta go soon but does mac jones talk about his time with steve sarkeesian oh yeah lo- loves him i mean lo- loved his time with him i mean he 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 knows that offense as good as any offense, he, he 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 constantly refers back to, you know, what Sark would do and those when he would, you know, when he would script those plays and what they were trying to do. So, yeah, he speaks very highly of of Steve Sarkeesian, absolutely, and and likes him a lot. So, uh, you know, I, I we've been we've been cutting up some of the some of the Texas offense and looking at some of the things that. You know they did in against Washington, and and they did throughout the year. And he's he's very you know very familiar with that with that entire uh, scheme and the way that Sarkeesian looks to uh, you know put pressure on defenses and, and 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 be able to push the ball deep. Mac loves throwing the ball deep, and and I know Sark does too. So they they've done a uh, he, he speaks very highly of the work that they did together while they were at Alabama. Where are you driving to Waco? No, I'm, I'm, I just left. Uh, I was down for Valentine's day in, in uh, Lake Conroe 
I spent a little time yeah. with my girlfriend, and uh, you know, it's God. you know how it is. You got it. You got a Valentine's Day. You got to You got to I love them I up. You, you, you got to love them up. I think it's the dumbest day of of all. And if you're not in the floral business, who gives a flying flip on a rolling donut about Valentine's? Corporate holiday, baby. You got to do it. You got to do. You got to do what you got to do, and. You know, if it means a few dozen roses and a Landry Steakhouse, and you know, you unless you want to run around uh, being single, you got to do what you got to do. And I know you understand that, Chip Brown. You've been you've been on both sides of the equation. You're darn right. You got to do what you got to do if you want to get it done. You know what I mean? That's, but um, that's it, hey. fellas. That's that's where I've been. I've been. I'm 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 headed back to the Metroplex from Lake Cornrow, Texas. I love it. I love it. Well, Stretch, you are the man. That's why we love chatting with you. Well, hey, fellas, and enjoyed it. And uh, you guys have yourself a, a grand weekend. And I'm sure you, I'm sure y'all are chopping up some basketball. And what a Texas baseball's getting to get started. Yeah, Texas got, baseball it's a busy starts time tomorrow. Of year, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. We got the overlap. <laughs> I like it. We got the. We got the overlap working, and we're not talking about the one when you loosen that belt, you fart for 30 minutes. That's not the overlap. <laughs> right. <laughs> not that one. Not that one. Hey, football right. season Football season never ends here on this show. Hey, you know buddy, I mean? ne- it, it never ends on a bunch of shows. That's a, that's a fact. We know, we know football's a year-round process, especially down here in God's country where we live. So, fellas, have yourselves a grand day today. Stretch, appreciate you. See you, brother. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe. Be safe driving. All right, there he is. Stretch. He's doing it. He's making the trip back from Conroe to Big D. Um, all right, Zay. Let's get into it uh, real quick. Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. Speaking of uh, date night, what a great place to take a date. Salt Traders Coastal Cooking. The, I mean, this is seafood like you cannot believe but if you love oysters oh my goodness gracious you got a happy hour every day from 3 30 to 6 30 and all night on monday night and that means you're getting five dollars off the beginnings menu which has the grilled oysters and the new orleans barbecue uh style shrimp and the chowder fries but you're also getting dollar raw oysters and you just keep ordering them and loving on them I mean, it is the place to be for great seafood, great oysters, and a great date night spot. Salt Traders Coastal Cooking in Zilker, uh, right off of Mopac, and up there in Round Rock at Old Settlers uh, from our man Jack Gilmore, who gives you Jack Allen's Kitchen as well. All right, Zay. I... uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my man, um, Dylan DeZoo, because I'm fascinated by Dylan DeZoo. He, he exploded last year in the postseason. Timmy Allen missed a game in the Big 12 tournament. And actually, he missed pretty much the whole Big 12 tournament. And... Rodney Terry went to Dylan DeZoo and said, hey, we need a little more offense from you. So what does he do? He ends up averaging uh, 18 and 8. And then he goes into the NCAA tournament and averages 22 and 10. And was the reason they pulled out the win against Penn State. Because they had a double-digit lead. It Penn State erased it. Penn State was up three. They're drawing up a play for Marcus Carr in the huddle. And Marcus Carr says, no, let's get it to Dylan. He's on fire. And Dylan DeZoo scored pretty much the last 10 points of the game, stretched the lead back out. Texas beats Penn State. And they go to the Sweet 16. And then he, well, he aggravated that foot injury in practice that week. But he had to have surgery. It's a major surgery. And we learned or i learned today i know fran for has been talking about it but that he 
started shooting in the chair while the foot was injured before the surgery in April. Surgery was in June and he is shooting from the charge circle back to the free throw line and he's getting that shot down and he does it from April to August. And then this, you know, he doesn't play the first nine games of the year as he's rehabbing back. And now what we're seeing from him, these last three halves and the Cincinnati game when he totally took over and led Texas to a really important win, especially now when you look at the, the Longhorns schedule and that horrible loss to Central Florida at home, which is just going to be the low point of the whole season. Because not only did they lose that 16-point lead, but RT lost his mind in the handshake line. Texas became a joke nationally. Horns down everywhere. Um, but Dylan Dazu, he goes, I mean, basically – RT said at halftime of the Iowa State game, you're not being aggressive enough. Okay, Willie comes out, scores 17 points in eight minutes, brings him back, and then starts off the West Virginia game, eight of eight, six of six from three. We've got to take note of this, and we got to watch it going down the stretch here because what Dylan DeZue is doing is not easy. Look, there's two people you have to account for in the Texas scouting report, Max Asmus and Dylan DeZue. Everyone else, you can cover man to man and take your chances, but you need to set your defense for Max Asmus and Dylan DeZue. And Houston is the best defensive team in the country. And I cannot wait to see how this plays on Saturday afternoon. Um, because this is a game Texas would have, could have, should have won. Um, they played one of their best halves of basketball this season in the second half against Houston, and they had a four-point lead uh, in the final you know, two minutes of this game, and they had a chance to score. They could have had the last shot. Um, Tyrese Hunter turns it over with 31 seconds left. The game tied. Uh, goes to overtime, and Houston wins. So – that was one that got away. You win that one, we're not worried about Texas and being a bubble team. But what Dylan DeZue is doing on a team that is not deep, wasn't very connected through the first half of the year, is something. And our RT, Rodney Terry, deserves credit. If this team can do this through this last – whatever, six, seven games of the season, six games of the season, then it'll be probably in large part due to Dylan DeZue. Like Max Asmus, we know he can score. Hell, guys, top 20 all time, all time Division One scorers. He, he's gone by Larry Bird, Nelvin Hayes, and Oscar Robertson. Now he's playing a fifth year. Some of those dudes only played three years. But this, this is... I just I love Dylan DeZue's mindset, love his makeup, love his demeanor. And I love that when Rodney Terry says you're not being aggressive enough, the dude goes out and, you know, lights up a really talented Iowa State defense in the second half. So I'm I'm impressed. I think what we're watching here is pretty, you know, it's it's a hell of a story. For a guy who's come back from a serious foot injury and a guy who's, you know, worked so hard to make sure that his shot was, you know, going to be something he could count on. And he's shooting 56% from three-point range. And that is, he's 6'9". He's, you know, he's by far the team's uh, best three-point shooter uh, percentage wise. And I'm just, I love this story. I'm, I'm cheering for Dylan to zoo, man, because I just think what we're watching is a story of perseverance, overcoming adversity and just with great humility. So, and like I said, Dylan to zoo, it's not like he shot 10 threes. He is, he's 31 of 55 or 56% from three-point range and 
you know, the last two games, he's he's put on a show, uh, including that, you know, 10 of 16 shooting, 7 of 10 from three against West Virginia. And uh, I'm just – I'm cheering for Dylan Dazoo because right now he's one of the best stories in college basketball. Yeah, and shout out to Coach Terry and the coaching staff for putting them in great situations to be successful. If you saw the first few games that he got back, you've seen him on the block a lot. And he was doing very well there. Well, with more film for this 2024 Texas basketball team with Desu being on the court, now teams are starting to double him more at the block. So if he's on the perimeter, you don't want to double him out there because he could see the whole court and make those passes and get hockey assists to where Kendall Weaver, Dylan Mitchell, those guys could cut to the baskets and do what they do best. So, yeah, I think – Again, the coaching staff's put them in good situations, and if he stays with this type of aggression to where you have the ultimate green light, bro, like let it fly. Let it fly. If the hand's in your face with how big you are and that release point, it shouldn't be able to touch you. You know, It shouldn't be able to affect you like it does other guys. So, yeah, keep playing with that mentality. You know, I think, again – Last year, if he doesn't get hurt in March Madness, that team, 2023 squad, has a chance to win a national championship. Obviously, we'll never know. Yes, that UConn team was very good, but Dylan Thesu, he's that talented. And, yeah, I still think he has a huge shot of getting to the NBA. He might not get drafted, but we're going to see him on a summer league team. And it's always going to go back to the injuries that he had at Vanderbilt and the foot injury that he had this past year and the lack of athleticism. But somebody that size with that kind of touch, that's going to get looks. And even if he doesn't have a big NBA career, he's going to make a ton of money in Europe. And shout out to his trainer, Zach Urbanis, my guy, BTY basketball, Bowie Bulldog alum, went to the Citadel, started all four years there as a 6'2 shooting guard. Like Zach's one of the best trainers and best basketball minds that I've ever met in my life. I might be a little biased, but you could tell Alex Caruso and Jared Allen and Dylan Dessou if I'm a little bit biased because all those guys are doing some serious work in the NBA and in college basketball. So Zach will tell you himself. Hey, Dylan's out there putting up the work. He's just got in them the right way on certain things. But yeah, man, Dylan Dessou has a great team around him and they keep this thing going. I could see them getting a huge upset win in H Town on Saturday. Love it. Yeah. All right. All right, man. Let me breeze through this right call. Uh, but I got shout out Covert B Cave, Covert Family automotive dealerships that have been around for the greater Austin area for over a hundred years and been doing it and doing it well. Like LL said back in the nineties, high quality selection of new and pre-owned vehicles, seven terrific brands to choose from Cadillac, GMC, Ram, Buick, Chrysler, Dodge, and Jeep. Go to covertbk.com for all the latest specials and inventory. Nobody beats a covert deal. Not now, not ever. Scott, I've been, I'm very sober, Scott. I don't know what you're referring to. Let me know, but very sober. Feeling good, though. Very happy. You know, Valentine's Day was good because me and wifey don't celebrate it. I'm cool. I'm cooling, but I appreciate your concern. Um, Chef, we're high on life. We're high, we're high on, on life. life. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're high That's on life. That's how we life. roll. Exactly. Um, high energy. Chip. My guy, William Post, the creator of the Pop-Tart, passed away the other day at age 96. Talk about a beautiful life, man. That's Let me make it to 96, man. That's a good living right there. But the creator of the Pop-Tart, this is my dude without even knowing who he was. I've had so many Pop-Tarts to this day, even in my 30s. I know it might be a child breakfast snack or whatever, but yo, man. Give to be a good pop tart. Pop that thing in the oven for about two minutes or so. Look at you. Yo, my guy. Look at you coming with the pop tart brown sugar cinnamon edition. Yo, that's an OG flavor right there, man. That's a top five flavor pop tart. Yo, you showing me something, man. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. What's your flavor? What's your flavor? Um, I haven't seen them in a while. The wild berry. With the purple frosting and all types of berries, I don't. I guess I haven't looked very much. I'm sure they're still around, but yeah, that's the number one go-to. And then I keep it OG, brown sugar, cinnamon, 
frosted so strawberry, frosted blueberry. Yeah, I'm pretty OG with it. When they start doing the crazy stuff, they can miss me on that, like the hot fudge sundae and all that stuff. Like I'm not really a chocolate. Have you tried the s'mores guy. though? Have you tried the s'mores? Yes, classic. Yeah, yeah that's legit. That's a classic. That's legit. Yeah, absolutely. They had a chocolate chip pop tart when I was a kid about 20 years ago. That was bomb. Like I dunked that thing in milk and everything. Yo, yeah, man. Fifth grade Zay was doing it back then. But yeah, man. Shout out to our guy William Post. He's an absolute legend. Man. Absolute legend. Kellogg's, right? Yeah, Kellogg Brand. Battle yeah. Creek, Michigan. There we go. That's right up. That's 25 minutes from my hometown of Kalamazoo. And every school would take a bus ride to the Kellogg's factory and we'd take a tour and you'd get pop tarts on your oh, way. Oh, that's bomb. That's you'd fine. Little, remember those mini packs of cereal? Yeah. And then you get pop tarts. Damn. You get a you get one bag with the two pop tarts in it. You get to pick your flavor. Wow, man. That's dope. I like that. We never I remember in summer camp. We took a trip to Brenham for the ice cream bluebell factory. Oh yeah, that's always cool. But there was nothing really like that, you know, for school. I don't know what. I guess you could take a trip to Waco. Is that where Dr Pepper is? Yeah. Have you yeah. ever done that? Have you ever gone in there? They get the little Dr Pepper float. Nah. -uh. <laughs> oh yeah, free. Just wow. go in there. They'll pour it for you. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's a good, that's, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because to me, that's like one of the little hidden gems on I-35. Oh yeah. Go to the Dr. Pepper plant or whatever headquarters, yeah. get that little Dr. Pepper float. Yeah, man. So Kellogg's responsible for Pop-Tarts, Cheez-Its, Pringles. Yeah. Future grain bars. Yeah, I'm all that cereal. stuff didn't exist when I went on my tour. It was frosted flakes or whatever and pop tarts. It Fruit was cereal. Loops weren't around? Huh? Fruit Loops weren't around? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But all the Kellogg cereals, all OG cereals and pop tarts. That was it. Now it's Cheez Its, like you said, and all kind of crackers, Pringles. Yeah. Yo, the, the underrated Manu Ginobili cereal of the Kellogg crew, Crispix. I agree. Don't sleep on Crispix. It might not be Fruit Loops. It might not be Frosted Flakes. But yo, man, I will go down <laughs> on some Crispix. You know why? Dog. Because it stays crispy in milk better than all the Czech cereals. Yo. You ain't lying. Period. Period. Boom. You ain't lying. Yeah. Now that I'm in my thirties too, I am trying to cut back on the sugar a little bit. Not, not. You know, I gotta have my OG stuff. You know, Fruit Loops and Frosted Flakes every now and then too. But yeah, now I like to think that I'm eating healthy with the Crispix. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So. Right. Yeah. Even though cereal with inflation, cereal about five dollars a box now, and you know them. Them days Almost as much as Girl Scout cookies. Oh, God. I'm still looking for, you know, a hustler with these Girl Scout cookies. They got to be some that falling off the back of the truck that I get me for three a box. You know, have me some deals. Give me four for 12, something. Yeah, you got to catch them. $24 for four? That's nuts, man. That's nuts. Little peanut butter patties. Only 15 come in the box. What am I supposed to do with that? I mean, didn't it used to be 20? Now it's 15? That's not bad. Come on, man. I feel, like I, I feel like those, I keep saying the little slots where the cookies go in, I feel like it's getting wider and wider. Yeah, yeah. and I, I need some statistics too. Like, where is this going to? You know what I'm saying? Like, are these girls, because I, I feel like this is like NIL type stuff. Like, where am I getting back by being a booster for Girl Scouts. You're I'm getting mansions the for the head of Girl Scouts. Like the See, troop only gets, they only get like 50 cents a box. That's what I have a problem with. That, that's what I have a problem with. 
<laughs> that's what I. That's what Meanwhile, I. Meanwhile, the head of Girl Scouts is like in a mansion. Let me have my guy. Look at KD I, in the shadows. Yo, I know. Yo, I know. There you go. In the shadow. In the shadows, man. No cook, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this guy right here. Look at that. He's got, his, he's, he's, wow. got his playoff, he's got his playoff stash going. Joe, what kid is fucking trapped in your closet right now? <laughs> man, you know, I, I have a, uh, my, my godmother has her 70th birthday party, and she said, we'll dress up in 70s attire. And my wife goes, well, you should get a prop. I'm like, I got the prop right here. So that's my plan. <laughs> I'm good to go, Joe said. I love I it. it. I love it. That's oh, a good look, God. man. You ready for baseball? I am. This is going to be a fun weekend with the uh, with San Diego coming to town and looking forward to when they head to Minute Maid because that's always uh, a fun match up when with some sec teams but it's it's gonna be a fun season one more big 12 ride right chip yeah yeah yes. let's see what let's see how that pitching looks LBJ. it's always a question but it's always fun to find out the answer isn't it yeah yeah because if that pitching and they it, maybe they have more than two arms in the bullpen you know what i'm saying i i've never been you know katie you can kind of emphasize this but like healthy programs they replace one to two rotation arms a year. Yeah. But it's kind of fig- you, you can't buy a bullpen in college. You can in that in the MLB. Just look at the uh the Astros. Uh, but you can't buy a bullpen. That's where you got to develop arms, and that's where the, the big question is with Texas this year, it feels like. Katie, are you trying to hide? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, I just got back and I don't have I didn't have my my light I usually put on here. So um Dealing Yo, with that. That, the, the, hey, as long as the internet's on point, that's the main thing, KD. The internet, every no glitch. You ain't doing the robot and I mean, none of that shit. Like we're you talking about that. Kevin Dunn, heartthrob from the real world, and he's depriving all of his viewers. Uh, I know. I, I, I'm also sick right now. You can probably hear it, so I'm not. You know, it, it's probably better off that way. All right, I won't. Uh, Chip, I'll... Chip, we can see your beautiful face. We can see Zay, and we can see, you know. I know, but I'm leaving. Joe, who gives rides with that mustache, not for free. Oh, come on. Hey, hey no, Joe, you look like, like a 73 Burt Reynolds, dog. Don't let these guys hate on you. You look good, man. You look it's good. It's about eight, eight days in, too, so we'll see what happens when I got to wear it in in uh, about 11 more days. That is good. That is good. All right, fellas. All right. See you, fellas. See you guys. Have a great show. Joe, what is up? You know, I'm getting around. You actually look good with that, man. And I don't think I could grow that. You've actually grown it. It grows all the way through. I know. And I, I've, I've joked around. I give I give this a try like every two or three years because everything else just doesn't fill in. Um, and, hey, BK is kind of the same way. It fills in here and then nowhere else. Uh, but it, I'm giving it a shot, and uh, I kind of like it. And uh, Yeah. Everybody I mean, else seems to as well. We're kidding around. It actually, you actually pull that off. Um, so I couldn't. Probably, probably why I'm jealous. I like the backdrop there, though, man. I know, man. My the view from my new apartment's pretty nice, isn't it? <laughs> so where, you, where, where, where exactly would that be, right there? I'm trying to think. That would be like uh, in a hell helicopter of... over Bass Concert Hall. Yeah, basically. that's exactly what I was thinking. It's like, are you, are you living at the top of Bass right now? Or the art building, something like that, and right, there, exactly. there's your art for you in the background. But no, I'm What's I'm about to uh, move up uh, in town to to far west, and I'll have an office. I got some good uh, good memorabilia I want to throw up, and the I think one of the crown jewels is going to be one. I had a uh, front page story on the San Antonio Express News when I was an intern, and the other is I don't know if you've heard of this. Daryl Royal and my cousin Dan Cook recorded a 33 way, way back when. And it's called The Ballad of Daryl Royal. And I have it on vinyl. And a vintage shop was handing them out as like party favors. And my wife went and bought one. It's like, hey, I got this like new burnt orange dress. And they gave me this vinyl. And I look at it, I'm like, the only place I knew that had that was a was a bar in Galveston that got flooded during Ike. So 
yes, thank you. I'm taking that from you. Uh, and she went and got it uh, framed for. Hold for on, Valentine's hold on. Day. Slow down here, Joe. Are you being serious? Yeah. The the ballad of Daryl Royal. Um, I I took a picture of it yesterday. So it's it's narrated by my cousin uh, Dan Cook. I don't know if Daryl himself is on it. Narrated by Bill Shomit and Dan Cook. And that is awesome, man. When when did they when did they do this? Oh, I couldn't tell you. Uh, it's got a uh, Vincent Danino University of Texas band uh, in the background. Here, hold on one second. I'll try to get the i can post it on the kind of credibly post it but ah hold on you're gonna get to see my uh backdrop which is just some some blinds real quick uh we're all good (laughs) but yeah there we go so that's what it looks like daryl royal ballad of daryl royal uh legend of the longhorns that is awesome where can yeah. people get where can people get this so oh my my wife got it from a place called adelante uh okay. which is right by uh santa rita's on what is that 38th and uh lamar basically uh that's where she got it i don't know if they still have that deal going on but um like i said they're handing them out as party favors and i once she brought it home i'm like you need to hang on to that because I want it. And she went, my beautiful wife went and got that frame for Valentine's Day. So it's going to be a a fixture for me in my uh, new apartment. That is really damn cool, man. Really damn cool. Sounds like you got the right woman too. I, I know I did. Yeah. No, you knew before, but there's things like that that just validate everything, right? Absolutely. She's She's the best. She's a... Native of West Point, Mississippi, and I always tell her that she's the second most famous person to come from West Point. And I'll give you, I'll, I'll send you ten dollars right away if you can tell me the most famous person to come from West Point. From West Point, Mississippi. Can I get a hint? Blues. Blues. Um, it's not Elvis, uh, and it's I don't know. Blues stuff. I mean, you know, that's, I know you're it's not a bad stuff. guess. It's it's Howlin' Wolf. Okay, I wouldn't have got that. That's pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, pretty impressive, so, man. So uh Howlin' Wolf, and then Mrs. Cook is number two. Well, hey, uh, tell Mrs. Cook, thank you for letting Mr. Cook join us here. Trey is off today, and uh, I don't know what he's up to, but thank you so much, man. You know how much I I think of you, and uh, right away. BK was like, I was like, Joe Cook. I was like, he's like, and what a minute. He's like, he can do an hour. I was like, what about Sean? So we got Sean Clinch coming up and uh, think the world of both y'all, man. How you been up? How you been? What have you been up to? I'm good. It's uh, one of the, those times of year where I'm kind of digging for for football stories. And we got a lot of NFL draft stuff to to keep us yep. very, uh, very busy. You know, don't, sometimes it's like, is there any long or are there any Longhorns? in any mock drafts this time it's how many longhorns are in mock drafts so we got that going on uh we got all the stuff from from chris del conte on tuesday which is always extremely fascinating and then you know i've i've i'm i'm weird about this covering a very fun excellent basketball team is a lot of fun last year was so much fun and you know just seeing if the conversation was are they going to win the big 12 and that's preferable, but there's a weird fascination I have with, are they in like bubble stuff and turn and just, are they in this, you know, projected field of 64? Are they in there? Like, I know it's nerve wracking, but there's a little bit of, uh, of fun with just kind of checking in on all the bubble stuff, all the, you know, quadrant one, quadrant two, that type of thing. And so I'm having a blast this time of February, just tracking basketball and tracking the NFL draft. And uh, of course, we've got baseball starting up this weekend, Kevin. I know we're going to get to baseball. I want to get to, I want to pick your brain on on some of the maybe new things CDC talked about. Um, But let's talk a little basketball here. Is Texas in? I mean, they're off this week. And they have Houston, obviously, what, in, in two days but they've had a, a week to, to maybe get shit straight. Are they in today? 
I think they're in today. Um, the Big 12's been a league where if you're eight and ten, you're good. Um, if you're seven and eleven, you may have to fight a little bit, and that may mean a one win in in Kansas City, but you're typically good. Uh, but you know, if I, I think they're in today, but they they have to get to that eight and ten point. Um, if they win this weekend, if they win at Houston, something nobody else has done all year, uh, and something they were close to doing at least in in the Moody Center a couple weeks ago, man, it, it looks really good because if if they have the wherewithal to win against Houston, then you have a a good sense that they can maybe go to Waco and give a good game and, of course, take care of business against Oklahoma State. Uh, right now they're in, but, man, eight, eight, 8 and 10 is that magic number. It's been the magic number in the Big 12 for the past few years, and I, I don't see that changing at this point. But uh, a win against the, the Cougars would go a long way towards taking care of that. Um, and I know – like I, I don't want to cover the NIT. I, I it's it's God. fun to get some extra games uh, from a reporter standpoint. It's kind of cool for access because we get to go into the locker room and coaches aren't afraid to maybe experiment a little bit more than than they typically have because it, it's the NIT. But my my standard as a fan is: Are you in the tournament? I'd love to win the conference. I'd love to go. You know, thirty and one. But I want to. If I'm a fan, and and there are a lot of times where I am, like I just want to be in the tournament. Like I want to know that, like on Thursday, I get the early slate, I get the middle slate, and then at the late slate, I have a game to cover. I have a game for my team to cover. That's my standard. Just going back and you know thinking about Longhorn basketball in the past. Uh, but that's. I'm curious how you think because you 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 go back for a night. You go back to the the running horns and and <laughs> sorry to age you, but you go back to where no. you know basketball and making the tournament wasn't always the standard. It was always kind of a a happy circumstance instead of an expectation almost. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd really go back to Mike Wacker and Alex Broadway and and those guys. I mean, mid eighties. Um, Bob Weltlick. Uh, Unfortunately. Yeah, the Bobby Knight disciple, Bob Weltlick, man. He had a personality personality to like AIDS, dude. Uh, that guy was just um, – and they bring in Tom Penders, whose personality may have been a little too much, um, but did a good job. Um, then obviously Barnes, who's the best coach in, in school history. So, I mean, yeah, I it's funny. I, I probably still have – I mean, the expectations have changed, but I go back and you're exactly right. I mean, growing up, it it was awesome when they made the tournament. I mean, I remember a lot of years them not making the tournament. And if they did, they got bounced right away. And you just kind of dealt with it. I mean, it was frustrating as a kid because I loved college basketball so much. But, you know, watching Texas and college basketball back then was kind of like watching Texas and football back then. I mean, it felt like there was – major college that I watched like serious high level stuff. And then I watched Texas in the Southwest conference, you know um, whether that was football or, or obviously in basketball, but yeah, I, I, I still kind of remember that. So maybe I'm not as, as hypercritical as um, I, I guess I, I never mind. I take that back. Cause then you get to a point where Barnes got them really good. And it was like, you, you really expected to maybe get to that second weekend. Uh, I don't expect that right now, but I'll say this of the major sports. No Texas sport has improved more or jumped up more in my lifetime than Texas basketball. I mean, hell, they may have been like 35th overall, 36th overall, and they may be, you know, 21 overall right now. I don't know. I haven't gone through it. And it depends how you want to measure it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was definitely, you know, it's definitely been cool to kind of see where they've gone. And this team's been weird, man, because I want to pick your brain. I mean, you know, I think the the addition of Weaver in his minutes has been really big. We've seen that. But it feels like, you know, Rodney Terry and the staffs and the team itself been trying to figure out what the right mix is. And I don't know if they have all the parts, but it feels like they have the parts. They just haven't figured out necessarily how all those go together. Is that fair? Yeah, I think – if you look at that Iowa state game and think about what went wrong, what led to Texas almost being down 20 points at halftime, it's that 
when they tried to defend, they weren't successful. I don't think there was bad effort on a, on every possession. There was bad effort on some possessions. Uh, but on the defensive end, they tried to defend, weren't successful. Iowa State was just making shots. And when you're making shots, it means you got to take the ball out from under the basket. The defense can go back, and they can set up. Rodney Terry has not been shy about saying we need to run this here. And I think that's because he knows that he basically has two, maybe two and a half, if you want to throw in Tyrese Hunter on a good night, but two and a half bucket getters. And that's Acemas, Disu, and Hunter. Um, if they're not able to run, I mean, we've seen it. The, they, they're not a very great half court offense team. And I love Kendall Weaver as much as you do, but he doesn't have a, a great shot. He's an effort player right now. And yep. Dylan Mitchell at, at 6'9 and you know 220 or whatever he is, he's a elevated effort player. And that's not to say he's not going to be valued by uh, NBA teams, but it's just to say what he is at this point. Um, so running is is what this team needs to, to be able to do. Uh, they need to push the pace a little bit more. But in order to be able to push the pace – they got to play defense, and that's what you saw a little bit against uh, West Virginia. Uh, of course, making shots like Clay, like Clay Thompson, like Disu did, that's going to solve any issue. If you're shooting seventy percent from three on the night, like yeah, you're good, you're going to be fine. That's why you win Big Twelve Player of the Week. But um, th this team, in order to be at its best, it it's got to run. It's got to run in transition. Um, it's got to it, Max Acemas, and he's been good at this. Has to find spots on the floor that defenses haven't been able to like check check on yet um and that starts with that starts with defense it really does and they've been good they haven't been great uh rebounding they've been good they haven't been great they've just been a middle of the you know, I don't want to say middle of the pack but I think that's about right despite what their standing is uh closer to the bottom of the league they've been a middle of the pack big 12 team that's still better than a lot of teams. Like they're still about to be top 30 in net, which replaced RPI. Like they're still top 25, I think in Ken Palm, which I think matters a lot. And if you go to bracket matrix, which checks on a lot of the projections for the field of 68, they're in like 95% of them. So uh, are they great within the big 12 conference? You know what? Maybe not. And that that's what happens. Are they great? Overall, maybe not, but are they a tournament team that uh, if they're an eight seed playing a nine seed, that that nine seed is not going to want to face and that maybe a one seed is going to be a little little apprehensive about? I, I feel like that's the case, and that looks like where they're going to be uh, in a couple weeks. Yeah, I don't remember college basketball ever being this wide open. Um, I mean, you can call it parity. Everyone just looks – average to me um i know you got connecticut and 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 uh purdue at the very top it's two, it's two teams at the top right now yeah and and maybe, uh, one. maybe one considering what we've seen for purdue in recent years i would say one i mean purdue's got ed obviously and that's a good basketball team but you know everyone looks more than beatable to me in fairness i really haven't seen a, a ton of uconn um so maybe they are just uh that far ahead but yeah, if you're an eight or a nine, dude, you, you can beat a one seed. Like, uh, you know, we've seen more. What is it? I saw a stat the other day. It was, you know, it was surprising, even though I knew that a lot of top 10 teams had lost at home against two unranked teams. But that should tell you, man, this is a tournament, Joe. Just get in. You get mm -hmm. in and get hot. Anyone can make a run. I mean, this, this would be the type of year where a, a 14 seed could make the sweet 16 and it would not shock anyone if they get the right matchup, you know, it's just one of those things where the portal does definitely help the high level teams. I mean, look at Kansas. They're, they're so good in the big 12. Uh, they're, they may not be up to their standard, but Hunter Dickinson's helping them out. Um, LJ Cryer is playing a, a key part to, to U of H, but think about that. Like LJ Cryer was at Baylor. And Baylor is now what third or fourth in the Big Twelve. Yeah. Still a great team, but that key piece is now on Cullen Avenue instead of on MLK Drive up in Waco. And you just think of that that one example that goes across the sport. Um, you know, it, it just it, it's a lot of different places. I mean, 
the guys like Armando Baycott at North Carolina are rare. Yeah. And it's still in, in, just because he's there doesn't mean that they're unaffected. You know, they've lost their own, some of their own guys. So uh, it, it's, it's a re- really weird year in, in college basketball. And it's just made the, the, the sport very portal driven. And, and also you still need to get those, those studs. You know, I, I know um, Ron Holland is having a statistically great year in the G league, but I don't know if it's been a, a great year for him uh overall Texas is gonna use that guy and then uh you yeah. know Trey Trey Johnson Texas needs him next year and they need yeah. Nick Cody they need uh I'm blanking on the guy from from South Carolina right now like those are you you build through the not you build you supplement through the portal but you still need those guys who are one and done level players to come through and uh, Texas needs to make sure they get those guys for next year, especially in the SEC and, and KD. Um, you know, we've always talked about the Big 12 in basketball and, and things like that. Uh, but we have to admit that with this ESPN contract that Texas is going to reap the benefits of, these SEC jobs, not only in men's basketball, but women's basketball, and especially baseball, like they're going to become destination jobs because they're going to be able to pay more from the trickle down effect from the whole athletic department as well. That's a great point. Um, yeah, they, they, you know, it's just, it's so weird. I mean, I, I get Holland doing what he wants to, and he's playing with Matas for that G league team, right? Ignite. Mm-hmm. Um, Matas uh, Buzeka is uh, is a guy we recruited and got to know his family a little bit. That that kid's going to be really damn good. And Holland sounds like he's going to be good. I just kind of wonder what the future of college basketball is. I mean, I, I guess it's this, but uh, it's just, you know, it just seems like it'd be really damn hard to build a team right now. And if you're at UT, you've got a lot of advantages, but even then, and look, we're seeing it in football and baseball too. So I understand it. it it's in a lot of these big time sports. It's just so fluid and year to year. I mean, can you really build the foundation or are you just restarting every year? It's tough. I don't, I don't blame college coaches of, of any sport for trying to get into the professional ranks, but I don't either. It's, yeah. It's, I mean, I, I like college life. sports both more than pro sports. If I but and people always hear this, they're like, I thought you were a bigger college guy than pro guy. Oh, I am. But if I was coaching, dude, I'd be doing everything I could to to get to the pro level. Yeah. And I, I even like college carousel changes can can indicate that. I, I think uh what was it, Georgia State's head coach went to go be a like run game coordinator at South Carolina. Because that is still a step up. And again, a lot of these guys are resetting their clock. They don't want to get fired as a Georgia yeah. State head coach. That's um, a great that's a great point, Joe. And that's an underrated point that I don't think a lot of people get. That that happened with Chip Kelly. That probably yeah. happened with with Halfley at Boston College. Yeah. Um happened Womack, with, happened Womack at South Alabama probably didn't happen to him, but Womack's a good example. Well, yeah, yeah. He and that was a well respected defensive coordinator who's had a great job, done a great job at South Alabama. And we'll see if uh if Major can keep it going. I think he took over for him. He did. So and that and then that could lead to a springboard for Major as well. Like if he goes, if he wins 10 games in, in Mobile again and or maybe in back to back years, yeah, you know, he'd like a head coaching job, but maybe he could get a power five offensive coordinator job and be back on the up and up. You know, he was Saban's first offensive coordinator, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about before he came back and and worked for Mac. But like it, the the way the carousel operates just on all sports is just been changed entirely by the way the portal works. Yeah, no question. Um, all right, let's get to some uh, college baseball here. Um, we got uh, first game tomorrow. You know, I'm always excited with college baseball coming around. Um, I know there's not many people, I can't think of anyone I'd, I'd rather ask than you and kind of dig into this team. You know, it, it does look like they should, you talked about the bullpen, I definitely want to get to that, but their starting pitching should be a strength this year. You got OBJ coming back. You got Tanner Witt. Um, kind of 
take us through what you see with the starting pitching this year. It's going to be LBJ starting off on on Friday nights. Uh, that's you know that 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 gives you a more than solid foundation for uh, getting your weekend going. Um, and watching him was one of the the best developments I feel like of of last season. You went from him being a bullpen guy to him becoming you know the best pitcher on staff. Basically, uh, I didn't get to make it to the dish for. Uh, David Pierce's, you know, preseason press conference, but kind of looking at some other reporting, uh, especially from Danny Davis at the States, Statesman, it's going to go LBJ, Charlie Hurley, and then TBA on Sunday. And, you know, the, the question, of course, is where's Wit? I got to watch a, a, a practice. I think we all watched spring uh, or, excuse me, fall ball. The velocity is still coming back with Wit. It's not hmm. there yet. Where's um, he? Where's he sitting right now? Ninety. I remember taking notes. I think his fastball was was still low nineties, um, and he's 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 trying to become a three pitch guy, which he needs to be if he wants to become you know a professional player. But he doesn't have the velocity that really stood out right now. He doesn't have the velocity that stood out during his freshman year when he was one of the best bullpen pieces and you'd come in and throw 94 on the, you know, back end of someone like Pete Hansen or um, whoever else was on that 2021 team, just, or Ty Madden. Yeah. You couldn't go 99 to 94 with Madden to, to wit just because it's not throwing 94 right now. It, it's still in the. It felt like he was sitting 95, 96 too back in the day. Yeah. So um, they they feel like LeBaron Johnson is going to give them what they need. Charlie Hurley uh, has, has earned a spot. Sunday what, do you think of, what, do you, what do you think of Hurley? Because I watched him in the alumni game. Um, he, got, he got beat around a little bit. You can never take much out of that. But he was sitting at 90, 91. Who knows with that gun? Um, do you like his stuff? I do. I, I feel like David Pierce knows how to work with these tall pitchers who I don't want to say raw because they're not raw. Uh, but tall pitchers who have a little bit of velo or just have that downward angle, yeah. that's really tough to take uh, to, to pick up on. Um, so I, I like I like what he offers. Uh, he offered some good stuff last year as well. Um, pitching's at least frontline pitching, I feel like they're going to be in good shape. Uh, I like one through six, I feel like they're going to be in good shape. Figuring out catcher. Figuring out whether they do Jared Thomas at first or in center, uh, and then figuring out some of the other spots in the lineup like DH and even right field. That's that's really what's going to define this team, and I think that's what's going to be worth watching over the first you know 10, 15 games of the season as they play some great competition uh, and as they play some you know not great competition. They they have a pretty friendly home schedule this year. Yeah. Uh, before they head to the SEC, like I don't think they're going to be really challenged at home until conference play starts, and I'm I'm fine with that. I remember a couple of years ago, and I think you do too. They they played the gauntlet and they played yeah. them home road wherever it was. That can build a team, it can break a team, and it build it it built that team. But when you have to bring in some guys year over year and and figure out where they fit, I. I have no problem with yeah getting the challenges in but also being able to get in some of the the games that are giving your guys opportunities to get some hits get some at bats get some innings in it, it can definitely break a team um if they're not prepared for it but it, as you mentioned it can obviously probably built them and help them out a couple of years ago i'm fine with that i'm you know you don't really know who you are but i'm totally fine with them maybe not knowing who they are until they get to conference play or at least forming it. Um, what about the bullpen? You know, that that seems to be the number one question. Do they have enough arms? You know, I the big loss is Will Mercer. And he was a – he went to strike Jesuit in Houston, I'm pretty sure. Uh, was a transfer from Notre Dame. I think he was on those really great Notre Dame teams that Link Jarrett sent to the yeah, he was. No, I, mean, I remember him he was good I was excited about that and then out for the season like and, and when you're a college team 
knowing who the eighth or ninth inning is going to be maybe one to two times a week, that's a huge advantage. It's a huge uh, just luxury. I'm not sure who that is right now. Um, I think David Pierce is trying to figure that out. And like I said, I, I got caught up in between writing some stuff about Chris Del Conte and, and basketball to where I couldn't make it to the dish today to, to hear from David Pierce. And uh, that may, that may show up on, on YouTube and, and stuff like that to hear what he said. But like, like I mentioned, you, you can't, you can't, settle for a Brayu in arbitration, sign Ryan Presley on an extension and then go and get Josh Hader. Like right. you, for the most part, you have to develop your bullpen. And so that's, that's what I'm really looking to see. This is going to be a, a great test for David Pierce, the pitching coach to prove to David Pierce, the manager, the head coach that he can put together a staff, put together a bullpen that can help with, you know, getting the, the bridge from, LeBaron Johnson to the ninth inning or from Charlie Hurley to the ninth inning. And, you know, I, I know there's been complaints from Texas fans year over year about the bullpen under Pierce, at least maybe since 2021 or maybe 2021 accepted. And I go back to that. Like you don't buy bullpens in, in college baseball. You, you have to develop those guys. When you think about the guys that David Pierce likes, he likes – toolsy pitchers he likes some taller guys who have velocity who may not be super refined uh as far as location goes but he's willing to fight those battles if he's got you know a 95 ish mile an hour fastball and downward motion with some of his stuff it's worked cole quintanilla tanner witt uh whoever else was on that staff i'm struggling to remember a little bit it hadn't worked but that's the approach he takes. Uh, and as pitching coach, I think we're going to see if he can develop some more of those, um, you know, stuff pitchers, toolsy pitchers to be able to be a little bit more regular and being strike throwers this upcoming season. And that'll determine the bullpen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was going through it uh, today and, and, you know, there are a couple names I, I recognize, but I just was going through it. I'm like, shit, do they have enough arms, man? Um, so I'm curious how it's going to play out. I will say this just as a fan, um, they, they, they gotta, they gotta throw more strikes, man. That's yeah. one thing during the Pierce era. And I get it. I grew up with Gus and Augie. So, you know, two legendary hall of famers, but man, I remember when I was doing play by play for, for, uh, for UT. I would go down, you'd go to some of the practices, obviously, and, and went to one practice during the week. And I'm in right field, skips in the bullpen with a guy. And it was, uh, I forgot his name, and I probably wouldn't give it anyway. But this guy was like, this guy's throwing mid-90s, breaking off a huge slider. And I'm back there with Skip. And I go, Skip, I go, where the hell has this guy been, man? I'm like, how come we haven't seen him? He goes, he doesn't throw strikes. Like you just weren't going to get on the mound if you walked guys, and mm -hmm. and I, I'm done with that. Give up 450 foot shots. Do not walk guys. So I'm hoping that they they do throw more strikes this year. And and one thing is that when you think about catcher, you go from Silas Arduan to Garrett Gillamette. Those are guys who can. I don't. They they don't solve the problem because they only get the ball once it crosses the plate. Right. But they can help with that issue. I'm not denigrating Ryland Gal Galvan or uh, Kimball Schusler, but I, I don't think that they're, at least at this point in their career, the quality of catcher that uh, Gillimet or uh, certainly Silas. were. So yeah. it, it, I think strike throwing is at a premium. I do. I wonder about this for you. You know, as long as I've been going to the dish, and I think I, my best memories are all after that. Uh, that regional, ugh, sorry to bring up bad memories, but that regional at Round Rock where they lost, I think, to one of the UC schools in 07, it was? UC Irvine, Ben yep. Orloff, and uh, yeah. And that bad first base um, first baseline umpire. Um, yeah. Basically, my, my recollection of the dish has been how it is in the current form. Uh, so what do you think about that Yeti Yard announcement that they made uh, talking about the the left field area that's going to give them some field level, um, just 
I don't want to I don't want to call it premium seating because I think it's not premium seating like suites, but like what do you think of the fact that there's gonna be some field level action for fans out in left center? I love it. I mean, I think what uh, you know, Mark and Occupy Left Field, what they've done has been awesome. Um, it's a really good scene. I mean, honestly, I, I wish they'd pardon me, as I mentioned, uh, if you guys are just joining. I'm a little under the weather, so you can probably hear it and um, and see it. Um, I I love where they're going. I I I think they need to completely redo that. I know they don't own apparently Cabal Street or that area. They, they need you to buy, buy a city of Austin Street. As weird as it sounds, <laughs> yeah. Guess what? You UT can. Um, so they need to clear all that shit out. They need to turn it into Mississippi State or a real SEC type feel and create a whole berm out there and put grass in because you know it looks like we got plastic over our fucking couches with the turf it looks awful um for me at least i, I think it looks cheap and uh just not good so there are a lot of things i would like to see change but i think this is a good start and i mean i've seen it so i'm curious to get your take but what's what it sounds like it sounds like it's going to be something that will be a nice addition yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of what the closest equivalent I can think of is. Um, center field at Minute Maid, just kind of that little area under the. Uh, oh, that's a good call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It basically it's 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 like a bullpen. Um, to there, there's no other real equivalent I can think of. If if they ever decided to put a bullpen in left center, that's what it would look like. Except they put some places where you can buy bottles and beer out right. there. Um, and, and Chris Del Conte, even on, on Tuesday, talked about how it's part of the SEC thing. You know, they can't buy Comal. Uh, they can't build on top of the main parking entrance. So it's how do they add a presence out there? Uh, just in state, you know, Tech doesn't have anything. Baylor doesn't have anything. But if you go to Olsen Field, which I think you've been to and you would recognize, despite it being in College Station, it's a pretty fun college baseball par- ballpark to go it, to. It, it's, a, have, it's, a, it's a top three park in college baseball. In my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. There's just not weird fitting, who, not fitting for the program, which is just fallen on its ass, you know, for a hundred years. There's just weird people to get that in there, that stadium. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but still, you know, along the train tracks where they count train engines in their spare time, like there's a big outfield seating area. Um, filled with students. That's part of the atmosphere. And I think that's something that uh, Texas wanted. Um, as far as expansion goes, I, all they talk about is is third base line. And that's about all they can think about expanding. Uh, but I think Chris Del Conte did make a point. Like, you look at the dish right now, its capacity is like 7,500 on a regular basis without adding any big seats. They can pump it up to about 8,000 on regionals and stuff like that. But they don't want to make any major changes when, you know, on Tuesdays, UIW is coming to town. And yeah. uh, no matter what they announce, UIW is not going to draw 4,500, let, let alone 7,500. So right. it's a it's a tough balance. But I I, I think that the, the program understands, the athletic department, that is, understands how important baseball is, understands the need to make it a destination, and understands that once they get to the SEC, the most competitive sport isn't going to be football, but it's going to be baseball. And if you want to continue to be the University of Texas at Omaha, that's where your toughest competition is going to be. Sark's going to have his work cut out for him, but David Pierce is too. And I think everybody recognizes that, but I, I think Texas fans have to understand that as well. Yeah, though Pierce is a lot in front of him. I'll be curious, you know, if he's the coach in in three or four years. Hopefully, obviously, he is because that means Texas has been doing well. Um, Yeah, for too long, they didn't appreciate this program and they just kind of let it run on its own, which is also why they they did well. I mean, there there was definitely a feeling I know with Augie and those teams like, you know what? Fuck those guys. They don't care about us and we're going to go fucking shove it up their ass because of that. And, and also, we're not like them. We're not soft like the football program. We're not soft like the basketball program. We're doing our own thing. We're UT, but but we don't have the same genetic makeup. We're like an adopted you know brother. 
and we don't mind scrapping. Um, and that was certainly the the thought. And then obviously with Mike Perrin in the last coaching hire, um, you know, they put a cap on and and almost felt like they didn't want the baseball program to be that good. Like you guys have done all this despite the fact that we're not trying to give you what you need. Um, and that's a little kind of behind the scenes making making the sauce at that point. Uh, but I'm I'm very curious kind of where they go because I I think the baseball program for me it's it's the second biggest one on campus and they need as much funding and as much help as they can get because I think you hit the nail on the head, man. I look at the SEC right now and dude, that's gonna be no joke in baseball. It's gonna be no joke in football, but baseball is gonna be whoa. I always bring it up this way. When you look at the SEC fr- footprint, where are the MLB teams? They're in Texas and they're in uh Florida, which you know its own thing, and they're in Atlanta. So right. yeah, that a lot of the SEC footprint. They're big Braves fans or they're big Astros fans. You can go all the way on I-10, all the way to the Mississippi-Louisiana border and find some diehard Astros fans. But what are they doing on weekends when it's not football season? In Fayetteville or in the state of Arkansas, they're going to Baum Walker. Aggies are Aggies. They're going to do Aggie things. Like, they're going to go to Bluebell. Um, same thing with Auburn. You know, they're going to go to the, the parking lot. Uh both Mississippi schools, Tennessee is going to go to that Cracker Jack box. Georgia is going to find their way. Like that, it is a big deal because not only is it the football off season, but it's a sport that they a lot of people like, but they don't have a pro team to like go to within a two hour drive. So they'll go and do that and spend a weekend there. So uh, it's got to be it's got to be emphasized. Um, I do have before I I got to roll out in a couple minutes, but I do want to get one question for you. Yeah. And that is just kind of looking around at some of the, uh, you know, now you, you experienced DKR in a broadcast booth. You've experienced it as a, as a fan. And then kind of hearing what Chris Del Conte talked about as far as making improvements to the game day experience, they, they seem to get it right. Like between you, the diehard, between the the weekend fan who goes to you know one game a year and all that, it looks and feels like they understand how to make people make it so people feel like make it so people feel like they get the most out of their dollar whenever they go to their DKR. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, as much as I may, you know, baseball is not what I want it to look like um, yet, or the dish shouldn't. Um, DKR is like what I envisioned as a little kid, you know, when there was a huge track and it was wide open in the South. And I just remember thinking, God, why can't we look like Tennessee? You know, why can't this thing be all the way around and right on there? Um, and now that they're putting in grass, I don't think that turf looks as bad as the dish turf. I mean, the dish turf looks like, bro. It's just the multicolor factor. If it was all one color, if it, yeah. if the sliding pads were burnt orange, yes, it's no problem at all. But you got the Longhorn, you got the sliding pads, you got home plate. It's weird. Yeah, and and, and dude, put dirt in there. Yes, um, you know, I mean, come on, like, I mean, are we that cheap? Um, I mean, I see, I see some of these programs that have grass. I'm like, so they can pay for that to keep that up, but we can't, you know. Um, so I, anyway, getting back to your point, I love what they've done. I think they've done an amazing job with the whole experience, game day experience, fan experience, the concerts, uh, the tailgating is so much better. Just the environment is so much better. Um, it's a lot better than when you were in school. No kidding. I remember, what was it? My junior year or something like that. What was it like the the pack in DKR game? And it's like, yeah, we're gonna get going. And then the two week window pops up, and it's like that game's at eleven a.m. <laughs> so get there early, pump up DKR for you know get get uh, uh prepared right at, uh, eleven a.m. So it, it's a lot better. Like, it, hey, it, go ahead, continue. No, I was gonna say like I would be able to go to places like even Baylor, Baylor at night when they were humming that was a tough place to play and yeah. granted a lot of that noise was artificial coming from the the scoreboard 
still, it wasn't an easy place to play. And that's not to say Texas is an easy place to play, just looking at sheer numbers um, and kind of the, the tenor of the fan as well. But last year, this year, like, it's been one of the toughest places to play. And I think a lot of it has to do with, of course, the product on the field, uh, but also just some of the things that they've done to make it uh, uh, an entertaining product when when game action isn't going on. Like my my favorite thing, and uh, my friend uh, Kat, she'll she'll love this. She's always been like a big on on the Texas fight chant, and whenever they did the thing where like they do Texas on one side with one lights or with people doing their cell phone lights, and then the other side does the same. I'm pretty sure like she died and went to heaven just to see like half. Yeah. That half of the same do Texas with the lights. And then that half of the same do fight with like, they've elevated it to make it a place worthy of, you know, sec football and also a hundred, 1000 people as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously joining the sec, it's never going to be as crazy of an environment. And some of that is us as fans, like, and I'm okay with that. You know I mean? But let's get loud and let's make sure it is at least some type of home field advantage. Hey, before you get out of here, what about UT baseball all the way around? I mean, you think this will be a talented uh, lineup? Yeah, you know, you'll. I'm, I'm very curious. Getting back to our point, they're going to have to score some runs this year. They are. And I think they'll be able to. Uh, they have a, a potent offense, whether it's uh, Porter Brown, Jared Thomas, and uh, Peyton Powell. Uh, I think Jalen Flores is going to be able to do some or is going to be able to do some great things. Um, looking forward to seeing what happens at catcher. I think Jack O'Dowd provides a, a real experienced player there in the middle infield. You know, I I kind of have these ba- baseline standards of non-football sports. Like I'd mentioned, like with with basketball, make the tournament because if you make the tournament. It's a pretty good year, you know. Maybe it's eight and ten, maybe it's eleven and eight, or maybe it's eleven and seven. Uh, but if you make the tournament, you're a top team. You're probably a top forty team in the country, top thirty, because you may not be one in the Big Twelve. You may not be winning your league. When it comes to Texas, like my standard is get to the super regional. You know, this is baseball is a, a game of bounces. It's a it's a game where a lot of different things can happen. And they were a shoddy pair of stadium lights away from being able to play for a, a spot in Omaha in a year where no one really expected them to. Yeah. Like that, that really showed a lot about, I think, a, a lot of positive about the program uh, and what David Pierce has done. Um, my, I, I'm just saying, if you're in the super regional round and you got a three game series for a, a spot in the final eight on the line, I know it's Texas. I know they've got higher standards probably within the program and uh, as far as, you know, making it to Omaha. But for me as a fan, like if you make it to that point, something's going right and you can rely on your best guys to say, hey, we got to win two of these three games against, you know, a really great team. Can you go do it? I, I am satisfied with that. That's my expectation. And I think they should be in a super regional uh, this year, just because you know the Big Twelve does have some solid teams, K State being on an upswing is is kind of entertaining in the last year in the league. TCU is going to be really strong. Oklahoma State, uh, Texas Tech is going to be really strong. Uh, so Texas is going to have some teams to contend with uh, to get a you know top sixteen seed to make that a little bit of an easier task. Uh, but you know, I, I think they have the the talent both on offense, defense, and in the field, uh, or excuse me, offense in the field and in the uh, bullpen to reach that top sixteen. And that and then at that point, play ball. I would trust LBJ against anybody. I would you know tend to trust a Texas staff against anybody in game two, um, and that's what I always look for. You know, do you make it to uh, the super regional round? I think, um, you know, your old co-host Trey would always ask me grades at the end of the year. Uh, and, I and you know, 2019, I think I gave an F. Uh, and then, you know, 2021, 2022, I gave A's. And there's only one way to get an A-plus at Texas. And I think everybody who's involved with the program understands that. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to this year. I think it'll be a good year on the way uh, to the SEC. 
there's some still some stout competition in the Big 12, and the the program is set up well to I think have a chance to make it to the super regional round and even host a best two of three with Omaha on the line. Dude, you're always so much fun to talk to um, and do such a damn good job. For people that maybe are just listening or watching right now, um, how can people enjoy your work? Yeah, head to InsideTexas.com. We'll be talking football, basketball, baseball all over uh, the next few months. Uh, I'm at JosephCook89 on Twitter, Inside Texas on Twitter, on Instagram. And then uh, I commented using our account, Inside Texas Football, on YouTube whenever uh, – this channel isn't live. Come and check us out. We're usually posting stuff a little bit after y'all are done. So good way to roll from, from this into that and uh, uh, get your Longhorns fix. Y'all do a great job, man. You really do. You got a really damn good team. And um, I'm obviously incredibly proud of what you've been able to do, man. Look at you like a little brother, man. My, I know. I remember my, sitting My right younger adult brother. I remember sitting at the when you came by, sitting at the uh, the dinner table with uh, with you know God rest her soul, Mom Abbott, and uh, uh, you know changing exchanging some stories. So it yeah, was, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, were, were you were you in school then? I was. I God, was. God, time flies. I was a, I was alumni relations chair, so I was the yeah. one who helped get you there. <laughs> Yeah, no, you were. And you're right. Rest in peace, Mom Abbott, who passed uh, recently and was, man, she, talk about a firecracker and a character. Um, and mom, mom had favorites. And I'm guessing you were one of hers. I was I was the I could do no wrong to her, you know, because I, I, I also had just gotten over chemo as a freshman in college and had like a scare that fall that it maybe had come back. And mom just like, Man, if you if you messed with me, Mom Abbott was gonna have your ass. She had mine a couple times. <laughs> oh man, but she was something special. Now I'll, I'll yeah. miss you. I will a lot. So yeah, I will Katie, too, thank you so much, my man. Hey, love you, Joe. Be good, and uh, and obviously, uh, give me a shout personally. Just text me, and and uh, let's get together soon. All right. We'll do. Appreciate it. All right. <clears throat> Sounds. Good. Here he is. <laughs> My man. man. So we go from DKR to the dish. I love it, dude. I absolutely <laughs> love it. And you got me in the shadows here. Um, but but for good reason. I'm a little under the weather. So I was man, I hope you feel better, man. When you texted me, you say COVID. I just, you know, I think we all cringe and think of 2020 all over again. And I felt for you. Yeah, and you know what? And I didn't have any, I didn't, I didn't get it that I know of um in 2020. I yeah. may have, but um, but I, you know, I don't feel that bad. I know I sound bad right now, and it's kind of gotten worse throughout the day. But right. I really don't. So, um, you know, knock on wood, and, and God bless everyone who's who's dealing with that. Uh, that clearly, it's been going around, brother. There's something. I swear, there's something in the air. All these organisms, viruses. I, I, I'm trying not to fall for the political trap on either side. Yeah, I, I'm with just... you. I, I'm not either, man. <laughs> You know me, dude. I, 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 I'm not gonna fall, try not to fall for either one of those. But, dude, it's great seeing you. Thanks for joining us. How you Absolutely. been? You know, I'm doing good. It's a, uh, you know, I'm a member of the uh, corporate world now. You and I uh, both. Yeah. You and I both. Yep. Yep. I know both of us, man. Both of us have have, have made that change. Um, are you enjoying it? You know what? I, I, the opportunity I have now, um, and I, you know, I've been instructed not to mention. Uh, by the powers that be on any podcast. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, you got, I feel like, well, I could recruit. You know, I like it because, you know, I think both of us know the grind that was what we had before. Yeah. I've, I've had to tell myself to slow down and it's not, there's no deadlines a day of three hours and four hours later. Yeah. You know what I love about it? I love that you can actually build on stuff. So yeah. if you did a really good radio show or a really good TV show or good play-by-play -play gig, you know, it was great. I mean, it's awesome. It, it, there is a rush there mm -hmm. and it's something that we love. It's sports and, and you know, it, that's hard to replace. But one of the things that always got me is you go home. It's done, dude. It, Wiped uh, off. Done. Go to the next day. It doesn't mean shit, man. Next day, you got to start from scratch. And I do like actually building stuff. Like when I get up now, I'm like, 
oh, wait a minute. I've been doing this for three weeks and I built it up and I'm at 47, not zero, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Cause you know, it's, uh, you, you, now I will say, and it's the same for your industry. It's all about relationships. Don't burn any bridges. I know people probably told us that when we were in college. You know, now I understand it. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, now you really understand it exactly. Um, well, dude, it's great to see you, man. Um, you know, everything good outside of uh, work? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I've actually had a, this last year, you know, it was just like, you know what? I need to travel more. Good. You know. Where'd you go? You know, the last one, I don't know if you have ever been or the viewers, have you been to uh, Camelback Mountain in Arizona? I have uh, actually, I've I've not been, actually, yeah, I have, because that's where uh, the Giants are, right? I think it's on the, uh, right on the other side. Okay. So, yeah, the wolf, the side from where I was. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. I, I was talking to the locals there, it was right around Christmas. And I didn't realize how close those spring training uh, yeah. facilities are. I mean, it's like less than an hour. And I climbed up that mountain, and there were some I, – I didn't want to be that guy, but there were some major MLB players. They were younger, or they were going to be reporting to camp in about uh, – or spring training in what, two months from when I was there. And I was just like, wow, these guys probably have a home here. Yeah, a seasonal home, right? Airbnb in the off season or something, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's cool though. Uh, I'm glad you've been traveling. I've I've been thinking about that a little bit more than I, I need to. You know, we get so caught up in day to day oh, and, and head uh, down that you know you got to remember that life's short. You got to enjoy it a little bit. And I think you and I have a perspective that I wish others had. Currently. Yeah, no, I, I I totally get it. Well, hey, we got a lot to get into. Um, yeah. I'm kind of curious, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'm kind of curious about your thoughts. Joe was getting into it. And once yeah. again, thanks to Joe Cook. Check out his stuff at Inside Texas, He's man. Great. He he really is and, and is is as good a guy off the air as he is on the air, a lot like you. Um, thanks, what do you think about, we'll start with the dish. What do you think about some of the changes? Like, the whole Yeti thing. I'm curious to see what that looks like. So, from the it's left center field, right? Is that yeah? It's left okay. center, and it's so, supposed to be. It's going to be like. I mean, it's going to be field level. I I think it's amazing from the the renditions of it. First, I want to know the price point. Yeah, right. And where do you enter? Boy, you and I really have gone to the corporate world, aren't we? Haven't we? <laughs> Like right away, what's the price point? Uh, well, well, what's the labor charge going to be? You know, what's the overhead for us four weeks? Yeah, right. Uh, I, first of all, <laughs> aesthetically, it looks great. The dish to me, and you tell me because you know it as well as I do, if not more. The dish allows for additions and expansions. It's not yeah. that it's a, it's a great facility, but. You know, I, I told some people, I had some people before the season or last month tell me, you know, this is a great facility, but we're about to go into a league where it's average. Yeah. And I'm best. like, what? At best. I shouldn't say at best. Yeah. yeah average is probably where, where it should be or where it's at and not right. where it should be. But yeah, I mean, the SEC's got some incredible, I would say my, like the probably top three parks for me personally are all in the SEC. Yeah. I, mean, I oh, think Ju Judy Noble one, um, probably Olsen field too. Um, I mean, you know, say what you want, like they've done an amazing job. Uh, that's a really cool place. Old Miss. I mean, you think about some of the, some of the ballparks there and they're just at a different level. You know, Joe and I were talking about it. They don't own Kamal. Not that they couldn't. All, all we got to do is say that, look, there are three lizards that may die, and hippies can take bikes through there. <laughs> Done. I mean, they're trying to take away dirty martins, you know. Um, this, you know, we've got to we've got to use the city and their their idiocy against them to 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 get that. And let's oh. really turn this thing into the park that is fitting of the best program for a hundred years. I, I know we're not going to talk about it, but I'll say this: whenever we get together for dinner or something, I'm highly opinionated on project connect against it okay thank god I, i'm a guest so this is not a reflection on no. or this uh podcast 
don't worry about it. Hey, hey, Sean, that's what we do. I want to hear because yeah. I mean, I I don't know enough about it. You know, oh um, I've looked at it, and and the city of Austin wants to do something in their minds to get together. Yeah. Naturally, being forty five years here, I go, I'm against it because I've seen what y'all do. It's and the prices, the cost, or are you talk about the <laughs> corporate level cost. I mean, it is. I, I don't have the exact figure, but it's a lot more than it was initially agreed upon, and it. it I get it. We need public transportation. We need. That'd be nice to have a, a train to go to the dish fall or 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 dish yeah. fall or anything. But Austin's just not one of those towns. It's it's that type of town for the people who have recently moved here. I see what they see, but when you've been ingrained and you know it, we just need more. I don't know. I think the buses can be improved. But I, I'll be honest with you. I've never ridden the train. I've never ridden a bus. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what frustrates me is is seeing, you know, I live here in Hyde Park and yeah, you know, it's beautiful. First. Yeah, it's it's awesome. I love it. You get to airport and you know, I understand it can be different times, but I've been there a lot of different times and that train's fucking empty, dude. You uh, know, and I'm like percent of the time. You just did this so you feel good. Um, and I don't think they're hitting the right spots too. You're right, Austin's never it's not gonna be New York, it's, it's Chicago. It's not built like that yeah. to really to really run with public transportation. We need public transportation. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure what the right answer is. It probably is buses. What we need first though, is to is to try and alleviate as much as we can the congestion and traffic. Yes, like hell, bring back the Dillo trolley on Congress. And don't Island. tell me people, don't, don't text and be like, well, that's why we need public transportation. <laughs> John and I just hit it. It's not, it, it's not alleviating that, and it won't. Okay? We're no, talking about a no, very no. small percentage, so you can feel happy and and go back to your you know West Austin neighborhood and tell the wife that you're you're helping out the world. Clearly, they're not. It won't. Yeah. It, think about what that's going to look like for ten years constructing that. Woo. I mean, it's but God, man, this fault to me to answer your original question. I aesthetically beautiful. Um, the facilities, the the uh, the what is it? The performance facility. I, I've got to visit it for the first time. Saw Coach Pierce briefly a few weeks ago, and I, you know, I got out of the media before that thing opened. Mm -hmm. And I first time I'd been inside, and I looked at it, and I was just blown away. And he said, "No, oh, this is." He says, "We're grateful." He said, "But everybody in the SEC has this or better." But he says we have a great facility. He said, but he said that uh, you'll see. And I said, well, I've been to Arkansas, and I see what they. By do the way, that, that is an amazing bomb. Is amazing. Oh. I, I called the regional there, and it was, it blew me away. You were it made an impression. Yeah, it it, it made an impression. Um, yeah, and it it was one of those I thought, God, I wish Texas had this. You know. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know, and and a lot of these programs are chasing something that, you know, that Texas has that they can never get or haven't gotten, which is winning for 100 years. That, and Arkansas has been good from Norm to Brian on. I'm not saying they haven't been. Good, but one. good one. Yeah. Texas, Philip Stidham. Remember Philip Stidham? Stidham. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the submariner they had. Oh, they had my God. Yeah, you're throwing back some yeah. memories right there. Do you still – do you still have that opportunity? Because, man, I thought you did a great job in those regional games. I appreciate it. I, yeah, I've gotten some – I've had some interest and some people ask me. Um, I, I just – I really love what I'm doing right now. And I'm making, you know, good money. And, yeah. and I see a future and I'm excited about it. And I love doing this. So oh, I'm excited um, for you for that. I, yeah, I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't totally hung it up. And I appreciate that people, you know, that I still have some interest with it. And appreciate you saying that. But – um one thing I've realized, and I'll be curious to get your take. You know, I didn't like doing play by play. In fact, I fucking hated it. Um, to be <laughs> I love it. Honesty, baby, let's go. Yeah, I mean, I, I did. Um, I love being a fan, and, yeah. and it, it really changed. I mentioned the other day, I was like, I called it robotic sex, you know, <laughs> um, to where, I mean, I, I like, you know, I, I like really being into it. And for some reason, I wasn't able to balance that enough. I mean, it, it just turned into boom right away. So, right. What about you? I mean, have you noticed that now that you're out? Because you did you did a hell of a job, man. I I do honestly kind of miss you watching you um, 
but that's just me being selfish. So yeah, but, hey, now that means a lot to me. I, it's funny you said just with that three letter word fan. I, yeah. I, I would say I've it's four years now I've been able to be a fan. So football season 2019 was the first 19 20, 21. 22. Oh my god, it just finished five football seasons. Are you serious? Yeah, it's wow. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Um, it's I'm a, I've noticed I I'm a little afraid of who I what I become when I get into that stadium. It's it's yeah. it's very intense. Yeah, and I don't no filter whatsoever. Um, it's but I will say those first two or three years, I was kind of uncomfortable for because some of the things I hear people say, and I'm like, what, what? You're yeah. bashing the kids, number one, right? And the things people say the whole time you pay that amount of money to be that negative for four hours. Right. Or that miserable, you know, yeah, well, you sound like you're miserable. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I have noticed that. And, um, and I, I'd probably talk more about a fan just watching it on TV. But when I do go to games, I'm just like, wow, this is really what, you know, is going on, but people are into it. So I, I guess, you know, to each their own. Hey, you know, one of the things you asked about, I want to get your take on this Texas baseball team. Mm -hmm. I thought you had a really uh, good observation in the notes we were going back and forth. Man, this is a big team. And I saw it in the alumni game. I thought, how many dudes are 6'5 or 6'6? Six, six? And you looked it up. Were there nine guys that are 6'4 or taller? 6'4, you know, I, I give or take one or two maybe. But you look at – I. I, for the first time, I got to go to that preseason first pitch dinner or whatever they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that RBI and the Texas One Fund with Britt? Yeah. Brit and, yeah. and they did a great job. They filled up that north end zone complex and the suites. It was amazing. And can you believe Ty Harrington? That was the first time he's ever emceed an event. Oh. Dude's a natural. He is. No, Ty is – um I put Ty in the same boat. I put you and, and some other people I've known for a little while in Austin. Like he's salt of the earth, dude. Um, Amazing. And he really is. Like Ty Harrington is as legit uh, as, as you would think. But yeah, he's kind of one of those guys who's like us is now in a different world. And it's cool to see him doing stuff like that. But Ty could do that full time if you wanted to. Funny. I think, I think he's making too much money doing what he's doing. So he's probably, you know, he can, he can, put his toe in a little bit, but yeah, I, that, that I'm, cu I'm curious to, to kind of know how that went. I'm guessing very well. He went, it was so good. The, the amount of natural humor, you know, he has those, his delivery is just how it's he is. When he speaks. And it's yeah. he self and he just makes fun of himself. Um, he, he uh, made fun of Swindell and because I think he's, they were roommates, I think. Yeah, they humor. were. And, Oh my God! It, it just you could tell the bro love right there. And, yeah, you know, they got each other's backs, and no, those guys love each other like brothers, dude. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, it, it, I love it. I love that energy between them, and it. But he did really well. But when they were talking, I was looking at, kind of thinking the last time that baseball program had that many guys of that stature, and what Kyle Russell's year, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually talked about it earlier. It's funny. Joe was talking about the 07 team that lost to UC Irvine. Oh, um, at, at Dale Rock, Diamond, right? At, at bingo at Round Rock because they were redoing the dish. And so Texas technically hosted. Um, but they they got beat at their own game, man. They got beat at small ball. It's funny, you know, the Kyle Russell, Jordan Danks, Bradley Settle, um, those teams. They were so talented, and it was coming off the 05 championship, yeah. and we saw this shift in college baseball. We saw this this time where all, all of a sudden guys that never were go, going to play college baseball were coming to play college baseball, whether it's Ike Davis and uh, uh, who was the – Brett Wallace at Arizona State who were kind of like Danks and Russell. I mean, guys that never would have stepped foot on campus. And it's only getting better. We're seeing that now where guys are really playing college baseball. It's funny to look at the complete 180 of college baseball and college basketball I love it. In, in our lifetime. College basketball's turned into, I don't know, who's who. And college baseball is getting a lot of these guys who you may have known their junior year in high school. But with that said, it kind of reminds you that, you know, after the 05 team um, or championship, I'm thinking, 
dude, we're going to go on a run here. And now we're just collecting more talent. Yep. And look, Jordan Danks and Kyle Russell were great. So was Brad, Brad Suttle. Yeah. But it didn't translate into Texas actually getting to Omaha. Those guys never got to Omaha. Isn't that crazy? That, that's hard to believe because – they had good. They had a good combination of power, small yeah. ball, and um, they just had men on base, and they would hit with men on base deep. Yeah, I mean Russell hit Minute Maid Park roof, didn't he? Yeah, Kyle Russell had. I'm still shocked, you know, because he, he hit the ball in Triple A too, and that Dodgers never, never called him up, dude. So I, that's funny you bring that up because I've always asked, been curious because we all know that dude that would. Is a lifer at Triple A, or even Double A, and it's it's that slim a margin. But it, something was explained to me two years ago that it really depends on the organization you're with. Yeah, a big portion of it. Oh, I I I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, heck, we talk about Ty Harrington, the guy who followed Ty Harrington at second base for Texas is Todd Haney, and yeah. Todd Haney was a hell of a player. Todd Haney was a Triple A All Star with the Cubs. So and- good. And and was one of the at that point thirty best second basemen in all of baseball. Um, now the problem is he had Ryan Sandberg ahead of him <laughs> at the big league level. You know what I mean? So that's more of an organizational deal. I don't know what the Dodgers thing was, but um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think people realize how many good Double A AA and Triple A players have never been called up. Now, is Melendez, I forget, he's with the Dodgers organization. He's right? with the Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks. Yeah. That's right. And he's going to be up. Know. He's going to be up sooner rather than later, man. I, so I, this is not a slide on him at all. I think his development at Texas was off the charts, but I didn't see the quick growth that he's had in, I mean, astronomical, really, in, in the minor league system that quick. Yeah. I, I thought it would take him. Three years. It's going to be quicker than that. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's going to be. And I'm kind of with you. Um, you know, it just, he's just shooting up. Uh, he's such a hard worker. And, and that, that guy has just gotten better and better and better. And he listens so well. So I know that I, I feel, I felt like it was going to be as sped up as it could be, but I just didn't see it like, like this. I, I didn't. I he, could, he could be up this year, man. That is wild to me. Yeah. I, I thought at least three years, but I knew he would make it. But I was just like, wow, to your point, man, that time frame. I mean, this guy's just – it was no – he's – no hesitation. He's hitting and seeing the ball like he did here. Yep. And yeah. I'm just like, who does that? Right. He's got Christian Walker ahead of him. And funny enough, Walker, if you look at metrics, is not even close by far head and shoulders above everyone as a defensive first baseman. Which you wouldn't necessarily think. I mean, he looks like a meathead that would be, you know, throwing punches, you know, at an yeah. NFL game. Um, you know, he'd be the type of guy you see on on one of these videos. It's like, Jesus, man, why aren't you in prison? Um, <laughs> but, but Walker can hit. That's what you kind of, you know what I mean, what you think. But this guy can really field. So I'm curious, like, if there's a spot for Ivan. But yeah. really, really excited for him. And I'm excited about the, this year's team. I am a little worried about bullpen and pitching. But I tell you what, man, that they got some they got some guys that can flat out rake, and I do think they're gonna put up some runs. I, I agree with that. I, I think here's the the pause that I've learned, and this has nothing. Listen, I, I I am all on board for David Pierce. I think to follow a guy like Augie, no one wants to follow the legend. No, I mean what he's done, and I I've heard a lot of criticism each time about, but then they those people who are critical, they quiet down because David has him in position except one year to truly make a run to Omaha. Yeah. He's been there three times. We're going on what year eight. He's is this his eighth year already. I, I, I find that hard to believe, but it is. Wow. They're relevant. And they, I, and someone called me out if I'm wrong, but he, his team's, are ne- that you never see what they're truly capable of until mid-April. Yeah. Because yeah. they're, they're trying, they're developing. I mean, I know it's for every baseball team, but more so for David's teams, which is not a slight. It means he's trying. Yeah. They're trying to develop people. 
Yeah, he is. Um, look, he's got the toughest job on campus. Yeah. You could say, what about swimming and diving? Um, they've got the most titles, but the the inter- there's enough interest with this and the, the expectations are just through the roof. So the best job is a basketball program. Oh. Because yeah. you're getting paid a ton and you got good facilities and people care about it, but they don't have the expectations they do in baseball. No, no, and understandably so, they shouldn't. You know, it. I, I, you know, we, you and I both. I think not. Not that what what Barnes did was amazing, and what Beard was building was great. We all loved, you know, uh, RT. What we were all pulling for him, but really, I felt, and it's just an opinion. I felt the peak interest for that basketball program was when Penders arrived. Oh God, it was huge. It took over the entire town. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. And it was, you know, because it was up and down. I think what what they realized is, you know, especially back then, it's changed a little bit, but this is not a basketball state or it wasn't, and not a basketball town. I mean, baseball just as a sport is more popular, and obviously football is king. Um, so I think they knew they had to have it be entertaining. Yeah. And and, and you know, and Barnes came in, it wasn't always as entertaining as, you know, Travis Mays throwing a lob or B.J. Tyler, but Albert Burdett, you know, half court. Burdett. Oh, I loved Albert, dude. But those teams were so much fun. But I think winning at the end of the day will cure all. Oh, and yeah. if RT can win, you know, because, I mean, look, there's a lot of 51-50 tough-to-watch college basketball games right now. A but get lot. The, uh, yeah, too many. But get the dub, you know. And so as long as he wins, they're going to be all right. I will say this. We're talking about facilities. Man, the Moody Center is amazing, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yes. I, I think it's a, it is a true basketball facility. Now, this will be an unpopular opinion, what I'm about to say. Uh, Bring it. It's a great place to go see a concert, but I really don't notice the difference in acoustics for a concert com- comparing that to the Irwin Center. Really? I think the amenities – amenities probably the best in the world watching a concert there one of the best but basketball off the charts they they crushed it on that side now do you do you hear the difference with the acoustics and basketball yes okay. yeah and that you know i, I I'm, I'm assuming that has to do with the you know they close off the top half and what the yeah uh, the garage door so to speak yeah but basketball Totally different environment. Now, the Irwin Center was cool when it was full, but at the same time, you know, they had – it's a Irwin Center was a cavernous place, you know, so far back, you know, with the upper deck. Oh, it was, yeah. But – But you know this, center. too. Like, the Irwin Center – it's funny. You can tell you can tell when people just say stuff and they never experienced it. Yeah. And you, you and I have. The Irwin Center, when it was full, whether it was the 90 regional, 95 regional, whether it was Arkansas coming in town, whether it's mid, that place, that place could get really loud. It, and obviously, it was you had that many people there, you know. It was fun. I mean, trying to remember the best. So, what was it? I was at Stephen F. Austin, uh, the lady friend I was dating at the time. We came in and for the North Carolina game, December of 95. 95, okay. Was yeah, it 95 or 96? I can't yeah, remember. 95, because they would have played in the 94 um, at Carolina on CBS. I think lost 96, 92, and, and should have beat them, man. They had them. Um, and that was a good Texas team, dude. And it was a great North Carolina team, man. Oh, yeah. And Texas beat them that day when we yeah. won that game. I mean, I, yeah. I literally just had my wisdom teeth taken out. Are you came serious? I literally, no, I've got it down now. I had my, came home. To have my wisdom teeth removed. That's and, nuts. And yeah, I mean, I remember being there. I remember first time Kansas came here and Carolina came here. And I knew these were top five programs. I was a huge college basketball fan at that point. And just watching them in warmups, like it felt like, oh my God, they're they're at the Irwin Center. I can't believe they're here, you know? And actually, I would have seen Carolina before because 1990, Rick Fox did a, uh, Kind of a uh, took it on the elbow and then actually kind of came in and banked a shot to be yeah, I do number, remember one, that. number one seed Oklahoma in that uh, in that 
in that regional second second round. That was God, man, and that was Billy Tubbs, right? Still. Billy Tubbs, Skeeter Henry, um, Carolina team. Had, so I looked it up recently. Had seven NBA guys: they, <laughs> Kenny wow. Smith, Scott Williams. Uh, I mean, they, they were they were loaded, and they were an eight seed that year. Yeah, is one versus eight. Yeah, Oklahoma, UNC. You know, there was another really good team that came in. I think when um, that I recall, I was interning at KXAN, and what year was that? Was it? Was it? Was 90? it a regional? No, it was Utah. Rick Majerus. Okay. It went to double overtime, and it was Wrencher, Burdett, yeah. Reggie Freeman. Okay. So that would have been like 96, maybe 97, or it could have been 95 because Reggie Reggie was, I think, on those teams and came off the bench. It may have been. Reggie was like 94, 97, wasn't he? I think so. It yeah. Was, uh, it, Reggie, this may have been the year before Reggie started at Texas. But remember, it may have been Albert. They knocked off ranked Utah. And remember the scores table? Yeah. Uh, at the Irwin Center, they're just yeah. – Card tables with a burn orange um, tablecloth on it. Over it, yeah. That's exactly what it was. Friggin' Albert jumps up there, just waving his arm. I mean, it was and there, there was only like nine thousand fans there. Right, of course. I was shocked. Nine thousand, seven thousand empty seats. Majerus almost came here. Did he really? When when they got rid of Penders, you know there was a there was a lot of talk that you know I mean they were already getting, you know like because he lived in a hotel which I always loved about him and so he was he was going to live at the Four Seasons oh. and yeah and I mean it, it that got closer th- than we than we thought and think about some of the coaches that almost came here um, you know Jimmy Johnson they were close to getting him from Miami when he was at University of Miami when he was at Oklahoma State. So they were thinking of letting Fred go earlier. Yeah. Wow. God and, rest his soul. Yeah. Ab- oh, God, absolutely. Um, yeah, I got to do a couple things with Fred when I first started interning at KOBJ. And, God, he was such a sweet man, dude. Um, just, you know, I didn't know him very well. But as a kid, I just looked up to him, and he could not have been could not have been more gracious. Oh, one other guy. I don't know if you heard about this. Apparently, Nick Saban's wife was looking for real estate <laughs> <laughs> was it in Westlake or Northwest Hills? Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Either one. Uh, yeah, that 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 one that one always stings. Hey, you know, one of the things that we talked about a little bit. I'm curious to get your take. For me, and obviously there is a proprietary element with UT baseball. Yeah. Where like, you know, I get on my kid really hard, but don't say a word about my kid. You know. Oh, um, so. I'm definitely definitely feel that, but uh, I think I think they should go to a grass field. Give me your thoughts on football yeah. going to grass, and should baseball be grass? So I know it's been artificial surface since 1975 when it opened, mm-hmm. and, and you know the thing is, I I think I've been caught up from uh, or caught up with the the uniqueness of it. But to your point. Baseball is not meant to be played on turf. Let's just be honest with each other. Agreed. Because you don't get true hops. I mean, the turf they have now, you, you've got a pretty true role. But I'm just not a fan of painted fake dirt. I'm not, I, oh, my God. Sean, thank you. That's one thing. People are like, well, you loved, you liked the dish back in the day. One, the turf looked better. But we had dirt. Dirt. How do we not have dirt? Uh, why are we? Why are we? Uh, here's my deal. Why are we pinching pennies? I mean, this literally is Warren Buffett in his house in in Omaha, and and he's got a 1971 couch, and they put plastic over it. It's like, bro, <laughs> you made seven billion dollars today. Yeah, you are, you are worth most countries. I, Will you let Gertrude go get a new couch and take the plastic off of it? She's over there driving an old, what is it, Oldsmobile Cutlass? Yeah, poor old ladies, 
you know, dealt with your shit forever. Like, spend a little. We all are impressed. Like, you are the master of saving and investing. Let it go a little bit. Dude. Wait a little bit, man. That's yeah. what that's what UT is with with fake dirt. So, when you and I started going to games, what eighty, eighty two, yeah. yeah, that was just a thin oh. doormat on top of concrete. Man, it, you're exactly right. I mean, remember, remember how quick that would skip? And I don't oh, know if you ever went to yeah. Gus's camp and actually took grounders there. Did you take one to the face? Oh, I, I took a couple. But I also liked it because I wasn't that good of a hitter. So I knew I hit a lot of balls on the ground, and I thought, well, hell, with this, I'm, I'm going to be getting some knocks I probably shouldn't, you yeah. know? The ground rule double. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then remember, remember in the summer with regionals, it would get real spongy. And so not yes. only was your crown, but like um, uh, to your point, the ground rule doubles, man. That thing would hit and boing, it like got shot up, you know. I always felt for the student manager. That dude, he was in great shape going after every foul ball, every home run. They were they were going to take, they were going to retrieve those balls. Oh God, they absolutely Gus was really into that. Yeah. So what Sean's referencing, you know, part of it was. Gus being a little cheap, but I totally get it. But a part of it was, you know, kind of where they're at with, with the money they were given back then. Um, you didn't keep foul balls. So you'd see players, guys that weren't playing, that would go go out and try and go retrieve a foul ball from, from the crowd, which is nuts. Yeah, that's It was unreal to me, just thinking about how it once was. You know, and there's still Pete. I had a conversation. It was it has nothing nothing related to – UT. It was just at a trying to, it was at the RBI uh, dinner okay. at the end of January. And I had some people tell me that I said, you know, UT baseball is one of the few programs in the country, baseball programs that generates revenue. And they're like, no, it doesn't. And I said, yes, it does. And I said, even if it's a few hundred thousand over the budget, the operating expenses, yeah, that's making generating money no you're exactly right there's few college baseball programs and there's like a couple women's college basketball programs like but to your, to your point how even if you're in the red it by 200k that's a win right yeah. but if you're even or making 100 or 200k in that type of sport bro that's a that, sean that is a huge win that that is massive i mean massive because they i don't know i, I just feel like you got to put in, you got to budget in grass, man. Surely that's going to happen at some point. I mean, at DKR, they're going to do it. And why they went back to turf to begin with, why did they? I don't remember. I don't know. I mean, do you remember? Hey, thanks for the like, whoever that was. Or was that you? That was a beautiful thumb. That was but, a good thumb. Where did that come from? How, how do you I, do that? I don't know. It, it definitely wouldn't trace them. <laughs> you, you ever seen that thing that bent back and everything? Um, get, get, answer your question. It felt like the college football programs were chasing what recruits wanted back then. Remember? Oh, yeah. Because it yeah. was turf, and then it was like injuries, grass, and then people went back to turf, and then back to grass. Um, so I, I'm not sure why they made that change, but I'm glad they're doing it. Aesthetically, yeah. it'll look better. And that's one thing I got to say about the dish. Now, I watch most of the games on TV, which I'll miss. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. After um, – after LHN's gone, hopefully ESPN Plus will still have something. But aesthetically, it looks really cheap to me. For who it belongs to, yes. That too. Texas, deserve, Texas baseball deserves the best that can be offered for any college baseball. They're in that class yeah. of baseball programs. I mean, there's nothing wrong with, that, with, with the dish. Absolutely nothing wrong but the field. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, no, I mean, I, there are, in my ideal world, that have a berm like some of these SEC deals, but I understand that may not be possible. But if they put in grass, like it, 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 it would just, it would, and dirt, it would help out. It'd go a long way. Cause you're right. There really is nothing wrong. I mean, there are 98% of other programs would die to have that type of stadium for college baseball, you know? I, I hate to throw my college alma mater under the bus, but. Shout out to Johnny Cardenas, the head baseball coach at Stephen F. Austin. He's he does he does more with less. 
that mm-hmm. I would venture to say they have the best grass baseball field in Division One baseball. Wow! But the facility, horrible. Wow! Awful. It's not his fault. I'll just say that. Yeah. No. No. I mean, it's it's not. Um, there's a lot of things I want to get to with you. Oh yeah. Um, well, let's kind of let's shift here a little bit. What what's your take on the Cowboys, man? <clears throat> You know, I, I, when, when we were texting earlier this morning, I had to really remind myself to step back from being a homer, even though that's what I am. I'm, that's the only team that I'll watch. Um, but, yeah, they're America's team, so to speak. They have that, that marketing, and Jerry's done a great job of making him relevant. They're never going to be the dynasty again, in my opinion, ever. They may have a two- or three-year run. It's so hard. I mean, there are so many good, I say programs, but in in the NFL. Organizations, yeah. It just, I mean, right now what San Fran and and what Kansas City is doing is kind of against the grain, more so Kansas City. No doubt. But but I hate saying it, man, but but it's – Dallas hasn't been bad. They, and I don't think it's on Dak. I really think there's some indirect micromanaging, if you will. You talking about Jerry? Jerry and and his son. I think Jerry, every player that I've heard from, or well, which is very few, they say Jerry's an awesome person. Yeah. But he. No, the players actually swear by him, dude. Yeah. He, you know, because he's also. Which is also part of the problem because he's given some deals that he shouldn't have given. If you're doing straight business, you know. He, I just feel like you've got to know, like you and I know, we got to be aware of when we're somewhere. How how does that affect people or what our actions? You got to be aware. And right now, we're in the social media world, and people get a people. I don't care that that generation is playing right now in the NFL and younger. They pay attention to what is being said about them. Yeah. And I, I just feel like Jerry's presence when he speaks, is he a good businessman? Yes. Does he need to be more aware of himself on the minor things? Like you don't have to be in front of the camera all the time. Don't be so hands on. Yeah. That's just what he's done for the Cowboys as a whole. Great. But we're in the business of winning championships. Yeah, it's um, – I, I don't think – you know, I say you, you know, the, they'll never have a dynasty again. I mean, I think what Kansas City is doing right now – I mean, first off, it's kind of been shocking since the salary cap was really felt, which would have been 95, 96, right. implemented earlier. But like any legislation, you started to feel it as it really took took hold. Um I never thought we were going to see a dynasty like the Patriots, like it, it in with the salary cap era. Um, and they were, it, it was amazing what they were able to do. I think it's pretty amazing what Kansas city is able to do right now. But even, even those teams, like none of those outside of funding up the Patriots 17 and O team that ended up losing to the giants in the super bowl that went undefeated. Like none of the none of these teams, relatively speaking, so height, weight, speed changes it's called evolution, um, are all time teams to me. They're yeah. just not. Like I mean, even even Kansas City, because you're going to have holes. I mean, look yeah. at Kansas. Look at Kansas City's right tackle, dude. That guy should not be in the NFL. It's God bless him. He's he's robbing a paycheck. Uh, he- but I mean, at least not for a Super Bowl winning team. There's going to be holes everywhere. It's just the way it is. It's how how do you mask those and how do you how do you get around it? And that's what Kansas City's been able to do. I think San Francisco for a large part. And it feels like Dallas has not been able to necessarily do that, at least not when it counts, which is in the playoffs. No, you're right. I mean, you hit the nail where on it on the head of that nail right there. But but look back at that Green Bay loss in the playoffs. I mean, they're running six defensive backs, you know. And they need linebackers more than anybody. Like you can't just keep moving Micah Parsons around. And, yes, because he demands a, a double team. There's no doubt about it. But they – God, they just need – they had no linebackers. And so 
Green Bay knew that. And they said, we're going to run your ass over. We're going to out-physical you. And they had their way. That is the worst display of a rush defense in a playoff game that I have ever seen. Man. And it just made it worse because it was the Cowboys at home. I mean, yeah. those holes were so wide. I mean, we could have had God, we could have had some true geriatrics run through those and get 10 yards a pop. <laughs> right. Oh, God. Yeah, and that was the hole. I mean, everyone, I think Cowboys fans knew it, and obviously Green Bay knew it. And you get in that spot, you know, to not have a run defense is uh, surprising for, for an NFL organization like that. Now, they hired Zimmer, didn't they? Yeah, and that's – Is that a good hire? No, I, I think he's a good coach, yeah. I do I too, yeah. Good. But – you know, we thought Quinn was good too. I mean, now Quinn is good, but something's not working there. And they're 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 bringing the retreads. And I hate. I'm not. I'm trying not to get on get on McCarthy too much. But it's hard not to think that all these people are yes men to Jerry mm -hmm. and the Jones. It, I think these people may know this. If I just stay the course and toe the company line, I'm going to be treated well and paid well. But you, I don't know, man. Do you think there's a compromise there for championships for security? Yeah. Um, I, I think his ego has just, you know, gotten too big. Um, now, look, he's made adjustments. I mean, we could tell five or six years ago how I keep on saying that's probably eight or nine years ago right. now, but their drafts were awful forever. Yeah. They were, they were hilarious. And for people that like us that watch it on a college football, yeah. you know, who's drafting well, like the Steelers have drafted well, virtually my whole life. Right. So, you know, guys, cause you know, the guy in the fifth and sixth round um, and you just look at their old draft. You're like, eh, they may not have hit on everyone, but man, year in and year out, these guys know what they're doing. And Dallas made that change and it's like, all right, you guys are drafting well now. You got a player personnel. So he was able to pull back a little bit. Yeah. Um, but there's still something there where you just have to look at him, whether it's fair or not now, because it's been a quarter century of the Cowboys not not even playing for a Super Bowl, which that's hard to believe, man. I mean, look, they they are what they are, and they are the biggest brand in, in the NFL and have yeah. been my whole life highest valued sports franchise in the world that's nuts and then getting back to your business man thing what did he pay 125 million i think you're right in 1989 dude i mean he is you know as brilliant as he is as a businessman you just kind of wonder about the other stuff but um i know cowboys fans are frustrated i feel bad for all my longhorn cowboys fans yeah you know because a lot of them there's obviously a lot of people that those are their two teams and it's a special type of frustration. I'll say this, though, man. I, I feel good about where Sark is. I mean, you, you feel good about where Texas football is heading to the SEC? I, I think AM fans are going to love this, sarcastically speaking. <laughs> I think Texas overall, beginning with the, the front door and being the football program, I think they're in as good of a spot as a team or program can be making such a leap to that league right there. I mean, they're yeah. ready. They are. Yeah. Everything, if you look at NIL, when it started, there were multiple groups, and now they're one. And I think that's right. Yeah. I'm trying to, I feel like it evolves into something every week right, uh, across the country. But I think when you had the, what is it, the State of the Union the other day with uh, CDC – I didn't watch it, but I just read about it. Everything he's laid out just tells me these are observations he's made since day one that he had to find a plan to implement. That's what it looked like, sounded like to me. Right. Everything that they're implementing are things that he's probably – that's why he always looks like he's in deep thought. <laughs> that that man is always thinking. And he I don't know if he sleeps. Oh, God. He is, and the stuff he puts up with on Twitter, like, I mean, 
there couldn't have been a better hire. And, you know, the biggest question with him is, you know, speaking of hire, how do you hire? And and we'll see if he has that up or has that with football, not football, with basketball or baseball coming up. But I think everything else, I mean, he's got to feel comfortable with Sark. You obviously feel comfortable with Jared Elliott. Um, <laughs> you know, no joke, right? Yeah. Um, but I think softball and women's basketball, they got down too. Yeah. Oh, and Mike White was a great hire. Now it's easier to go to Eugene or go to Starkville in those sports and say, um, yeah, you're coming back on the plane with me. Well, I'm not really sure you're coming back on the plane with me. Well, I'm not. A- Here's a check. Okay. Coming back. You're coming back to Austin. Let's go to right? Austin. Let's go yeah. to Austin. It's harder to do that in, in those big three sports, you know? It. Yes. And I, I think, uh, you know, for women's basketball, Vic is, he's, I mean, he knows the SEC landscape more than any of us. That is a uh, great point, And I hadn't even put that together. Yeah, you're right. He's, you know, it's funny when I was at, I, I saw him. And South Carolina is the cream of the crop in the SEC right now, right? Is that Don Staley? Probably the country. Yeah. Don, do you remember her as a player? She was at uh, Virginia. Is that right? I think it was Virginia. Um, I remember her though. I mean, she played like a dude. Oh, straight up compliment. Her playing on defense. I mean, it was like playing pickup at Clark. Clark Field Outdoor Courts on Court One. Clark Field Outdoor Courts, dude. I haven't <laughs> thought of that forever, man. These I, kids have no idea, KD. No, they've got absolutely no idea. Well, we were talking about it a little bit too. Uh, where'd she play? Dun dun dun. The Wahoos. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Virginia. I mean, it's, uh, let's see here. I want to find out. I think it was. Yeah, Virginia. Great call, dude. 88 to 92. God, that ages us. God, that no. ages her, but she doesn't look like it. Uh, no, I know. I know. Exactly. Um, but she's done She's done one hell of a job. Um, Clarkfield, dude. That, that That's Clarkfield Courts. You you mentioned in the deal. You know, we talk about is why is Dishbuck Field the coldest spot in Austin? <laughs> I have no idea. I've tried to. I've tried to figure it out. You know, um, but it really is for people that don't know that. I don't know if it's because of I thirty five in the upper deck and it's blowing in, and obviously, you know, you've got the uh, the. Uh, kind of a closed area right yeah. there so it's going to be all trapped but i don't know why is it, it it's that i mean i've also been the hottest in in my life ooh, no know. circulation none yeah, that's it none but in the winter or, or winter february march and some april games sometimes you and i oh my god it's borderline miserable oh I'll tell you one game. I said, what it does, it swirls. It swirls, yeah. Uh But, I mean, I remember, especially in college, you know, I remember, you know, you were in shorts, T-shirt, walking around campus, sun's out, feeling good. It's like, oh, what a beautiful day. This is why we live in Austin, Texas, you know. God, this is great. And, man, if they weren't playing baseball, I'd go to Barton Springs today. But you end up going to the game, and you get in there, and you're, you know, same thing, same city, not that far away. In a couple of innings, you're like, dude, I'm, I'm freezing right now. Miserable. And you can walk out and go back, go back to a certain part of Austin and be like, and oh, I'm, everything's yeah. fine. Perfect. It's like Antarctica <laughs> in, in early and late February. Right. So, oh, oh I got a game. Do you remember this? I was a sophomore in high school. I think it was the 88 season. And I, oh my God, help me remember who the ace Donovan was. Forbes. He was on that. I, I, I just throwing it out there. He was on the baseball team too. I um, Jim Abbott and the Michigan Wolverines came down here. It was a uh, about. It, it, was, it, was, it was. It was. I think the spring break um, when a lot of teams would come down. I think it was that because I because there were different teams. They played someone else and played Texas. You know, I was bat boying a lot then. So my dad dropped me off and I, and I knew Abbott was going to be there. And I, you know, just, he was an all American. So people knew about Jim Abbott, right. you know, obviously outside of his condition, but 
but the condition made it to where you had to see this guy pitch. You, First time you heard it, you go, wait a minute. He's got one hand, and he puts it on the nub, throws it, and is able to that quickly, yeah, and field it. And then, um, like he was a good fielder, mm-hmm. uh, and and I so I you just had to see him. And my dad drops me off, and I go, hey, I go, I go, I got a little trick. I go, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna have Jim Abbott sign a baseball. I go, but I'm gonna throw him too. And uh, my dad goes, don't you dare do that. I go, dad, I go, Jim Abbott's, <laughs> I go, Jim Abbott's so talented. He'd catch both. <laughs> oh, he would. It was, that was a great night. But I remember it was T-shirt, pants, hat, very, very light jacket. Something happened. They lit, they lit him up, if I remember, didn't they? Yeah, I think they did. Yeah. They lit him up. That was a year that was disappointing because they, they got beat by Cal back when the regionals were six, six. teams. Yeah. And a cold front blew in that night with Michigan and it just plummeted. It went from like 68 to 43, just like that. Wow. Boy, you, you know, the Michigan kids felt comfortable. They're laughing. They're oh, like, they're like, man, they're looking at Sean right. Clinch flipping out in the, uh, in the crowd. They're like, yeah, you wimp. Oh, yeah, this, this is summer weather for us. So, so I look like I was smuggling marbles in my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that, dude. At 45 years of age, you think you've heard everything. That is fucking great. That is that's fantastic. <laughs> Smuggling marbles. Oh, uh, that, that, that makes me feel better. That's that that's that's too much. Uh, they lost a cow in '88. Was that Jeff Kent? You know what? I think you're right. Let's check it out. 1988 cow bears. I mean. Oh, it was heartbreaking too. It was heartbreaking. Um, They've had some tough ones, man. I remember uh, Oklahoma State coming in and beating them in '91. Yeah, it would have been Brooks's uh, freshman year. Obviously, Oklahoma coming in in '94, and they won the national championship. They won the national championship. Speaking of that, do you see who passed recently? The minor. Ryan, Ryan that yeah. was because you had Ryan and Damon on that team. So, Damon was a big lefty who hit one uh, over the green monster in that regional. I mean, just on a fucking line. You could have you could have dried were, dried clothes off that. Two sports star. Oh, oh Ryan, Ryan was legit. Ryan was a better basketball player. They were uh, you know, working up there. I, I, you know, you would have done the same thing. I had to immerse myself deeper and deeper and deeper to learn, 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 because, you know, I had blinders on. I didn't care about Oklahoma. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to like anything growing up. You, you just didn't. Right. But when I got that, when I had that job up there at the Fox affiliate, I poured myself into those OSU, OU, all of it, the fabric, the history, everything. Well, that's why you were so good, man. You, you that, that's what you, you it was it was obvious when you were on the air, that's what you did. So man, I appreciate that. That was I just couldn't get over the amount of people, athletes, whatnot, that had ties to like the minors. And it a lot of them return and they and they st- they stay they stick around. Yeah. Like you remember the, you, do you remember the two starters on that team? For baseball? They pitched in the bigs for a long time. Oh my God! I ask. I cannot believe I have to resort to Google. Russ Ortiz and uh, I'll give you Google right here. Uh, Russ Ortiz and Mark Redman. Redman, yeah, and he was in the he lefty. He he made a few. How many? Because I remember he was. Redman was sent back down to the minors. Um, he had a long career. Oh, he pitched in the bigs for a long time. And obviously, he the Cardinals, the right? Was yeah, it, Cardinals and I'm trying to think of who else. He pitched for a couple of different teams. Um but he, he didn't he didn't have they didn't have a ton of velo, if I remember right. Um no. Not no, no, no. He he was more I mean, he threw 90, 91. Russ obviously was a righty and had had more velo, but yeah, Red Redman Redman was the real deal. He was 
I maybe and I do remember Russ now, and now it's coming back to me. You know what? I never got to meet them while I was there from 06 to 12. But I did meet Redmond when he was on an assignment. I want to say Redmond was signed by the Rangers late, right? I don't remember that. No? Um, I mean, I, I feel like he played with the Marlins and played with just a bunch of teams. Yeah. But that, that, was a, that was a hell of a uh, hell of an OU team. And now we're going to get, you know, get shit for talking too much OU there. But, uh, but <laughs> al always fun. Um, you got anything else, brother? Man, I, I tell you what, it, it is – when you look at where we are here with this um, baseball program, I think it's ready to compete in SEC. I think we just uh, – everybody needs to embrace this also, but also realize this new Big 12 baseball. Central Florida is a perennial or annual uh, regional team. Mm -hmm. Really good. Um, I, I do think uh, when you look at, obviously – TCU. I mean, the Big Twelve is is has been a good baseball league. Help me out with the additions here. I don't know why I'm drawing blanks. For, Boy, Houston, uh, Houston, Houston there. good. You know, I have no idea if Cincinnati. My guess is they don't play great college yeah. baseball. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then BYU, right? They they're an NCAA regional guy type of program. Yeah, usually. Yeah. Is BYU in the Big 12? I don't know why I'm 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 blanking here. Yeah, it's weird because we're in a weird trend. We get one year and I know, which is why I'm like, all right, just get me out of here. Like two ships passing in the dark over here. Right. Um uh no no doubt about that. But, but uh, I think you know, there's so many good things happening right now. Even though you and I are irritated by our lack of leadership at the city level, um We've got some great places to dine and, and all that. Yeah, I'm joking with our text, you know, it's it's there's a lot of anxiety because you 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 got to make reservations a month ahead of time unless unless you're Kevin Dunn and and you got some yeah. connections with some restauranteurs. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that, dude. I think I think you got a lot more connections than I do. Is there a, is there a new favorite restaurant? I was laughing with someone the other day. We were talking about uh, steak and ale and the Kensington. Club. Oh my goodness! On Anderson Lane. Anderson Lane, man, steak and ale. When I was going through chemo, that was the only thing that I, you know, when I would eat, I could eat, and or you know, your taste buds are gone. But there was something about the the Kensington, you know, that teriyaki sauce that that oh. still got me going. Dude, I I miss oh. that place. You know, I. I, and Austin's gotten only better with food. I I, yes. I, totally, I totally understand that. Sean and I would never try and say that it hadn't, but there were a couple old school spots, you know, that um, we were talking about the Hoff Brown the other day too. Man, a place that I should have visited more and didn't. Yeah. You know what's good for Italian? And it had, it's been around a couple of years. It's on Anderson Lane near the old steak and now it's called Backspace. Oh, Backspace. Yeah, I used to go to the one downtown. Good pizza. I need to try that. Yeah. Um, you haven't been? I've been to the one on Anderson. I just have not ordered the pizza. Okay. Um, oh, Susie's is back. Susie's is back? Are you serious? On the southern part of Burnett Road. Um, uh, one question I had, was she part – do you know if she was – remember when that, that location on Anderson and Shoal Creek? Mm -hmm. It was JoJo's, Coco's, then Susie's. Yeah. Was Susie part of the ownership of JoJo's and Coco's? I don't know. That's a great question, Sean. And I don't think I ever knew that, but it did feel like there was something symbiotic there, didn't it? Uh, it just, it's so random. Yeah. And why go from Joe? Why do you want to change one letter and go from JoJo's to Coco's? Who, who was offended by that? I have no idea. Um, great but I will say this for all the stuff that Austin, you know, for us old old heads who remember what it was like, when people will ask me, when was the change, man? When was the change? Yeah. I go, well, for me, it was 98, 97, 98. You know, I think when Dell came in, it certainly put Austin on a more national map with the tech oh. world. We didn't realize what was coming with tech at that point, or I didn't, I'm sure some of you computer nerds did, and you're probably sitting on a yacht watching us right now, having, you know, escorts feed you truffles and, you know, <laughs> and 
to give you lap dances. So props yeah, to you. Nothing wrong with a good lap dance on a Thursday night. No, there's nothing wrong with escorts giving you truffles. Hey, escort escorts need they need money too. Um, so let me ask you this. So when I was in high school. I was class of 91 at Anderson and you were 96 at Westlake. 97, Westlake. 97. Yeah. Um, my junior year, I think Dell started at near that pond at the Arboretum. I think. I thought it was a little bit before then. It wasn't? It was. No, uh, you, 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 would, you would know. Um, but yeah, it was right around then. But for me, that's when Austin changed and, and where we started to get the warehouse district and. You know, it didn't totally change, but um, but for me, that was it. But is there a time period? You Do you think like it's an 04, 05 when you go, you know, so, old Austin to this Austin? I would have a – so I didn't move back. So I left in 93 and came back to live, uh, what, December of 2012. Okay. When the, when the – <clears throat> excuse me. When the cave you job presented itself. And I moved back and, but I would visit, but you know, when you visit, you really, you're not ingrained. Yeah. You, you're just reading the Austin Chronicle and what people say on the phone. Right. Um, I'm trying to think. So there was a time. So even when Texas, I was back home that year, Texas won the national title for a visit. And I came back. So I here's when I noticed it. Katie, we came to Austin. I had to follow Oklahoma State when Des was a Des Bryant was a sophomore to play Quan and Colt and that good 08 team. Yeah, when everybody in the Big Twelve was ranked, it seemed. I say that that was a pretty good Oklahoma State team, if I remember too. They were really Zach Robinson. Yeah, Kendall Hunter, uh, Pettigrew. Um, God, that was a good team. Des, Des. Um, Andre didn't feel Sexton. like they had enough defenders. I'll say that. Yeah, no, that's when they they needed he needed more pieces on defense. So that trip is when I realized just a different vibe. Yeah, oh eight for me. Okay, that's I I can I can totally see that. Still a great town. I, I've tried to. It's very easy to get frustrated with stuff. And I've just tried, I've tried to do this with everything in, in life as I get older. You yeah. can get caught up and just being pissed off and, and negative about everything. But like, it's, st- it's still a great town to live in. Focus on the good stuff that's here now, which is food. And, and there are a lot of different people and different opportunities, business, yeah. life, you know, and and just stay off I-35 and Mopac, <laughs> you know, different yeah. times. And Why I was swear to God, your blood that? pressure will, will be a lot better. <laughs> I just don't understand why anyone would voluntarily get on 35. Yeah, they don't. People got to work, you know, and and, and God, God bless you, you know, and, and you got to get home at some point. So, um, hey, I got to say something. I, it's just something. If it, uh, it's, I'm just on a kick this year because I've uh, I've been on a three year journey of surveillance to all our all of our dudes and bros out here watching, listening because there's a bit a ton of support for what you guys do and and, and rightfully so get your psa check do it it's simple my i've been under surveillance for three years um man it's very simple if you want a urologist you can message me i won't do it over there no give it it's uh dr carl bischoff okay urology austin okay man Um. I, I that there's nothing we said that'd be more important than than that today. Um, yeah. Because you know, even with the stuff I've dealt with in my life. Oh man, you dealt with some stuff. Yeah, I, I still and I should have learned my, my my damn lesson. And I still, I'm just a guy, and I don't get checked up enough. And you know, I hate to split stuff up because it's unfair <laughs> at times. You know, women do that, men do that, but you know, women can't drive, and we don't go to the doctor. So that's just the way it is, Sean. I mean, you know, I mean, we just have. Let's be honest with each other. We're just human. Yeah, exactly. That's all we are. That's all we are. But I think it's more important. um, Just a reminder. Sometimes us, especially men, need that reminder over and over again. And sometimes to get pushed there. But 
Um, there's nothing more important that we're going to say today. Brother, I love you to death. Let's I get love you there. too, man. Let's get lunch soon. Uh, once I once I kick this thing, and um, I miss you, man. It, it, today, it, this could not have flown, but I literally looked down and I thought, dude, we just Go. started. We just started. I mean, Joe Joe Cook was great, and the uh, the one and only, and I mean that, the one and only Sean Clinch. I, I don't know anyone who's like you, so uh, and I mean man. that. Compliment, brother. I've enjoyed this. Shoot, maybe one day we'll have something regular. And I, I've got to get you on stories inside the man cave. Sometimes. Absolutely. You, you know, I love you guys, and I, I, I've been following, watching, and you know, heck, even I've listened to it probably a couple of months ago uh, on a car ride. So um, you guys Thank just you. do, you guys do a hell of a job, dude. So keep it up. I'd love to be on that. Let's get you back on here. We got to do it, man. We'll have fun, man. And uh, good to see you. And we'll, we'll definitely do lunch. We won't have to have a reservation for that. No, 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 no. We may, <laughs> we may, we may even do backspace. Hey, shout out to everyone. Shout out to all of our sponsors. Uh, yeah. Big, you know, big thanks to them. We're able to do this because of them. So whether it's audio, visual consultations, mm -hmm. brain vault, you see covert, all stat, uh, Apple leasing, big shout out to our guy, Scott Crossett. They got some good deals going on right Longhorn now. Longhorn laundry, baby. Yes, sir. Longhorn Laundry, Last Stand Hats, Mike, uh, just to everyone. We really appreciate it. We will be back tomorrow. I'm not sure with my situation if I'll be out at the dish, but I certainly will. Um, I'll certainly join if I can to talk a little bit of UT baseball, but the boys will get everything started at eight o'clock tomorrow. For Sean Clinch and for Joe Cook, Trey will be back. We appreciate everyone. Y'all have a great night and hook them.